It's time now for... Johnny Deller. Tim Connors, John Boy. Congratulate me. Congratulations, Tim. What for? I just had another boy. Seven pounds, 12 ounces. Hey, you like cigars? Sure. Well, come on down and pick one up. Oh, maybe you better pack a suitcase, too. I got one for you out in Culver, Montana. Where is that? I just told you. Out in Montana somewhere. We have a debt policy holder there named Henderson. Henderson, huh? Yeah. Now, we don't know if he was murdered, committed suicide, or had an accident. Well, what does it look like? All three. Okay, Tim, be there in an hour. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Paramount Insurance Adjusters, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Henderson matter, whatever it's going to be. Expense account item one, dollar and a quarter for a detailed map. I had an idea that Culver, Montana was a place that only Rand McDally might know about. They did. I found it tucked up in the high northern corner of the state near Great Falls. Hey, where's your bag? Home. Oh. I told you to pack it. Now look, Give me a cigar, Tim. Tell me about the new boy in the new case. Okay, have a chair. Here you are. I wouldn't smoke it if I were you. Terrible. Cost me two bucks a box. Hey, you know something? I'm thinking of naming the new boy Johnny. Oh, tough case, huh? Yeah. Hmm? Look, look. We're in the same sweet old spot, Johnny. Same old problem. One of our policyholders is dead, and for looking into the circumstances of his death... The insurance company is no longer a friend of the widow and orphan, but a big, bad monster trying to weasel out of a just claim. All claims are just claims, or are they? Well, of course they are. No one ever tried to pull a fast one on an insurance company. Well, the world's full of nice, honest, straight-playing people. Uh Uh-huh. Now tell me about getting sandbagged in a poker game. Look, I want to get this out of the way and get back over to the hospital and see my wife. Now, John, this claim came into the insurance office yesterday afternoon, airmail special. The insurance company turned it over to me today. What company? Western. The policy's worth $25,000 face value, double indemnity if death was by accident. No payment for suicide. Uh Uh-huh. You say the man's name was Henderson? Yeah, it says here, George Walter Henderson, Montana rancher. Last Thursday, he fell four stories out of a hotel window in Culver and died instantly. At least that's what we have in this report here. Somebody could have shoved him, or he could have taken the leap. Now, we have to know for certain. Oh, what's on the claim report? Accidental. There was no inquest, no police investigation, and that's not good enough for us. Uh Uh-huh. This Henderson prominent? Well, he was big enough, Johnny. Cattleman, rancher. He was also a major stockholder and the only newspaper in Culver, so I doubt if his paper would suggest suicide or anything else. Do you? I don't know, Tim. I never met the editor. Well, meet him if you like. Talk to him. Talk to anybody in Culver. Find out what was what. This is a lousy cigar. Johnny... You know how to handle these things. We have to have more information than this. Have you tried to do anything on it at all? Yeah, I phoned the sheriff's office long distance and talked to a man named Holton, Eve Holton. He said he'd be happy to cooperate. Oh, what else? I phoned the beneficiary to get some information. Name's Pauline Henderson, his widow. Is she going to cooperate, too? I don't think so, pal. Huh? She hung up on me. We will continue with the Henderson matter in a moment. Friends, how'd you like to thrill your favorite youngster with some of the most exciting toys of the year? Picture the breathless excitement of any child surrounded by six gaily colored balloon-like giant animals up to three feet long, and all for the low, low price of just one dollar. First, you get Bounzo the Clown with round pot belly and funny nose. Next comes Hoppy the Australian Kangaroo. Third, there's Roscoe the Roller Skating Bear. He's two feet tall and looks almost like real. Fourth, there's Whitey the Fat Indoor Snowman. And fifth, Mortimer the Giant Mouse, 18 inches long and sure to scare the whiskers off any cat. That's five different giant animals. But now hold your breath for the most sensational toy of all, the star of the whole Christmas season, the jolly giant talking Santa Claus. Guaranteed to make everybody's Christmas a merrier one. 
one. He's a big roly-poly happy Santa. He stands erect on two legs, is actually over three feet tall and 32 inches around. Best of all, he actually talks. Just pull the tape and he says, Merry Christmas for all to hear. He's the biggest, merriest talking as Santa ever. Sure to please your youngsters and spread good cheer. Yes, giant Santa proves there really is a Santa Claus. That's a total of six giant animals made of brightly colored preformed sturdy latex, which the kids can easily inflate. And the cost, just one dollar, not for each. Just one dollar for all six of these lovable giants who'll turn your home into a circus parade. And here's a surprise. Mail your order today and you'll also receive absolutely free Peter the Rabbit, actually over two feet tall with big red ears almost nine inches long. But you must send now. Rush one dollar plus ten cents for packing and mailing for each set you want to Giant Animals, Box 90, Grand Central Station, New York City. If not delighted with every one of your seven giant animals, return them to the Super Animals Company for a full refund, but keep the giant talking Santa as our gift. Order now. Supplies are limited. Rush $1.10 for packing and mailing for each set in cash, check, or money order to Giant Animals, Box 90, Grand Central Station, New York City. That's $1 plus 10 cents with your name and address. Mail to Giant Animals, Box 90, Box 90, Grand Central Station, New York City. Giant Animals, Box 90, Grand Central Station, New York City. Expense account item two, $185.65. Airfare, Hartford, Connecticut to Great Falls, Montana. The nearest point I could make to Culver by air. Item three, three bucks. I took the train to Culver. Sometimes when I'm having nightmares, I dream about the smelter stack standing up against the cadaverous hills that lie to the south of town. Everything, including the three or four feet of snow covered with a uniform dinginess, made Culver an ugly little town set in an ugly notch between two ugly mountains. The only hotel in town was the Butte. It happened to be four stories high. It also happened to be the place where George Henderson had met his death. Okay, just a minute. Mr. Dollar? Yeah. I'm Eve Holton, sheriff here. Huh? You're from the insurance people, aren't you? Yeah, that's right. Hmm? Been expecting that you'd be in sooner or later. Well, I'm glad to meet you, Mr. Holton. Uh, call me Eve, son. Everybody does. Uh, hey, uh, got a drink on you? And uh, No, I haven't. Well, I got one on me. <laughs> nice and chilly, too. <laughs> well, I'll see if there's some glasses around here, Sheriff. You didn't waste any time looking me up. No, I guess I didn't, son. Thought it'd save a little time this way. Knew you'd be looking me up sooner or later. I really thought we ought to have this drink together. Private. May not have any more together while you're here. Uh-huh. Well, health and happiness, boy. Uh, same to you. <clears throat> now, this drink we're having. This is in your room, and I'm just a fellow welcoming you to Culver. In my office or on that street out there, I'm a sheriff. And I'm going to be real official. All right, go on. I want you to notice I'm not asking any questions of you, son. I'm just answering anything that you might want to ask me right now. All right. You're going to have to plow ahead yourself on this one pretty much alone. And let me tell you what kind of plowing you got in store for you. Excuse me. Uh, now, first off, this is a little burg like you ain't used to. We got 3,500, 4,000 people living here. Some of them work in that mine you've seen on your way into town. Others hire out to work on the ranches around here. Some in business. Uh Uh-huh. Very tight little place. We hardly ever fool around with anybody else. Sure. Now, you're here because your insurance company don't like to pay off on a policy without knowing whys and wherefores. They don't like the word accident without knowing some of the details. No, they don't. There's a lot of people here, most people, who don't care about those details. As a matter of fact, son, they'd all just as soon put old George Henderson down on the ground and say it was an accident and let it go with that. Well, maybe it was, Sheriff. I don't know. But I'm going to find out. Yeah, well, now, let me go on. Those people who don't like the details don't like detail getters. You understand? Uh, yeah. Scare you any? Not yet. <laughs> you do all right, son. So, maybe you'd kind of like to get your coat on and come to your funeral with me. Starts at three. Henderson's? Yeah, give you a chance to look around, get the lay of the land. Okay, good idea. 
I wondered what kind of bull workers insurance companies turned out. I like you, Dollar. You're all right. You ain't bothering with any questions till you got some worthwhile asking. You tired? A little. Well, this won't take too long. A half hour later, I was standing beside Sheriff Eve Holton on a flat top hillside that served as a cemetery. The snow was white and gleaming under the winter sun of the mid-afternoon skies. The air cold and crisp. To thee, our heavenly Father, who knoweth all things, we commit the body of our beloved to thy eternal care. Thy will be done. Trusting ever in thy mercy, we invoke the consolation of thy sheltering wing. Earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Ensure and certain hope of resurrection into eternal life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Here. Oh, that's that. Yeah. Poor George. Eve. Hmm? Which one is Mrs. Henderson? There. That's Pauline Henderson? Yeah, that's her. Well, she can't be more than 25. 26, to be exact, Dollar. I went to her birthday party two months ago. Well, how old was George Henderson? 59. Went to his party, too. Yeah. Pretty thing, hmm? Very. Any other family? Nope. No other wife, huh? Nope. Want to meet her? No, not right now. Mm-hmm. Well, suit yourself. Kind of thought you might start thinking when you got a look at her. Hmm? Now, well, now, just keep on the way you're doing. You're doing fine. When there's something you got to know, you'll find out. Well, Leif, I already know one thing. Yeah? What's that? I'm going to ask for a coroner's inquest. Just from seeing her? Just from seeing her. Mm-hmm. You're a sly one, Johnny. Johnny Dollar will be back in a moment to tell you about tomorrow's episode. Friends, send for your set of some of the most exciting toys of the year. Six giant inflatable toys for only one dollar, some up to three feet tall. You get Bounce the Happy Clown, Hoppy the Australian Kangaroo, Roscoe the two feet long roller skating bear, Whitey the fat indoor snowman, Mortimer the giant mouse 18 inches long, and last but not least, the great giant talking Santa, a roly-poly giant over three feet tall and 32 inches around the belly that actually says Merry Christmas out loud when you pull the tape. That six sensational giant toys for only one dollar, made of sturdy, gaily colored latex that the kids can easily inflate. Send one dollar for each set to Giant Animals, Box 90, Grand Central Station, New York City. And if you order right now, you get Peter the Rabbit over two feet tall absolutely free. If not delighted with your giant animals, your money refunded immediately. Order today, you may never hear this offer again. Rush one dollar plus ten cents for packing and mailing in cash, check, or money order to Giant Animals, Box 90, Grand Central Station, New York City. That's one dollar plus ten cents for each set with your name and address to Giant Animals, Box 90, Grand Central Station, New York City. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of The Henderson Matter. Tomorrow, I find out how hard it is to believe what I see. And I see plenty. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Shiny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure and join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking.
From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Keith Holden. How are you this morning? Oh, pretty good, Sheriff. How about yourself? Oh, I'm fine, Dandy. You were over at the city hall this morning, huh? Yeah, that's right. I requested the coroner to conduct an inquest into the death of George Henderson. Yeah, I know. The coroner left it up to me. Huh? Yeah, came into my office and asked me if I had any reason to conduct an inquest into the death of George Henderson. I told him I didn't have any reason, but I'd do it if I was ordered to. Well, what happens now? Well, somebody will have to decide whether there's going to be an inquest or not. Who? Mayor, I guess. I don't know. Anyhow, you stirred up some action, and you'll be getting it. Yeah, where? Just stay where you are, son. My guess is it'll come right to you. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Paramount Insurance Adjusters, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Henderson matter. The death of George Henderson of Culver, Montana, where I am today. A casual certification announced that death is accidental, having been received by a fall from a hotel window. No one in Culver seemed to be too worried about any of the details. But details are my job. That's why I requested the coroner's office to conduct an inquest. I took Sheriff Holton's suggestion and waited to see what my request flushed up in the dingy-colored mountains of Culver. An hour later, my first bird winged up to my hotel room. He was a tall, gray-haired man in a Stetson, earmuffs, and the western version of a Chesterfield. His honor, Mayor Newton. Mr. Dollar, I want to talk to you about this request you made for an inquest into George Henderson's death. Yes, sir, Mr. Mayor. You are aware, of course, that George's death, and he was one of my beloved and personal friends for many, many years, was a great blow to the entire community. No, I didn't know that, Mayor Newton. Huh? Only the smallest part of the community were at his funeral yesterday afternoon. His widow and, I'd say, not more than half a dozen other people. Ah. Well, I understand that your insurance company is not quite satisfied with the certification. Is that correct? Uh, More or less. What would they need to be satisfied, sir? An exact knowledge of how Mr. Henderson fell out that hotel window. I would rather no inquest were held into Mr. Henderson's death. Why? Why, sir, George Henderson is dead and buried. It should remain that way. If an inquest were to be held, it would only prove that George fell out of a window... I beg you to consider that, Mr. Dollar. You seem very certain that an investigation would prove that death was accidental. It was accidental. George fell out the window. Well, now, I can't just tell that to my insurance company, can I? Uh, We are a small community with a rudimentary police force, not equipped in any way for an exhaustive investigation, nor for the financial burden of such an investigation. I strongly urge you to reconsider this request for a coroner's inquest. You do? I do indeed. His untimely death was an unfortunate occurrence, outside the pale of any of our poor abilities to foresee. A terrible, terrible accident. I'd like proof of that. Proof? An inquest, Mr. Mayor. An inquest. All right. We will continue with the Henderson matter in a moment. Friends, how'd you like to thrill your favorite youngster with some of the most exciting toys of the year? Picture the breathless excitement of any child surrounded by six gaily colored balloon-like giant animals up to three feet long, and all for the low, low price of just one dollar. First, you get Bounce the Clown with round pot belly and funny nose. Next comes Hoppy the Australian kangaroo. Third, there's Rusko the roller skating bear. He's two feet tall and looks almost like real. Fourth, there's Whitey the fat indoor snowman, and fifth, Mortimer the giant mouse, 18 inches 
long and sure to scare the whiskers off any cat. That's five different giant animals. But now hold your breath for the most sensational toy of all, the star of the whole Christmas season, the jolly giant talking Santa Claus. Guaranteed to make everybody's Christmas a merrier one. He's a big roly-poly happy Santa. He stands erect on two legs, is actually over three feet tall and 32 inches around. Best of all, he actually talks. Just pull the tape and he says, Merry Christmas for all to hear. He's the biggest, merriest talking as Santa ever. Sure to please your youngsters and spread good cheer. Yes, Giant Santa proves there really is a Santa Claus. That's a total of six giant animals made of brightly colored preformed sturdy latex, which the kids can easily inflate. And the cost, just one dollar, not for each. Just one dollar for all six of these lovable giants who'll turn your home into a circus parade. And here's a surprise. Mail your order today and you'll also receive absolutely free Peter the Rabbit, actually over two feet tall with big red ears almost nine inches long. But you must send now. Rush $1 plus 10 cents for packing and mailing for each set you want to Giant Animals Box 46 Grand Central Station, New York City. If not delighted with every one of your seven giant animals, return them to the Super Animals Company for a full refund, but keep the giant talking Santa as our gift. Order now. Supplies are limited. Rush $1.10 for packing and mailing for each set in cash, check, or money order to Giant Animals, Box 46, Grand Central Station, New York City. That's $1 plus 10 cents with your name and address. Mail to Giant Animals, Box 46, Grand Central Station, New York City. Giant Animals, Box 46, Grand Central Station, New York City. My interview with Mayor Newton had convinced me that I'd get no real help from him in the Henderson matter. Quite the contrary. Expense account item three, 20 cents, coffee. Myself and Sheriff Eve Holton. Well, you got it. Huh? At the direction of Mr. Jackson. That's our coroner. He deputized me temporarily to conduct an inquest. It's going to take place tomorrow morning, 9 o'clock, City Hall. Tomorrow, Sheriff? Room 207. Well, Eve, you won't have time to do anything. No, I guess I won't. Not much, anyhow. Oh, brother... The mayor pitched me pretty hard for not having the inquest. Knew he would. Any idea why? Nope. You think somebody asked him to stop it? Yeah. Who? Don't know, Johnny. Honest. The next morning, I struggled my way against a belligerent north wind to City Hall and the inquest, if you could call it that. I sat in the back of the room and listened while a Dr. Horace Nam assured the six-man jury that George Henderson was quite dead when he was called out of his office and examined him on the street. Dr. Nam reckoned George had died from a broken neck. An ancient bellhop, a desk clerk, and a chambermaid gave their versions of what had happened the day Henderson fell out the window. Now, you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, so help you, God. I do, Sheriff. I'm the acting coroner today, Miss Cubley. Sit down. Now... When did you see Mr. Henderson last? Last Thursday morning. Where was this, Miss Cubley? At the Butte Hotel. Mm Mm-hmm. You know what time of the morning it was? About 10 o'clock. I went in to make his bed and straighten up his room. I see. I made his bed while he worked on some papers there, and then I left. Did you see him after that? No, sir. You didn't see him come downstairs for breakfast or anything? No, sir. Do you know if anybody went up to see him? I believe I saw Miss Henderson in the lobby after that. Do you see Mrs. Henderson in this room? Yes, sir. I believe that's Mrs. Henderson over there. No, that's Mrs. Henderson. Now, do you know if Mrs. Henderson visited Mr. Henderson in his room? No, sir. I don't know that. Miss Cubley, did you happen to notice if anyone else went up to Mr. Henderson's room that morning? No, sir. It went on all morning long. Sheriff Holton, acting in the coroner's position, questioned person after person. All had more or less the same vague knowledge concerning George Henderson's death. I was most interested in Pauline Henderson's testimony. Now then, Mrs. Henderson, when did you last see your husband? Thursday. I went to see him about noon, maybe a little before. Where did you see him, Miss Henderson? At the Butte Hotel, in his room there. The same room he occupied prior to his death? Of course. The same room from which he fell? Yes. Were you alone when you went to see him, Mrs. Henderson? Yes. I must have left before 12.30. I had an appointment at the dentist. And that was the last time you saw your husband alive? Yes. I was still in the dentist's chair when they told me he'd fallen out the window. What uh, What did you and your husband talk about, Mrs. Henderson? Must I answer that? Well, we're trying to determine something here. I'd appreciate it. 
George and I discussed our divorce. Could you tell us about that? George and I decided to part about a month ago. He moved out of the house and moved into the hotel. Mm Mm-hmm. Outside of the divorce, were you on good terms? Oh, yes, we've always been on good terms. Mrs. Henderson, do you think there's a chance that he might have thrown himself out that window? Mrs. Mrs. Henderson, do you think he might have thrown himself out that window? No, at least not over us, if that's what you mean. As far as you knew, was your husband in good health? Yes, he was. You happen to know when he was examined last? Oh, a month or so ago. He was in perfect health. Uh, One more thing. Did Mr. Henderson drink? Yes. Did he drink that morning with you? I think he had a couple of drinks. Yes, yes, he had a drink or two while we were talking. He could have stumbled at that window. The clothes were New York, the perfume Paris, the jewelry Tiffany's. The look you might expect it on the Riviera, where everybody tries to act bored with too many good things in life. Her dress, blank for the occasion of death, was cut too well and too carefully for her to pass as a grieving widow. She answered the questions without hesitation or emotion. Fifteen minutes later, the jury brought in the expected verdict. Therefore, it is the opinion of this jury that the said deceased George Walter Henderson came to his death as a result of injuries incurred in a fall from the fourth floor of the Butte Hotel at or about 12.45 p.m. on the 19th day of this month. No evidence to the contrary. It is deemed and declared that the manner of death was accidental. Adjourned. As far as Culver's people, it's police and its mayor were concerned. Yeah, the mayor. Well, Mr. Dollar, I hope you're satisfied. It was a pretty good inquest, Mayor Newton. I trust the official verdict of the jury will answer any questions your insurance company might have had on their minds and clear this whole matter up. hmm? I'll forward it to them and tell them the circumstances under which the inquest was conducted, Mr. Mayor. Satisfactory, I trust. No, but it served a purpose... Now that everybody thinks it was an accident, everybody will breathe easier. Certainly. Yeah. If everybody's relaxing like that, somebody's going to get careless. See you, Mr. Mayor. Johnny Dollar will be back in a moment to tell you about tomorrow's episode. Friends, send for your set of some of the most exciting toys of the year. Six giant inflatable toys for only one dollar, some up to three feet tall. You get Bounce the Happy Clown, Hoppy the Australian Kangaroo, Roscoe the two feet long roller skating bear, Whitey the fat indoor snowman, Mortimer the giant mouse 18 inches long, and last but not least, the great giant talking Santa, a roly-poly giant over three feet tall and 32 inches around the belly that actually says Merry Christmas out loud when you pull the tape. That's six sensational giant toys for only one dollar, made of sturdy, gaily colored latex that the kids can easily inflate. Send one dollar for each set to Giant Animals, Box 46, Grand Central Station, New York City. And if you order right now, you get Peter the Rabbit over two feet tall absolutely free. If not delighted with your giant animals, your money refunded immediately. Order today, you may never hear this offer again. Rush one dollar plus ten cents for packing and mailing in cash, check, or money order to Giant Animals, Box 46, Grand Central Station, New York City. That's one dollar plus ten cents for each set with your name and address. To Giant Animals, Box 46, Grand Central Station, New York City. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of The Henderson Matter. People do get careless tomorrow, all over Culver, Montana. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure and join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. 
Chief Holden, son. Hi, Sheriff. You put in a call for me, did you? Yes, I'm ready to go to work. Now that the inquest's been held and George Henderson's death is officially an accident, I might be able to move around your little town a little easier. What can I do for you? Help me to move around. Uh, case is closed, as far as I'm concerned. Eve, what's the matter with you? That inquest was a farce. For all I know, Henderson could have been pushed out of that hotel window. The attitude of different people in this town makes that whole oh, thing... Hold on now, son. Hold on. I meant to say it's closed as far as my office is concerned. Personally, I think it needs investigating. We can help each other, maybe, you and me. Can I come over? Oh, I better come there. You know how folks are around here. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Culver, Montana, to Paramount Insurance Adjusters, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Henderson matter. The question, accident, suicide, or murder? Expense account item four, $3.48. One day later to Tim Connors' office in Hartford explaining the situation in Culver. I'll, uh, I'll read it back to you, Mr. Dollar. Mr. Tim Connors, Paramount Insurance Adjusters, Hartford, Connecticut. Coroner's inquest into the death of George Henderson, policy number EMP-196667, found death to be accidental. In my opinion, the inquest was not thorough. Have decided to stay on in Culver and conduct my own investigation. If any change, please advise via Western Union, Butte Hotel, Culver. Am forwarding copy of coroner's verdict this date. Best regards, Dollar. Correct? Okay. Oh, uh, Mr. Dollar. Hmm? Good luck. <laughs> yeah, sure. Expense account item five, 68 cents, postage. I mailed a copy of the coroner's verdict to Hartford Airmail Special. After that, I went back to my hotel to wait for the sheriff, Eve Holton. Come on in, Eve, I... Oh. Hello. Hello. Uh, Mr. Dollar, my name's Porter. I'm the manager of this hotel. Oh, well, come in, Mr. Porter. I, I can't right now. I've got some other things to attend to. Well, anything I can do for you, Mr. Porter? I I'm going to have to ask you for your room, Mr. Dollar. Oh? When? Uh, t today. Any particular reason? We're all filled up. Uh, the, the room's been reserved for six weeks. By whom? What? Who reserved it? Why, uh, a man from Bozeman. It's a sort of convention. Sort of convention. What kind of convention is that, Mr. Porter? Look, Mr. Dollar, you'll have to leave this room today. The man's coming in tonight. Aha. Uh -huh. And there's no other hotel in town. That's the way it is, Mr. Dollar. No other place to stay? No. So I have to pack my bags and get out of town, is that it? I must have the room, Mr. Dollar. Who asked you to say you wanted the room, Mr. Porter? Who asked you to come here and kick me out? Why, no one, I... Well, I, you I, go back to no one, Mr. Porter, and you tell no one that I'm staying right here in this room here in Culver until I finish what I have to do here. You tell that to no one, will you? Mr. Dollar, I'd, I'd hate to call the police. Go ahead, Mr. Porter. Be sure and tell them about the sort of convention you're having and how all the rooms are sold out. Tell them about Mr. No One and tell them I called your bluff. Anything else, Mr. Porter? <laughs> I was at the stage where I was beginning to take notes for myself. Note one, the mayor didn't want to have an inquest into the death of George Henderson. Note two, when they did have an inquest, they didn't want to really find out anything. Note three, Mr. Hotel Manager wanted me to keep on not finding out anything by getting me out of town. I explained all of this to Eve Holton when he showed up a half an hour later. Well, kind of, kind of tight, isn't it? I don't know what that means, Sheriff, but it's pretty stupid. <laughs> Yeah, it's stupid, son, but it could be effective. Now, I'll tell you what. If Porter calls the police, I'm the police. So don't worry about that. I'll hem him and haw him. All right, thanks. Now then, uh, tell me how much your insurance company's stuck for. $50,000 if Henderson's death goes by as an accident. 
The good book says that's what it was. I know, I know. There's a chance, too, we had a heart failure and fell out of that window. No, sure. Always a chance. We might have to dig him up and find out, Sheriff. Oop, no, hold on. Autopsies and digging people up is one thing you'd have a hard time doing around here. I might insist on it. I don't know. Well, let that go for now. Say, tell me about Mrs. Henderson. Where's she from? Here. Right here in Culver. Now, she didn't get that mink coat and those diamonds she was wearing at the inquest in Culver. More important, she didn't get that continental look here either. So what's the story? Well, her name was Pauline Underwood before she married George. Born and raised right here in Culver. Of course, she went to school in the East, and she's been in Europe a couple of times, but most of her life's been right here. She is a mighty pretty widow. And a mighty rich one, too. Henderson had it. I know. This divorce she talked about at the inquest yesterday. Well, everybody in town knew they weren't getting along, never did get along. How could they? Pauline's 26 and George is 59. He could have been her father. As a matter of fact, he almost was. Well, tell me about that. You got a drink? Hmm? Oh, yeah. But George raised Pauline from the time she was 14. He paid for all her schooling and growing up. She didn't have any folks after her old man died. George was pretty good to her. He sure was. <laughs> Was he a friend of her parents? Well, Tom Underwood worked out at the ranch for George. When he died, there was Pauline standing there. Oh, yeah. Oh, thanks. And she eventually married him and his money, huh? Well, I, I wouldn't put it that way exactly. I, I think she liked him. Now, I, I've gone over what you're thinking, son. Those two were talking about divorce for some time. The papers had been drawn up for a settlement. She'd have got a lot of alimony and so on. Oh, Pauline had no call to push him out that window or have him pushed out. At least not for money. All right. Suppose he didn't want a divorce. Suppose he loved her and she came to the hotel room that morning and he pleaded with her to try all over again. Suppose she said no. Suppose she said no in a great big cold way. And George Henderson sat there and thought about it after she left. And he got sick all over and he walked over to that window and... Suicide? What do you think? You know him. Uh, he wasn't a suicide type. So. Oh, nobody's the suicide type until they come to the end of the line, Eve. Then it's too late to interview them and ask them how they got there. Everybody seems to think it was an accident, so I'm just throwing words around. Well, you have a right to do that if you aren't satisfied, son. Hey, getting back to this hotel again. Who might want me to get out of town and not ask any questions? Anybody. Well, who? No idea. But it's somebody who has some feelings in this. Hey, who owns this hotel, Eve? Noah Baxter. Who's Noah Baxter? Rancher. Got a place about 15 miles from here. Pretty big man. Uh huh. Friend of Henderson's? Yeah. Hmm. And let me put that question a little different. Baxter, a friend of Mrs. Henderson's? I don't know. Can you find out? I can try. Well, find out about him and any other friends, Eve. Friends that might be younger, that might have gone to Europe or school in the East. Yeah. <sighs> sure. What are you thinking now, son? Well, now, if I were Mrs. Henderson and my husband fell out of a window in this hotel and killed himself, I'd hire a lawyer and I'd sue the hotel for damages. If the insurance company didn't pay off my claim, I'd hire a lawyer and insist that they pay that claim. I'd do those things right away, Sheriff, especially if I thought it was all legitimate. Yeah. Yeah. Two hours later, I received a wire from Tim Connors. He requested me to look up a man named Thurber, an insurance broker living in Great Falls. Expense account item six, $4.92, tank of gas. I borrowed Sheriff Holton's car and drove the 80-odd miles to Great Falls that afternoon. Mr. Thurber bought lunch. My Lord, I hope there isn't anything to all this, Mr. Dollar. I just hope there isn't. George Henderson. My. Yeah, well, there isn't anything to anything yet, Mr. Thurber. I'm... Still trying to find out the facts. Oh, I knew you were over in Culver. I tried to call you there a couple of times. You were out both times. Finally, I put in a call to the home office in Hartford. I talked to this man, Connors, with the adjustment agency. Yeah. You see, Mr. Dollar, it's like this. I've been over in Jackson Hole for five days now hunting duck. We were way in, and I didn't hear about Henderson's death until I got back yesterday. Uh-huh. Now, oh, look, Mr. Dollar, I don't know what reflection this will have on your attitude toward this case. But two days before I left, Mr. Henderson telephoned me here in Great Falls... He said he wanted to change the beneficiary on his policy. Oh, in other words, he was going to cut his wife out. Huh? Yes, I suppose so. I know they weren't getting along. There'd been talk of divorce. Yes, I guess so. Uh-huh. Did he name a new beneficiary? Yes, a schoolteacher in Culver named Matilda Knickerbocker. 
Everybody calls her Maddie. What was his connection with her? None that I know of. I think it was just a name for him to throw in until he could decide on another beneficiary why he didn't have Wait a minute. Maddie Knickerbocker. Just a school teacher. Everybody knows her. He was awful mad when he talked to me that day. I could tell it in his voice. Now, here's what might interest you just a little more. The day I left on my hunting trip, Mr. Henderson phoned me again. He said to never mind. Mrs. Henderson was still his beneficiary. Had you changed the policies yet? No. Are you sure it was Henderson who telephoned you? Well, yes, of... I, I think it was him. Do you remember when you got the call? Oh, somewhere around noon, a little later, I guess. He died between 12.30 and 1. And it must have been just before he fell out the window. He phoned you long distance from cover, huh? Yes, sir. Well, he was supposed to have been in the hotel all morning, so he had to phone from his room. Well, you can check that, can't you? <laughs> You'd be surprised how hard it is to check simple things like that around the Butte Hotel. Did you know Henderson very well, Mr. Thurber? He was a customer. I wrote a lot of insurance for him. Know his wife? Oh, yes. Well, tell me about them. Well, go ahead, Mr. Thurber. Uh, now, look, accidents rarely have reason behind them. Suicides and murders always do. You don't think it was an accident? Well, let's say I've heard enough and seen enough to make it a draw so far. Go ahead, tell me about them. And I wish I was married to Mrs. Henderson. I mean, I wish she could see me. I think most any man who's ever met her hoped the same thing. Young men, old men, any kind. But she picked George. George was as tough and leathery as these mountains around us, exactly her opposite. But Pauline married him. He raised her. He was close to her all her adult life. Yes. But Mr. Dollar, you know and I know she didn't have to marry him. She could have married anybody here in Culver or anybody in London or Paris. You see what I mean? And not quite. Well... I always had the idea that after she married him, she kept letting him know she could have had anybody else she wanted. Go ahead, Thurber. I think she married him for his money. I think she would have killed him for his money. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Henderson matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, the whole affair becomes a town issue, and I become the town goat. Incidentally, let me take a moment to say thanks for the many kind letters you've sent. We appreciate them more than you know. And I only wish it were possible to answer them all personally. Again, thank you. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure and join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Mrs. Henderson. You asked me to call, Mr. Dollar? Yes, Mrs. Henderson. I'm with Paramount Insurance Adjusters. Oh, yes. You probably know we asked for the inquest into your husband's death. Yes, I know. We're trying to clear up the entire matter as quickly as we can, Mrs. Henderson. I'd like to talk to you. Oh? Hate to trouble you at a time like this. Well, that's all right, Mr. Dollar. When do you want to talk? May I come out to the house this afternoon? There's a nice restaurant called Big Horn Lodge on the highway. How about meeting you there at, say, uh, four o'clock? Good. I'll be there.
Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Paramount Insurance Adjusters, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Henderson matter. Expense account continued. Item seven, five bucks. One pair of galoshes, believe it or not. It snowed in Culver, Montana during the night, all night. By morning, 14 inches of fine new snow covered everything in sight. After my phone call to Mrs. Henderson, I spent the morning trying to rent an automobile. There was none to be had, so that afternoon I dropped over to see Eve Holton, my sheriff friend. Well, son, you're going to catch your death unless you start wearing this car. Yeah, I'll remember that, Eve. But maybe I won't need one. Oh? Yeah, I think I'll be leaving Culver pretty soon. Well, I hope you don't mean that, son. I'm afraid I do. I'll have to tie this case up one way or another pretty quick. Why? My company wants me to get back home. I got a letter this morning. Oh, well, how can I help you? Well, for one thing, you can lend me your car again. I, uh, I have a date with a lady out at the Bighorn Lodge. <laughs> Pretty fancy. You can have the old thing anytime you want it. You know that, son. Who's the lady? George Henderson's widow. Yeah. Oh. Now, I know what you're going to say. Why go after her? Why bother her until I have something to go on? Well, I got to do something, Eve. I'm no nearer now to knowing whether Henderson was pushed out that hotel window, fell, or jumped. I think I have enough of an idea of Henderson and his wife to pick up some valuable information from her. Any objections? Nope. Johnny, a couple of days ago, you asked me to look up people who might have been especially friendly to Mrs. Henderson. You still want to know about them? Yeah, sure. Well, I'm working on it. Anyone so far? Nobody I'd put in that category. What time do you have to be at the Bighorn? Four. It'll take you a while. Wouldn't hurt to start right now. He's, uh, she's parked out back. Okay, thanks, Eve. Good luck. And don't let her rang dangle you, son. She could do it if she wanted to. Goodbye, Eve. Ten minutes later, I was on the road to Bighorn Lodge, which also happened to be the same road I'd traveled two days before to attend George Henderson's funeral. As I drove past the graveyard, white and stark against the blue winter sky, I noticed a car parked along the side of the road, a little Chevy Coupe, about 1952. There was the figure of a woman, all alone, standing by George Henderson's fresh grave. Her head was bowed. She didn't notice me as I walked up. A gray-haired woman, about 45, slight, delicate, gentle. <gasps> oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to start you. Oh, that's all right. Must be getting late. Dear, it is. Uh, do I know you? Why, I don't know. I'm Maddie Knickerbocker. The name had startled me. The day before, an insurance broker in Great Falls had mentioned her, told me that George Henderson had named her his beneficiary, then changed his mind a few minutes before he died. Your name's not Campbell, is it? No. Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar. You remind me of a boy I had in one of my classes once, Tory Campbell. Oh, you're a teacher, Miss Knickerbocker? (laughs) Yes, yes. Everybody knows me, I think. Or at least I flatter myself that way. (laughs) Well, I should be going. I, uh... I knew Mr. Henderson, too. Oh? He was a wonderful man, George. He was very dear to me. I'll find it difficult getting used to the fact that he'll never be around anymore. George had a wonderful laugh, didn't he? Yes. uh, Yes, he did, Mrs. Knickerbocker. I never really thought that he ever grew up. Of course, you knew him in a business way, and I'm sure he was very, very grown up in business. But it doesn't hurt to think of him this way now, does it? I don't think so, Miss Knickerbocker. I didn't come to his funeral. I didn't think I could bear it. I thought I'd just drive out this afternoon and say goodbye by myself. Well, I apologize for interrupting you. Oh, not at all. Please. <laughs> Funny little things. Hmm? 
The birds in the snow. Oh. Such tiny, wonderful little things. A little bit of God in each of them, Mr. Dollar, wouldn't you say? Yes, ma'am. I don't know why. I think George would like to know they're here, near him. Miss Knickerbocker, I have to tell you... No, you don't, Mr. Dollar. I know who you really are. Everyone in town knows. You seem like a nice young man. Was it curiosity that made you stop your car? Yeah, I suppose so. I apologize. Oh, you needn't. I'm just an old friend of George's saying goodbye to him. Good afternoon, Mr. Dollar. Goodbye. Talking to Maddie Knickerbocker, I felt that for the first time, somebody, namely Maddie, had talked frankly and truthfully about George Henderson. I was still thinking of the frail, drab little woman with the nice blue eyes when I met Pauline Henderson at the Bighorn Lodge. What are these matters you want to clear up, Mr. Dollar? Oh, just some doubts in my mind about your husband's death. What do you drink? Perno. Perno. I learned to like it in France. All right. Uh, one perno, bourbon, a little water on the side. Yes, sir. You sound like George when you order. Hey, I like your Bighorn Lodge. And I have to say, when it's elegant in the West, it's elegant. I'd like a light, please. Oh, sir. Sure. Thank you. Mrs. Henderson, do you mind if I don't stall any longer with the drinks, the smokes, and the compliments? I'm surprised you've stalled this long. I've heard you're a very blunt and impulsive man. I spoke to an insurance agent named Thurber yesterday in Great Falls. Your husband's agent. Mr. Thurber told me that your husband wanted to name a new beneficiary last week. Really? Yeah. He named Matilda Knickerbocker. Matty Knickerbocker. I'm not surprised, I suppose. Matty's a lovely woman. I know George was very fond of Mr. her. Mr. Thurber also told me that Mr. Henderson changed his mind about that the day he died. In fact, he phoned Mr. Thurber in Great Falls and told him to leave the policy as it was. He did that a few minutes after you left his hotel room. A few minutes before he died. Can you explain any of that, Mrs. Henderson? Why don't you ask Matty Knickerbocker? Because I don't think she'd know. I ran into her this afternoon and I talked to her. Or not about this, just about other things. I'll look her up again if I have to. But it's you I want information from now. Then why don't you ask what you mean, Mr. Dollar? All right. Did something happen in that hotel room that made him change his mind about you? That's better. I do wish that ridiculous little man would bring our drinks. He will. Don't misunderstand what happened in the hotel room. George and I were going to be divorced. He moved out of the house a month ago. We went to his attorney's and drew up a tentative property settlement. You mean... Dunlap, Edder, Reardon, and Blake, Great Falls. They have a copy of that settlement. George was quite generous to me. So I didn't kill him for his money, if that's what you're thinking. Here we are, sir. Perno bourbon. Thank you. I didn't see George for mm, three weeks or so after we made the settlement. Then we happened to meet one day in Culver and... Well, we had a rather bitter argument. It was one of those ridiculous things. We quarreled and parted very angrily. The whole thing was childish. My first impulse was to go right back to the lawyers and demand every unreasonable thing I could on the divorce settlement. I guess George's first impulse was to cancel me out as his beneficiary. Did you go to a lawyer, Mrs. Henderson? No. No, I cooled off. I cooled off considerably, Mr. Dollar. After all, George had been everything to me most of my life. I was truly sorry we never got along as man and wife. I'm glad that we made it up before he died. That morning. He apologized when I came by the hotel. I apologized. After I left, he fell out the window. Then I can assume that this business with the policies had to do with the argument. Assume what you like, Mr. Dollar. I can understand why you're annoyed by me and my questions. It's just that it's kind of hard for us to believe that a man involved in divorcing his wife would still name her as his beneficiary. I say that because of past experience. Oh, it's happened. But as usual. I could have told you that we were reconciled that day in the hotel, that we were going to drop the whole divorce matter, and that George was coming back to the house to live. Yes, you could have told me that, Mrs. Henderson. Mr. Connors in our home office in Hartford called you a few days ago. You hung up on him. Why? Well, I was very upset. I've never been a widow before. Uh-huh. I believe you, Mrs. Henderson. Sitting here like this. 
You're a lovely person, and I know it. And you know it. And this is a pretty nice place to conduct business. Why didn't you ask me to your home? I preferred to talk to you here. That's what I thought. I saved all the... Did your husband have any enemies? And did he seem depressed questions for another time? But before I went to bed that night, I read and reread Mrs. Henderson's testimony given at the coroner's inquest. The next morning, I interviewed all of the people at the Butte Hotel who'd been on duty the day Henderson fell out the window. After that, I dropped in to see Eve Holton. Here, here it is, Johnny, right here. Personal effects of the deceased included four suits of men's clothing, 14 shirts, five pairs of holes. Was there a bottle in that room, Sheriff? Liquor? Yeah. No, no bottle. Nothing like it, son. All right. He didn't call down and have a bellboy bring him a bottle or send him any drinks. The chambermaid swears there was no liquor in his room all the time he lived at the hotel. You say he was a light drinker. Now, what light drinker takes a nip before he has his breakfast? Who said he had a drink that morning? Mrs. Henderson. What? On the witness stand, under oath at the inquest. She testified that her husband had a drink before she came up to the room and while she was there. Now, mind you, she didn't say he was drunk, but she did say he had been drinking. You read over that transcript. So? So I think she threw that in, made sure it got in, because it's sometimes hard to believe that a cold, sober man will walk out of a hotel window and kill himself accidentally. A drunk or a drinker might do it. You and I and everybody at that inquest somehow got the impression that Henderson was slightly tipsy that morning. And Mrs. Henderson saw to that. Now then, if Henderson had a drink, I want to know where he got it. Tell me, Eve, no bottle in the room, no bottle brought up to the room. Where did he get that drink? That's a pretty good question, son. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Henderson matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, the wind-up. Yeah, the whole case blows sky high. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure and join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. I have a call for you from Hartford. Go ahead, please. Johnny? Right here. Connors at Paramount Adjusters. Say, what was his wire, Johnny? You serious about denying liability to Mrs. Henderson? I sure am. I think it'll bring the whole thing out in the open. This is pretty serious. Have you got any concrete evidence that death wasn't accidental? Jim, I have a copy of the coroner's inquest. Concrete evidence that Mrs. Henderson lied under oath. She said her husband was drinking the morning he died. Everybody here believed he was a little crocked when he fell out that hotel window. I've got proof that he didn't have a drink that morning. What proof? No bottle in his room. No bottle brought there. Nothing. What do you say? Don't make a move, kiddo. I'll get the first plane. (laughs) 
tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Paramount Insurance Adjusters, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Henderson matter. Sheriff Holton agreed that there was enough of a doubt about the circumstances prior to George Henderson's accidental death to warrant an official re-examination of all the facts. He promised me the police would start an immediate investigation. That was all I needed. I knew Mrs. Henderson would be re-questioned and that the pressure would start to build up. Fourteen hours later, when Tim Connors arrived in Culver, I had some pressure of my own. Well, Johnny, what? Well, the best thing we can do now is move in. Deny liability on the grounds that the accident is not proved. I suppose Mrs. Henderson sues us. All right, let her. Then the burden of proving that her husband's death was accidental would be on her. Look, Tim, contrary to her testimony under oath, Henderson didn't have a drink that morning he died. All right, she made a mistake. He had a heart attack, got dizzy, and tumbled out of the window. He wasn't drunk. Oh, don't talk nonsense, Tim. Listen to me. Mrs. Henderson was ready for the coroner's jury a couple of days ago, and she was ready for my questions when I saw her yesterday. The only one she wasn't ready for was you a few days ago when you phoned a long distance. You said she hung up on you. Well, she half apologized to me for that, but it was because she couldn't think of anything to say. Well, maybe you're right. But suppose he did die accidentally, and suppose it is a just insurance claim. I tell you it isn't. Now, the fact that she made a mistake testifying about him having a drink and... Hey, Johnny, do you have anything else? Three things. Instinct, experience, and statistics. Pauline Henderson's a young woman. She married a wealthy older man. With him out of the way, she has all his money and all her youth. All right, I'm going to phone the company as soon as I can find a phone. Tell them I'm working for evidence, and the best way to get it is to bring Mrs. Henderson out in the open. File a complaint against her. What charge? Suspected murder. Oh, no, Johnny, that'd get us in all kinds of trouble. Remember the drink, Tim. Henderson didn't have the drink. Now, we'll have to have more than that. I'm sorry, Johnny. All right, I'll get you more. An hour later, I was with Sheriff Holden comparing notes. He reported that after questioning Mrs. Henderson, she admitted she might have been mistaken about Henderson drinking the morning of his death. She wasn't sure. But Eve Holton said what we both were thinking. He went in front of the coroner's jury and gave a misleading impression, son. Made us think that George was drunk and stumbled out the window. Well, we better find out who helped her pull this off. Sheriff Holton had every man in his office working on the case by then. It was a long, tedious job of combing over everything in Pauline Henderson's background to find a possible accomplice. About five in the afternoon, I drove to the Henderson Ranch with Holton. Mrs. Henderson was out, but we interviewed one of the servants. That's right, sir. Once, twice a week. Uh Uh-huh. You know where she drove to on these trips? I have no idea. Mrs. Henderson would get up early in the morning, be gone all day. How do you know she went out of town? Well, she'd generally take a small suitcase with her, change her clothes. You don't take those when you're visiting a friend in town, do you? Tell us what car she'd use on these trips. A Cadillac. Always come back covered with mud and ice. Always have to be washed up. Mr. Henderson used to complain about that. About the car being dirty? Uh, about the trips, mostly. He and Mrs. Henderson had some pretty good arguments about him. He'd say Mrs. Henderson shouldn't visit that man. What man? Just that man. I never knew who it was they argued about. You've known Mrs. Henderson quite a long time, huh? Yes, sir. I knew her when she was a little girl, when she first came here. Saw her grow up, go away to school, go away to Europe, come back a little more grown up, a little different every time. Were you surprised when Mr. Henderson married her? Well, no. No. Yes, guess I was. Because she was so much younger? Not that so much. I mean, well, Mr. Henderson, he had something about the plains and cattle and mountains about him. When he moved, it was as big as all them things. Mrs. Henderson was different. She didn't fit in here? Is that what you're trying to say? I think she fit. Not like him, though. Before they were married, they were sort of like good friends. I mean, they'd ride horses and go hunting and laugh and talk about different things. Mrs. Henderson, she traveled to Europe, saw so many things and places in the world. She fit here, but then she didn't belong here. I feel awful about Mr. Henderson's being dead. 
If there was anything wrong with the way he died, I'd like it to be fixed. Mrs. Henderson would probably fire me for talking like this, but I don't care. This house isn't the same no more. By the time we got back into town, Sheriff Holden's boys had discovered the names of three men who had been seen at various places around Culver in the company of Mrs. Henderson. Rod Tyler. Oh, who's he? Mining engineer. He's been away from here for over a year now. See, now here's another one. Sam Pollard. Sam died six months ago. Hey. What? Noah Baxter. Noah oh, Baxter. That name's vaguely familiar. Yeah, he owns a hotel you're staying in. A couple of ranches, too. Well, he might have been the one who tried to have you thrown out. Oh. He also owns the mayor. Young man? About 30, 35. Let's go see him. Another drive, this time north of Culver to the Baxter Ranch. We found Noah Baxter busy with his help shoring horns on cattle. A lean, tall man with thin features. If you're trying to find out if I've been seeing Pauline on the sly while she'd been married to George, why didn't you come right out and ask? All right, have you? No, not on the sly. There's nothing between us. George knew any time she came over here to see me. He was a good friend of mine. I'm sorry he's dead. Pauline's a good friend of mine, too. I'm sorry you people are thinking what you are about us. Let's go up the house. It's getting cold. All right, Stan, that's enough for today. No, I got to ask you this. Where were you last Thursday? The day George died, Sheriff? Yeah. I was right here. Can you prove that? <laughs> sure. Ask anybody. You boys want a drink? No, thanks. Oh, no. Well, I do. Mac! Mac! I can get it myself. When was the last time you were in cover, Mr. Baxter? Three, four weeks ago. My cook and the others handle what supplies we need. Do you mind if we talk to some of your help around here? No. What do you want to talk to him about? About last Thursday? About what happened when Mrs. Henderson came here to visit? It wouldn't look good if she came here to visit me, would it? Well, that depends on the circumstances, no? Huh. Well, she'd come and sit there and read and look at some of those paintings. We'd talk when I had time. Anything wrong with that? No. Mr. Baxter, I think I ought to tell you. I've asked my company to file a complaint against Mrs. Henderson. Suspicion of murder. Oh. I'd like to tell you something. She didn't kill him, and she didn't have him killed. She loved him a lot more than George loved her, I think. Both of you know her. Her dad was a drunken cowhand. When he died, George took her over, gave her everything. So you see, you're wrong. She loved George for giving her what he gave her, and mostly for being the kind of a man he was. I lied to you a couple of minutes ago. There was something between us. It was bound to happen sooner or later. She'd come here to cry on my shoulder, and I... I let her. Cry? About George. He wanted to divorce her. Didn't you know that? I had the idea it was the other way around. <laughs> You're all wrong. George raised her, educated her, made her into a woman, and then he married her. And she wasn't what he wanted at all. <laughs> you know who George wanted to marry? Matty Knickerbocker, the schoolmarm. Go on. Oh, there was nothing between George and Matty, but there would have been if he'd lived. What about you and Mrs. Henderson? Yeah. And the thing that was between us was that I wanted her. She didn't want me, but I wanted her. I was glad when she told me about the divorce coming up. I really think she would have listened to me. But she wanted to be married to George. She really loved him. Sure you don't want one of these? No. Nope. And I really loved her. I went to see George last Thursday at his hotel. You know why? To tell him to go back to Pauline. Yeah. Because I knew what he meant to her. <laughs> you can talk to my people around here. They'd lie for me and say I was here last Thursday all day. They tell you that Pauline never came to see me. They'd lie right down the line for me. 
But, Mr. Dollar, I can't let you get out that complaint and take her in. One of my trucks was taking some beef to the hotel last Thursday. I rode in with the driver and went in the back way. I went right up to George's room to talk to him. Pauline had just left. I wanted to talk to him about the same things I've been telling you. I didn't want to hurt him. I loved him, the same as everybody loved him. When I got to his room, he wouldn't let me talk at all. He was mad that I interfered. He tried to swing on me. I shoved him once. He went out the window. That's all. I killed him. Expense account, item eight. $58.15. Hotel and food while in Culver, Montana. Item nine, same as item two. Transportation by train and plane back to Hartford. Item ten, $88. Miscellaneous. Expense account total, $802.50. Remarks? We still had to pay double indemnity. Maddie Knickerbocker, Pauline Henderson, Noah Baxter, they'll pay another way. With the hurt that comes to nice people. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, there'll be another exciting story beginning next Monday night. Next week, a real mystery, complete with plenty of action, a beautiful blonde, and a killer lurking in the shadows. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Lillian Bayef, Irene Tedrow, D.J. Thompson, Herb Ellis, Marvin Miller, Forrest Lewis, Bob Bruce, and Russ Thorson. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story... Of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Petri Wine brings you Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce and the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invites you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective Sherlock Holmes. You know, the lives of Holmes and Watson were not always filled with action. They spent many a quiet evening at home in Baker Street, discussing the problems of the world over a glass of port. You know, it seems that no wine is more expressive of friendship and hospitality than port. And I'm sure there's no port wine more enjoyable than Petri California port. Try a good glass of Petri port after dinner some evening, or any time you get together with your friends. You'll love the rich, ruby-red color of that Petri port. You'll love its smoothness and full body. It's remarkable and wonderful flavor. A flavor that comes straight from the heart of luscious, hand-picked grapes. Serve that Petri port alone or serve it together with cake or cookies or with fruit. 
Yes, and serve it proudly. You can because the name Petri is the proudest name in the history of American wines. And now I'm sure our old friend Dr. Watson's expecting us. Let's tap on his study door. Come in, come in, come in. Good evening, Doctor. Good evening, Mr. Bartell. Come over here by the fire. I was just having a cup of coffee. Would you care to join me? Thanks, that'd be nice. Uh, it'll prevent you falling asleep during my story tonight. <laughs> There's no chance of that, Doctor. From the hints you gave us last week, it sounded like quite a story. It began in a circus in Paris, you told us? Yes, my boy, the circus. A colorful world of sawdust and spangles. A world, Mr. Bartell, that I may tell you confidentially, always held an irresistible fascination for me when I was a youngster. Me too, Doctor. In fact, when I was eight years old, I fell desperately in love with a... With a lady bareback rider. A stunning creature who wore pink silk tights with gold sequins on them. Unfortunately, my mother caught me writing her proposal of marriage. And I'm afraid that, uh, well, it's another story. And one that you probably wouldn't find very interesting. <laughs> I'm sure I would, Doctor. But I think it would be safer to stick to your Sherlock Holmes yes, story. Yes, you're probably right, my boy. Well, it was a winter in the 1890s. And Holmes and I were in Paris. On our second day there... Holmes suggested we attend that night's performance of the Cirque Royal. Needless to remark, I was delighted, Mr. Bartell. And shortly after nine o'clock that night, I found myself seated beside Holmes in a box near the ringside. It was an incredibly vivid scene, even for that city of color and light. The gay costumes of the women and the gaudy trappings of the ringmasters and clowns looked like a giant kaleidoscope under the blazing glare of the arc lamps. As we sat there, a brass band nearby blared forth some popular music of the day, and yet he didn't appear to be enjoying himself. And so I leaned across and touched his arm. Hmm. What is it, Watson? Well, you're very quiet, Holmes. Aren't you having a good time? A good time, I suppose, old chap. I was just wondering where Mr. Edwards is. Mr. Edwards? Who's he? An extremely distinguished client who was to meet us in this box at nine oh, o'clock. Ah, client. Oh, this little excursion was on business. After all, yes, I might have known it. No worry, old fellow. In your case, I think you'll be able to combine quite a little pleasure with the business. Well, can't you be a little more explicit, Holmes? Shh, shh. Here comes the ringmaster. Mademoiselle Giselle Girondet, écrivaine incomparable. Giselle Girondet, yes, I've heard of her. She's a bareback rider, isn't she? Honest in France, old fellow. She also has quite a reputation as a femme fatale. Three duels have been fought over her. A young English officer in the Grenadier Guards committed suicide last year because of her. And a famous French banker is at present languishing in prison because her extravagances drove him to appropriate funds that did not belong to him. Yes, Watson, she's an extremely colorful personality. You know, Holmes, it's a funny thing. When I was eight years old, I fell violently in love with a lady bareback rider. She wore pink silk tights with golden sequins on them, but uh, unfortunately... Yes, she is, old fellow. Yes, she is. Look at the way she's jumping from the back of one horse to the other. Sheer poetry of motion. The lady appeals to Watson. By George, yes, indeed she does. In fact, Holmes, I don't mind telling you that if I weren't a married man and a yeah, poor man... Yeah, you'd like man... to court the lady, eh? Uh, yes, I, I should Excellent, indeed. old fellow, excellent. That's the very reason for our attendance. At the well, what in heaven's name are you talking about, Holmes? Ah, there you are. Good evening, Mr. Edwards. Holmes, my dear fellow, how are you? I haven't seen you since, uh, since that little affair at... Windsor Castle, when Mother... Uh, excuse me, sir. I am Mr. Mycroft, and this is my friend, Sir William Nigel. Sir William Nigel? Of course, of course. And I am Mr. Edwards. We must uh, respect each other's incognitos, eh? How do you do, Sir William? Oh, 
Well, I'm extremely honored to meet you, Your, your Royal, uh, 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 Mr. Edward. How'd you like Giselle? Isn't she a stunning creature? Yes, uh, indeed she is, sir. The four of us to have supper together after the performance tonight, I understand, Mr. Edward. Well, unfortunately, I can't be there, Mycroft. There's some stupid affair at the embassy which I have to attend. We must postpone the dinner until tomorrow night. Oh, very well, sir. Uh, come over to my hotel a little early and we can discuss the whole business. Personally, I think a lot of fuss is being made about nothing. Now, if you'll excuse me, gentlemen, I must go back and see Giselle for a moment and tell her that I can't keep our appointment for tonight. I'll see you tomorrow, Mycroft. Good night, sir, William. Good night. Good night, uh, good night sir. Et maintenant, pour votre plaisir, les frères Salini, les jongleurs internationales. Holmes, what's all this mystery? That wasn't Mr. Edwards, it was the prince of... Shh, Watson, please. Discretion, old fellow. Mr. Edwards, as you know, is extremely democratic. Too much so, possibly, when one considers his position and responsibilities. He's become quite seriously involved with Mademoiselle Giselle, the lady bareback rider who has just left the ring. Oh, so that's it. The Foreign Office, quite naturally, I suppose, is deeply concerned over the matter. And I've been entrusted with the delicate mission of protecting Mr. Edwards. Oh, does Giselle Gironde know that his true identity, do you suppose? That's the first thing that we have to find out. It's possible that she is simply captivated by having a rich Englishman at her feet. If on the other hand, uh, she knows who Mr. Edwards is, then we may be in for a great deal of trouble. Yes, but how are you going to find that out? By tempting her with a richer Englishman. And one with a title. That, my dear fellow, is why you are Sir William Nigel. You mean that... Uh, your I... job, old what? fellow, is to do your utmost to steal Giselle Gironde from Mr. Edwards. But, uh, well, I, I don't even know the girl. We shall remedy that defect in a few minutes. As soon as the performance is over, my dear chap, I shall take you to her dressing room and arrange an introduction. I must say, Holmes, the backstage life at a circus is even more colorful than in the ring. What makes you say that, old fellow? Well, I just saw a pinhead having tea with a, a bearded lady while a sword swallower was standing behind him practicing his act. Oh, hello. See that man standing talking to the girl in tights? Yeah, attractive, isn't he? Uh, the gentleman is Inspector Vernet of the French police, an old friend and a distant relative of mine. Vernet! How are you? Ah, Holmes, <clears throat> mon cher ami, comment ça va? Oh, oh, Vernet, please. On this occasion, my name is Mycroft, if you don't mind. And this is my friend, Sir William Nigel. How do you do, Inspector? Enchanté, Sir William. Uh, permit me to introduce Mademoiselle Yvette Marat. How you do? How do you do, Mademoiselle? How do you do? Uh, uh, what brings you behind the scenes at the circus, may I ask, Monsieur Mycroft? Uh, my friend, Sir William, is most anxious to meet the acquaintance of Mademoiselle Gironde. But of course, every man wishes to meet Giselle Gironde. Why not ask Vernet? He will present you to her. Ha! In other words. Oh, now, Yvette, chérie, do not begin that all over again. You are in love with her. You have always been in love with her. I, I, I wish you were dead. Sometimes I... Sometimes I think I could kill her myself. Upon <laughs> my soul, Inspector, she's a fiery little thing, isn't she? Ah, ça c'est vrai, ça, Sir William. <laughs> Many times I've told her that Giselle Gironde would never waste her time with a simple police inspector. Uh, she prefers a wealthy foreigner. But Yvette ne comprend pas. She does not understand and she does not believe. Mademoiselle Marat was dressed in tights, Berne. And what does she do in the circus? Uh, she walks the tightrope. Oh, She's yes, a queen of the high wire. Mm -hmm. A charming and a talented girl, but a most, most, most jealous one. Uh, Verne, my distinguished friend, Sir William Nigel, is most anxious to meet Giselle Gironde. Uh, will you introduce him? I should prefer not to appear on the matter at this stage. Oh, mais certainement. I, I will take you to her dressing room. Uh, please come with me, Sir William. Uh, right. I I'll see you later, Holmes. I'll be waiting for you, old chap. Good luck. Hey, you're a lucky man, Sir William. Giselle has quite a penchant for the Englishmen. And when they are rich and have a title, I am sure she finds them irresistible. You really think so? Oh, but of course. Ah, quel dommage that I am only a poor policeman. Ah, hey, here we are. Entrez. Giselle Monchou, permit me to present to you Sir William Nigel. He's a great admirer of yours. Yes, indeed, madam. Ah, Sir William Nigel. Come and sit here beside me, Sir William. Uh, <clears throat> I uh, shall leave you. Au revoir. Uh, sit closer. There. That is much more cozy, no? Oh, it's very nice of you to see me, Mademoiselle Gironde. Oh, don't <laughs> be so formal, my Englishman. You may call me Giselle. 
And I shall call you... Let me see, I shall call you Sir William Knight. Willie! I shall call you Willie! You do not mind? <laughs> mind? I, I it's very delightful. Quite delightful, my dear. I was hoping perhaps that you'd care to have a little, little supper with me tonight, Giselle. <laughs> uh, so what about some, some oysters, a cold pheasant, and a bottle or two of Pomery and Green 072? Do you get to taste rather well, don't you think? <laughs> oh, Willie, I can see you are a perfect oh, host. I don't know about One that. more, more. I get my clock. Oh, uh, well, you, you know, you know it, it, it's a funny thing. What is a funny thing, Willie? When I was eight years old, I fell violently in love with a, a lady bareback rider at a circus. History seems to be repeating itself. Pierre. Hey, Pierre, Pierre. Do you no longer knock when you come to my door? Who is this man? My name is Nigel, Sir William Nigel, my good man. And who may you be? I am Alfio Alfieri. I am Alfio Alfieri. And what is he? Huh. A trainer of wild animals. An ambusier. What? You must not speak to Alfio in that way. You belong to me. Send this stupid Englishman away. Found it impudent. Of course, ye. Yeah. Belong to you. He said belong to no one. Do I have to take my whip uh, to put you? Put it on that way. Put it down, you scoundrel. <coughs> That's the time it will be your face, can You me. infernal blackguard. Raising your hand against a woman. Shocking. Bravo. Mon cher Willy has knocked him down. Uh, he certainly deserved it. Oui. And... You, in turn, deserve something, Willie. Oh, what was that? Come close, Willie. And I give it to you. A little kiss. Oh, yes. <laughs> Thanks awfully. <laughs> So strong, so resolute, so brave. Oh, it was nothing, my dear Giselle. Nothing at all. Here, more champagne, got more champagne. Oh, really? Giselle? Oui, Monsieur Edwards? I have a box for the opera tomorrow night. I was hoping that perhaps... Oh, I'm sorry, monsieur, but my time is occupied. I am showing the delights of Maman to mon cher Willy. Mademoiselle est mieux le collier de perles à cinq rangs ou celui à trois rangs? He says, which do I prefer? The five-string color pearls or the three-string color pearls? What does my Willy think? So that you can't hang too many pearls on a pretty neck like yours. I'll take the five-string collar, my good fellow. You think splendidly, Watson, splendidly. Yes, but Holmes, I felt such a blasted fool handing that jeweler fellow a check signed by Sir William Nigel. Are you quite sure that it'll oh, be honored? Oh, don't worry, old fellow. Remember who our client is. Money is the least important concern in this matter. On with the masquerade, old fellow. On with the masquerade. More champagne, Gasson. <laughs> Good evening, Bernay. Has Mademoiselle Gironde come in for the evening performance yet? Yes, Monsieur Holmes. I escorted her to her dressing room an half an hour ago. Uh, Monsieur Edwards is in there with her now. At last, it seems, she has used for a poor policeman. Last night, she found a threatening letter on her makeup table. Since then, she has been most grateful for my company. A threatening letter, eh? Any idea who might have sent it? Oh, yes, of course. I'm afraid I have, Miss Holmes. Uh, I told her to pay no attention. Uh, by the perfume of the note paper, I recognize the sender. A jealous tightrope walker called Yvette Marat. Oh. <laughs> Poor Yvette. She would make a very inferior criminal, I'm afraid. Still, Giselle asked me to stay outside her dressing room till the performance starts. Uh, uh, you wish to see her? Uh, yes. Oh, good evening, Mr. Redwood. Evening, Mycroft. Evening, Inspector Werner. Uh, come on, sir, Mr. Redwood. Look here, Mycroft. I think this little game's gone far enough. Giselle has just refused another invitation of mine. Now, I know who Sir William Nigel is, and I swear I'll tell her. Uh, don't you think, sir, that the lady is hardly worth bothering about? Surely this whole incident with Sir William proves that she's a scheming little adventuress, a fictitious title, and 
an apparently bottomless purse, have shown her up in her true colors. <laughs> I could have told you the same thing without such an experiment, my friend. Well, I suppose you're right, Mycroft. I've been a fool. An idiot who lets a pretty ankle turn his head. A conceited dope. <laughs> <laughs> Let us just say, monsieur, that you have been a man. Uh, good evening, sir. Oh, good, evening. Watson, good evening. Good evening. Uh, just going back to see Giselle for a moment, I brought us these flowers for her. Oh, I'll be back in a jiffy. Uh, just a minute, Watson. I, uh... I hate to dampen your ardor, old chap, but uh, the masquerade is ended. Ended? What, what do you mean, it's It is no ended. longer necessary for you to impersonate Sir William Nigel or to pay court to Giselle. Oh, 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 oh really? Really? Well, that's, that's a great relief, sir. Great relief. I've hated the whole business. Oh, yes, yes, I'm sure you have. Uh, we um, appreciate the sacrifices that you've made, don't we, Sir Edward? Yes, yes, indeed. Well, I must go back and see her once more, though. We had a rendezvous for tonight, and I must cancel it. A gentlemanly thing to do, you know, um... I, I won't be a minute. <laughs> Never have I seen a man more downcast. Obviously, with him, my dear Holmes, business was a pleasure. Alfieri, where are you going? That Englishman. I just saw him go into Giselle's room. To whom are you referring? That man that called himself Sir William Nigel. Oh, yes. Two days ago, he strike me. I have to settle with him. No man may strike Alfieri. Do not cause any more trouble, Alfieri. From what I've been told... You thoroughly deserved what happened uh, to you. Here he come now. You English, you. I'll fairly challenge you to a duel. Holmes. Holmes. What's wrong, chap? What is it? You're as white as a ghost. It's. It's Giselle. What's wrong with her? She's dead. She's lying there in her dressing room. Strangled. Strangled. And only half an hour ago I spoke with her myself. Since then I've been standing in this corridor, guarding your door at your own request. Only two men have entered Giselle's dressing room since then. You, Monsieur Edwards, and you, Sir William Nigel. What are you suggesting, Bernay? I am suggesting nothing. I am stating that these two gentlemen are under arrest for suspicion of murder. Dr. Watson's unusual story will continue in just a few seconds time I'd like to take to remind you that one wine that seems to be the outstanding favorite among the ladies is Petri California Muscatel. That's probably because, like a beautiful woman, Petri Muscatel is subtle and intriguing. Petri Muscatel is the color of burnished gold. And its flavor, well, it's the flavor of big, plump Muscat grapes, picked by hand, carefully and tenderly, and they're just full of wonderful, delicious juice. If you want to show that you really know the wine that women prefer, serve Petri Muscatel. Serve it after dinner or later in the evening. It's wonderful. And why shouldn't it be? It's a Petri wine. Well, Dr. Watson, so you and the mysterious uh, Mr. Edwards got yourselves arrested on suspicion of murder. Huh? Yes, Mr. Bartell. Holmes did everything in his power to persuade Inspector Vernet to release us, but it was useless. And so, while Mr. Edwards and myself were languishing in detention cells... The local Sûreté, Holmes, and the French inspector were examining the dressing room of the dead woman. I'm, in sh I'm sure, Inspector Vernet, that uh, being as keen a detective as you are, you must suspect the true identity of Mr. Edwards. Of course, Monsieur Holmes. But that is the danger of incognitos. If he chooses to assume the identity of play Monsieur Edwards, then he must run the risks of play Monsieur And you are convinced that either he or my friend strangled Mademoiselle Girondet? It is obvious. Then I'll have to prove to you that they didn't. Let me examine the body again, will you? If she had been strangled by either of my friends, why would her body be lying here under the window? It's as far away from the door by which they left this room as possible. That proves nothing. No, but it's odd. Giselle was a strong girl. Uh, there might easily have been a struggle. Uh, perhaps she tried to get away through the window. And yet there are no marks of violence on her throat. Just this piece of very fine cord that did its deadly work so cleanly. Mm -hmm. Cut with a knife. Uh, please do not remove the cord, Monsieur Holmes. The body has not yet been photographed. Jeremy Vernet, you're making it very hard for me, aren't you? Uh, you notice, of course, that the window is open. Yes, but we have examined the snow outside. There were no footprints within three yards of the window. The murderer must have entered by the door that I was watching. Yes, it would be hard, even for a professional acrobat, to jump in. An acrobat? There, your young friend, Mademoiselle Yvette Marat, is a tightrope walker. Yvette, but... Yes, yeah, she certainly had a motive. She'd even sent a threatening letter. I heard her express hatred and jealousy for this dead woman. It's conceivable that she could enter a room by a window without leaving footprints in the snow. 
Where was she at the time of the murder? I do not know. I was waiting for her in the corridor. Then I suggest that we investigate her alibi at once. And after that, Inspector, I must pay a visit to the Surte. I don't want my friends to think that I've deserted them. Excuse me, sir. Yes, Holmes. I'm afraid it looks rather black. As I was telling you, Yvette Marat, the tightrope walker, was able to establish a completely satisfactory alibi. Then they still suspect you or Dr. Watson. Well, that's ridiculous. May I ask you a very straightforward question, sir? Of course. I can well understand that if you had gone into the dressing room and found the woman already murdered, you might easily be tempted to conceal the fact, to avoid a scandal involving your person. Will you swear to me, sir, on your true identity? That Giselle was alive when you left her. She was, Holmes. I swear it. Thank you, sir. That's all I wanted to know. Holmes, I'm glad to see you. You know, I've been thinking. All this depends on Vernet's evidence. But supposing he was the murderer... He told us that Giselle had turned him down, you know. I'd thought of that, but Mr. Edwards swears that Giselle was alive when he left the room. And yet that means that Mr. Edwards... Oh, no, 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 it's unthinkable. Holmes, you're not suggesting... Holmes, if I thought that that were possible, I'd confess to the murder myself. My life wouldn't matter if, if it had saved a scandal like that. Great Scott, it'd, it'd shatter the empire. Dear old Watson, you will not sacrifice yourself. You're as valuable a British institution as the lion himself. No, my dear fellow. We shall never sacrifice you, not while my mind is still capable of... My mind? That's it. Thank you, Watson. You've given me the answer. Holmes, what are you burbing about Be patient, old fellow. In half an hour, you'll be out of this cell and the real murderer will be in it. Questions, questions... Why must Alfieri answer so many questions? Because he will not yet tell the truth. You murdered Giselle Girondet. How many times I have to tell you I did not kill her? Why should I want to arm her? Because you were jealous. Because she humiliated and tormented you. But I was not in her dressing room. I have already proved that fact. Am I a magician that I can kill somebody without entering a room? Alfieri, I know how you killed Giselle Girondet without its necessitating your entering this room. Uh, and you are a smart man. Please to tell me. I don't need to tell you. With the aid of Vernet, I'll show you. Open the window, Alfieri. Uh, what game is this? Very well, then I'll open the window myself. Put your head out. Come on. So. Uh. Who do you see? Inspector Vernet, standing three yards away, where you stood, and he's got your long training whip. No, no! Don't move! Stand there, the inspector hasn't your skill with a whip, but he wants to try a little experiment. No, leave him alone! All right, Vernet, I'm holding him! Mr. Edwards, I, I mean, I mean, well, sir, this is a, a pleasant change from a prison cell, isn't it? It certainly is. <laughs> Holmes, I can't tell you how grateful I am. I still don't quite understand how you did it. Watson, in uh, rather a roundabout way, was responsible for giving me the clue. Oh, how was that, Holmes? Well, on more than one occasion, old chap, I've had cause to deploy a rather florid style of writing. Tonight, I was very thankful for it. Uh, when I began to speak of the capabilities of my mind... Uh, suddenly I remembered a phrase of yours in which you referred to uh, its whip-like rapidity and accuracy. That, of course, made me think of Alfieri, the animal trainer. Exactly how did he kill the poor girl? Uh, well, sir, he stood outside the window, uh, far enough away to leave no incriminating footprints. Called to Giselle, probably persuaded her to lean out, then snapped the whip around her neck, pulling it tight and strangling her. And then I suppose he cut the cord and let the body fall back into the room. Precisely, old fellow. We found a whip stock among his tackle, a whip stock from which the lash had been cut. The stub of lash left matched the cord around the dead girl's throat. Amazing business. And I don't mind telling you, fellas, I'm very thankful to be through with it. Yes, so my sir. In fact, I wouldn't be at all surprised if this whole instant cures me of my love of circuses. Oh, I didn't know you had a predilection in that direction, Watson. Oh, oh, oh yes, sir. Yes, if you don't mind my saying so. Uh, uh, when he was eight years old, he fell in love with a lady bareback rider. Oh, didn't you, Watson? <laughs> Indeed. What happened? Well, sir, I, I don't remember her name, but she wore pink silk tights with uh, golden sequins on them. And I wrote her a rather hot-headed letter... 
Doctor, that was one of the most unusual stories you've ever told. And, and I might say you played a very prominent part in that case yourself. Oh, I suppose I did it. That, Mr. Bartell, Giselle was a beautiful girl. Beautiful. Boy, I sure love that nickname she gave you. Wheelie. Yes, I thought it was rather nice myself. Well, that is, uh, <laughs> I, I, I mean... I, I... <laughs> Don't get embarrassed over a nickname, Doctor. You should hear the nickname I had. But when I went to school, all the girls called me Bottles. Bottles? Oh, <laughs> I see from Bartell. Bartell, Bartell. Oh, <laughs> Some nickname, like a prophecy. What do you mean? Well, they called me Bottles, and now that's what I like to talk about most. Bottles. Bottles of Petri wine. Oh, I should have known. <laughs> and I'd like to talk about Petri wine because, as far as I'm concerned, it's the swellest wine that ever poured from a bottle. That's because the Petri family really knows how to make good wine. Well, they ought to. They've been making good wine ever since they started the Petri business way back in the 1800s. And since the Petri family has always personally owned and operated their business, they've been able to keep that fine art of winemaking right in the family, handing it on down from father to son, from father to son, from generation to generation. So it's no wonder, whenever you want a good wine, you want a Petri wine, because Petri took time to bring you good wine. Well, Dr. Watson, what new Sherlock Holmes story are you going to tell us about next Well, week? now, next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you of a strange adventure that Holmes and I had in the swampy Fenlands of Norfolk. Concerns a gypsy encampment, a child that vanished, and a horrible death in the murky depths of a fearsome quagmire. <laughs> Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Adventure of the Three Students. Music is by Dean Fostler. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is Harry Bartell saying goodnight for the Petri family. By Pano Toothpaste and Sal Hepatica present... Mr. District Attorney, Champion of the People, Defender of Truth... Guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. <music> Mr. District Attorney is brought to you by Ipana Toothpaste and Sal Hepatica. Ipana for the smile of beauty. Sal Hepatica for the smile of health. Ipana, Sal Hepatica. <music> shall be my duty as district attorney, not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. Tonight's case of the sinister cinema, ladies and gentlemen, concerns a master criminal, a man whose knowledge of his fellow man is keen and penetrating. We can almost say that Richard C. Graves has based his astounding crime solely on his understanding that men are vain, and therein lies the tragedy of his success. We begin in the private office of the president of a small bank here in our city. Well, that's my proposition, Mr. Claypool. How does it strike you? 
I, I, I hardly know what to say, Mr. Uh, uh, Seagraves. Uh, Richard Seagraves Productions. Oh, yes, yes, I know. Uh, you're from Hollywood, you say, sir? Well, I've produced most of my pictures in Hollywood, Mr. Claypool. That's true. You've seen them, of course. Gone with the Storm, Valley of Wind. Oh, and... of course. A cigar, Mr. Seagraves? Oh, yes, thank you. But as I said, Claypool, the tendency these days is to shoot on location. As I was telling the boys at the Academy Award dinner just recently, we've got to get out and photograph the real thing. Oh, the Academy Award, eh? Oh, Ronald Coleman and, uh, the, who was it my wife was... Oh, yes, Loretta Young. Yes, yes, dear Loretta. There are, I said, you and L.B. and the rest of us. We've got to go out and photograph real people. Ah, and you want to use my bank, Mr. Seagraves? Uh, just for one shot, Mr. Claypool, but what a shot. Think of it. Think of the Radio City Music Hall in New York. Yes? <laughs> Those dancing girls, you mean? We open up in a bank. Not a Hollywood bank, A.B. A real bank. This one. And who do we see? Whose face do these millions of people look at? An actor's? No. Oh, uh, mine? The face of a banker. A.B. Claypool. Honesty, courage, the backbone of America. Your face. Well, I must say, I... Of course, this is irregular, Mr. Seagraves, highly irregular. We have a business to run, you know. You hit it right on the head there, A.B., and that's exactly what we want, to see your business in action. Why, we won't change a thing. Your customers won't even know we're shooting the picture. They won't? Realism, A.B. Realism, it's the coming thing. You'll come out of your office, greet our star, just as if you were another customer, and we grind away. Oh, your star, did you say? Well, let's not let this get out, A.B. Variety and Billboard have spies, you know. Oh, they have? Yes, it's Dolly Eads. Dolly Eads? I, I don't think I recall oh, having... Oh, what an actress. What a personality, A.B. And when the cameras start rolling here in the bank, when Dolly turns that smile on A.B. Claypool, man, oh, man. <laughs> well, I, I did a little acting back in college, come to think of it. Uh, Rutgers, 1919. Oh, that's wonderful, A.B., wonderful. It's all set, then. We'll do this shot this afternoon. But this huh? afternoon? Don't you worry about a thing, A.B. We'll be in here shooting before you know it. When did this report come in, Miss Miller? The one from Battle Creek, Chief? Yes. This morning. Well, this is really amazing. Hmm? I'd hardly believe it possible. Yeah, I want you. Oh, this will interest you, Harrington. Yeah? Uh, didn't you say not so long ago that there are no new tricks in the book? He did. Yeah, certainly I did, Miss Miller. Hmm. Well, look at that bum I put in the lineup this morning. Pulling the old gypsy handkerchief gag. What? That's one of the oldest in the game. Well, this report from Michigan isn't an old one. Yeah? Well, it's absolutely astounding. Well, what is the gag, Chief? Uh, bank robbery, actually. Huh? Only the bank hardly knows it's been robbed. What? But according to this report, this gang goes to the bank ahead of time and arranges to shoot a movie. Uh, arranges to do what? Yeah, yes, that's what it says here. <laughs> they convince the banking people that they're going to do a shot for a motion picture. <laughs> I don't get it, Chief. Well, then they return a few hours later, set up a camera, and photograph what the bank thinks is a scene. Oh, and it ain't. <laughs> Decidedly not. In Battle Creek, they got away with $60,000. What? Oh, Chief, yeah. you're kidding. Well, it's, it's all here. Oh, and it's done with imagination, apparently. Well, uh... Cards printed with impressive Hollywood addresses, a producer with a cigar, or oh, everything. Oh, honestly. The camera equipment, of course. <laughs> the works. Shot for a movie. Yeah. Oh, Chief, now I've heard everything. Say, so, I don't think we ought to treat this lightly. Yeah. Uh, Miss Miller. Uh, yes, sir. Call the banking association here in the city, will you? Ask them if they have any way of notifying their banks about this. Right away, Chief. And if they haven't, we'll do it ourselves. All right. Yeah, any idea where these boys were headed, Chief? Well, the Battle Creek report doesn't say, Harrington. However, I think we'd better check up on that, too. Yeah, right. A movie. <laughs> <laughs> Chief. Well, that's the darndest thing I ever heard of. Uh, it was beautiful, Georgiana, if I do say so myself. He swallowed everything, Dick? Complete. He even thinks he's seen you in the movies, darling. What's so unusual about that? I got a nice figure. That's beside the point. What do you mean, beside the point? I got a peel. Haven't I, Richie? Uh, later, Dolly. Georgia and I, and I, and I have to plan things. What time, Dick? Uh, two o'clock, I thought. I left his office at 11. Two o'clock? Oh, gee, it's noon now. Oh, I better get made up. In a moment, Dolly. That's two hours, Dick. 
I wonder if it's too long a time. He won't call anybody, Georgia. Not A.B. Claypool. Huh? Your leading man, Dolly. He's probably in front of a mirror right now rehearsing. I still don't like too much time between your visit and the fireworks, Dick. Gives him time to think. Time to get suspicious, uh, maybe. Relax, Georgiana. This one is a cinch. Well, everything's ready, at least. Now, how about the camera? I told him we'd use a small, cruel, the intimate touch, you know. No, I got the camera. How about you? Huh? Me? Come to, will you? Do you have your makeup? Who's telling whom to come to, uh, to may I ask? Oh. Dolly, Dolly, you've got to cooperate. Georgiana asked you a question. My figure beside the point. Sure, I've got makeup, just like Battle Creek. All right, I'll do your face. Get a towel. I can do it myself. Do what Georgiana says, Dolly. I can do what I said. What am I supposed to be? A movie star, dear. A rich young thing making a deposit in a bank, remember? She won't. I will, too. Oh, Richie. Oh, uh, run along, Dolly. You like my figure, don't you, Richie? Uh, you're sweet, Dolly. Now, run along and get made up. Well, at least I don't look like... like... Like what? Like the broadside of a barn. Well, you brainless little tramp. What? You mustn't mind, Dolly Georgiana, please. I don't. After all, we do need her. The squares could think she's a movie star. I know, Dick. Shall we go on with the plans now? If she gets on your nerves, just let me know. That won't be necessary, Dick. If the time comes, I can handle Dolly in my own way. If the time comes, Georgiana... And I'll get you. When you begin to confuse my figure with her brain. It's a quarter after 12, Chief. You have a luncheon appointment at 1. Oh, yes, I know, Miss Miller. Thank you. Oh, and I call the Banking Association. Mm -hmm. They were just as amazed as you were. Oh, on that Battle Creek matter. Mm -hmm. What did they say? <laughs> They never heard anything like it, Chief. Hmm. They're putting out a bulletin on it. Good. Oh. Yes, come in, Harrington. Come uh, in. Yeah. I've been doing some telephoning, Chief. Yes? Among other places, Battle Creek. Oh. Yeah, you were right when you said we shouldn't take this bank thing lightly. Mm -hmm. I found out a lot more about that outfit. Fine. What do you have? Well, in the first place, I got a pretty good description on three of them, Chief. Mm -hmm. A man and two dames. Mm -hmm. One of the women pretends to be a movie star. Well, how can she do that? Yeah, What'd you say, Miss Miller? How can you pretend to be a star, Harrington? Either you are one, everybody knows you, or you're not. Okay, so she pretends to be a new star, then. Or a foreign one, Miss Miller. How do I know? I, I thought you said you checked. I did. Well, all right, go on, Harrington. Anything else? Yeah, but these interruptions, yeah. Chief, they're confused. Mm. Plenty, Chief. Under descriptions, yeah. One of these dames is very, very pretty. Yes, yes. Yeah, the other one sounds like a lady wrestler. Yes, and? Here's the payoff, Chief. Mm-hmm. They're almost sure this gang was headed this way. What? Yeah, I can trace them up to three days ago, and then we lose them, Chief. Mm. And when we lost them, they were on their way here. I see. Oh, uh, Miss Miller... Yes, Chief. Of uh, course, that, that don't mean they are here, Chief. No, I asked around a little since this morning. They ain't checked in with the boys around town. Yes, I know, but we can't afford to take a chance. Uh, Miss Miller, call the banking association back, will you? And tell them we'll notify the member banks from here. All right, I'll get their list. Fine. What do you do, Chief? Send a letter on it? Oh, we'll do better, I think. Uh, tell the mimeograph room to stand by, please, Miss Miller. Okay. And call the motor pool downstairs. We'll need eight or ten motorcycle messengers. Right away, Chief. We'll just put the whole story in a bulletin, Harrington, and send it around to the banks right now. <laughs> Seagraves, right on time, I see. I hope I didn't keep you waiting. Oh, not at all, A.B. We were uh, just getting the cameras set up. Uh, oh, uh, A.B., may I present our little leading lady, Mr. Dolly Eves. I'm pleased to make your acquaintance. Oh, Miss Eves, this is a pleasure, a great pleasure. Likewise. Oh, pardon my makeup. A.B., I see you change your suit. Hmm? What? Uh, oh, my suit. Well, yes. Uh, I was home for lunch, and Martha, my wife, she... Uh, you like it? Fine, A.B., just fine. All set up, Mr. Seagraves. Oh, excuse me. Uh, ready, Georgiana? You know, I must say, I'm somewhat at sea, Mr. Seagraves. Is, is this all there is to it? Just one camera? Well, just the one by the door, A.B., but what a camera. In the hands of Georgiana Heron, it's sheer poetry. You've, uh, seen her name, I know. Oh, yes, yes, I believe I have. My goodness, I expected lights and all sorts of things. Uh, we clear the space, Mr. Seagraves. Uh, not necessary at all, A.B. Realism, you know, realism. Oh, set, Miss Eve. Oh, sure. 
You've uh, notified the tellers and everyone just to go on about their regular duties, A.B.? Yes, I have, Mr. Seagraves. Oh, I've been busy, I can assure you. Why, I haven't even read my mail. Well, we won't take long. You've got the sequence, Miss Eads. I think so, Mr. Seagraves. I go up to this nice gentleman here, say my lines, and he escorts me behind the little cage. Uh, uh, behind the cage? Uh, just show our money, A.B., pick up a handful of it, and just show it to Miss Eads. Oh, it's in the script. Script? We won't bother with the lines, A.B., we dub them in back on the coast, you understand. You just make with your mouth like you were talking with me. Uh, I see. Ready, Mr. Seagraves? Oh, I'll just get out of the way, then. All set, A.B.? Miss Eads? Roll them. Yes, I, I think I'm quite ready. Everything okay? Like candy from a baby. Now, just act natural, everybody. All right, Miss Eads? We're rolling. Don't turn your back to the door, Dick. I'm all right. All right, Miss Eads. Your lines, please. We want this realistic, you know. Why, why, I'd just love to see all that money, Mr. Claypool. Oh, oh, back here, behind this tiny little cage. Oh, that's fine, that's fine. Now, take her arm, if you will, A.B., Yes, that's fine. There they go, Georgia. Wait till he gets that cage open. Yeah, I know. That's right, A.B. Now, let Miss Eads go in ahead of you, please. If she doesn't stand in front of that alarm, I'll murder her. Well, I, I don't know what to say. Should I just move my lips? Oh, it's terrific. It's sensational, A.B. It's sensational. We're getting every expression. Now, where's the bag? Right here. Go on. Now, please don't stare at the camera, folks. It's just a movie. Ah, uh, that's fine, A.B. That's fine. Little smile, Miss Eads, please. All right. <laughs> you know, I'm beginning to enjoy this. Oh, uh, it couldn't be better. Now, please don't crowd near us, folks. It's just a movie. That's right. Go on about your business. All right, Dolly. Let's put the dough in the bag. Oh, did, uh, you mustn't touch the money, Mr. Seagraves. No, no, really. Get it, Georgiana. Now, don't miss his eyes. All right. Come on, hurry it up, darling. I am, Richie. Give me a chance. Oh, now, see here, Seagraves. I asked you not to touch the money. That's real. Ah, huh? careful, A.B. Keep your profile to the camera. All set, down. That's all of it, Richie. Yes. Where are you going with that? Stop, I say. Uh, Mr. Seagraves. Perfect, A.B. Perfect. Sensational. Did you catch all that, Georgiana? I'm still rolling. Stop, I say. What's the meaning of this? Come on, Dolly. Move. Relax, folks. It's only a movie. Let's get out of here. Right with you, baby. No, I warned you, Seagraves. Picture or not, I'm going. I'm, I'm setting off that alarm. Get away from me, you big Help! Hug. Help! Stop them! Shut up! Somebody stop them! Just a scene in a picture, friend. All right, Mr. Seagraves, let's have the shot look, now. This is unheard of. Get out of my way! I told you, A.B. Shut up. Richie, look out. Sorry, A.B., but I said this has got to be real. Pay no attention, friend. It's just a movie. I'm, I'm shot. I, help me. I... Gee... Perfect, A.B., just perfect. All set, George, Anna. All set. Now keep them rolling. Wonderful, A.B., keep it up. Come on, doll. Stay in front of the camera now. Now back, George, Anna. Take it straight back. Let's go. Out the door, doll. Folks, please don't watch the camera. You'll spoil the scene. Hold the door. I am. Is George, Anna in the car? She's waiting. Okay, then. Great work, folks. That was fine. Fine, A.B., one of the best acting jobs I've seen in years. Come on, dolly. Let's go. In just a few moments, we will pick up the developments of this interesting case. But first, here's an important question. Tell me, who should know best the difference between toothpaste? Who should know best the difference between toothpastes? Why, the dentist, of course. He knows best because his life work is the health of your gums and the care of your teeth. So listen, please, to this sound advice. Ask your dentist about Ipana toothpaste and gentle gum massage. So many dentists recommend massage. Yes, and a nationwide survey shows more dentists recommend Ipana toothpaste than any other dentifrice. And wait a moment. More dentists personally use Ipana than any other toothpaste. Yes, Ipana toothpaste followed by gentle gum massage is the modern way to aid the health of your gums and the brilliance of your smile. So help your dentist help you. He knows the value of gentle gum massage to tone up your gums. Begin now getting your new Ipana smile. Taste the freshness, feel the cleanness, see the sparkle. Get Ipana toothpaste for your Ipana smile. And now back to Mr. District Attorney. All right, 
let's get organized, Harrington. Yeah. Everyone's here? Yes, sir. The bank employees are all downstairs in the meeting room. Yes, thank you, Miss Miller. We yeah. want all of them. Okay. Boy, that's irony, or whatever you call it, Chief. Your message about the Battle Creek job is on this Claypool's desk. Yes, I saw it. Hmm. Unopened. His secretary said he was so excited about appearing in the picture, he didn't do anything else. In a movie. Well, it's our Michigan gang, all right, Chief. There's no doubt about that. Yes. Hey, what's this, Harrington? What? What do you got, Chief? Uh, looks like broken glass here on the floor. Huh? Oh, Chief, excuse me. Uh, here's Ray. Oh, good. I want photographs and diagrams, Miss Miller. Well, this one shouldn't be too tough, Chief. Mm. We got a whole bank full of witnesses. They all thought when this Seagrave shot, it was part of a scene. Yes, I know. Uh, what's the loss, Harrington? Are they through checking? Well, it'll run about 35 grand, Chief. Mm. Claypool used the main cage. Yes. You know, it's the audacity of this thing that gets me. Hmm. One man and two women, and they pull this off without a hitch. Oh, it's tricky, all right, Chief. Hmm. Yeah, but maybe we can show them a few tricks of our own. And the district attorney issued a similar bulletin to all banking institutions in the county. I don't get it. So what? We got the dough. Well, Georgiana means, Dolly, that we can't pull it off again. At least not around here. I figured on that. But this stinking paper is a new syndicate. That'll queer the act in every town in the country. It'll blow over, Georgiana. We could just lie around and take it easy for a while. I'd like that. On what? We need money, Dick. Money? Well, we just got nearly 40 grand for that one bank alone. Georgiana means good money, though. We can't pass the bank stuff until the heat blows over. If we picked a town small enough, maybe we could pull it off again. Someplace where they don't read the papers. The same thing, Georgiana? Just about. I'll have to get another part for the front of the camera. I lost it. What for? You don't really take pictures, do you? Georgiana means that the camera has to look real, doll. I'll take a look at the map. Maybe there's a small town we can hit. Well, I say we don't. You what? We got all the money, and I say spend it. I'm sick of working. Spend it? Are you crazy? Georgiana just explained all. You can't spend money if the bank has a record of the bills. I don't care. You promised, Richie. You said we could just lie around and have fun. That is also beside the point. You stay out of this. I think it's wrong anyway, I didn't know you were going to kill people. Doll, now listen, just... Never a... mind, Dick. As I remarked before, I'll handle things when the time comes. Time? What time? Soon, I think. I promise you, Dolly, I'll let you know. Uh, will you switch off that light, please, Miss Miller? I want Harrington to see this. Hmm? Yes, sir. What, in the microscope, Chief? Yes, that's right. It's that broken glass I found on the floor of the bank. Hmm. Hmm. Let me see it, Chief. Hmm. Now, what's that mean? Well, I'm not quite sure. Uh, did you send for Ray, Miss Miller? Yes, I did. He's on uh, the way up from the photo lab now. Hmm. What's up, Chief? Something in Ray's pictures? Well, no, no. As a matter of fact, I simply want his opinion on something. Uh, all right. The lights, please, Miss okay. Miller. Hmm. As you know, broken glass is always interesting. Each piece seems to have a personality all its own. Yeah, sure, Chief, but well, that ain't finding sea grays, Chief. No. You put out the alert? Yeah, right away. I made it a full five states. Good. Oh, and the bills from the bank? Well, they had a pretty complete list of the numbers, Chief. Oh, well, that's a break. Uh, put it out on a full distribution, Miss Miller. Stores, depots, bus stations, everywhere. Okay, it's being prepared down in Mimeo now. Fine. Well, we'll just keep at this, Harrington. One way or another, we've got to bring that trio in. <laughs> can't see the point in arguing about it, Dick. It's a matter of common sense. But we might need her, Georgiana. You said yourself you've got a small town picked out. I know that. We'll leave as soon as the part for the camera's ready. Then let's take her with us. I said no. Oh, but she's a nice kid, Georgiana. You should have seen that guy in the bank give her the once over. She softens him up. If necessary, I can play the actress. You? Yes, me. The choice is quite clear, Dick. The girl is bloodshy. Well, I 
Guess you know best, Georgiana. You always do. My dear boy, the woods are full of fancy figures. Yeah, so are banks. Only if we could just bring... I told you. All right? Yeah, sure. Sure, if you say something. Call her. Now? Now. Okay, okay, sure. Hey, Dolly. Come on in here a minute. Stand back, Dick. I don't know you even got a chance to talk to her. What for? She's hardly intellectual. Dolly! I'm coming. Well, what are you... Hey! Hey, Richie, stop her. She's got a gun. I told you, young lady, I'd let you know when it's time. Well, it's time! <laughs> it's high time. Dick, you know something? What? She did have a beautiful figure. I tell you, it's definite, Chief. Mm -hmm. They found the dame about three hours ago. Are you certain, Harrington? Uh, sure it's the one who posed as an actress? It's a positive identification, Chief. Mm -hmm. Four employees from the bank just saw her in the morgue. I see. And she was shot, you said? I'll say she was clean as a whistle. Well, all right, let's get to work. Uh, tell Dr. Colgan I want the slug. He's working on it now, Chief. Uh, when he gets it, set up a comparison check with a slug from Claypool's body. Right. Oh, Chief. Yes, Miss Miller, what is it? Ray's on the phone, Chief. Yes. He says he's located just what you want. What? Ray, Chief? Uh-huh. Our photographer? Yeah, definitely, Harrington. Get the address, Miss Miller, and tell him to stay there. Right. Uh, bring that comparison microscope, Harrington. We'll need it. All set? I've got it, Chief. All right, let's hope this is it, then. Come on, let's go. It's a small town, Dick. Don't forget that when you talk to the banker. Tomorrow morning, huh, Georgiana? Sooner the better. Anyway, I think it's wise to get out of this town. Mm, you mean Dolly? For one, yes. As soon as we can pack, we'll get going. Uh, what about the camera? Oh, I picked up the part this morning. Well, who's that? One of Jerry's boys, I think. I asked him to drop around. Here? Yeah, what for? We need a third, Dick. I thought I'd offer a 20% split on a one-shot. Okay, then. Uh, come in. Yeah? You're from Jerry's? Not quite, lady. This is the district attorney. What? Don't move, bud. Or is the name Seagraves? All set up, chief. Oh, thank you, Harrington. Well, this makes it easy, doesn't it? Easy? What are you talking about? Murder. Or to be more accurate, two murders. All right, get your coats, please. You're both under arrest. Arrest? Well, you're crazy. What for? You heard him, pal. Come on, the camera's rolling. You can play the scene right up to the hilt. Your district attorney will return in just a moment to explain the clues which led to the arrest in tonight's case. But first, first let's bend an ear to one of those early morning sounds. One that says, rise and shine. <laughs> now, to a lot of people, that sound can mean a wonderful morning with a good day ahead. But to a lot of people, there's another sound that can mean the same thing. And that's the sparkling sound of sal hepatica in a glass of water. And remember, unlike slow-acting laxatives, a sparkling glass of sal hepatica, when you get up, brings quick, gentle relief, usually within an hour. That means you don't have to feel dull and headachey all day waiting until night to take the laxative you needed in the morning. And if at the same time you're troubled with excess gastric acidity, let sal hepatica help sweeten your stomach. So keep a bottle of sal hepatica handy. Then any time you need a laxative. Morning, noon, or night. See how much faster you feel better thanks to gentle, speedy sal hepatica. And now, here is your district attorney. 
I'm happy to report, ladies and gentlemen, that both Richard Seagraves and Georgiana Heron will pay the full penalty demanded for the murder of A.B. Claypool and the murder of their associate, Dolly Eve. Gee, that was one of the strangest, Chief. Yes, Miss Miller, it was. But like all criminals, they made a mistake. And like all criminals, now they'll pay for their mistake. Yep, their mistake being when the dame dropped a part of that camera on the floor of the bank. Huh, yes, Harrington. As you know, under the microscope, we were able to determine that the broken glass from the bank floor was part of a camera lens. So you had Ray check on the camera supply stores in town, isn't that right, Chief? Yes, exactly, Miss Miller. And Ray assured me, you see, that not more than a dozen stores carried the kind of lens needed to replace the broken one. Fortunately, Georgiana went to one of these stores for a replacement. And that was the beginning of the end, Chief. She leaves a trail... And we follow it. Yes, and, of course, we were able to prove that the gun in their possession killed both Mr. Claypool and Dolly Eads. I think I'll just pass up that screen test, Chief. Yeah, uh, what screen test, Miss Miller? What? Oh, nothing, Harrington. A girl can dream, can't she? Oh, Chief, what about next week? <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, again, next week we see the futility of a life of crime, but in a very different and unusual way in the case of service in silver. And I invite you to join us for it. And so until then, thank you and good night. Say, mister, want some good shaving advice? Forget your whiskers. What counts is your face. How it feels while you're shaving. How it feels and looks afterwards. And to give yourself a better feeling, better looking face, use Ingram Shaving Cream. You see that rich Ingram lather on your brush? helps condition your face for the razor. Result, cool, comfortable, soothing shaves. Just remember, comfort means coolness. Coolness means Ingram. I-N-G-R-A-M. Ingram, the cooler shaving cream. Try Ingram tomorrow. Names of all characters in tonight's dramatization are fictitious, and any resemblance to names of living persons or actual places is purely coincidental. Our stars were Jay Justin in the title role, Len Doyle as Harrington, and Vicky Vola as Miss Miller. The music was under the direction of Peter Van Steeden. The program is produced and directed by Edward A. Byron and written by Robert Shaw. Mr. District Attorney was originated by Phillips H. Lord. Remember, I pan a toothpaste for the smile of beauty, sal hepatica for the smile of health. Bristol Myers invites you to tune in again next week for Duffy's Tavern and Mr. District Attorney. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. What's that supposed to mean, and who are you? Oh, Johnny, this is Pat McCracken at Universal Adjustment Bureau. Well, hi, Pat, but what's with the crazy dialogue? Oh, that word, that, yeah, was most of the conversation I got from some crazy character who just called in. I'm afraid I don't dig you. Oh, he called about five minutes ago. Said he'd been trying to reach you, but he got no answer. I was out picking up a morning paper. Who was he, Pat? He wouldn't say. He just gave his phone number. Wait a minute. There's only one man in the world talks like that. Yeah. Yeah. Was the call from San Francisco? No. No. Oh. Los Angeles. Well, then maybe I was, uh... Oh, because the man I was thinking of... Now, what? wait a minute. Yes. Yes, I'm waiting, John. Tell me just one thing, Pat. Well? Have any of your insurance companies been having to pay off on any big fires lately? I mean, out in Los Angeles? On any fires? You'd better start checking with those companies out there. No, wait a Do minute. Do it, Pat. And I'll lay odds that you get a handful of arson reports. Arson? Yes. Johnny, just because some silly guy calls up and all he says is, yeah. Hey, let me have that phone number he gave you. Oh, Johnny. Come on, come on, Pat. What is it? Uh, Hollywood 8, 3142. Okay, now you go ahead and check with your West Coast insurance company. Johnny. And get ready to pay my expense account to Los Angeles. Are you kidding? Are you trying to tell me that the way some jerk says, yeah, means arson on the West Coast? Now, don't be silly. You, uh, want to bet? Oh, Johnny. Pat, I'll call you back. CBS 
Radio brings you Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Talk about best-selling records. Here's a familiar tune about America's best-selling filter cigarette, Winston. Winston gives you real flavor, full, rich tobacco flavor. And you know, that's because only Winston has filter blend up front. Choice, flavorful tobaccos, specially selected and specially processed for filter smoking. No wonder Winston tastes good, like a cigarette should. Smoke Winston. And now, act one of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Universal Adjustment Bureau Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the burning desire matter. Yeah, as I told Pat McCracken, there was only one person I knew whose conversation might consist mostly of that one word. So, expense account item 1250 for a phone call to Hollywood 83142. Hello? Hello? Yeah? Yeah, I thought so. Yeah? Smokey Sullivan. Well? Smokey, this is Johnny Dollar. Yeah? Hey, you tried to call me here in Hartford. I was out. You called Universal Adjustment Bureau. I got the message. Here I am. Yeah, Johnny. Only what are you doing in L.A.? Last time I saw you was in San Francisco. Got a job here, Johnny. Legit. Hey, that's the stuff. Pays off, too, doesn't it? Yeah. You're my friend, Johnny. You've done a lot for me. So, when I got a chance to help you... Well, there's something doing out there, Smokey, that I ought to know about? A bunch of fires, Johnny. Arson, huh? Yeah. Is there insurance involved? Why else anybody use a torch? Yeah, you got a point there. But do you have any lead on whoever is behind the fires? Yeah. So you better come out here, Johnny. Okay. The first plane I can get. Where will I find you? 322 South Equity Avenue. South Equity. Okay, Smokey, I'll be there. Yeah. Uh-huh. Now I'll call the Pat McCracken, pack my bag, and... Johnny Dollar. Oh, Johnny, thank goodness. Pat? Yes. I'm just about to pack up and no, tell don't you. don't you ever get off that phone of yours? I was talking to the guy listen, who telephoned... Listen to me. Johnny, you were right. Only reason that nobody smelled a rat is because a different insurance company was stuck with each of those fires out there. So until I called him to give me a report. Oh, uh, and listen. I'm listening, Pat. According to the L.A. police, every one of them could have been arson. Okay, I'll grab the first Seven sign. of them in a row, Johnny, that we know about so far. I mean, I haven't got the reports in yet from all the companies, and I'm also waiting for another report from the police. Now, Johnny, Johnny, your best contact out there. That I've already got. What? Yeah. <laughs> oh, you mean that character who called us up? Yeah. Look, will you please tell me... Who is he? What does he know about this? Universal Adjustment, putting the old expense account on this. Yes, of course. Then I'll give it all to you in the usual report. See you. Oh, now, Johnny, listen. Sorry, Pat, I got to catch a play. <laughs> expense account item two, $162.85 plane ticket from Hartford to Los Angeles. Thanks to the time differential, it was only shortly after dark when the big mainliner set down at the L.A. International Airport. Item three, seven fifty for a cab to Smokey's address. It was uh, hardly Beverly Hills or Bel Air, believe me. 322 South Equity was in a beat-up part of a downtown industrial section. A weather-beaten three-story house with a sign out front that said, Borders by the week of month. Yeah, who are you? Well, my name is... Just what's a fancy dresser like you want around a place like this, huh? Well... 
I'm looking for a man by the name of Smokey Sullivan. I understand he lives here. That's right. Uh, you, uh, are you the man he said he was expecting? That's right. My name is Johnny Dollar. Well, he didn't tell me what the name was, but if you're sure he was expecting... I'm sure. Now, where is his room? Uh, now, I don't know. Where is his room, please? Well, it's up on the second floor. It's just to the right after you get up the stairs. Okay, now, look, thank you very much. I, well, now, maybe you better... It's all right, I'll find it. Thanks a lot. No, what I mean is, I thought you'd already come. I mean, what I mean is... Smokey? Hey, Smokey, it's Johnny Dollar. Ah, huh, what was that? Smokey! Now, what's all the... Ra oh, no. Hey, Smokey, can you hear me? Who did this? Are you... Good Lord. Smokey had really had it. Whoever had beaten him up probably would have killed him if I hadn't come along and scared him away. I looked out of the broken window, but of course was too late to see who'd done this. Meantime, the landlady appeared, and I had to get me some towels and a basin of cold water. Here you are, Mr. Oh, good. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Ooh, somebody sure laid into him. I'll say that. You ask me, it's a wonder if he stays alive. He'll be all right. He'd better be. You're lucky you come along to see him is all I got to say. Yeah, uh, you better give me a couple more towels and maybe another basin of water. No, wait. What? You won't need him, mister. I got a much better idea. If I can find it. Hey, Smokey. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Give me a to find that bottle. Well, here it is. Yes, sir. It's here. Fix him up. Smokey, can you hear me? Fix him up quicker than the wings. It's Johnny. Johnny Dollar. Here now, mister. You just pour a slug of this down his gullet and see if it don't bring him to. Huh? Oh, yeah. Good idea. Let me have that. Oh, sure. He's real genuine California cognac, it is. And soak up another towel for me, oh, would yeah, you please? I sure will, mister. All right, here now, Smokey, here. See if you can get down some of this. Easy now, huh? That's it. Attaboy. <laughs> really? Yeah. A little more of this. Here, here. You know, before you come up here, mister, I tried to tell uh, easy you... Easy now, Smokey. Yeah, I tried to tell you... I thought that mm. other man that come up here to see him was the one he was expecting. Here, now, here's your fresh towel. Thanks. Did you say other man? That's right. Come in just before you did. You know him, who he was? The chimp. What? What's more The chimp. Yeah. That's who it was. The chimp? Yeah. Strong, strong arm for Mickey Fortina. Who was Mickey Fortina? He... He's a worried. Oh, now, look. Look, Smokey, maybe you'd better wait until you feel better. You and I should get a doctor. No. No, listen, Johnny. Yeah? Unless you stop him, there's going to be a lot more fires around here. Fires? That's what he said. Just but... don't worry about it, Miss... Uh, Mrs. Uh... Miss Fletcher. Bertha Fletcher. That's my Johnny, name. Johnny, listen. Oh, okay, Mrs. Fletcher. You you go along. I'll take care of him. Oh, well, now, I, I, I don't know. You sure I hadn't better get a doctor? No, no, no. I'll take him to a hotel. When his condition, I'll look after him. Now, you him. go downstairs and give me a cab. Well, please. I don't oh, know. Here, I... Here's a ten spot for your trouble and this bottle of brandy. Oh, Oh, well, thanks. You're a gent. Go ahead, please. Oh, yes, sir. Anything you say. Charlie. Yeah? You've got to listen to me. Yeah, go ahead. You had come up the stairs, scared him off. The chip might have killed me. Well, he won't get to you again. I'm going to take you out of this place. Somebody must have tipped off Mickey Fortina. Must have known I put in that call to you. So listen, Johnny. Later, Smokey. After I get you out of here. Item four, the ten bucks to Miss Fletcher. Item five, a buck and a half for a cab to the Stadler Hotel where I had to show my credentials to the room clerk to get a bed for the somewhat mangled Smokey Sullivan. Item six, fifteen dollars to the doctor who came up to the room and I must admit got him back in a pretty good shape. Then when the doctor had left us... Yeah, Johnny, all those fires, big insurance, all of them set. Seven of them in a row. So that means by one fire, no. this Mickey Fortina you mentioned, huh? No, Johnny, Mickey's too smart for that. What? All set by different guys. I don't know who they are, but 
I see no remains, and the police ain't sure, but I know there was arson. Who's Mickey Fortina? Uh, he's a go-between. I've seen this happen before. Yeah? Frisco, Seattle, and Denver, a lot of places. He brings in a lot of boys of his own. Everyone got a different way of setting the blade. So the cops can't tie it up with any local boy whose uh, methods they know. Yeah. Fortina's a go-between? He makes the deal with whoever wants a fire. And the police aren't on to him? What for? He never set a fire himself. Well, I know, but he's the guy that... By that time the arson squad is in, the guy who done it is far away. So there's no witness can prove Fortina set up the deal. And the police have never been able to put the squeeze on whoever made the deal for a fire? And get sent up for it? For being accessory or... Whatever you call it. Oh, yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah. Fortina sent for me when he found out I was here in L.A. I... I used to know him, Johnny. Wanted you to be a torch for him, huh? Yeah, he just asked if I wanted to work for him. and He knew that I knew what he meant. But if you knew that Fortina was operating here... Smokey. How could I prove it? How can I prove it now? Well, maybe I can. But... If he finds out I sent for you, Johnny... It looks to me like he already has. Oh, yeah. All right, then. If somebody who wants a fire can get to Mickey Fortina, there must be some way I can. At his office. His what? At his office every night. 1025 South Spring. He has an office for a racket like this? Why, you'd never know it. You'll see. Yeah, I think I'd better see. Hey, Smokey, you... Who's that? You got a gun, Johnny. Right here and ready. Open up in there. This is the police. Police, huh? Well, surprise. It is the police. The room clerk reported a man was brought in here who... Johnny! Yeah, Pat. Pat yeah. Nichols. Sergeant Nichols now, Johnny. Good, good. How are you, boy? Now, wait. Wait a minute. Is this the man you brought in here? Smokey Sullivan? I, uh, listen, officer, I... Johnny, I, you think maybe Smokey is tied in with this string of fires out here? No, no, tell him, Johnny. No, 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 you you tell him, Smokey, anything you want. Well, no, 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 look, you you, you know I'm I'm no good at talking to a cop, Yeah, well, Johnny. give it a try. And, Pat, uh, be sure you stick around to keep an eye on him. What? Smokey may need a bodyguard. You. Huh? Yeah. Until after I made a little business call. Sorry. Now, look, if you're out here because of those fires... Did I say I was? I didn't tell him anything like that, did I, Smokey? Um, no, Johnny. And I see what you mean. Now, now listen Just to... uh, stick around, Pat. I'll see you later. If I had told Pat where I was going, he might have wanted to come along. And a man in the uniform would hardly have helped in the plan I had for trapping Mickey Fortina. But you know something? Going over to see him alone was a big mistake. One I almost didn't live to regret. We'll bring you Act Two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in exactly one minute. Here's Hollywood star Mona Freeman. Who feels like acting with a miserable cold? I relieve cold distress the fast way, with four-way cold tablets. Yes, tests of all the leading cold tablets proved four-way fastest acting. Amazing four-way starts in minutes to relieve muscular pains and headache, reduce fever, calm upset stomach, also overcomes irregularity. When a cold strikes, do what I do. Take four-way cold tablets. It's the fast way to relieve nasty cold distress and feel better quickly. Four-way, only 29 cents. Now, here's a word about another fine product of Grove Laboratories. Had dandruff for years? Now get rid of it in three minutes with Fitch Dandruff Remover Shampoo. Three minutes with Fitch regularly is guaranteed to keep unsightly dandruff away forever. Apply Fitch before wetting hair, rub in one minute. Add water, lather one minute. Then rinse one minute. Every trace of dandruff goes down the drain. Three minutes with Fitch, embarrassing dandruff's gone. Fitch can also leave hair up to 35% brighter. Get Fitch Dandruff Remover Shampoo today. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Burning Desire Matter. My plan for trapping Mickey Fortina was a very simple one. I'd make like a property owner who was anxious to collect some fire insurance, who was willing to pay in advance to make sure my property went up in flames. Easy, or so I thought. 
Item 7, 85 cents for a cab to the office building at 1025 South Spring. The only lights on were in Suite B on the second floor. According to the directory in the lobby, that was the office of the Fortina Friendly Loan Company. Loan office, huh? Yes, sir. Can I help you? Yeah, I'd like to see Mr. Fortina. You got an appointment? No, but I'd uh, like to make a little deal with him. Well, can I have your name, mister? It's uh, Morris, uh, Theodore Morris. Uh, just a minute, huh? Excuse me. Yeah, sure. Man says his name is Morris, wants to see you, Mick. Oh? Hey, listen, has a chimp come back yet? No. And he said he was going to send Husky over there. Husky? Why? Well, Chim said he was afraid if he showed up at that hotel... Careful. And... Careful what you say. Close the door. Sure. The chimp. And somebody was going over to the hotel. That could mean only for one thing, to get Smokey Sullivan. I carefully edged over closer to the door of Mickey's office, hoping I could hear more. It was too thick. And it suddenly dawned on me. If they knew I was the one who put Smokey in that hotel, they probably also knew why I'd come here. There was only one way to make sure. I'd have to go through, or at least try to go through, with a bluff I planned. Oh, sorry to keep you waiting, Mr. Morris, is it? Yeah, that's right, Mr. Fortina. Ted Morris. Oh, uh, Mary, when the uh, uh, when he gets you, send him in. Sure, Mick. Uh, come in, please. Sit down. Yeah, surely. Thanks a lot. All right, I'll get right to the point, Mr. Fortina. Oh, by all means do, Mr. Morris. Well, I own a big shoe store over on North La Brea. Yes? Well, business has been pretty bad lately. I've been losing a lot of money. Too too much stock on hand, big inventory and hardest. Well, if it's good merchandise, that's you no know, reason why we can't arrange a loan for you. Yeah, uh, a loan? Of course, sir. What else? Well, listen, I carry a lot of insurance on not only the stock, but the building, too. Oh, uh, how much, Mr. Morris? Well, it adds up to over 185000 hmm, I see. It's very commendable. But why do you tell me about this insurance? Well, I said I'd get to the point. Now, listen. If that place was to uh, burn up some night, the whole works, I'd collect a lot of money on it, all the insurance. And, of course, be in a position to repay whatever loan I advance to you. All right, stop beating around the bush, 14. I want that place burned out. Can you fix it? Mr. Morris, if you want a loan, possibly even a size... Well, you know what I want. Come on, how about it? As I said, possibly we can advance it to you. Now, look, I didn't come up here to... However, as evidence of your good faith, your, uh, shall we say, good intentions, uh, are you prepared to make a down payment on such a loan, say, uh, $10,000 cash... In advance? What are you talking about? Set the fire, burn the place up so I can collect the insurance and I'll give you 15000 Now, just a minute. Who said anything about setting a fire? I did. Well? Who sent you here? If you said it was a former client, I won't believe oh, it. Oh, look, does it make any difference? Do you by any chance know a man by the name of Smokey Sullivan? Sullivan? He knows him all right, Mick. Well, the chimp? Shut up. Sure, Mick, this is the guy I told you about. I come to see Smokey at his rooming house. What I left of him. Very interesting. After I ducked out, I hung around there. I see him take Smokey in a cab. I followed him to that hotel. Did you send Husky over to take care of him? Sure. And listen. Yeah? I don't know what name this guy gives you, but when he knocks on Smokey's door, he says it's Johnny Dollar. Dollar? Insurance ticket? Yeah, that's right, Mickey. All right. So maybe I do arrange another fire with you in it, Dollar. Mickey! There's a police car just pulled up in front! Go ahead, Jim. Yeah, I'll kill this dirty yeah. oh. All right, now, Fortina, your turn. Don't move, Dollar. Reach for a gun and I pull this trigger. I see. Yeah. How are your eyes, Mickey? Can you see in the dark? What? Without this lamp in here? All right. Baby! Now, are you... Well, I guess Smokey was right at that, Johnny. Uh, Hi, Pat. 
You seem to think you wouldn't need any help around here. You're right, Charlie. Yeah. Okay. When that strong arm, that husky Castellini, uh, came up to the hotel room after him, well... I had to tell him, Johnny. I had to tell him what it was all about. Yeah, it's okay, Smokey. It's okay. So we threw, threw Husky in the clink and came over here. Well, I got an admission out of him, Pat, but unless you can get these goons of his to talk, I don't know what you're going to hold him on. After what just happened in here... Shanny, we'll hold him and his goons just as long as we need to. And unless they want to take the whole rap for him, I think they'll talk. Yeah, they talked all right. And as a result, the police in a couple of nearby states should have no trouble at all in picking up some of the other of Fortina's boys, his hired torches. Ah, funny, isn't it? These stupid jerks just never seem to learn. Expense account total, including hotel bill, plane ticket back to Hartford, and a sizable bit of folding money for Smokey Sullivan, eight seventy four twenty. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's a word from our star about the case he handles on next week's program. Thank you, Daniel. It's called the hapless ham matter. And yeah, you guessed it. The ham turns out to be an actor. A really bad one with one of the cleverest methods of committing murder I've ever known. There's a lot of action suspense in the story, and I think you'll like it. Who knows? Maybe if you listen closely, you'll be able to figure out his method even before I do. So join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood and is written, produced, and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Gene Tatum, Lawrence Dobkin, Vic Perrin, Paul Duboff, Don Diamond, and Frank Gerstle. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Dan Coverley speaking. Intrigue breeds terror as suspense brings a shady moonlight sail next on the CBS radio network. If I should ever become totally disabled, it would be a mighty comfortable feeling to have a check coming in every month regularly. Yes, it's a good feeling to know you have a financial cushion against trouble like that. Well, if you're a veteran with World War II or Korean GI insurance, you can protect yourself. You do it by adding a disability income writer to your present policy. The cost of the extra premium is just a few cents a day. For example, a 40-year-old veteran with a $10,000 term policy would pay only $1.60 a month for the added protection. If you sign up for the disability income provision, it works this way. After you have been totally disabled for six consecutive months, VA will pay you every month as long as this condition persists. $10 for each $1,000 of your GI insurance policy. That adds up to $100 a month if you hold a $10,000 policy. Full details about total disability income at any VA office. Radio 59, WROW, first on the dial in Albany, Schenectady, and Troy. CBS Radio brings you Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Are you smoking more now, but enjoying it less? Have a real cigarette, have a camel. The best tobacco makes the very best smoke. Have a real cigarette, have a camel. Are you looking for flavor and mildness? Have a real cigarette, have a camel. The best tobacco makes the very best smoke. Have a real cigarette, a real cigarette, a real cigarette, have a camel. Again, for the 11th straight year, Camel outsold every other cigarette, filter, king size, and regular. The best tobacco makes the best smoke. So if you're smoking more now but enjoying it less, change to Camels. Get more real satisfaction every time. Start to really enjoy smoking again. Have a real cigarette, a real cigarette, a real cigarette, have a Camel. And now, act one of yours truly, Johnny Dollar.
expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Tri-Western Life Insurance Company, Corpus Christi office. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the unholy two matter. It was a little late in the day to ride all the way to Texas, but I managed to make a pretty good set of plane connections. So, expense account item one, 127.20, plane fare and tips, Hartford to Corpus Christi. Item two, four dollars even for a cab in from Cliff Mouse Airport to the Driscoll Hotel on North Broadway. As I was about to sign my name on a registration card for the benefit of the room clerk, well, I guess this is a pretty small world at that. And I'm sure you're going to find this room very comfortable, Mr. Dollar. Sure. Okay, then, I'll be. I'll see you first thing in the morning. Here you are. Thank you, sir. Right now, I'll turn over and tell Wayne Stocks this. Boy, yeah. take Mr. Yeah, Dollar's man. bags up to room... Dollar? Excuse me. Did I... I hear the name Dollar? What's that? Johnny Dollar, the insurance investigator. That's right. Who are you? Well, the name is Doug Johnstone. Johnstone? Yes. <laughs> Funny. Man by the name of Johnstone dramatizes all these cases I handle so we can put them on the air. <laughs> Jack Johnstone. That's right. Well, I'm his younger brother, Douglas. No kidding. <laughs> no kidding. Wow. Well, glad to know you, Oh, Doug. Johnny. Uh, listen, I'm in a big hurry. I've got somebody waiting for me. But I hope we can get together while you're here in town and uh, well, tear that brother of mine to pieces or something. Sure, why not? Uh, if, you're, uh, if you're down here working on a case, if I can be any help to you, you know. Hey, wait a minute. Uh, are you here to look into the, uh, the Peterson matter by any chance? Well, frankly, I haven't the least idea. I wonder. Well, can you tell me this? Did Jack Price over at Tri-Western Life send for you? Yeah. Uh, clerk... May I have a piece of paper, please? Oh, yes, sir. Here you go. Uh, sorry I've got to rush out of here, Johnny, this way, but... Well, who, who is here, here Peterson, Doc? Here, here's my address and phone number. That's both the home and the office. All right. Now, maybe I can be of help to you, so, so don't lose that. Huh? Yeah, okay, thanks. But now, because does... Because if it gonna... is on account of old man Peterson, Johnny, well, well, I've got some ideas about it, and then, well, they could be helpful to you. If, as I say, that's why you're here. Well, uh, what kind of ideas? Well, you know he was supposed to have died because his heart gave out on him. No, no, I didn't. Oh, yeah. But if you ask me, well, if it turns out this is the case you're working on, well, you give me a call now, will you? Yeah, sure. But look, why not tell me what you know about it? Well, Johnny, after all, you may be here for something entirely different. Maybe, maybe not. Well, why don't you see first what Jack Price has to say, huh? Well, now, look, Doc, well, you said, Johnny, this, this theory of mine could be all wrong. About the death of some man named Peterson. Yeah, John Ridgway Peterson. Well, come on, tell me anyhow. What is your theory? Well, it may not mean anything to you. You may have no interest whatsoever in Peterson. Oh, come on, stop beating around the bush, Doug. What do you think about his death? Well, okay. Murder. What? Yeah, Johnny. Murder. But because neither of us really knew if I'd become involved in it, that was all he'd tell me at the moment. And as he said, he had to run off to meet somebody. It was late and I was tired after the plane trip, so I grabbed a bite to eat. That's item three, two and a quarter, then hit the sack. The first thing in the morning, I was in Jack Price's office at Tri-Western. Well, no, I didn't mean to sound in a rush for you to get down here, Johnny. On the other hand, the hotter the trail, the easier it is to follow. Whose trail, Jackson? Sterling Peterson, beneficiary of his uncle, John R. Peterson's life insurance policy. 100,000 clams. Yes. And what's happened to him? The nephew Sterling, I mean. He simply disappeared. When? About the same time his uncle died, apparently. When was that? Five days ago. Funny that he should leave town when he was about to be presented with that wad of insurance money. He didn't know that he was his uncle's beneficiary. Oh? No. Old John Peterson never told him. Actually, the old man didn't particularly want to leave it to this nephew, but, well... Why not? Oh, they never really got along, as I understand it. The old man had been a hard worker all his life, and Sterling is anything but. Nonetheless, he named him his beneficiary, so that's that. And his heir to whatever else there is to the estate, huh? No, that goes to Sterling's half-brother, Paul. Much of an estate? Certainly not as much as the insurance. The old man didn't have much use for either of them, Johnny. But since they were his only surviving relatives, since they'd probably get everything he left anyway... Yeah, I see what you mean. Does Paul live here in town? Yes. What does he do for a living? Apparently has some money in the stock market. And Sterling? Johnny, I don't know what he lived on. No visible means of support kind of thing. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. 
Now, I'd rather just call him, tell him of his uncle's death. His landlady said he wasn't there, hadn't been there for a couple of days, that he'd simply packed up his things and left. Uh, I'll give you the address. Yeah, do that. Then I called his brother, but Paul didn't know where he was either. Just disappeared. That's right. Hmm. I wonder why. Who knows? Have he called the police? Why? Just because a man suddenly leaves town? That's hardly reason to call in the police, Johnny. Mm, maybe. Maybe not. What? Sterling didn't know he was beneficiary of this policy. No. But maybe he did think he'd get some of the estate if he were lucky and the old man turned up dead. And maybe Sterling needed money. I understand he always did. So if he could help the old man on his way... No, Johnny. The doctor said it was a heart attack. Yeah? Well, there are a lot of ways to make it look like a heart attack. Has there been an autopsy? Why, no. Then have one made. The insurance company's entitled to one. But you're saying Sterling murdered him? Maybe. Johnny... Just uh, go ahead and order that autopsy. Item five, a dollar and a quarter for a taxi. I found Doug Johnstone in his office, a small place, but with a cluttered desk of a busy man. Full of stock market reports, that sort of thing. Doug brushed him aside and got right to the point. Yeah, I've got to know a lot about Sterling Peterson lately. Now, you see, I have interest in a handful of oil wells, a gas compressor station, and things like that. Ah, lucky man. Well, I spend quite a bit of time over at Merrill Lynch trading in the stock market. You met Sterling in a brokerage office? Well, that's where I met his brother, Paul. That's where I learned about Sterling. Seems he was always trying to get money out of Paul. Yeah, I take it Paul is uh, pretty well healed, huh? Oh, uh, hardly. He's a sharp one. He has a pretty wild idea of how to make money in the market. What do you mean by that? Well, you know, it's always flattering for someone to ask your advice. Naturally. Well, I'd recommend he buy something like IBM... Good, solid stuff for a stable company like U.S. Steel, AT&T. Uh, nothing wrong with that, brother. No, no, but instead he'd throw his money into some crazy penny stock like, well, Golden Dream Uranium oh. Company. It was being pushed by some crooked promoter, some boiler room operator. Yeah, I see what you mean. Uh, I'd suggest Union Carbide. He'd end up with some speculation nobody ever heard of and, and so on. Yet somehow he managed to stay solvent. The point is, Sterling was always going to Paul for money. Money for what? Oh, to pay off his gambling debts. Much as I hate to admit it, civic pride and all that sort of thing. There are plenty of places in and around this town to gamble. Yes, yeah, so I've heard. So when a stupid guy like Sterling Peterson simply won't learn that house never loses, well, uh, you see what I mean. Yeah, yeah. And Sterling never really worked for a living. No, uh, and he was always in debt up to his ears. Isn't it possible he simply left town because his debts had caught up with him? Some of his creditors were getting tough with him? Well, Sterling needed money badly, and... Well, Johnny, I think he finally reached the point where he was willing to kill to get it. His own uncle? If what Paul has told me about him is true, yes. Now, you remember, he thought that he would inherit part of the estate. Uh, which, of course, was wrong. But he didn't know that. Not then. Then his running away... Well, the way I look at it, Johnny, if he did kill his uncle... And you think he did? Yes, yes, I do. Wow. Well, when he found out he wouldn't get his uncle's money, his property, after all, that he'd killed him for well, nothing, he didn't know about the insurance, you know. Yeah, I know. Well, what was left for him around here? I'll buy it. Nothing. Nothing but a lot of creditors pounding on his door. And once people begin to think about that, they might get suspicious, start asking him questions about his uncle's death. Questions that... He didn't have good answers Yeah, for. but to run out is the surest way in the world to arouse suspicion. I know, I know. It's stupid. Well, what do you think? Well, I'm not sure. But thanks. I, uh... I'll see you later. I took a taxi over to the place where Paul Peterson lived. That's item six, a buck and a half. It was a nice apartment in a fairly good neighborhood. But he wasn't home. Item seven, a dollar even for a cab to the brokerage house Doug had mentioned. I talked to Wayne Stockson, a friend of Doug's. He hadn't seen Paul Peterson around there for several days. Well, Paul said something about going out of town, Dollar, to look at some of the companies he considers investing in. I see. When he gets the money from his uncle's property and so forth, Paul will have quite a bit to play with. And play with is the proper term, despite our advice to avoid so many cheap speculations. I've heard he's a bit of a plunger. Yes, I'm afraid so. Well, if he does come around, Wayne, ask him to call me immediately. I'll be at the Robert Driscoll. 
Two dollars for a late lunch, item nine. A dollar thirty for a cab to Jack Price's office. Now, wait a minute, Johnny. Yeah? Instead of hunting for Sterling Peterson, you're just hanging around hoping to find out the old man was murdered. Well, give me time, will you? But I tell you, the doctor who was with him when he died said it was heart failure. And I tell you, Jackson, there are plenty of ways. There are medical tricks. I can't Hold believe... it a minute, Johnny. Price speaking. Yes? Already? Well, well, doctor, what did you... What? I see. Thank you. What's the matter, Jackson? Uh, How did you know? How did I know what? The autopsy. Yeah? You were right. Apparently some drug substituted for the digitalis the old man was taking. You mean Doug Johnstone was right. The old man was murdered. Yes, Johnny. Murdered. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Welcome, recording star Mel Torme. It's terrible trying to sing with a bad cold. So I always take four-way cold tablets to relieve cold miseries fast. Good idea. Tests of all the leading cold tablets proved four-way fastest acting. Four-way starts in minutes to relieve muscular pains, headache, reduce fever, calm, upset stomach, also overcomes irregularity. When you catch cold, try my way. Take four-way cold tablets. Fast way to relieve cold distress and feel better quickly. Four way, only 29 cents. Now, here's a word about another fine product of Grove Laboratories. To get rid of embarrassing dandruff in three minutes, change to Fitch Dandruff Remover Shampoo. Three minutes with Fitch regularly is guaranteed to keep unsightly dandruff away forever. Apply Fitch before wetting hair, rub in one minute. Add water, lather one minute. Then rinse one minute. Every trace of dandruff goes down the drain. Three minutes with Fitch and embarrassing dandruff's gone. At the same time, Fitch can brighten hair up to 35%. Get Fitch Dandruff Remover Shampoo today. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account item 10, $1.70 for a taxi to the cheap rooming house where Sterling Peterson had lived before his mysterious disappearance. The landlady turned out to be quite helpful. Well, that chiseling, no-account, tin horn gambler owed me two months back rent, Mr. Dollar. Well, if we can find him, only I'm beginning and to... And you ask it. me, there's something mighty suspicious about the way he picked up and left. Yeah, what do you mean, yeah. Mrs. Toomey? Well, now, here. Here, now, you look for yourself. You see all them empty hangers in that closet there and uh-huh. them... Them, them empty drawers I pulled out on the bureau. Oh, so what? Yeah, it took every stitch of clothes he had. Uh, how he ever stuffed them all in them two little suitcases he owned would have been impossible. Uh, so he picked up a tour over, a couple of more handbags. Without me seeing him come in here with him? You apparently didn't see him leave. Well, no. But look here, in the medicine cabinet in the bathroom. Well, yeah, we see. Yeah, that is funny. Well, it sure is. Man not take along his comb and razor and shaving things and his toothbrush and his hair tonic. I, I don't care how much of a hurry he was in. Uh, Mrs. Toomey, the day that Sterling Peterson disappeared... You mean the night he disappeared, don't you? Do I? All that day, he just sat around here and said he was waiting for his brother. His brother had promised to come and see him. Oh? Ask me, he was hoping his brother would bring him some money to pay up his rent and things. Did his brother come around? Ah, at 7 p.m., his brother telephoned. I took the message. Yeah? Said Sterling was to meet him at some dive out on Staples Street, so he left. And that's the last you saw him? I heard him come back here and up to this room sometime after 2 a.m. But you didn't actually see him. I go to bed at a respectable hour. Then how are you sure it Next was? Next morning he was gone, bag and baggage. Must have just plain, just plain sneaked out no, on me. No, I don't think so, Mrs. Toomey. What's that? A couple of things I learned earlier, a couple of things you've told me. And the stuff in that medicine cabinet. Hey? Now, I don't think you'd better bank on collecting any back rents. Not from Sterling Peterson. That, that beat. Is he? Of course he is. Or is he just plain dead? I went back to my hotel. No, Paul Peterson hadn't called me. But there was a message from Jack Price, so I went up to my room and I phoned him. I just wanted you to know the police are in on this now, Johnny. As a result of that autopsy? Yes. They're looking for Sterling Peterson, too. 
Also, they've been looking for you. They're very anxious to talk with you. Anytime they like. After all, it was you who brought this thing out of the open by suggesting the autopsy. Because you had the idea that it might be murder. No, that was Doug Johnstone's idea, and a very good one. Have they talked with Paul Peterson? Well, I assume they will. Well, if he's back in town, huh? Okay, Jackson, thanks. Now, well, let's see. Yeah? Come in. Dollar? That's right. I'm Paul Peterson. I got your message. Wow. Oh, come in. Come in. I understand that you're an insurance investigator, that you're looking for my half-brother, Sterling. Ah, that's right. Who didn't know that he was the beneficiary of your uncle's insurance. Sit down, sit down. Well, thanks. I just got back in town from a business trip and... so? Uh, look, I found these letters waiting for me. Oh, from Sterling? Yes, here. Hmm. Dallas, Wichita, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, Fargo, North Dakota? Yes, and by now he could be across the border in Canada. Yeah, maybe. Read it, Dollar. Uh, just keep quiet and give me time and you won't have to worry about me anymore. Yeah, the others are practically the same. Yeah. Neatly typewritten, no signature. I'm afraid it's obvious who they're from. So it looks as though your half-brother is running away. Now that uh, we know your uncle was murdered. Murdered? Yeah, that's right. Sterling. Uh, type these on your own machine, Paul. That might be pretty easy to trace. What? Yeah, with Sterling out of the way, you'd get your uncle's insurance as well as his money and property, wouldn't you? Oh, I suppose so, but I don't see what you're driving at. Oh, you did things up pretty well, Paul. Much better than your stupid brother could have. What are you talking and about? And all to play safe in case we discovered it was murder. Dollar. That so-called business trip. It was so that you could mail these letters to yourself, make it look as though Sterling had done the murder. Well, he must and have. And what happened? Did you make the mistake of telling him you'd done it? I? Now, look After here. After all, he would never have thought of substituting for the digitalis your uncle was taking. Look here, So Dollar. did Sterling threaten to blackmail you? Is that why you had to kill him, too? You're crazy. You don't know what you're talking about. And the tiny thing that tipped me off. What? When you went back to his room that night, after you'd killed him, to haul away his stuff, make it look as though he'd taken a powder... Yes, silly little thing. But no man, no matter how much of a hurry, would have left behind his comb, his razor, a toothbrush. And that isn't all. I say you don't know what you're talking about. Or maybe you do. Oh, oh easy, Paul. That gun will make an awful lot of noise in here. No, not when it's tied up against your back with a pillow over it. Stand up, Dollar. And if I don't... Well... Okay, Doug. What? Kick open the door. I'll cover him. I shut it. The police. That's right. All right. Uh, look. Look, boys. I said you covered, Peterson. Drop it. Drop it. Johnny, you okay? Yeah, sure, Doug. You hear it all, Sergeant? Yeah, I sure did, Mr. Dollar. It's funny, though. Funny? All I really came up here for was to talk to you. Not much point in it now, is there? So, another day, another dollar. And I'm not talking about myself. Expense account total, including hotel bill, a flock of incidentals, and a plane back to Hartford, two eighty-seven twenty. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Our star will return in just a moment. Constipation is something people don't talk about much. But it can be a problem for anyone, even doctors. And when constipation occurs, it's interesting to see just what doctors consider important about a laxative they might use or recommend. Well, a majority of the doctors we heard from had this to say. A laxative should be effective, gentle, as close to natural acting as possible and a medicine that can be used with complete confidence. Now, X-Lax has been popular with many doctors and millions of people over the years because pleasant-tasting chocolate at X-Lax is effective. Overnight, it helps you toward your normal regularity. X-Lax is gentle. Next morning, it gives you the closest thing to natural action. 
And that's why many doctors and millions of people use X-Lax with complete confidence. X-Lax, the laxative that helps you toward your normal regularity gently, overnight. Is X-Lax in your medicine cabinet? Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a hurry trip to Alaska to look for a clue to a murder. And say, if you've been to Alaska, if you know anything about the customs, the manners of the people up there, especially their eating habits, well, it's quite possible that you'll find a solution to the case even before I do. Or maybe you will anyhow. Because it all hangs on a tiny, seemingly unimportant clue. And yet, well, give a listen. See how well you can break down a killer's alibi. Yeah. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood and is written, produced, and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Jack Edwards, Forrest Lewis, Stacey Harris, Gil Stratton, and Barney Phillips. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Dan Coverly speaking. Tangled secrets unravel eerily all through the long night as suspense follows on the CBS radio network. Who's telling me to get out? I have a better right than you in this house, Rose. It's half mine. And half mine? Only because my brother Walter left it to you. Oh, you wish you could have talked him out of that, don't you? Uh, would have been a good idea. Idea nothing. You wanted him to leave me without a penny. He told me so several times before he died. All right, I tried to cut you off. You sure did. it didn't did. work. Walter left you half this house in a barrel of dough. I think he must have willed you his nasty disposition, too. Oh, I have a nasty disposition, have Ooh, I? Oh, have you? Well, I'll show you just how oh, nasty. Oh, don't prove that. You can kill a guy. I like hope so. Well, that's the last time I'll have to look at that flower pot. It sure is. Oh, the doorbell's ringing. I know it. Probably one of the neighbors again, complaining about the noise. Well, let them complain. Oh, oh. Mrs. Galloway? Mrs. Walter Galloway? Yes. I'm Lieutenant Crane, Miss Galloway. I know. The neighbors called the police again. Why don't you policemen get lost? I don't know anything about your neighbors, Mrs. Galloway. I've come to see you about your husband. My husband? Yeah. Walter Galloway of 18 Oak Street. This is his home, isn't it? Well, it was, but not now. My husband died ten years ago. Ten years ago? Yes. Why, that's impossible, Mrs. Galloway. What do you mean? This morning, a man killed in an automobile accident has been positively identified by his fingerprints as Walter Galloway. And now meet Dick Calmer as Boston Blackie. Enemy to those who make him an enemy. Friend to those who have no friend. Well, Mary, those are the facts. Uh-huh, well. What do you make of them? Oh, well, let's go to a movie, Blackie. Uh-uh. <laughs> this situation's too intriguing. No. Walter Galloway was killed in an explosion ten years ago, and the police were satisfied then that he was dead and buried. And today, a man is hit by a car and killed, and the police are equally satisfied that that is Walter Galloway. That's right. I'll let you in on a little secret. What? I'm satisfied it is, too. Oh, you didn't know Galloway, Mary. No. He always said he was too tough to die. Well, maybe he forgot to tell after the car that hit him this morning. Yes. <laughs> An obvious oversight. It's too bad. Mary, listen to me. Galloway was a gangster. So... He was on the spot, and when that explosion happened ten years ago, and his wife identified him as the victim... Excuse me, but just how was the identification made? I don't know, personal belongings, clothing, what it was left of the guy. Oh? Anyhow, 
From what we heard just now on the radio, his fingerprints positively identified the man hit by the car this morning as Walter Galloway. Well, maybe the fingerprints were just, uh, wanted to confuse everybody. <laughs> well, they did a good job, then. <laughs> All I know is we're going out to the cemetery where Galloway was buried ten years ago. Where what? You heard me. If his body is still there, and it's also in the police morgue, we're in a grave situation. <laughs> Johnny Moore, Tom Francis speaking. This is Blake, out at the cemetery. Oh, hello, Blake. Hi, Tom. Oh, pretty good. What's up? Oh, nothing. Just wanted to have somebody to talk to and figured you would, too. Yeah, sure. Always glad to talk to somebody who can answer back. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's a funny thing about that Walter Galloway body, ain't it, Tom? Well, no funnier than any other body. Right here on a slab. <laughs> yeah, I know, but according to my records, he should be in a tomb in my place. Oh, that ain't for us to worry about. Well, no, but... A little confusion. You got to hit fix that. No, not to me. All I know is they bring a body in here. I hold it a couple of days, ship it out. <laughs> Never hear from the customers one way or another. I don't generally get any messages from mine either. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, you heard about any good accidents lately? No, no, except the one that killed Galloway. Yeah, me neither. Things are kind of slow. <laughs> yes, you <sure> are. <laughs> Say, uh, let's you and I get together Sunday time. Maybe we'll go up and see my friend Joe on our day off. Oh, the undertaker. Yeah. Oh, look, that's a good idea. I'll see you Sunday, huh? All right, Sadie. Be careful of that Galloway body, Tom. <laughs> you watch your Galloway body, too, huh? <laughs> <laughs> hey, I wonder which one of them really is Galloway. Hey, yeah, wouldn't it be funny, Tom, if neither of them was Walter Galloway? Well, I don't know if my guy is. <laughs> Lieutenant Crane's inside now, looking at the body with Galloway's widow. Oh, I, oh, 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 uh, I'll call you back, Blake. Okay, bye. Bye. Oh, Tom. Oh, yes, yes, Lieutenant Crane. Mrs. Galloway has definitely identified the body inside. Is that of her husband, Walter Galloway? Yes. Yes, it's Walter, all right. But I thought he had died ten years ago. And so did all of us, Mrs. Galloway. Well, I just mark it in the usual way, Tom. Uh -huh. Killed in an accident, but I'm going to report to Inspector Faraday in the homicide department. Man getting himself killed twice, well, that just can't be an accident. Yeah, that's great, great, great. Oh, uh, will you, will you quit with that slide whistle, Cotton? I've heard enough racket for one day. You had another fight with your sister-in-law, Mrs. Galloway, I take it. Fine, fine, fine. Well, you know there's nothing fine about it. Oh, look, will you cut out playing with that whistle? Yes, when I'm ready for bed. Uh, you'd blow that whistle in your sleep if you could, wouldn't you? Look, cut it out, will you? You're getting on my nerves. Now, what's the matter, Bill? Don't you like music? Yeah, that's the trouble. I do. Besides, we're in a jam. Are we? Oh, you know we are. Not if you did what I told you to. I did what you told me to. And uh, have you made plans to do what you're supposed to do next? Yes, the plans are all made. Then we're not in a jam. But, Cotton, if things don't work out, we're in plenty of trouble. Things are going to work out. You never did anything wrong, and no one knows where to find me. Yeah, but... No the... one heard my name for eight or nine years. The place will be mentioned in your name, huh? now that my brother got himself killed for the second time this morning. My dear fellow, everyone knows poor Walter died ten years ago. Yeah, 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 we hope everybody thinks that. But then who got killed by that car this morning? Oh, let's not go into that. Let's just say that before we are through, it'll be a well-known fact that Walter Galloway died twice and came to life again each time. <laughs> Galloway Marshal him is right down to the end of this path, Blackie. Yes, I see it. Coming, Mary? Mm hmm yeah. You know, Blackie, this is all wrong. Why is it wrong? Well, it ought to be dark and pouring rain. Not a beautiful, sunshiny afternoon. <laughs> You've been reading too many books. Now, right now, I'm in one too many cemeteries. <laughs> Here we are, Blackie. Oh, good. Here's the Galloway Marshal you sure you want to look around inside? Yes, uh, just a brief look, if you don't mind. Oh, it's no bother to me. And no bother to uh, Mr. Galloway, neither. He's been in here at peace and rest for ten years. Oh? <laughs> you were the um, caretaker here when Mr. Galloway was buried? Sure was, lady. But the biggest funeral I ever saw. And I've been watching funerals and burials for 42 years, come next snowfall. There you are, Blackie. Go in and have you look around. Thanks. You want to come in too, Mary? Uh, no, I'll, I'll wait out here. What's in there? Nothing much. 
Darkness for the most part. Yeah. As soon as my eyes get used to it, I'll be able to see a uh oh. Oh? What's an uh oh? Something I'm gonna remember. There's no body in this mausoleum, Mary. What? It's gone. But believe me, it isn't forgotten. Will you please listen to me, Cotton? You like the idea? Well, it's a variation of my own, so I must like it. When can you start, Bill? Right away. Oh, <laughs> good. Good, good. It's going to mix everybody up so they won't know what's going on. Just so long as you remember, Bill. What does that mean? It means that just because this little idea of yours happens to be a good one, don't get any thoughts about big ideas. Oh, you're a little afraid of me, aren't you, Cut? <laughs> hey, what was that for? Oh, just another noise I happen to like. Providing you didn't mean what you said, Bill. And if I did mean it? Then it's a sample of things to come. What? I'm not afraid of you, Bill. I'm not afraid of the police. I'm not afraid of anybody. Remember that. Uh-huh. I've outsmarted everybody so far. And it'll be so easy to take care of you. Okay, okay, Cotton. Just relax. Everything will go just like we decided. Just like I decided. Okay, just like you decided. That better? Well, that's good, Bill. <laughs> good. <laughs> good. <laughs> mm. Knock, knock, Faraday. Beat it, Blackie, but fast. I'm busy. Thank you, Inspector. I'd be delighted to come in. Well, you're looking fine, Faraday. Yeah. Why shouldn't I look good? I haven't seen you in a week. I'm sorry. So what do you want here? As if anybody cared, especially me. Faraday, my friend, what do you make of this Walter Galloway situation? I'm not making anything out of it. And that's okay with everybody concerned. Except me. You're not concerned. No? No. Then how do you account for the fact that I'm frowning? What? This is mystifying me. Uh, uh, couldn't it mystify just as much out of my office? No, it's more consistent to be mystified in here. You're so confused all the time. Yeah, now you are. Okay, so it's catching. Mm-hmm. What about the Galloway case, Blanky? If Galloway was killed this morning, who was knocked off in that gangland explosion ten years ago? Unfortunately, it wasn't you. That's right. Well, whoever it was, old pal, has taken a walk from the cemetery. His body isn't there. I know. I happen to look. A peeping Tom in a graveyard. Blackie, is there anything you won't snoop to? Oh. The body is missing, huh? That's what I said. And after I saw that, I went to the morgue. Don't tell me Galloway's body is missing from there, too. No, it was there, all right. And it was Galloway, all right. But the body in the cemetery has disappeared. How would you like to make like that body? Thank you, Harry Houdini. Uh, look, Blackie, the next thing I know, you'll be telling me Galloway came to life after his funeral, lived for ten years, was killed this morning... And tomorrow he'll come to life again. No, Faraday. I think by now Galloway is tired of making the trip between the living and the dead. Mm. What I really think is that it was someone else who was killed ten years ago. Somebody else. If we can find out who, we might find a murderer who's gone free all this time. Blackie, couldn't you arrange to get lost? I guarantee nobody will look for you. Uh, that's your phone, Faraday. You do know something, don't you? Blackie, you amaze me. Hello. Hello, Inspector Faraday. Yeah? This is Tom Francis, Inspector Faraday. Tom with the morgue. Yeah, Tom, what is it? We'll get some men down here right away, Inspector. A corpse just got up and hit me on the head. What are you talking about? What just happened down here? I was knocked out from behind when I came to. The slab was empty and it was gone. What? It was gone? The it they brought in this morning, Inspector. The same it we had ten years ago, too. Walter Galloway. It's alive again. Now, back to Boston Blackie. For ten years, Walter Galloway has been considered dead, victim of a gang war. Yet a man killed by an automobile is identified by police and Boston Blackie as Galloway. Investigating the case, Blackie finds Galloway's place of burial empty. He theorizes that someone identified as Galloway was killed ten years ago. To add to the mystery and confusion, the body of the man just recently killed is missing from the morgue. As we return to our story, there is a knock at the door of a music-loving character named Arnold Cotton. Hello, 
Come in. Hello, Mr. Carton. Well, Bill, how did it go this time? Well, good as the last time. Oh, great, great, great. Now, look, Mr. Carton, I'm nervous after this last job. You have to make that noise. Yes? But why? Oh, you should know why. For years, I was a funeral director. The silence of the parlor was depressing. The quiet of the processions chilled me. And the calm of the cemeteries upset me. Uh, no, I'm what you might say, uh, making up for lost noise. Okay, okay, if that's your idea of fun. I came up here to give you a report on my brother. Oh, go ahead, by all means. Is the supposedly immortal Walter Galloway where he belongs now? Well, not yet, but he will be soon. As soon as I get to the cemetery, he'll be where he won't go walking around and getting himself killed again. <laughs> Faraday isn't for a surprise, is he, Mary? I doubt it. With you around Blackie, nothing should surprise him. Well, nothing does, except Blackie's doing something smart. Now, now. Okay, you two got me down here to the cemetery. This is the mausoleum where Walter Galloway is supposed to have been buried ten years ago. That's right, and it's now empty. Well, see. The body must have walked out, just as it walked out of the morgue after hitting the morgue attendant on the head. Mm-hmm. On the head. Well, here we are. Come on in. Personally, I'm waiting this one out. Outside. All right, Mary. Okay, Blanky, I'll go in. But this better not be any of your tricks. This trick is a better one than any I ever did. Now, Inspector, look around. What's the matter, afraid? No, but if this place is empty, I'm seeing things. What things? You look and tell me. Hey! Who's yelling hey at, Blanky? Galloway's body. It's here this time. Here? How do you... Blanky, quick, come here! What is it? What's the matter? Look, there, across the uh, cemetery wall, look, something. Oh, probably the man who brought Galloway's body back. Come on, Blackie, let's go get him. Okay. Hey, you on the wall there. Stay right around. He's practically on the other side of the wall. I can still get him. Uh, he got away, Faraday. No. Yeah. Well, we still don't know what this is all about. But it's about time we did. You gotta help me, Cotton. I got hit by that bullet Faraday fired. Well, it's just a nick. Stop complaining. Now, look, help me, will you? I'm hurt. The bullet's still in me, probably. You go to a doctor. Oh, you know I can't do that. I'd have to tell how I got shot. The doctor would report to the cops. They'd know what we've been up to. Now, you took the original body out of the mausoleum. You took your brother's body out of the morgue and put him in the mausoleum. Yeah, but you killed the guy we buried in my brother's place ten years ago. Well, of course I did. He was my partner. I wanted him out of the way. Your brother wanted to disappear. Because he was on the spot and knew it. Yeah, so you put your partner's body in the shack and set off an explosion. After making sure it had my brother's identification on it. (laughs) As far as anybody's concerned, my partner, Henry Preston, disappeared. Uh Nobody's looked for him or me for nine years. And everybody's happy. (laughs) Everybody was happy until my brother got himself hit by that car. But now that cop's bullet's in my arm, the police might possibly find out that your partner disappeared ten years ago. They never will. That body's at the bottom of a canyon right now. Yeah, I know. I helped put it there. You've done an awful lot of work, Bill. And I should be grateful. Only I'm not. But you're... This was a business proposition. You received your share of Walter's insurance. I'm in the clear, my friend. But with that bullet in your arm, you're in a bad way. Barney, I'm now convinced that Walter Galloway didn't die ten years ago in that explosion. Mm-hmm. But somebody did. Brilliant, aren't you, Blackie? Mm-hmm. i better put on my dark glasses. Uh, listen, the man who might tell us who was buried as Walter Galloway ten years ago is the man who directed his funeral. Yes, I checked on that. It was a man named Arnold Cotton. He was kicked out of the profession nine years ago. Nobody's heard of him since. Oh, fine, mm-hmm. fine. Hey, wait a minute. A missing person, huh? That's right. Faraday... Call the Missing Persons Bureau and see if somebody else has been missing since just before that gangland bombing ten years ago. I made that call a while ago. There was somebody else missing at the time Galloway disappeared. Well, who was it? The name was Henry Preston. Well, let's find out something about him. I know all about him. He was a partner of that undertaker, Arnold Cotton, the man nobody can find. Well, I'm going to try. And I'm going to start with Mrs. Galloway. Maybe I can convince her Arnold Cotton talked to me. That'll get some results if Cotton is in on this. Any objections? Objections? Sure I have. I have a good mind. Overruled. What? 
You say you have a good mind. Sorry, Inspector. Objection overruled on the grounds of insufficient evidence. <laughs> Mrs. Galloway. Yes? Maybe you honestly believe your husband died ten years ago, but you have to admit now that it isn't so. All right, it's not so, but I didn't do anything wrong. The clothes and the jewelry I identified were Walter's. Yes, and the money you've lived on the last ten years was from his life insurance policy. Yes, but I only got half. His brother Bill got the other half. Where is his brother Bill? I don't know. Do you know a man named Arnold Cotton? I never heard of him. No? No. He was in charge of that funeral ten years ago, with all of you pretending it was your husband who had died. Cotton told me about the scheme, Mrs. Galloway. Oh. Someone was murdered in your husband's place, and I know who that someone was. Who? You know who. Why? Mr. Preston. He and Arnold Cotton were the best of enemies, weren't they? You seem to know so much. Why ask questions? Very well, I won't. Mind if I use your phone? Go right ahead. Thank you. Huh. No dial tone. Well, your phone seems to be out of order. I'll report this to the phone company for you, Mrs. Galloway. Oh, thanks. And then I am going to take what Arnold Cotton told me and report back to the police. Bill. Uh, Bill. uh, Wake up. Wake up. Come on. Leave me alone, Rose. My arm hurts. Bill, I've got to talk to you. Oh. Oh, what's the matter now? Boston Blackie was just here. What? Yes. I told him I didn't know where you were. It's a good thing, too. Because he was making some pretty wild remarks about us. Like what? He said somebody named Arnold Cotton talked. What? Blackie says he knows who was killed in Walter's place ten years ago. No, that can't be. You jerk, what is all this? Well, I'll explain some other time. Cotton might double cross me, but not that way. What? He'd get himself in a jam. Oh. It's a trick, Rose. Get Cotton on the phone. The phone is out of order. Oh. Well, then there's only one thing to do. I've got to go see him. i got to go see him right away. <laughs> Homicide, Faraday. This is Blackie, Inspector. Busy? I'm always too busy to talk to you, Blackie. What do you want? How would you like to bust this case wide open? Uh, how would I like to bust your face wide open? This case? Oh. Meet me right away, Faraday. You won't be sorry. No, that's no. But there are at least two, maybe three people who will be. <laughs> Come in. Cotton, Cotton, we're in trouble. Get out of here, Bill. No, Cotton, I've got to talk to you. If you had to talk to me, why didn't you phone? Well, my phone's out of order. There are other phones. Yeah, I know, but I thought this was safe. Well, why? I can't afford to have anyone know where I live. Even me. <laughs> oh. That's why you hoped I'd die from that bullet wound, didn't you? I'm not a doctor, and I don't know any doctor. I wouldn't have believed you'd double-cross me, except for the way you treated me when I got shot. I'm not double-crossing anyone. No? You told Boston Blackie everything. What? I... I... Why, you must be out of your mind. I wouldn't tell anyone anything. Didn't I commit a murder? I killed Henry Preston. What? If I told on you, I'd be telling on myself. And admitting something far worse than what... Go right on, Cotton. I'm Boston Blackie and Faraday and I are listening. Now, listen here. I don't think you'll move, Inspector. You'll wear ready to move him. Bill, I told you this was a trick. It was a way to find me. Yes, it was. And thanks, Bill. You made the way very easy to follow. Well, I wouldn't have led you here if our phone hadn't been out of order. Faraday had it put out of order, Bill. Temporarily. That's well, right. It's in order now. And so is everything about this case. <laughs> Blackie. Yeah? You know, I really need a lot of information about this case. <laughs> it was pretty complicated. I should say it was. Well, where do you want me to start? All right, now, let's see. Let me ask questions. First, was Mrs. Galloway in on this? No, but I didn't know that when I went to see her. Mm-hmm. My visit served its purpose, though. She went to Bill Galloway, and he led Faraday and me to Cotton. Mm-hmm. I see about that. Well, uh, uh, what about the um, the insurance? Walter Galloway had a tremendous life insurance policy. He promised he would split half of that policy with Bill Galloway and Cotton. Mm -hmm. So, Cotton went ahead with his plan to kill Henry Preston. Yeah, I see. Well, I understand that. Now, explain the disappearing bodies. Well, first, Preston's body was removed from the Galloway vault as soon as the real Walter Galloway was killed in the auto accident yesterday. Uh Uh-huh. Cotton and Bill Galloway knew there'd be an investigation and didn't want Preston's body found. 
Well, but how did the, the body that disappeared from the morgue uh, turn up at, at the tomb? Bill Galloway slugged the morgue keeper and took his brother's body out to the cemetery where it belonged. That's when we almost grabbed him. Well, Arnold Cotton was a pretty clever fellow, Blackie. You know, he, he almost got away with all this. <laughs> yes, he did. For ten years, Arnold Cotton really pulled the wool over everybody's eyes. Oh, <laughs> Help, police! Help! There's been a murder! Police! Police! Hey, hey, take it easy, mister. Take it easy. Officer, come quick. There's been a murder. I saw. I saw. You saw it. Where? When? Right back there in that vacant lot. I saw a man stab another man and then run away. You sure you're not seeing things? No, come on, I'll show you. Come on. Okay, let's go. Lead the way. Uh, it was right here in this vacant lot. Uh -huh. I saw one of the men fall into the grass by the side of the path. Uh -huh. The tall grass right over there. Okay, we'll have a look. It was awful. Officer, I saw a murder. I know, I know you said that. Yeah, right here, officer. Right here's where I saw him fall. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. See? He's still there. Yes, and... And plenty still. Yeah, he seems to be. Did you get a look at the man who did this? Oh, no, I just saw him from the back. I, I was starting to cross the lot when I saw the murder. Okay, stick around. Oh, you want me They'll to... still want you as a witness. Oh. Hey, there seems to be something in the dead guy's hand. Better have a look. I saw the murderer lean over and try to take something out of the dead man's hand after the stabbing. Then he saw me and he ran away. Well, whatever the killer wanted, he didn't get. Because this dead guy still got a good grip on it. A, a plenty good grip. Well, it must be something awfully valuable if he was killed for it. Valuable, did you say? It uh, must be. Take a look. There's nothing in this guy's hand but a nickel. Cases of Mr. Ace, starring George Rapp. Yes? Uh, my name's Eddie Ace. Oh, yes, you're the private detective. Yes. There was a message at my office from a Dr. Gale. Asked me to come right over here. Is he in? I am Dr. Gale. Come in. Please. So, you're Dr. Gale. <laughs> Shouldn't I be? I didn't expect you to be a woman. Well, what can I do for you? I want to retain you to talk to me. To, to talk to you? You'll be amply repaid for your time. Well, you don't have to bribe me. All you have to do is tell me what I'm to talk to you about. Your experiences? Why? You see, I'm a psychoanalyst, Mr. Ace. I'm planning a book dealing with criminal psychology. And I intend to do something different. And there, I need your help. I want the material fresh and unbiased, so to speak. From the point of view of a private detective. Of, more specifically, an Eddie Ace. You make me feel very important. Is that a trick of a psychoanalyst? No. That's a trick of a woman. What do you say, Mr. Ace? All you want me to do is to come here whenever I'm finished a case and tell you about it. Mm-hmm. The strange people you meet, what they said, how they reacted, what they were after. I guess you know what you're after, Dr. Gale. All right. When do we begin? I'm listening, Mr. Ace. I'm listening. <laughs> The Cases of Mr. Ace, starring George Rath, and produced and directed by Jason James. You're 
sure my typewriter won't disturb you, Mr. Ace. I don't think the typewriter will bother me, but I'm not so sure about the typist. When you arrived, you said you didn't expect me to be a woman. You were right. I'm a psychoanalyst. Shall we begin, Mr. Ace? Mm. I see what you mean. Yeah. Well, it, it all started with a killing that was no business of mine. The murder of Frederick Miller. You know, the corporation lawyer. His body had been found in his apartment. Three bullets in it. As I say, it was no business of mine until I arrived at my office over on 6th Avenue in the morning after the killing. A man was waiting to see me. He was very small, very dark, very smooth. He smiled and showed me all his teeth. He had a lot of them. I opened my door, and he followed me in. Ah, merci, monsieur. Sit down. You're French. Uh, you are very observant, monsieur. What can I do for you? Uh, permit me. My name, monsieur, is Faure, Pierre Faure. Uh, I have selected you to perform for me a very important service. Oui, a service. Such as? Uh, uh, oui, oui, oui. Now we come to it. Uh, last night, monsieur, I performed a most impulsive act. I killed a man. I see. You're a big boy now. You must learn to control yourself. Ah, uh, you are right. Uh, but uh, that is how I am. I killed him, and I do not feel regret. I feel only pleasure when I look into my eyes and see him die again and again. Oh, that's better than a double feature. I had warned this man, monsieur. Twice I had warned him to stay away from Sally, my wife. He would not. So, I killed him. It is simple. You make it sound reasonable. Who is the lucky lover? A pig named Miller. It is in all the papers. Oh, such a fuss. All for one pig named Miller. Mm. Frederick Miller, eh? A uh, oui. Cochon. What are your plans? Uh, that is why I've come to you, monsieur. I am now on my way to the city hall of justice. Giving yourself up? Oui, but it is not serious. When I explain to the man in charge of the justice why I killed this, this Miller, uh, he will let me go. Yes, you're sure. He's cute that way, uh... Well, uh, why did you come to see me? To all for me, two things, monsieur. One, a five hundred dollars. And uh, two, this little key. That's, uh, this key, eh? Uh, oui. You will hold it for me until after the man in charge of the justice has heard my case. When I return, you will give it to me. Suppose you don't return. Oh, it is certain. How do I know? Because I am a Frenchman. But, but I say, if by some silly mistake I am detained, then you will give it to my lawyer. But only if I am detained by what you call a conviction of guilty. Why not give it to your lawyer now, yourself? He still remains to be selected. And I do not wish to surrender myself to the justice dispenser with the key on my person. Mm, I see. And this 500, what do I do with it? That? You keep it, monsieur, for your uh, trouble. Frey left, and I sat fingering the 500 and the key. It was a small brass key, the kind you use on your trunk. No marks on it except a number, 427. I had Frey doped as a nut. Anyway, uh, Frey confessed to the killing of Miller. And the final edition stole out Timothy Hogan. The wild Irish criminal lawyer came forward with an officer to defend the prisoner. The next morning, Hogan came to my office. I had a hunch he would. And as sure as I'm sitting here in your office, Mr. Ace, I'm certain that Pierre Ferre did not kill Miller. He confessed. Confessed? Ha! <laughs> so there you have a darling confession. A Frenchman, a crime of passion, and he gives himself up. No, no, not Ferre. Not after talking to the man. And what's your best guess? Think, man, think. Can't you see it? Maybe I'm looking in the wrong direction. And that you are. Perret is covering up for someone, someone he loves. His wife? Aha, uh -huh. that's the thought, Mr. Ace. That's precisely the thought. And that's why the case attracted me. There's uh, no money in it. But it's sentimental and violent. And uh, <clears throat> I'm Irish. Oh, it could be. But if he's covering up for his wife, how are you going to get him to sing? I must. If I can get him to recant a confession from his wife, why, well, I could get her an acquittal with a twist of the wrist. Good heavens, man. Look at the elements. Self-sacrificing husband, outraged and betrayed wife. 
he comes forth at the last minute, why, it's better than Mother McCree. I'll have the jury swimming in their own tears. I like your script. How are you going to get it on the stage? Aha, uh-huh, that, sir, that is the problem. And there I need your help. I know this much. Yesterday, before he gave himself up, Foray came to you. What did he tell you? Nothing. He gave you something? Nothing. Oh, I don't think you're telling me the gospel truth, Mr. Hill. I'm not. Hmm. I see. Very well. I tried to persuade Foray to give you his permission to talk to me. That's better. But in the meantime, Mr. Ellis, in the meantime, you might try to sound out the wife of me. Very, very discreetly, understand? But sound her out. Are you hiring me? Yes. Will you see what you can do? Well, I'm practically there now. <laughs> Yes? Mrs. Foray? Go away. All day you reporters have been I'm a detective. To... What do you want? Sit down. Say what you want and get out. Do as I say or I'll take you downtown. You don't frighten me a bit. I'm ready. Mm-hmm. I see what you mean. Okay. I'll level with you, Mrs. Foray. I'm not from the police. I'm a private detective. I'm working for your husband's lawyer on the Miller killing. You knew Miller. Yes. Yes, I knew him. What is that to work on? That rat Pierre killed him. I hope he dies in the chair for it. Pierre says you were seeing Miller. That might save him from the chair. Let him prove that. Just let him prove I ever saw Fred Miller outside of his office on business. When did you see Miller last? None of your business. Get out. Sure. But keep this in mind, Mrs. Foray. Your husband confessed to the murder. But maybe you'd be able to give the jury the impression that he's covering up for someone else. Someone may be like his ever-loving wife. I said go on, get out. Oh, uh, by the way, uh, did you ever see this key before? No. Now get out of here. And tell that rat Pierre I'll do my best to get a ringside seat for his execution. I went back to my office, opened my door, and then I saw him. A man was sitting behind my desk. He got to his feet. He didn't introduce himself. But I could tell by the bulge in his right pocket that he had a very good reference. You are Mr. Ace. What do you want? The key, Mr. Ace. What key? Please, Mr. Ace, do not act childish. Give me the key. I'm bigger than you are. But if you force me to use this gun, I shall be liver than you are. The key, please. He pointed a stubby little revolver at my head. I gave him the key. He thanked me politely enough and left. I counted ten then raced down the hall to the fire exit, slammed down the iron stairs, and picked up behind him as he was leaving the building. He went straight to the Times Square station. I went right behind him. He went directly to the locker. I was right behind him. He inserted a key in the locker number 427, threw the latch, pulled the little door open, and then... It must have been hours later when I opened my eyes. I was still in the station. Near me and around me were maybe a dozen more. Cops and interns milled around. But bending over me was Detective Lieutenant Walsh. Feeling better, Ace? Yeah, right. Oh, my head. What happened? Bomb exploded in a locker. Anybody killed? Yeah, the man who opened the booby trap. Blown to bits and uh, three bystanders. You were lucky. You can say that again. All right, I will. You were lucky, and I mean lucky that you didn't open it yourself. I? How could I open it? With the little key you showed Sally Foray. You certainly get around. Where'd you get that key? From Pierre Foray. Oh, oh. Pierre Foray, eh? That's the name. He came to my office. Gave it me to hold. You can ask him. Well, suppose you ask him, Ace. But you better get yourself a good spiritualist. Pierre Foray hanged himself in his cell two hours ago. (laughs) 
Walsh took me down to police headquarters. He talked to me for two hours. He didn't learn a thing, but I did. Pierre was visiting his cell by Hogan and Mrs. Ferre just before he strung himself up. It was Hogan who found his body when he went back to talk to him again. I asked Walsh what he knew about Hogan, and he didn't know much. I left police headquarters and went around the corner to Jenny the bail bond. Jenny had been around New York longer than the city charter and runs the biggest bail bond mill in town. I asked her what she knew about Timothy Hogan. She didn't know much offhand, but promised me a rundown by morning. I said I'd call her and left it at that. Outside, the rain was just beginning to wash the town. A hack pulled up. I opened the door, bent to get in when... The butt of the gun came down across my skull, and that was that. It was the cold water that brought me out of it. I opened my eyes. A ceiling and a chandelier spun around. I closed them again. Leo, douse him again. Ace. Ace, you hear me? Get up. The man said, get up, and the man meant it. The man was big, big enough to lift me to my feet with one hand. I tried to open my eyes. There were battleships tied to the lashes, but I made it. Two other mugs flanked me, with Mike in front of me. The rug was wet with blood and water. The water and the rug were theirs. The blood was mine. Somebody must have taken a bad working over. I began to figure it must have been me, but I couldn't remember. In fact, I didn't even know who Ace was when Mike barked the name. You hear me, Ace? Give me... Give me a drink of water. Leo, give him a drink. You're making a lot of trouble for us, Ace. It ain't necessary. Now, look what you look like. Busted nose, busted lips, busted eyes. You think we like to do things like this? And just look at me old lady's rug. Don't... Don't let it break you up. Just look at yourself. And for what? Tell me. For what? Because you get stubborn. You... You mustn't be impatient. Uh... I'm not very bright. What am I... What am I stubborn about? All we want to know is where is the envelope for A gave you? Michael, how much longer will you be? Uh, j just a few more minutes, Ma. Oh, well, just look at that rug. I'll have it cleaned. Well, hurry up. The hot catch is getting all burned. All right, Ace. I'm through talking nice. Where's the envelope? For A didn't give me a... Leo, take it. <coughs> oh. Oh. <sighs> I remember there was the old hack screaming about her furniture. I know I smashed a chair when I went down, and that made me feel pretty good. I felt the water hitting my face again. I got my right eye unstuck. I was on my back in a field up in the Bronx. The rain washed over my bruised face, and that felt fine. But I couldn't stay to enjoy it. I remember there was a phone call I had to make. And by the time I let myself into my apartment over on Third Avenue, the sun was up. I looked into a mirror. I never saw a guy before in my life. But even if he was a stranger, I had to do something for him. I wrapped some ice in a towel, held it over my face, and then I picked up the phone. Jenny's bail bond. You sleep in that ratty office of yours, Jenny? <laughs> Holding for you. How does he shape? Well, he was the mouthpiece for the old Ringo mob. Back in Prohibition, you know. Ringo got pushed over, rest his soul. Hogan fronted for the policy boys in Harlem. And finally, he broke away from the heist guys. Went into straight criminal law. Only the very highest types of criminals. Where does he hail from? Why, uh, he's from, uh, yes, here it says, uh, Timothy Hogan, Washington University, class of 28. X. X? What's that mean? X, it says here, it says. I see, you didn't, didn't finish at Washington. No record of any other school. I see. All right, thanks, Jenny. Yeah? Anything else I can do for you? Yeah. Keep a nice fat bail bond warm. I may need it. Who is it? What? 
Oh. Well, don't let the face frighten you, Mrs. Frey. I'm just breaking it in for Boris Karloff. What? What happened to you? Mm, what happened to me shouldn't happen to a private detective. But it did. Sit down. We're going to make with a little talk. Look, I'm, I'm in an awful hurry, Mr. Ace. I was just going out. What did you and Hogan tell Pierre in his cell yesterday? Oh, well, I didn't want to go. That lawyer, Hogan, he insisted. Well, I, I guess I blew my top. I, I told Pierre I was going to tell the jury the truth. That, that Freddie, Freddie Miller begged Pierre to give me a divorce. He wouldn't. Instead, he took money from Fred to keep his mouth shut and not make a scandal. And you figure that's why Pierre strung himself up. So there was no chance for him. That's the one thing I regret. He didn't go to the chair. Mm-hmm. You must have had quite a burn for this guy, Miller. When, when I love a man, I love him. I love him. I... Do you <laughs> kind of lost now, eh? I loved him, Eddie. It's going to be awful tough. Freddie was... Freddie... Oh, what's the use? I, I wind up with memories in four walls. The kind of memories you can't forget. The kind of cut your heart out every time you breathe. Come here. What am I going to do, Eddie? How can I forget it? Easy. You call me Eddie. Just try calling me. Freddie. All right. I'll try it. I'll try it. A little later, I remembered that Sally was just on her way out when I arrived. I asked where she was headed for. She hedged a little, but then I saw the court orders on the desk. She was going down to the First National Bank to open Pierre for a safety deposit box. I went with her. A small vault contained some jewels, an insurance policy, and a bulky package wrapped in brown paper. The jewels are mine. I'll take them with me. Maybe we better see what's in this package. Oh, I can't imagine what it could be. Money. Thousand dollar bills. Must be fifty of them. Fifty thousand dollars? Well, where did where did he get all that? Not in the private eye business. In this envelope. I think we better open it in the presence of a lawyer. Look, I'm going upstairs to see if anybody's around that looks familiar. Here, take this nickel. Yeah. Call police headquarters. Lieutenant Walsh. Tell them to meet me right now at Timothy Hogan's apartment. This is important for both of us, Angel. So don't trip. I'll wait for you outside. I waited. Four minutes later, she joined me. Told me Walsh was starting out. We got to Hogan's apartment first. Well... Grace, Mrs. Perez, sit down, sit down. Hmm. What happened to your face, Mr. Reyes? I ran into an open gun cell in the dark. Oh, really? Now, where? I didn't get the address, but it was the home of that mug named Mike you keep on your payroll. I see. What else do you know? Put that heater away, Hogan. Walsh is on his way up. I'll give it to you fast. Frederick Miller, the lawyer used to needle in court. Dug into your background. Found out you weren't a member of the bar. Never finished law school. Why, you aren't even a shyster. And that's why I killed him. Right. But Foray confessed. That was the deal you made with him. Fifty G's if he confessed to the murder of Miller. And you think a man would confess to a murder for any amount of money? You convinced him you'd get him an acquittal. On the unwritten law. But before he agreed, he wanted full protection. This little envelope we got out of his safety deposit box. That's true, Mr. Ace. That's true. I had to give him my signed confession, just in case anything went wrong. And plenty went wrong. He didn't trust you. You'd try to get that confession back, but you'd watch every move he made before he confessed to the police. That's why he came to me. Gave me a key to a booby trap. He figured you'd try to get that key from me. Open the booby trap and get your head blown off. But you sent one of your mugs instead. You leave nothing for me to say, yes? Is there anything else you'd like to know before I... Kill you? Yeah. How did you manage to kill Foray in his cell? That, my friend, that is the trade secret which I cannot divulge. Too bad, Hogan. Right guy like you. I know that Walsh will feel the same way about it. But he's a city cop. Mr. Ace, you are priceless. But you made just one little mistake. You see, Sally here wasn't in love with Miller. You didn't even know him. Sally was and always has been in love with me. That true, Sally? Here's your nickel, Eddie. 
I didn't make that call to police headquarters. <laughs> so little Sally wasn't three-timing. She was four-timing. You know, Ace, it's remarkable you've stayed alive as long as you have. Can you give me one good reason why I shouldn't kill you? Can I skip that question and take the $32? Go home, Charlie. Yeah. Yeah, I'm... I'm sorry, Eddie. Believe me, I am. Go on home and shop in your stiletto. <gasps> Going somewhere, Mrs. Foray? Look out, Walsh. He'll shoot. Yeah. Oh, no. yeah. That's a darling break. Tim. Charlie, get your... Double... No. Get your car. No. No, I didn't, Tim. Honest, I didn't. Ah. Ah. The day. It's easy. Uh, Stop wailing, Sally. He can't hear you. He's dead. And I wish he'd killed you. A brilliant man like him shot down like a dog and you stand there. Okay, Walsh. From here on out, it's your party. The confessions in the envelope will give you the score. Sally is right. He was a brilliant man. That's how Timothy Hogan died. Here I called Walsh when I left Sally for a minute at the bank. She could have been held as an accessory to the murder of her husband in his cell. But Walsh never got her down to headquarters. She took a header out of the window. I guess it was better for her like that. Well, that was a gory business, wasn't it? Gory? Oh, I, I thought I'd give you the mild ones first. Mild? Good heavens. Do you mean that this sort of thing goes on with you all the time? Only when business is good. Well, for my sake, then, I hope business improves. Good night, Mr. Ace. There's, uh, there's something I'd like to say, Dr. Gale. Yes? Yeah? Well, it's... Uh, never mind. Uh, maybe next time. Or maybe the time after that. You're reading my thoughts, Mark Private. Good night, Dr. Gale. George Raft as Mr. Ace will be back in a moment with news of next week's case. But now a word from our sponsor. Thank you. And next week I have another appointment with Dr. Gale. I'm going to tell her about a murder that shouldn't have happened. Not even to a corpse. And George will all be waiting to hear that. In the assisting cast tonight, you heard Jeanette Nolan, Kathy Lewis, Theodore Von Elts, Leo Cleary, and Stanley Farrar. The music was composed and conducted by Sandy Courage. This is Carlton Cadell speaking and inviting you to listen again to George Raff in the cases of Mr. Ace. <laughs> and Lipton Soup present Inner Sanctum Mysteries. Good evening, gentle friends of the Inner Sanctum. Welcome through the creaking door for another soothing half hour of sweetness and light. <laughs> oh, I've learned a new trick. Would one of you like to step up here and be sawed in half? What? No volunteer? Well, maybe you're right. The first part, the sawing in half, that's easy. But the second part, the uh, putting together again, I'm still not very good at that. <laughs> Mr. Host, how can you joke about such things? Are you trying to get our listeners in a mood for enjoying themselves? That's it, Mary. Well, jokes like that certainly won't put people in a good mood. Here's a much better way to do it. Just serve folks a piping hot cup of Lipton tea, and they'll be in a good mood in a minute. For Lipton's is the password to pleasure. It's tea at its delicious best. Thanks to Lipton's brisk flavor. Brisk, you know, is the tea expert's own word for the fresh, lively, full-bodied flavor of Lipton tea. 
Unlike ordinary dull-tasting teas, Lipton's is never flat. It's always spirited and satisfying. Try it real soon and get the extra enjoyment of Lipton's wonderful brisk flavor. What does a man think of when there's murder in the air? The close presence of death. Does it have matter and substance? Does it generate unseen light waves that touch a man's subconscious? Or unheard sound waves that speak to him when he sleeps? Well, let's listen to I Walk in the Night, written by Emil Tepperman. With Larry Haynes in the role of Peter Lang to tell you this story himself. I don't know if it was the ringing of the doorbell that awoke me. Dragged me back to consciousness out of a deep, heavy sleep. I felt groggy. As if I'd been drugged. My eyes were so heavy. So hard to keep open. That infernal raining. I stumbled out into the hall. Myrna's room. My wife. There, opposite mine. I knew the door would be locked. We'd quarreled last night while the Judsons were visiting from the house next door. Myrna had made a scene. She went to her room and locked herself in. Please, please, wake up in there. As I stumbled down the hall of the front door, I recognized Phil Judson's voice. Phil and Henrietta lived in the house next door, just across the lawn. Please, please. All right. All right, I'm coming. Just a minute. Okay. I got this open. There. Oh, thank heaven you woke up, Pete. I thought you'd never hear me. What's wrong, Phil? What's that poker for? Henrietta saw a prowler come out of this house. A prowler? What's the matter with you, Pete? You look groggy. Wake up. I, I don't know. I feel as if I'd been doped. Uh, what's this about Prowler? Henrietta saw him climbing out of Myrna's window. She yelled to me, and I grabbed the poker and came running out. The poker? What, what, what's, what's the matter with you? Didn't you hear me? A man was in Myrna's room just now. Uh, great Scott. Myrna's alone in there. Come on. Myrna. Myrna, you all right? Open the door. She doesn't answer. Phil, are you sure the prowler came out of this room? Yes, they ran around the house and got away. Uh, look, Pete, uh, have you got a key to this door? Oh, it's bolted on the inside. Well, we've got to break it down. Come on, put your shoulder to it. Once more now. Well, where's the light switch? Oh, here. Here, I've got it. Better not come in, Pete. Oh, let me in. I've got to see. Uh, Take it easy, Pete. Oh, Myrna. Strangled. Strangled to death. Oh, Myrna. Look at the black and blue marks on her throat. This chain on her neck. It's broken. It was her locket. The one I gave her last Christmas. Killer must have taken it with him. And see here, her fingernails. There's bits of skin under them. She must have struggled and scratched the killer's face or hands. Why, Phil? Why should anyone want to kill her? Then began the long torture of the investigation. Detectives swarming over the house. Men in derby hats examining the body of my wife. Measuring the room, searching for fingerprints. And finally, more men who came and... Carried her away forever. Through it all, Phil and Henrietta sat with me, trying to give what comfort they could. Oh, Peter, dear, please talk to us. I can't stand seeing you sit there with your head in your hands. It won't bring Myrna back to life. Henrietta's right, Pete. You've got to get a hold of yourself. I know. I know, but... I can't stop thinking about it. Those marks in the throat, the torn chain, the locket gone. Look here, Pete, there's something we have to talk about. Now, get that dazed look off your face and listen to me for a minute. Yes, yes, Phil. 
There's a police inspector in Myrna's room right now. O'Brien is his name. He'll be coming in soon to question you. Now, you'd better not tell him about the quarrel you had with Myrna last night. I don't get you. It would look bad for you. For me? Oh, well, what do you mean? Phil, you, you don't think that I... <laughs> Suddenly, I caught my breath. My right hand in my bathrobe pocket had touched something cold. Phil and Henrietta both stared at me. Peter, what's wrong? Phil. Phil, look what I found in my pocket. What is it? Look. A locket. It, it's Bernice's locket. The one that was torn from my throat. Phil. Phil, how could this get in my pocket? Here, give me that quick. But Phil. Give it to me. Yes, it's Werner's locket, all right. You recognize it, Henrietta? Yes. What are you going to do with it, Phil? Get rid of it, quick. Out this open window. Well, if the police find it out there, they'll think the killer dropped it. But Phil, it was in my pocket. What, what are you looking at, Phil? Your hand, Pete. What? Your left hand. <laughs> I looked down at my left hand. There on my wrist... The three long gashes where the skin had been scraped. As if by the fingernails of a woman fighting for her life. Phil. Do you, do you think I could have killed her? Nonsense. I don't believe it. You could never do a thing like that, Pete. Couldn't I? How can you be sure? How can I be sure? Peter, please. Don't talk like that. You... You're making yourself out some terrible monster, but you aren't. Phil and I know you... You can't be like that. I don't know. Maybe I got up in my sleep and, and killed Myrna without ever knowing it consciously. After all, I, I did have that quarrel with her last night. Cut it, Pete. Here comes O'Brien, the detective. I hope I'm not intruding. Oh, oh no. It's, it's all right, Inspector. Come in, O'Brien. Mr. Lang is very upset. The shot. Yes, I understand Believe me, Mr. Lang, you have my deepest sympathy. I wouldn't bother you at all at a time like this, but... Uh, Inspector O'Brien was a pink-cheeked, cherub-faced, chubby little man. But his eyes were cold and blue and restless. They kept jumping from Phil to Henrietta to me as he fired his questions at us. Mr. Lang, uh, one more thing. Uh, I understand you had a small party here last night? Oh, no. No, it, it wasn't a party. It's just Phil and Henrietta and, and, and Ted Hale. Ted Hale? Yes, Mer Myrna's cousin. Oh, I see. Uh, this Ted Hale, a cousin of your wife, she said. Pardon me, Inspector. Uh, yes, Mr. Johnson. Peter's too easygoing and good-natured to tell you about Ted Hale. But as Peter's attorney, it's my duty to give you certain information. Oh, go ahead. Myrna, Mrs. Lang, owned considerable property in her own right. Recently, I drew a will at her request. In it, she leaves a sizable sum to Ted Hale. Oh? Uh -huh. Oh, I... I just thought of something. What is it, Henry? Well, Peter was so groggy when he woke up. That's right. He looked as if he'd been drugged. Well, don't you remember last night? Ted Hale went in the kitchen to mix the last round of drinks. Oh, Henrietta, that's ridiculous. On the contrary, it's quite important. Now, uh, tell me, this Ted Hale, what does he do for a living? Why, he works for me in my brokerage office. Uh -huh. To please murder, I gave him a job as my confidential secretary. Hmm. Uh, I suppose you tell me where Mr. Ted Hale lives. I think I'll have a talk with him. Now, all you have to do, Pete, is sit tight. Let O'Brien follow up his lead. But Phil, I can't let him arrest Ted Hale. He didn't kill Myrna. I did. I must have. The locket. He scratches. It, it's not fair to Ted. As your attorney, I won't let you strap yourself in the electric chair. You go back to your room and get some sleep. Uh, Henrietta, do you mind going back to our house by yourself? Of course not. I'm going to sleep right here in the living room on this couch in case Peter needs me tonight. On my bed in the dark, I kept seeing a thousand pictures. Myrna, her face modeled with strangulation. Phil, always so sure of himself. Henrietta, worried and frightened. And O'Brien, 
his face grim and his blue eyes cold. Going off to question Ted Hale. I must have been close to dozing off when I heard the doorbell faintly, as if in a dream. I tossed about in bed for a moment or two. And then I heard the voices in the living room. Phil's, cold and harsh. And someone else's, loud and angry and frightened. I got out of bed and opened the door. I went down the hall to the living room. I had to know who was in there arguing with Phil. It was Ted Hale. Ted, what are you doing here? Phil phoned me. He told me about Myrna. I called him up. Told him O'Brien would be coming for him. I suggested he come over here and talk it over with me. Pete, don't let them arrest me. You gotta help me. Me? Help you? You know I didn't kill Myrna. Well, I'm not sure. Pete. What? I was here last night, you know. When you had that fight with Myrna. What do you mean? If I'm arrested... Says I had a motive, but what about you, Pete? You were always quarreling with Myrna. Now, look here, Ted. If you're threatening me... I only want you to help me, Pete. Don't let them arrest me. Hide me. Hide me out till this blows over or till they get the real killer. I think Ted is right, Pete. We should help him. But where? I'll handle it. You have a dark room fixed up in the cellar, haven't you? Yes. We'll stick a cot in there and let Ted hole up for a day or two. Nobody will think of looking for him in this house. Poor Peter. Seems to be in a daze half the time. Yes, his trouble is that when he's awake, he's half asleep, and when he's asleep, he's half awake. <laughs> no wonder he can't sleep well. He seems to be such an honest person, he can't lie easy. Hmm? You know, it's too bad he doesn't go over and stay at Phil's house, Mr. Host. Phil and Henrietta seem the kind of people who do everything to make him comfortable. Well, I just hope they know something about hospitality, Mary. Oh, I'm sure they do. Why, everybody knows that the proper way to treat guests is to serve them something delicious. For example, when guests drop in at my house, the first thing I do is put on the tea kettle. And almost before they have their wraps off, I have my best tea service out, and I'm serving them some of my fragrant, fresh-made cake and a cup of heartwarming Lipton tea. For no matter what time of day or night guests arrive, there's nothing like wonderful Lipton tea to make them relax and feel at home. Yes, Lipton's brisk flavor is so lively and, and full-bodied and satisfying, it just naturally hits the spot with everybody. In fact, I always say, whenever you want to serve your friends or your family a grand, refreshing drink, make it tea. And make it tea at its delicious best. Lipton tea. Now, let's get back to our sleepwalker. There's no telling what he might have done while we were talking about tea. Now, let's see. Where were we? Peter and Phil were going to hide Ted Hale in the cellar. Now, listen to me carefully, Peter. If Ted Hale is arrested and talks, O'Brien will learn about the quarrel you had with Myrna last night. He'll start digging into things that won't look so good for you. No, Phil, wait. And I know you're trying to help me, but if I did it... If, if I did kill Myrna, then there's no use trying to protect me. It isn't right. I'm a dangerous man. Fiddlesticks. But you can't brush it off like that. Do... Do you know what it means to lie awake in the night... Wondering whether you've killed your own wife. Wondering whom I'll kill next. Cut that out. We've got business to attend to. Now, here's my plan. We'll let Ted stay here tomorrow. And then tomorrow night, I'll smuggle him out of the country. Get him passage on a freighter to South America, maybe. You think he'll go? Sure, he'll go. He's scared stiff. But we'll need money. Lots of money. Now, how much have you got in the safe at the office? Oh, about 10000 in cash, but there's a batch of negotiable bonds. They'll do. I'll go down to the office the first thing in the morning and get them out of the safe. Uh, you had the combination? Yes, you gave it to me when you gave me your power of attorney, remember? Oh, yes. Now, don't you worry about a thing. Oh, um, here. Take this powder. Hmm? It's just one of the bromides that Henrietta uses. It'll help you get to sleep. By tomorrow morning, everything will be fixed up. Fine. It 
was almost dawn when Phil left. And it must have been hours later, close to noontime, when I felt myself being roughly shaken out of a heavy, troubled sleep. Pete, Pete, wake up. Uh, what? Hey, wake up. Come on, snap out of it. Huh? Oh, Phil. Gosh, I, I feel groggy. What, what was in that powder you gave me? Never mind the powder. Get your eyes open. Got something to tell you. Phil, what's wrong? What happened? Listen to me carefully, Pete. I went down to the office before business hours this morning and opened the safe to get the money out. Yes? The safe is empty. Empty? The securities are gone. Well, it can't be. Who else had the combination besides you and me? Only Ted Hale. Oh? Do, do you think that... I'll bet you a dollar to a donut he's gone. Come on, let's check. <laughs> Look, Pete. There's a light in the dark room. He must have got up early and beat me to it, to the safe. Ted, Ted, you in there? <laughs> Always the optimist, huh? Come on, open it up. Ted! Good heavens. Ted Hale hadn't gone anywhere. He was lying there on the cot. His head was a bloody pulp. It had been bashed in while he slept. With a long-handled coal shovel which lay there alongside the cot. Great Scott. He's been murdered. We stood there in a narrow dark room, Phil and I, and we looked at each other. There was a strange gleam in Phil's eyes. I tried to read the meaning of that gleam, but he averted his eyes too quickly. He dropped his gaze to my hands. I saw what he was looking at. My hands were... Black and grimy with coal dust. And on the grimy, coal blackened handle of the shovel, there was a fresh set of fingerprints. Phil, did I kill him? Did I kill him in my sleep? The same as murder? Phil, I can't stand it being a murderer. I'm going to give myself up. You'll do nothing of the kind. If you did it, Pete, you're not responsible. You do think I did it? And Myrna, too? I, I don't know. I don't know what to say. <laughs> Just think, Phil. Maybe, maybe tonight I might kill you or Henrietta. There's no telling what I might do. Rubbish. No, no, Phil. It's hard to believe, but there's the proof. I'm a murderer. I'm dangerous. There's only one thing to do. I won't let you do it. What else is left? Come on. I'm going to help you hide Ted's body. <laughs> How much further, Phil? Oh, there it is. There's the bridge up ahead. Okay. Here, help me with it. We had the body of Ted Hale in a sack with a pair of hundred-pound dumbbells to weight it down. Myrna's funeral took place the next morning and I had to endure the condolences of friends and business associates. But Phil and Henrietta stood by me all through. It'll be over soon, Peter. Then you can rest. Keep your chin up. I'll get rid of the stragglers. Look. Look who just came in. Where? Oh, Inspector O'Brien, what does he want, Phil? Take it easy, take it easy. Let me do the talking. I uh, came to pay my respects, Mr. Lang. Oh, well, thank you, Inspector. No trace of Ted Hale, is there, Inspector? I'm afraid not, Mr. Judson. We're combing the city for him, but I'm afraid he's got clean away. You see, uh... It was marvelous to see how calmly Phil could talk to O'Brien about Ted Hale. Knowing all the time just where the body was. Under that bridge. I glanced at Henrietta. She was watching Phil, too. You know, uh, know what I think, Mr. Judson? I think Ted Hale will never be caught. I have a very funny feeling that he's dead. that afternoon, I took a taxi cab, and I went down to police headquarters. 
I've asked to see Inspector O'Brien. Ah, oh, glad to see you, Mr. Lang. You're looking a little better this afternoon. I <laughs> feel better, Inspector. I, I feel better because I've come to an important decision. Oh, yeah? Inspector, I've decided to tell you something that'll startle you. <laughs> That's pretty hard to startle an old hand in my business. Go ahead, I'm listening. All right. Inspector, Ted Hale didn't kill Myrna. I killed her. That is, I think I killed her. You think you killed her, don't you know? It sounds crazy, doesn't it? But I assure you, I'm perfectly safe. Uh, just a second now. You either killed her or you didn't kill her. If you killed somebody, you know it. No, not in this case, Inspector. You see, I, I think I did it in my sleep. Both times. Myrna and Ted Hale, too. Uh, hold on now. I'll get someone to take notes. I suppose you start from the beginning. I told him the whole story. I feel it awaken me. We found Myrna strangled. The groggy, drug feeling I'd had. How Ted Hale had tried to blackmail me. And how Phil had awakened me once more and we'd gone down to the cellar. We found Ted with his head bashed in. I talked for a solid hour. I'm glad you came to see me, Mr. Lang. Glad you've told me all this. You must have had a hard time reaching a decision to come here. Yes. Yes, it was hard, Inspector. Mm-hmm. Phil wanted me to go away. It would have been so easy to go away and let him take care of things. But I, I'd never be able to sleep for fear I'd kill someone else. Well, you needn't worry, Miss Lang. There won't be any more killings. Not if I'm safely in jail. You're not going to jail. You're going home. What? In those notes the stenographer has taken, Mr. Lang, I have almost enough material to convict the real murder. I need just one more thing. Now, I, you go home and wait. Don't worry. You, you mean I, I, did, I didn't kill Myrna and Ted? Now, you just go along home and take it easy. I'm back at home now. It's two hours since I left O'Brien's office, and I've taken the time to write down this full account, just as I gave it to the stenographer. As I write now, I can look across the lawn to Phil Judson's house. Five minutes ago, I saw Inspector O'Brien and two detectives go in there. The front door is opening now. I can see them coming out. O'Brien first, then the two detectives. With Phil between them. They've got handcuffs on Phil. And here comes Henrietta. She's running across the lawn. Coming here. Peter! Peter! Coming, Henrietta. Peter, they've taken Phil away. Yes, I saw it off in the window. Oh, darling. Everything went right. Exactly as we planned it. Oh, baby, baby. Hold me tight, Peter. Hold tight. We can be together now. Forever and ever. I'd have killed a dozen learners for you, baby. I know. And you were clever, Peter. So clever. And the hardest part was getting Phil to cooperate. <laughs> but I knew he'd do anything for a friend. What a fool he is. He stepped right in and took over. <laughs> you should have seen O'Brien when I told him the story. I could tell exactly what he was thinking. Here's a poor, innocent sap whose best friend is framing him. Giving him drugs and then making him think he commits murder. So sweet. Oh, Peter. <laughs> as soon as he's convicted, I'll be free. And we can go away together. All yeah, right. Huh? But you'll have to cancel that trip. Both of you. O'Brien. You... You heard what we said? Sure did, every word. <laughs> Remember at my office, Mr. Lang, when I told you I only needed one more thing to clinch the case against the murderer? Well, this was it. I faked the arrest of Mr. Judson. And then I sneaked back to see what you'd do about it. <laughs> you did plenty. Well, Pete certainly ruined a perfect crime by talking too much, which all goes to show that it's not wise to kill and tell. Mercy. <laughs> People do go out of their way to get themselves into trouble, don't they, Mr. Host? I'm really surprised at Henrietta, though. 
For being a partner in crime, Mary. No, for not being a partner to her husband. Oh. Most women, you know, take great pride in looking out for their husband's happiness. Mm -hmm. You mean like mending the bullet holes in their shirts? Oh, Mr. Host, <laughs> there are lots of better ways than that to keep a husband happy. For example, when your husband comes home from work, give him the refreshment of a brimming cup of piping hot Lipton tea. Lipton tea makes a wonderfully pleasing drink at mealtime or any time. Because Lipton's is such a grand tea. So deliciously different, more flavorful and full-bodied. If you've been forgetting to get it, why not jot down Lipton's on tomorrow's grocery list now? Remember, Lipton tea always meets with favor because Lipton tea gives you brisk flavor. <laughs> And now, friends, a parting word of advice. If you ever wake up and think that you've murdered someone in your sleep, don't go to the police. Now, just take another powder, brother, and go back to sleep. <laughs> oh, by the way, this month's Inner Sanctum mystery novel is The Innocent Mrs. Duff by Elizabeth Sanksy Holding. And next week, the makers of Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup will bring you another Inner Sanctum mystery directed by Hyman Brown and called Accident. Does the wind whistling in your ears frighten you folks? Oh, now don't be scared. Because when you're pushed down an empty elevator shaft and you hit the bottom, nothing ever can frighten you again. It's just an accident. And you'll learn all the mystery of it if you're listening to Inner Sanctum next week. <laughs> Until then, good night. Pleasant dreams. Mm -hmm. <laughs> For a wonderful soup. Be sure to try Lipton's Noodle Soup. Lipton's is the extra delicious noodle soup that folks rave about on account of all those tender golden egg noodles and that honest-to-goodness chickeny flavor. Tastes like homemade soup that you'd spend hours in making, yet Lipton's is ready in a jiffy. Lipton's Noodle Soup mix costs less and makes lots more than ordinary canned soups. So get some Lipton's Noodle Soup tomorrow. And tune in next week for another Inner Sanctum Mystery. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Lipton Soups present Inner Sanctum Mysteries. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. All waiting to go through the squeaking door. What a long line. But everybody's here tonight. The line reaches right to the edge of the grave. <laughs> Been waiting long. What? Seven days and seven nights? Dear, dear, you should have not. I can always slip the latch string out and you could hang around properly. <laughs> Why, Mr. Host, people don't need a latch string to do that. Didn't you know that all our listeners hang on your every word? Oh, yes, Mary. There's no better place than Inner Sanctum for people to get the news. Or the news. <laughs> As a matter of fact, we have some good news for our listeners right now. Folks, there's a new delight waiting for you when you try Lipton tea. Now, many of you may have been drinking tea for years, but until you taste Lipton's, you just don't know the full pleasure of tea at its delicious best. Lipton, you see, has brisk flavor. In fact, brisk is the very word that tea experts themselves use to describe Lipton's spirited, full-bodied flavor. Unlike ordinary dull-tasting teas, Lipton's is never flat. 
but always hearty and satisfying. Lipton tea gives you more contentment in every cup. So do try it soon. It's tea at its tastiest. Lipton tea with that grand, brisk flavor. And now for tonight's story. It's an original radio play written especially for the Inner Sanctum by Hank Warner. Called Strands of Death. And starring Santos Ortega in the role of Henry. Do you love your wife? Do you enjoy buying her a handsome fur piece, perfume, jewel, or nylon? Do you wonder secretly what you would do if the finery you bought her was used by her to win another man so that she could leave you? Oh, you can't answer, can you? Well, this is the story of one man who can. Meek, mild Henry Turner. I should have known at once. That morning in the office, when Judson was reading the newspaper aloud, that something was wrong. The unidentified body of a young woman strangled with a brand new pair of nylons was found last night. Unidentified? Yeah. In the hallway of a rooming house at 72 Beach Street. Unidentified? Near the body, which was fully clothed, police found a handbag containing a sales slip from the Silvertone Hosiery Company. Incredible. Police are at a loss to... Not always carried identification, charge account, keys. Much to discover. And a second pair of nylon. But if it wasn't Helen... No, no. Of course it was Helen. Well, that's a pretty piece of news, eh, Turner? <laughs> By the way, you bought some nylons for your wife the other day, didn't you? So what's the matter? Are you sick? Was I sick? Johnson wanted to know. Wonder what his face would have looked like. Had I told him right there that the police were wrong, that the body could be identified, that it was Helen, my wife. I went to the police. The body was at the morgue. Uh, this way, sir. Uh, here it is. Uh, steady. No. No, it's not Mrs. Turner. It's not Helen. I know how you feel. The shock of relief. But it wasn't relief. I walked from the morgue to our apartment. My brain was pounding with a question I hated to face. It isn't your wife. Who is it? If you didn't kill your wife, who did you kill? I didn't know. I didn't know. I got to the apartment. Weary, exhausted. Questions unanswered. My foot kicked a telegram that had been slipped under the door. I tore it open. It was from my wife. From Helen. The telegram was like a hand tearing the black curtain from my mind's eye. Could at last recall what had happened, what I had done, why I had killed a strange woman, thinking it was Helen. It swirled across my brain like a crazy picture. The night I came home after a hard day. Hello, baby. Hello. Gosh, I'm tired. Anything special for dinner? I could stand a good meal right now. What do you expect me to do? Slave over a hot stove for oh, you? Oh, Helen, please. I'm sorry. I'll enjoy whatever you've got. Maybe you will. But I'm sick of potato salad and cold cuts. Oh, well. That's all you ever say. Oh, well. Look, darling, I'm tired. Let's not argue. Please. After all, things could be worse. You get your permanence, new dresses all the time, shoes, hats. Why, well, you're the best-dressed woman in the crowd. I suppose you'd like me to wear a rag. Oh, that's where you're wrong, baby. You're a good looker, and you need pretty clothes. And you can have all my money can buy. Happy? Let's have a kiss, huh? Oh, I guess you're good to me, Henry. Let's eat. What I was really upset about, I suppose, is that I haven't got a single pair of nylons to wear with a new dress I got today. A new dress? 
Lovely, you like it. Black. I plan on wearing it tonight. Could look lovely with real sheer nylon. Tonight? Oh, I didn't tell you. Girls are having a bridge over at Margie's. I won't stay long. Do you mind, Henry? I'm not very hungry. I'll slip into the dress if you don't mind. Go right ahead. Mmm, dress sounds very good tonight. My compliments, Mr. Schmidt, darling. Hey, that is stunning. You like it? And how? Yeah, you certainly should be wearing nylons with that dress. Yes, sirree. Oh, well. Oh, uh, would you mind, darling? I uh, bought a carton of cigarettes in my briefcase in the hall, please. Oh, yeah, I'd better take a pack with me. Henry! Nylons! <laughs> oh, you beast, teasing me like this. <laughs> Oh, they're lovely. Think nothing of it. Anytime you want nylons, just call on me. When? Where? Did you have much trouble? Ma'am, did you say trouble? Nothing at all. I just stood in line for three hours at the Silvertone shop. Of course, it rained for about two hours. But after all, nylon. Oh, Henry, you're wonderful. Oh, I'm crazy about them. I put them right on. Oh, Marge and the girls will eat their hearts out. Ah, uh, if you permit my saying so, ma'am. You sure have a pretty pair of legs. Uh -huh. uh, don't be late, will you? Darling, I'll be back as soon as I can. Bye. I sat around listening to the radio and reading the paper, waiting for Helen to come back. Hello? Oh, hello, Marge. Uh, didn't, didn't she? Oh, uh, she went out about two hours ago. Why? Oh, well, just thought I'd tell her Silvertone's got some nylons. I'll tell her. How's your bridge party? Bridge party? Oh, well, that's tomorrow night. Be sure and remind her, please. I will, Marge. All right. Good night. Bridge party. Tomorrow night. Marches. I tried to sleep. I couldn't. I rolled around from side to side. Thinking. Thinking. Wondering. It was no use. I got out of bed. I paced the floor. I didn't dare call Dottie's. Oh. Hello, darling. Helen. Where are you? <laughs> Lake Placid. Third drive. Billy chartered a plane. Just like that. Took Dottie and her husband and me. Why do you expect to get home? Dressed and shaved, I don't recall. I don't know how long I walked the streets. My briefcase was in my hand. I must have parted from one account to another because my sales book shows that I took orders for some of my firm's new carpeting that day. These things I don't recall at all. But the line, the nylon line. It's strange that I shouldn't remember getting on it. All I know is that. Suddenly, I found myself part of it. How long I'd been on line, I don't recall. I told myself I had no business being on this line. I should have been out getting orders. But I felt chained to the line, waiting for the store to open. Finally, the line started moving. I asked for the same size and shade I bought for home. Then I saw her, leaving the store. I walked after her. Helen! Yes. Oh, I... I thought you were... Helen? Uh, yes. I, I hope you'll excuse me. Did you get some nylon? Yes. Sometimes I wonder whether it's worth the trouble just for one pair. So exhausting. 
I could stand a cocktail. Why are you looking at me like that? Where shall we have it, Helen? There you go again, Helen. You sure have Helen on your mind. Call me Louise. We had the cocktails. And then dinner. And I walked her home. In the hallway. This hall light seems to be out all the time. Well, it's been a lovely evening. You really need those nylons? I reached over to kiss her. She turned her head. Swung her back to me. I put my arms around her waist. Kissed her neck. What's Helen got that I haven't got? I got them for you, Helen. What shade? Rosy Dawn. How smooth and soft they are. <laughs> they look lovely against your pretty white skin. <laughs> Tickling my neck. What are you... They look, look lovely around your pretty white throat. I got them for you, Helen. Just for you. Bye, Helen. That's what happens in a dark hallway when a girl embarks on, um, shall we say, sheer folly. <laughs> oh, Mr. Host, to think there probably were people who would have helped Louise just inside that doorway. But they couldn't hear her, Mary. Nylon stockings aren't like chains. They don't rattle when they're wrapped around someone's throat. <laughs> well, at that hour of the night, folks aren't expecting murders on their doorsteps. <laughs> The family was probably out in the kitchen having a last-minute snack before bedtime. Perhaps the radio was on, and they were all listening to the latest news headlines. Meanwhile, Mother would be fixing up a plate of sandwiches and brewing up a pot of Lipton tea. For Lipton tea would surely be part of the picture. Served with a late evening snack, it gives a happy ending to the day. And because it's so relaxing and enjoyable, a piping hot cup of Lipton's adds extra delight to any meal. Why waste time just thinking about it? Why not get a package of Lipton tea tomorrow and treat yourself to its mellow, full-bodied flavor? Remember, Lipton's gives you brisk flavor. Wonder whether Henry's realized his sheer recklessness. Pretty thin, isn't it? Poor fellow has just strangled the weed. A nylon collie baby, if ever there was one. Under the impression he was killing his wife, Helen. Let's see what else he has to say about the telegram he just got from his dear, dear wife. The telegram I held in my shaking hands convinced me of the horrible truth. It wasn't Helen I had murdered. The telegram was dated the very night in which I had strangled the unidentified woman. Please don't be too angry with me. It is for the best. I've decided to marry Billy as soon as we can get divorced. I'll be home in a couple of days to pick up my clothes. Please don't be too unhappy. <laughs> Please don't be too unhappy. I wasn't. It was beyond that. I would never be unhappy again. Or happy. I felt only one desire. Kill Helen. I passed the nylon line again. The next day, walked by it. I was drawn back to it. I joined the line. I didn't move fast enough. I felt a slight bump from behind. I, I turned. I'm sorry. Helen... You must be mistaken. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> we got in just in time. They're closing. Sold out. Wish my husband would stand in line. 
Oh, dear, it's starting to rain. Can I drop you off? My car's around the corner. We drove a bit into the country. She was nice. Just bored. We pulled into a side road. Is out of town so much. My arm was around her shoulder. She snuggled against me. The same heady perfume. Helen's perfume. My free hand reached for the bag with the nylons. Thanks, dear. They hung around her like a necklace. I broke both hands and twisted. I knew sooner or later they'd get me. But I couldn't help it. All I knew was that I had to kill Helen. I knew I would have to kill anyone who reminded me of Helen. Until... Until Helen herself was home. Yes, Commissioner, we've got all the men out. Yes, I'm assigning Keating to it. I'll keep you informed. Goodbye. Uh, Keating. Come in, please. Commissioner on you again? Uh, we've got to do something and do it fast. The city's going crazy. It's only an idea, but it may work. Uh, you know the details. Both women wore the same size stockings, same shade. Both used the same perfume, same size clothes. Both pretty, same color hair. Eyes, uh, yours. Uh... Want me to dye my hair? Right. Now, those nylons, both pairs and the extra pairs found on the women came from the Silvertone shop on Madison Avenue. What about a fur coat? Can I take your pick of the two with the property clerk? He may lay low for a while with a panic on. Yeah, we'll have to take our chances on that. But if this is the work of a madman, and it looks like it, he'll try it again. Now, drop everything. We'll arrange to have you hang around the counter. The shade is Rosie Dawn, size nine and a half, fifty-one gauge. Well, there'd be more than one man asking for that. It's the Vogue right now, you know. Yeah, we'll have to take our chances. Yes, Mister, what's yours? Make up your mind, Mister. There's lots of people waiting. Oh, I, I, I beg your pardon. I, I was just looking over there. I, I thought I recognized someone. Size and shade, please. Uh, Rosie Dawn, nine and a half, 51 gauge. But down there, I'll get them. Rosie Dawn, nine and a... Rosie Dawn, nine and a half, 51 gauge, Lieutenant Keating. Thank you. Uh, would you mind stepping up this way, ma'am? This is the last box. That gentleman wants a pair, too. Well, not at all. Oh. oh, I beg your pardon. Helen. Oh, you must be mistaken. Oh, I'm sorry. You look so much like... How much, please? Dollar sixty-five cents. I'm sorry to keep staring at you. You still think I'm Helen? You could be. Well? Care for a lift? I'm taking a cab to 51st and 3rd Avenue. I don't mind. I live down near 2nd. Stop, driver. I told you, sir. Never mind. What are you looking at? That cab in front of the house. A woman getting out. My wife, Helen. Must be coming for her clothes with those bags. Hey, you are, Cabby. Keep the change. I'll just sit here until she goes in. So, hubby wanted to play while wifey was away. Uh, what, what's that? Oh, uh, I'm sorry. I, I need these nylons now for my wife. Oh, uh, uh, driver, take the lady down to Second Avenue. Uh, uh, then come back to me in about 15 minutes. What's the address, lady? I'll be getting out here, too, as soon as he goes into the building. Yes, darling. It's me. You scared me. I scared you? Mild, meek, adoring Henry? Your husband? Scared you? Don't talk like that, Henry. I explained everything in my wire. You got it, didn't you? Your wire? Yes, my darling. Made everything clear. Very clear. The cold and the wind and the rain. 
Standing in line for hours and hours for nylons. My darling. Don't come near me. Stay away from me. Don't be alarmed, darling. I brought you some nylons. Look. Pretty? I really don't need them. I got plenty. But you won't need any more after these. Stop it! You won't need any more nylons. I could hear her trying to revive Helen. It was no use. But she'd come in too late. And she bent over me. Summoning what strength I had, I grabbed her leg, oh, tripped her. As I had hit the wall, the gun dropped. I grabbed it. Better not. Get up. Sit in that chair. You're the nylon murderer, aren't you? Yes. You're a detective. Pretty smart. What are you going to do? Strange. I wanted to kill you. When I saw you in the store, Miss, uh... Lieutenant Keating... Now, now that Helen is gone, I, I feel at peace. I don't want to kill anyone. I know how you feel, Henry. I loved her. You believe that, don't you? Sure. She was no good. Get up. What for? Get up, I said. Now walk over to that closet. Go on. Open the door. Now turn around. Don't try anything or I'll have to shoot. Walk in. I'm sorry. <laughs> so sorry. Miss Kitty. Now... They can come and get you. Both of you. Kidding. Kidding. You all right? Nasty bump, Inspector. Did he get away? He, he was bleeding pretty badly. Now the blood leads into the bedroom. Oh, oh. Oh, crazy fool. He's hanged himself. With nylons. Crazy? I wonder. Cut him down, Brady. Well, too late, Inspector. There's a note on the floor. Let's see it. Miss Keating will understand. Do you, Lieutenant? Yes, Inspector. I do. Now, wasn't that a wasteful cup? Imagine cutting poor Henry down. Ruined a perfectly good pair of nylon. He should have untied the knot. Well, one way or another, it goes to prove that when you've got a case of nylon, you've got your hands full. As for poor Henry, one way or another, he faces a long stretch. Well, there's one good thing about it, Mr. Host. With Henry dead, ladies can stand in nylon lines once again without being afraid. Yes, Mary, tomorrow is another and a happier day for the ladies. Oh, but it needn't be just for the ladies, Mr. Host. Tomorrow can be a red-letter day for their families, too. That is, if they remember to put Lipton tea on tomorrow's grocery order tonight. How about that, friend? Jot it down right now so you'll surely remember. You'll be doing yourself and your family a good turn. Because you'll all love Grand Lipton tea. Everybody does. Because Lipton's has such delightful, brisk flavor. Because it's so satisfying and, and zestful. Don't let another day go by without trying it, will you? Tomorrow, be sure it's Lipton tea you ask for and Lipton's you get. Because Lipton tea has that wonderful, brisk flavor. <laughs> Ah, 
And now, friends, before I bid you a fond farewell, I must tell you about the wife of a friend of mine who smokes nylon cigarettes. Yes, it burns her up. She has to roll her own, but she sure gets a run for her money. <laughs> oh, by the way, this month's Inner Sanctum mystery novel is The Lying Lady by Robert Finnegan. And next week, the makers of Lipton Tea and Lipton Soups bring you another Inner Sanctum story directed by Hyman Brown. Starring Victor Moore, the famous Hollywood and Broadway star. It's called Murders in the Moor. A scalp-raising, toe-tingling story about a little man and a big knife and girl. Lots of girls. But most of them will be no good to anybody because they end up dead. <laughs> Until next week, then, and our special star, Victor Moore. Good night. Pleasant dreams. Hmm? <laughs> For tomorrow's lunch, let's see. Now, why not serve creamed salmon with peas? And lead off with a soup that's super, wonderful Lipton's noodle soup. You've never tasted better fresh-cooked chickeny goodness in your life than you get in homemade-tasting Lipton's noodle soup. Now, that I can promise you. It's easy to prepare, too, and costs less, yet makes lots more than ordinary canned soups. So why not get a supply tomorrow of Lipton's noodle soup? And tune in next week for another Inner Sanctum Mystery. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Soups presents Inner Sanctum Mysteries. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. When you heard the sound of the squeaking door, it was exactly 30 seconds past the hour for murder. But don't worry. We won't keep you waiting much longer. Even as I talk to you now, our hero and his victim are standing beside me, wishing I'd uh, dispense with formalities so they can get to more enjoyable pursuits. Like murder. <laughs> now, isn't it funny, Mr. Host? I feel the same way in hot weather. You mean the heat makes you feel murderous? Mm, now, this doesn't sound like our Mary. <laughs> Please don't misunderstand me, Mr. Host. I mean the heat makes me want to dispense with formalities <laughs> so I can get to more enjoyable pursuits, like serving myself and my friends tall, cooling glasses of iced Lipton tea in my backyard under the trees. Mmm, what grand iced tea Lipton's makes. So gloriously full-bodied, so full of zip. And it's that brisk Lipton flavor that does it. A flavor that's never flat, but always spirited and satisfying. You see, brisk is the word the tea experts themselves use to describe the livelier freshness of Lipton's. And those same tea experts agree that in iced teas, brisk flavor is extra important. That's why, for the best iced tea you ever tasted... You should always insist on Lipton tea. It's good iced because it's brisk in flavor. So keep a frosty pitcher of iced Lipton tea always on hand. Thank you for those cooling thoughts, Mary. Now into our sizzling thriller, Eight Steps to Murder. Written especially for Inner Sanctum by Emil Teppelman. This is the chronicle of a carefully calculated crime. A crime so twisted and subtle that it had to be blueprinted in advance. As Barry Kroger, in the role of Mark Durfee, the newspaper columnist, tells his story, we shall watch this crime develop, step by step, eight steps to murder. When I decided to kill Basil Archer, I went about it like an architect laying out the plans for a complicated building project. Only a fool leaves the details of such an undertaking to chance. I calculated every risk. I weighed every possibility of failure. 
I blueprinted each of the eight necessary steps I had to take. My first step was to get a suitable weapon. I went on Monday morning to the office of a pawnbroker I knew on 48th Street. Uh, good morning, my friend. Uh, how are you, Mr. Krug? Come in, come in, Mr. Duffy. Thank you. You know what I want? Indeed, yes. I have it here, exactly what you need. It's uh, fully loaded. You can spin the barrel and see for yourself. Mm-hmm. Nice revolver. Looks a little awkward. Well, you uh, you said you wanted it with the silencer attached. Mm, yes. Uh, how much for this, Mr. Krug? Uh, $250. What? That is the price, Mr. Durfee. You know, uh, it's against the law to sell these. Well, yes, but, but $250. You will pay it, Mr. Durfee. Well, all right. You know what I want this gun for. But naturally. You know, I'm planning to kill someone with it. But naturally. Otherwise, would you want a silencer on it? You wouldn't be above a little honest blackmail, would you, Mr. Krug? Uh, please, do not point that gun at me. It is loaded. I know that. What, uh, what are you going to do? I regret this, Mr. Krug. I'm going to have to kill you. No, I swear to you. Save it. You'll be sorry for this. You will make a mistake. You will make a slip. There'll be no mistake. There will. There will. You cannot think of everything. I have thought of everything. This is the first thing. You. You. You cannot think of everything. I left Krug's body where it lay and put the silenced revolver in my inside pocket and stepped out into the air. Stopped, stuck still. The rain suddenly coming down in buckets. I hadn't counted on it starting to rain. My alibi for Krug's killing was carefully planned. Everybody at my hotel thought I was still in my room, sleeping off a binge. The carefully staged a drinking spree last night. But if my clothes were wet, they'd know I'd been out this morning. I cannot think of everything. You cannot think of everything. I hurried back to my hotel, walking in the rain. It was too dangerous to take a cab. I sneaked in the service entrance, the way I'd come out, and walked up the one flight of stairs. As soon as I got my room, I took off my clothes, dropped them all in the bathtub, and started the shower going. Then I went to bed. At noontime, when the phone rang, I knew it was the clerk downstairs calling because I'd left a call for 12. I let the phone ring. That was step number two. A few minutes later, just as I expected, Ryan, the house detective, let himself into the room with his pass key. I pretended to be asleep, dead to the world. What a load he must have taken on last night. I heard Ryan go into the bathroom where the shower was still running, and then come out muttering and approach the bed. Wake up, Mr. Duffy. Uh, what? Oh, my head. Oh, you must have been as high as a kite last night. Oh. You undressed in the shower. You left all your clothes in the bathtub. They're soaking wet. I was safe. My tracks were completely covered. This was Monday afternoon. According to my schedule, Basil Archer was to die on Friday evening at 10 o'clock sharp. I was now free to take step three in my blueprint for murder. For this purpose, I went to Basil Archer's office. He was a theatrical producer, you see. His office was upstairs over the famous old fantasy theater where Archer's new play was to open on Friday evening. As I opened the door of Basil Archer's office, I was quite cool. I'd rehearsed myself well. Basil was seated at his desk talking to Gregory Sutherland, the young and handsome author of the new play. Hello there, Mark. Glad to see you. Hi, Basil. 
I just dropped in to get a line on the new play. You know Greg Sutherland, the author? Sure. Greg, this is Mark Durfee. Yeah, we've met. I tell you, Mark, Storm Over the Highlands is going to be the biggest hit of the season. Greg's written a fine play. Oh, I'm glad to hear that, Basil. Ought to go over big, especially with your wife doing the lead. Nina's a great actress. <laughs> Confidentially, that's one of the reasons why I'm doing Storm Over the Highlands. Just suited for Nina. Mm. Nina will be wonderful. Oh, I guess she likes working with you, Mr. Sutherland. It's always a good idea for the author and the star of a play to uh, work together. Oh? Have you and Nina been working together, Greg? Well, yes, Mr. Arch. We uh, sort of thought if we could exchange ideas. <laughs> <laughs> I never saw two people put their heart and soul into a job like Nina and Sutherland here. They spend every minute they can together. Now, look here, Durfee. I, I don't like the way you said that. Oh, I'm sorry, Sutherland. You know I didn't mean anything. It's... Uh... It's only what people are saying, seeing you both together so much. Uh, what's this all about, Mark? This is the first I've heard of anything. Oh, forget it, Basil. Oh, by the way, here's a package. I want to give it to Nina on opening night. I wonder if you put it in your safe for me till Friday. Why, oh, sure, if you want me to. Sure. I'll put it here, on the bottom shelf, next to the payroll money. Come in Friday evening during the first intermission, and I'll get it out for you. Fine. Are those all packages of money on the bottom shelf? Yes. Over 100000 in there. The receipts from my other shows. Here you are, Mark. All safely locked up. Uh, what kind of a present is it? I... I'd rather keep that a secret till Friday. <laughs> from Archer's office, I went straight to his apartment... I knew Nina would be home, and it was important that I talk to her now. Hello, Mark. I've been wondering if you'd come today. Oh, I told you I would, Nina. I've waited so long. Oh, darling. Oh, Mark, how long will it be now? How much longer? Only till Friday, darling. After Friday, you'll be free of him forever. And then you and I... Mm. There's work to do first. This is only the fourth step. There are four more to go. Mm. Everything's working according to schedule. The next step is up to you. What must I do, Mark? Oh, I've started the ball rolling. Basil's beginning to worry about you and Sutherland. Mm -hmm. He's got to be encouraged to suspect as much as possible. You've got to be seen around with Sutherland as frequently as you can. Oh, that'll be easy. Sutherland's hardly more than a kid. He worships the ground I walk on. But I'd rather be with you, darling. Mm. Just five days more, Nina. And then we can be together. Always. Outside Nina's house, I stopped for a moment with a queer sensation in the pit of my stomach. It was raining again. It reminded me of Mr. Cruz. Can't think of everything. You can't think of everything. I seem to hear Krug's voice drumming in my ears. Drumming. You'll make a mistake, oh. Mark Durfee. You'll make a mistake. I won't, Wolf. I won't. You'll make a mistake. Oh, poor Krug. You know, a pawnbroker's life is not an easy one, and... Krug took such an interest in his business. And he never suspected Mark Durfee. In fact, he probably liked him for his redeeming qualities. <laughs> Though, come to think of it, Krug was pretty lucky at that. Mark didn't steal anything from the store but the gun, so Krug lost practically nothing but his life. <laughs> you know, Mark's story gives me an idea. I'd like to draw up a blueprint myself. Yes, Mary, another blueprint for murder. Oh, now, Mr. Host. I'd call mine a blueprint for summer refreshment. And I'd like to do it in sound. First, I'd start with the creak of porch rockers on shaded summer streets and the murmur of backyard gardener in the lilac dust. And with the teensters home from school, there'd have to be some sweet swing music, of course. And just to make my blueprint of summer sounds complete... You'd hear the tinkle of ice in tall, cool glasses. Glasses of refreshing iced Lipton tea. 
Yes, iced Lipton tea just goes with summertime fun and enjoyment. Lipton's has such a wide awake flavor. The whole family will love it. And that flavor, folks, is brisk. Yes, that's the secret. Lipton's brisk flavor is what makes iced Lipton tea taste extra good. So for a delightful treat to beat the heat, Serve iced tea, and for the best iced tea ever, insist on Lipton tea. Brisk flavor, never flat. Couldn't have done better myself, Mary. But now, let's catch up with our architect of murder. If Mark Durfee's blueprint works out according to schedule, our death rate should go up sharply to about one per person. Let's see. He should be up to his fifth step by now, shouldn't he? Tuesday was a clear day without rain, and I felt better. I knew now that I couldn't make a mistake. In four days, Basil Archer would die as planned. And now for the fifth step. An easy one for Mark Durfee because he's a newspaper columnist. It merely requires dictating a little item for his column into the dictaphone at his desk. Oh, there's a new play opening soon, which should be a huge success... If the author and the leading lady can do anything to make it click. They're working harder on it than the producer himself. It looks like they've um, clicked with each other, too. And now, the sixth step. Eight steps to murder, and this is number six. Just a couple of telephone calls to set the sixth step in motion. Hello, Nina. Did you see the paper this morning? Mark, darling, it was perfect. Okay. I've had a half dozen phone calls. Everybody knows you met Sutherland and me. Oh, good. Basil saw it, too, at breakfast this morning. You did? How did he like it? Oh, he just looked glum. I don't think he believes it. <laughs> well, all right. Now, here's what I want you to do. Get hold of Sutherland and make him take you out tonight. Uh-huh. There's a fast little nightclub out on the island, the uh, Pirate's Hole. I know the place. Kind of disreputable, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, right. But now, look, you get Sutherland to take you there. You think you can manage that? Oh, he'll take me anywhere I want to go. Good. Be sure to be there tonight, about ten. I'll take care of the rest. <laughs> Speaking. Oh, hello, Basil. How are you? Mark Durfee. Now, look here, Now, now look, wait. Take it easy, Basil. I know you want to bore me out about that piece in the column. I thought you were a friend of mine. Oh, look, Basil, that's why I printed that piece. I don't like what's going on. Just what do you mean? If Nina feels like working with the author of the place, you Sure, sure, that's all right. But, but, look, why keep things secret? What do you mean by that? Well, you ask Sutherland if he has any plans for tonight. I know what plans he has for tonight. He's going to stay home and work on some lines in the last uh, scene... Oh, 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 is that so? What are you hinting at, Mark? I'm hinting that you take a run out to the pirate's hold. You know where it is, out on the island? And you'll see how hard Sutherland will be working on the last scene. Hello? Mark, this is Nina. Oh, where are you? I'm calling from the pirate's hold. Basil was just here. Oh, God! Did he find you with Sutherland? Well, naturally. I did just what you told me to. Fine, fine. Everything is set for tomorrow. You're sure everything will be all right? Oh, yes, quite sure. Now, this is what I want you to do tomorrow. Just before the show opens, you'll take sick. Oh. Basil will have to put in an understudy for you. Yes, I can do that all right. Then you'll dismiss the servant. Yes. Now, remember this clearly, Nina. You're going to be my alibi for the hour between 9 and 10. Understand? I understand, Mark. I'll be over at nine. But I'll leave a few minutes later by the back way. Only you'll swear that I stayed till a few minutes after ten. Is that clear? Yes, Mark. And good luck. When I rang the doorbell of Nina's apartment Friday night, I knew that every step I'd taken thus far had been right. I couldn't fail. Mark, I was afraid you weren't coming. I was afraid something had gone wrong. No, no, no. Nothing's gone wrong. You sent the servants away? Yes, they're all gone. I'm alone. I can swear you were here till after ten. Good. How, how are you... How are you going to kill him? With this. A gun. 
What's that bulky-looking thing on it on the muzzle? Mm, that's a silence, Nina. Oh. Well, you better hurry, darling. You haven't much time. There's one thing more that I've got to do here before I go. Why are you pointing the gun at me? Because I'm trying to kill you, Nina, dear. Oh, now, Mark, I don't like that kind of joke. <laughs> it isn't a joke, my darling. Mark, are you crazy? You little fool. Did you think I'd go to all this trouble planning this thing step by step? <laughs> Did you think I was doing all of this for you? But I, I thought you loved me. I, you I... thought I was committing murder because I loved you? <laughs> oh, Nina, you're just another step in my blueprint. Now you've served your purpose, just like Krug. Krug was step one, you're step seven. Mark! <laughs> Made sure Nina was dead. Then I hurried out and went to Basil Archer's office. I had to be sure my timing was right. This was the eighth and the final step. I knew Basil would be in his office during the first intermission, so... Hello, Basil. Oh, it's you, Mark. Come in. I want to talk to you. What about, Basil? Mark, what's going on between Sutherland and Nina? Oh, no, Basil, you're not a fool. I, I can't believe it. Well, look, if you want proof, suppose you get that package out of the safe, the one I left with you. The package? Once I got well, the... You get it, and I'll show you. Well, all right. Uh, well, here's your package. Now, what do you want to show me? You still got all that cash in the safe, huh? You know, I always have it here. Yes, I know. Say, what are you doing with that revolver? Look, Basil. Look into the muzzle. What the gaps? Just right. Oh! I opened the package Basil had given me. It was only an empty box, nothing in it, but there was something here I could put into it now. I stepped across Basil's body, knelt before the open safe, and took out the neatly tied bundles of money and put them into the empty box. A hundred thousand dollars. It was well worth the months of planning, the careful blueprinting. I was a rich man. Now I was ready for the finale, the last bit of routine business, which would finish the whole thing off properly. Pick up the phone and dial police headquarters. It wouldn't be too difficult to imitate Basil Archer's voice over the telephone. <laughs> I'd rehearsed that, too. Yes, headquarters. Uh, hello. This is Basil Archer speaking. I've just killed my wife. What's that? My wife and Sutherland, they were planning to run away together. They stole all the money from my safe and were going away. So I killed her. And now I'm going to kill myself, too. Now wait, Mr. Archer. Now wait a minute. Don't do anything rash. Just stay there and we send the radio. Now. Now everything was set. Carefully, I placed the revolver in Basil's cold hand and left no prints on it because I was wearing gloves. I picked up the package and walked out into the hall. But in the hall, I stopped short. Someone had just come into the building downstairs. I peered down and I saw Gregory Sutherland coming up. Mr. Archer! Are you up there? You better hurry. The second act is started. Sutherland was coming up the stairs. I couldn't get out. But I wasn't trapped. Oh, no. There was a porter's closet down the hall. I tiptoed over to it and slipped inside just as Sutherland got to the landing. Mr. Archer, are you in there? Sutherland was in Basil's office now. He'd be finding the body. This was my chance to sneak out. I opened the closet door. What, well, Kitty? Archer's office is one place up. Yeah, we can make it in time. The guy said he was going to kill himself. The police had come in answer to my telephone call. Now I couldn't get out. There'd be a crowd outside and I'd be seen leaving. I had to stay in the building. But still, I wasn't trapped. I knew just what to do. Instead of leaving the building, I would walk out of the closet and into Basil's office right after the police. They'd think I'd just arrived. I stepped out of the porter's closet. I started for the door of Basil's office. Then, suddenly... Got a sick, weak feeling in the pit. 
pit of my stomach. I stopped stock still. I'd almost walked in to my death. It was raining outside. Suppose I'd walked in there with my clothes all dry, claiming that I'd just come in from the street. They'd know that I'd been hiding in the building all the time. The rain, that rain, it almost tricked me again. You can't think of everything. You'll make a mistake. You can't think I can't, of everything. I can, you old fool. I'll show you. I hurried back into the porter's closet. I knew how to beat this, too. I turned on the faucet in the sink. Flashed and drenched myself from head to foot. <laughs> well, now, now, I looked as if I'd just come in out of the rain. I stepped out of the closet, went down the hall, and entered Basil Archer's office, dripping wet. The two policemen were standing over Basil's body with Gregory Sutherland. They all looked up as I came in. Oh, hello, Mr. Sorry about this. It's your friend, Basil Archer. Committed no. suicide. Oh, no. Oh, it's impossible, Sergeant Moran. Basil wouldn't do a thing like that. Why, who, who found him? I did, Mr. Durfee. I came to call him for the second act. Oh, this is terrible. He's taken open and shut case. Killed his wife, then came here and knocked himself out. Oh. And what's more, Mr. Sutherland? Yes? Before he knocked himself off, he phoned headquarters and said you'd stolen money from his safe. Well, that's a lie. A lot... Wait a minute. Sergeant. Uh, Mr. Durfee. Yes, Sutherland? How did you get yourself all wet like that? <laughs> oh, well, you try not getting wet in that rain. Rain? What rain, Mr. Durfee? Suddenly. Suddenly it went clammy all over. I saw that none of them was wet. Their clothes were all dry. But how, how could that be? They'd just come in out of the rain. What rain, Mr. Dorsey? Well, you, you can hear it, can't you? It's pouring rain. Just listen to that thunder. Thunder? Rain? Good heavens, that's the funniest thing I've ever heard. Don't you see, Sergeant? He's been in the building all the time. Trying to make us think he just came in and he got himself all wet for nothing. Sergeant, I bet you a dollar he murdered Archer. You're crazy. Well, it's pouring outside. You can hear it yourself. But just listen to that rain beating down. The thunder. You poor sap. That isn't rain you hear. It's my play next door. Storm over the highlands. Remember? And those are the sound effects in the second act. <laughs> Looks like Mark Durfee was all wet. In fact, he got himself so soaking wet, he practically liquidated himself. But cheer up, I'm sure he won't spend more than six months in jail. And that wouldn't be so bad, would it? If they weren't going to execute him afterward. Poor Mark. If only someone had told him. Uh, told him what, Mary? Well, look, Mark took eight steps to get in the cooler when you really only have to take one step to get cool. <laughs> sure, just step down to the grocer's and get a large economical package of brisk Lipton tea. Then keep a pitcher of iced Lipton tea always on hand and help yourself to its cooling refreshment off and on throughout the day. That's all there is to it. And you'll find Lipton's makes perfect iced tea because Lipton's is never flat. It always tastes delightfully tangy and full-bodied. That's why this summer, when you want iced tea, you should be sure to use the tea with the brisk flavor. Ask your grocer tomorrow for Lipton's. And so ends our little essay on the modern methods of murder. Of course, our little essays on murder are only for the select few. As a matter of fact, only one person in every 10,000 is capable of murder. Mm -hmm. And speaking of statistics, due to our high birth rate, the population of this country is increasing faster than inner sanctum can kill them. Very discouraging. Very discouraging indeed. <laughs> Oh, by the way, this month's Inner Sanctum mystery novel is The Panic Stricken by Mitchell Wilson. 
And next week, the makers of Lipton Tea and Lipton Soups will bring you another Inner Sanctum story directed by Hyman Brown and called Bury Me Not. Now there's a plot for you. A plot right in the graveyard. Trouble is the rain's come and uncover it. Hmm? What becomes of the body? Well, now, that's anybody he scares. But come around next week. We'll be right at the graveside, and uh, we'd like to have you drop in. <laughs> Until then, good night. Pleasant dreams? Hmm? <laughs> now that summer's here, keep cool by keeping out of the kitchen. Serve Lipton's Noodle Soup. It's quick and easy to prepare and gives you a delicious soup in a jiffy with so much less work and trouble. It's the perfect hot dish to serve with cool summertime suppers because Lipton's is luscious noodle soup with real old-time chickeny flavor. Besides, Lipton's noodle soup mix costs less and makes lots more than the usual canned soup. Ask for it tomorrow, Lipton's noodle soup. And tune in next week for another Inner Sanctum mystery. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. My name's Regan. I work for Anthony J. Lyon, Detective Bureau. They call me the Lion's Eye. For Jeff Regan, investigator, starring Paul Duboff as Regan, with Frank Nelson as Anthony J. Lyon. So stand by for mystery, suspense, adventure in tonight's transcribed story, A Claw, A Corkscrew, A Coffin, A Crab. There was about everything in this one. A claw, a corkscrew, a coffin, a crab, 67,000 clams, some deep sea fish, and Juliet. Case took me all over L.A., out to San Pedro, down to Long Beach. Took me 20 feet underwater where it looked like I wasn't going to come up. Yeah, but Juliet was where it started. Uh, Juliet Jones. Uh, now sit down, Jeffrey. Sure, sure, Lion. Uh, just the man I wanted to see. I was just about to phone you. Juliet Jones. Our new client. Uh, our new client uh, wants you out in Inglewood right away. Her life's in danger. That's so? Yes, yes. She wants protection. A bodyguard, Jeffrey. Uh, here, here's her address. Juliet Jones, 712 Garbanza Avenue, Inglewood. Oh, she was beautiful, my boy. Came here to the office an hour and a half ago. Lovely, lovely. And never, Jeffrey, in all my vast experience as president of the Lion Detective Bureau, has it been my privilege to see such a gorgeous... Uh, oh, and she had a voice, my boy. Well, it stroked you when she talked. And she smelled... As a matter of fact, Regan, she smelled of tea. Tea? She's a broken Pico tester. You don't tell me. Yeah, I do. She feels, smells, and tastes broken Pico tea. Is the very best, Jeffrey. Best black tea, of course. She wouldn't think of testing green or oolong, or so she said. Sure. Anything else that'll help? Well, uh, there was one thing. Now, now, we mustn't jump to any rash conclusions, Jeffrey, but everything she had on, everything was brand new and all very expensive. Very expensive. Maybe some guy likes her. Uh, yes, yes, I suppose that would be it. Look, Lion, if you think she's a phony, we just don't take her case. And now, Regan, don't start that. What's the matter? She give us dough? Julia Jones advanced us $400. That's a broth of clams. Yes, it is. Hey, look here, my boy. Just look. One, two, three, four. Four one hundred dollar bills. Oh, Jeffrey, is life wonderful? Life was. I drove to Inglewood. She was there. It was like the lion said. Hair tawny, eyes that were golden when she looked at you a certain way. And she looked at you a certain way. I found out the guy threatening her life was named Adam Garth. Then we found a place for dinner and danced. After nine o'clock, I was on time and a half. It's 
Jeff. Jeff. Yeah, Julia. Jeff, you make a wonderful bodyguard. I like my work. Jeff. Hmm. Just think, this is all we have to do for days and days. Till Adam Garth takes that slow boat to China. Hmm. You know, I'm going to be sorry when Adam Garth gets tired of trying to kill me. Because Jeff, in what reason will I have to hire my own rival detective? Lady, let's try fresh air. <laughs> oh, Jeff, I love <laughs> I know just where there is some. <sighs> let's walk along another few yards so the lights of the Long Beach Amusement Pier won't blind us. Yeah. Juliet. Yes, Jeff. Adam Garth. Oh, Adam Garth. Maybe I ought to take off and hunt him up. Are you just stay right with me? Sure, it's nice work, but if Garth is gunning for Jeff, you... Jeff, I explain. I looked at the guy once. He's a big lug, Jeff. All thumbs. In the brain, I mean. I looked at the guy. He fell over his thumbs. That could happen. Well, it isn't easy to be a girl like me, every guy's dream. Guess not. You gotta be triple careful, huh? I didn't do anything, Jeff, to encourage Adam Garth to think. He got crazy all of a sudden. He thought he owned me. You told him he didn't. He said if that was it, then, then nobody else would. I see what he meant. Adam Garth threatened to kill me. He said he. Jeff, he. He said he'd fix it so my beauty would never wreck another guy's life. You hired me to block his punch. Yes, Jeff. I want you with me every minute, all day, evenings, wherever I go, because, well, because. She stopped on the sand, stood in front of me, turned up her face, and that was when... <clears throat> Even Juliet's kiss didn't pack a wallet like that. Somebody sat me from behind. I whirled, half groggy, there was a black shape between me and the white cream of the surf. But I didn't even get my fists up. All right, Regan. Oh! Couldn't figure it out for a second where I was. It's like a dream. Far, far away. A big production and Juliet was in it. Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou, Romeo? Yeah. Wherefore? Coming out of it now, are you, Regan? Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. Your jaw where I hit you. All right? Oh, sure. Well, then you'd break it off out the sand, Regan. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. You can stand up. Fine, fine. Now, just sit down here on this bench. I'll stand in front of you. Thanks, I'll stand. Sit, Regan. Yeah. That gun in your hand, yours or mine? Mine. Yours is in my pocket. Sure, that's how it would be. Juliet, take a walk someplace? That's right. She took a walk. With Adam, maybe? Why, yes, Regan. To get apples. Candied apples up on the amusement pier. <laughs> yeah, well, you're not Adam. You don't fit the description Juliet gave me. Squat, hairy guy, thumbs in the brain. You're a little taller, smarter. And I have my clothes on. Regan, quit kidding. Where's the money? I got 475 in my pocket. Oh, that's enough, lion's eye. You know me. You're one of those private investigators. It'd be hard to do any kind of a job. This time you took the wrong assignment. Working for Juliet Jones. That's right. Regan, I want $67,000. Just don't happen to have it on me. I didn't expect you to, but wherever it is, get it. Bring it to me. Bring it to you like where? I told you not to kid. Oh, why, you know where. Oh, and Regan, the police aren't doing this job for me, holding a gun on you, getting $67,000 from you. 
Maybe you're wondering why. Nope. Hadn't occurred to me they might. Of course not. All right, Regan. I'll be fair with you. I have a reason to keep the police out. When you come with the money, make it 66000 Keep a 1000 for yourself. Thanks. Here's your gun. Unloaded. See you around. He handed me my gun, walked off. He was a nice guy. Lovely. And he smelled. Yeah. Yeah, when he came up close and handed me my gun, I caught a whiff of... I couldn't place it the first second, but then I remember what the lion had said about Juliet Jones. He'd said she was lovely. He said she was lovely and smelled of tea. That was it. The tough guy that was 67,000 G starved, he smelled of tea, too. Uh, hello? Wake up. Oh, Jeffrey, it's half past ten. I've gone to bed. Where are you? Payphone booth, Long Beach Amusement Pier. Jeffrey, this is a toll call. <laughs> That's right. Lion, when Julia Jones talked at the office this afternoon, she said she was a tea tester, even smelled of tea from being around it so much. Uh, Jeffrey, if you call me in the middle of the night, half past ten, a, a 25 cent toll call, a 30 cent, or whatever it is. Did she say to... where she tested tea? Uh, where she works, you mean? I can't remember a thing like that. Call me tomorrow. I... Jeffrey. Yeah, Lion? Julia Jones isn't with you. That's why you haven't asked her. That's it. Oh, Jeffrey. Jeffrey, my boy, nothing's gone wrong with our lovely $400 case. Mm, a couple of things. We're in the red on it. In the red? But we can't be. Why, why, I have the four $100 bills right here, Jeffrey. In this, in this chamois bag tied around my neck. Yes, yes, here it is, under my nightshirt. Well, with that 400 bucks taken away, we're only 66600 bucks in the hole on the case. That's the amount we have to cough up to get out. Jeffrey, Jeffrey! No. No, I understand now. I, I'm asleep. This is a nightmare. Regan, get out of my dreams! It's a nightmare, Lion, only you're not asleep. So shove your pillow between your teeth, fatso, to stifle your screams. I'm going to give you the rundown. <laughs> Lion whimpered, moaned, but he took it. One thing, story shocked his memory into double quick. He remembered where Juliet Jones had told him she worked. The Phelan Great East Importing Company place was called Tea Importers, San Pedro Docks. I phoned Juliet's house in Inglewood. Like I figured, nobody home. Tracks in the sand down on the beach hadn't helped much either. I just had one thing to go on. Phelan Great East. I drove out to San Pedro. Dark section, parked. Dark's empty. Streetlights far apart. I unclipped my shoulder holster as I walked up the dock. My unloaded gun might back up a bluff. All right, hold it. Voice out of the building shadow. Stand still, no moves. Who are you? Who are you? Private, Private detective. Like you I too? Si credentials? Sure, I got credentials. Trade your looks. Oh, well, that sounds fair. Over there, under the light. Yeah. Here you go. Here you go. Regan, private investigator. Beckett's private investigator. Here. Here. You're working tonight? Yeah. You? Yeah. Doc detail. Keep an eye on stuff for some warehouse owners. <laughs> Big shippers. Fat guys. Who you work for? I work for a fat guy. That's the way it is in this world. A smart work for the fat. Beckett. Yeah. Failing Great East Warehouse around here somewhere. Yeah, that's it up there. You go up the stone steps, turn into the alleys. A door in the alley. Yeah. See you, Peeper. See you, Peeper. I climbed the stone steps, turned into the alley, and then I saw high up behind shut blinds, light burning in one window. The door Beckett had told me about wasn't locked. Inside the warehouse, I burned my fingers with paper matches finding the stairway that led up. After that, it was easy. There was a light under a door on the fourth floor. You could just make out the single word painted on the door. 
Phelan. As I opened the door, the drapes swirled across the room. A door slammed behind them. I went in. Well, hello, Regan. Hello, Phelan. Oh, yes, that's right. It's on the door. Well, sit down. Sit down, Regan. I was just drinking tea. Two cups. Mm, that's right. One for Julia Jones. Well, maybe. It adds that way. She just went out that other door. You picked her up the same time you slugged me. You must have had a helper. Beckett's. Go on, Regan. Tell me what else you know. Beckett, the private investigator, works for you. I suppose I should have figured that. Man can't think of everything, Regan. You haven't thought of the 67 grand. Now it's smart of you, Regan, to see it in that light. Three quarters of an hour ago, you thought I was the one that stole your dough. Now you know the money was stolen. I didn't catch on at first, but you told me that on the beach. You asked me if I was surprised the cops weren't getting the dough for you. Only way that could make sense was that you actually had been taken for dough. You gave me the amount yourself, 67 grand. Only, Phelan, you told me something else. Yes. Yes, Regan. I said I had a reason not to go to the police. Here, have a cup of tea. No, thanks. <laughs> well, I understand. Darkened warehouse, waterfront docks. But I don't mean you any harm. Here, I'll prove it. Look here. The tea leaves in the bottom of this cup. Yeah. Well, I, I read them, you know. Now, let's imagine this is your fortune. Go on. Well, um, well, now, here. Now, this form in the tea leaves, a coffin. That means look out for trouble. And here, shape of a crab, you've got an enemy. And a claw, Regan. The enemy wants to kill you. See anything else? A corkscrew. Which means... Don't be curious. About why you don't want to go to the cops. <laughs> I guess you can find your way back downstairs, Regan. I'll see you around. Yeah. Maybe you will. I had the pieces of the puzzle. Jagged jigsaw pieces. Phelan of Phelan Gray East, tea importer. He'd been robbed of $67,000, was out to recover the loot himself because he was scared to go to the cops. My client, Juliet, was mixed up in it. That made sense. She worked for Phelan as a tea tester. She'd blossomed out all of a sudden in new clothes from head to foot. She had 100 clam notes to pay private detectives. Then there was Adam Garth gunning for Juliet, Juliet said. I hadn't met him yet, but I didn't have to wait long. I let myself out of Phelan Great East Warehouse by the door that opened on the alley. That was when I got a big surprise. Not who, but what she did. Jeff. Julia. I knew you'd come out this way. I've been waiting. How come you beat it out of Phelan's office upstairs just when I got there? I'll explain all that later. Right now there's something more important. The reason I've been waiting here, I've been hoping you'd get here in time. To what? Hold me. Huh? And you are in time. Not too early, not too late. Oh, Jeff, hold me. Hold me. Are you nuts? Jeff, I've got a good reason, a good, good reason. Jeff, you've got to hold me close to you and kiss me. You are nuts. Hold me. What? I think this will do it nicely. Now, stand back, Jeff. I said stand back. Lady, you skipped your rocker. Stand back, Jeff. I've got to get back from you now. I've got to get back. Jeff, stand back. <laughs> She hurled backward, flattened herself against the far wall of the alley, and then I saw. End of the alley, away from the docks, man standing watching us. He couldn't make out his face, but his posture, feet apart, right hand forward, meant gun ready. I sucked back flat to the wall across from Juliet. Six spurts of orange from the black silhouette. Yeah, but Mr. Jealous didn't score. Instinct, anger, threw my right hand to my unclipped shoulder holster, brought my gun to ready. Then I remembered. My gun, empty. Regan, why don't you shoot? No bullets, baby. Gun's not loaded. Oh, you stinking dumb sap. You dumb shamus, and I paid 400 bucks for this. You did, huh? What do you mean? You let go of me? Oh, no, Juliet. Exactly what did you pay 400 bucks for? Regan, let me go. Why, you little... Let go! Juliet ran down the alley toward the docks. 
Only I decided to play it away from the docks instead of toward. I couldn't go both ways, and the guy who fired the shots had disappeared in the other direction. It didn't figure he'd be hard to find. All I'd have to do was make myself available, and he'd find me. Only I didn't expect him to find me so soon. Walk straight ahead. Don't look back and don't try nothing. Okay, Garth. Hey, how come you know me? Well, I was born in the dark of the moon. Hey, don't make no gags. You're healed? I got a gun with no bullets in it. Don't make no gags. Well, it's the truth. Look, Garth, we've got things to talk about. I don't know who you are. I'll show you. No funny stuff. Sure not. Here, look. Jeff Regan, private detective. Here's my license. Hmm. Oh, looks okay. Garth, you stole 67 grand from Phelan. Yeah, 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 I did. That's right. Yeah, I did. You seem pretty set up about it. I stole $67,000 from Mr. Phelan. I don't know what come over me. I'm sorry I did it, and I am ready to go to prison and pay the penalty for my crime. Hey, wait a minute. Huh? Turn off the gramophone. I don't know what you mean. Garth, where's the 67 grand? Oh, <laughs> I was a crazy fool. I tried to double it. I don't know what come over me. I went to Las Vegas, Nevada, and I... Lost every cent of it. Yeah, yeah, that's what I did. Garth, you gave the 67 grand or most of it to Juliet Jones before you left. No, 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 that ain't what happened. Oh, yes, Garth. You gave the 67 G's to her. You went to Las Vegas to pretend to lose it gambling. You came back here to California. If Phelan had reported the theft, you'd have been caught. You expected that. You meant to serve your time. You figured it was worth it. Juliet waiting for you when you got out. Yeah, yeah, well, she will be. That's how we planned it. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Well, you want to start serving that time, Garth. So come on. Let's go. I drove him to the police station in Long Beach. I let him think Juliet's plan had just misfired. I didn't have the heart to tell him what a real plan was. When Garth was booked out of the case, I had other business. I wanted to see Juliet bad. And I figured I knew how to find her. She'd left her coat in the check room at the Long Beach place where we dined and danced. She'd be going there to pick it up. I'd wait on the pier and get on her trail. That's how it worked out. Hello, Juliet. Well, Jet. Jet, how could you... How could you possibly have found me here? Not tough. You unchecked your coat just now at the dine and dance place. I figured you would. And you followed me out here on the amusement pier. That's it. Well, I... Well, I'm glad to see you, Jeff. Sure, you are. In case Garth shows again, you'll want me to protect you. Well, yes, of course. Yes, of course, that's it. Sorry I lost you at the docks. Oh, well, that's understandable, Jeff. The confusion... I took off after Garth. I don't suppose you found him. No. No, I guess like you said, I'm a no-good dumb shamus. Oh, well, now, Jeff, I was upset. I wasn't responsible for what I might have said, what I might have done, Jeff, just You knew time. Garth was in range, watching. Yes, that was it. Why you wanted to get close to me, because Garth was around. Well, uh, yes, Jeff, because I was scared I wanted protection. Sure. Lady, you and I got things to talk about. Uh, things, Jeff? Things. Like a fall guy, like a poor dumb cluck in Las Vegas, Nevada, pretending to lose 67,000 bucks. Like that guy being willing to come back here, get caught, service time, expecting you to be waiting with the dough when he came out. You did find Adam Garth. I found him, and I didn't tell him all I knew. What else do you know, Jeff? Why you hired me. Oh? You wanted me to be around you all the time. Guard you from Garth, you said. Oh, no. You wanted to make Garth shooting iron jealous. Now, why on earth would I have wanted a thing like that? So he'd shoot, kill me, and go up for murder, and I'd kill him in self-defense. Either way, you'd have the 67,000 clear for yourself. Jeff, you... <laughs> you are smart. Thanks. Come on, we're going to the clink. Jeff. Yeah? Are you sure there isn't anything else we could discuss? Such as... Jeff, I, uh, I know a place we could talk alone. Just up the midway. It might be worthwhile. All right. Let's go. She was thinking of one thing, buying me off. I was thinking of something else. There was one little bit of the puzzle I didn't have as I went along. She wouldn't get away. Not where she took me, anyway. There was a big steel tank at one side of the midway. Tank full of water, water full of fish. 
And down into the water and fish, 20 feet down, spectators were lowered in a diving bell. Juliet and I bought tickets. Went down. The two of us. Alone. This one reminds me of you. That's a man-eater, isn't it, Jeff? Yeah. Long, sleek, beautiful. Tiger shark. Jeff, over here through this porthole. On this side of the diving bell. Look. Yeah, lady? Over there in that corner of the tank. Octopus. Could that octopus suggest you, Jack? I mean, tentacles reaching out in every direction. Reaching for whatever there may be to grasp. What you mean is, can you buy me off? I've got a lot to buy you off with, Jack. 67,000 years. And good luck. Good luck, Jack. And something else. The way you and I could make a lot of money. Blackmailing Phelan. That's what I came down to this diving bell to find out about. Yes? Sure, baby. So talk about Phelan. She talked about Phelan. Turned out all he brought in from the Great East wasn't broken Pico tea. In a couple of minutes, the last piece of the jigsaw was in place. I had leads that when the Federal Narcotics Squad had got its teeth in would send Phelan to the pokey for an even longer stay than Garth's and Juliet's. So that wrapped it up. Yeah, it wrapped it up. All of a sudden, I noticed something. It was silent in the diving bell. The air tube had stopped hissing. There were a couple of windows in the outside wall of the tank come on for customers by letting them glimpse the fish and the diving bell down in the water inside. Face appeared in one of the windows, grinned at me. Beckett! Phelan's Gunsel! Beckett drew his forefinger slowly across his throat. I was as dumb a shamus as Juliet said. Jeff, I can't... I can't breathe. Jeff, I... I'm scared. She passed out. I was next. Everything was getting wavery. Water. Fish I saw through the portal. Funny thing. One fish looked in at me. Looked like... Looked like my boss, Anthony J. Lyon. Lie. All right, now, all right, now, stand back. Stand back, everybody. Get him out of here. Please stand back. He's in a dangerous condition. Oh, hey, Jeffrey, <laughs> Jeffrey, my boy, are you all right? Oh, Lion. Lion, what happened? What well, happened? Uh, Jeffrey, I came here to the Long Beach Amusement Pier after you telephoned. I was worried about our $400 case, you see. Yeah. And when I got here, that man Beckett was looking into the tank, making suspicious gestures. You tangled with him. Uh, no, not exactly, Jeffrey. I found the operator of the tank. Uh, Beckett had knocked him out, Jeffrey. I revived him, threw water in his face, you see, and he and I managed to get air going to you and Juliet again. Uh, the police were attracted by the disturbance, my boy, and they rounded up Beckett, and they've taken charge of Juliet, too. Uh, All this time, I was as cold as a mackerel. Yes, yes, my boy, you were. But, Lion, one thing. Uh, yes, Jeffrey? How come you're sopping wet? Eh... Uh, Oh, well, uh, well, <laughs> it was nothing, my boy. I-, I saw you in peril in that diving bell. My heart overflowed. I dove in to save you. Save me through the steel wall of the diving bell? Jeffrey, I was going to tear those steel walls apart with my bare hands. Lion, you were going to do that for me? Maybe I've been misjudging you. Hey, Mr. Lion. Hey, hey, don't bother me, lad. Well, Jeffrey, we'll forget the past. Let bygones be bygones. In no man really sees another's metal till the test of battle. Mr. Lyon, please, uh, Get away from me. Stop bothering me, boy. Go away somewhere. But, but Mr. Uh, Lyon, uh, here's uh, your chamois skin bag full of money you dove into the tank to try to save. Uh, oh, uh, 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 money. Lyon? Uh, Lyon? Uh, now, 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 Jeffrey, uh, don't excite yourself, my boy. Uh, you've been a sick man, you know. Hey, Jeffrey, what are you doing? Oh, no! Not the tank again! <laughs> Thank you.
Jeff Regan, Investigator, was written tonight by William Fifield, produced and directed by Sterling Tracy, and stars Paul Dubov as Regan, with Frank Nelson as Anthony J. Lyon. Original music is by Decorant. Jeff Regan, Investigator, is heard transcribed each week at the same time over CBS. Alan Botzer speaking and inviting you to be with us again for more suspense, mystery, adventure with Jeff Regan, Investigator. Harrington, what time is it? It's just 10 o'clock, sir. You're due in the grand jury meeting. Yes, I'll go in in just a minute. But uh, close that door, please. Radio friends, this is your district attorney speaking. A group of racketeers has moved into this city and taken over the restaurant racket. We've been gathering information on them. But every restaurant owner has been so terrified he's been afraid to testify. But now we've got to start. One restaurant owner, Mr. Tony, was broken by the racket and sent to prison by then to keep him from talking. But we finally heard of Tony's plank and went to the prison and got him out. Now he's anxious to help us smash these racketeers. If you'll excuse me, I've got to go into the grand jury, which is meeting in the room right next to my office here. The grand jury is composed of 23 outstanding citizens who meet behind closed doors and hear testimony and decide whether that testimony warrants their issuing an indictment for the arrest of the suspect. What goes on inside the grand jury is strictly private, but I do want you to hear this one. Excuse me while I go in. Well, I seem to be a little bit Good evening, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. District Attorney, we've just been going over this information you've gathered about the restaurant racketeers. You say here that Mr. Tony is willing to work closely with you. Mr. Tony will tell me everything he knows. Well, uh, do you consider his life will be endangered by doing so? None at all. And we've sent his family away to a little cottage down south. No one but my immediate staff and myself knows where they are. We even changed Tony's own personal appearance. And I doubt if even his own wife could recognize him now. We've done everything possible to protect Mr. Tony and his family from the racket here. Who's there? The Ohio kid. Come in. You're late. Hurry up. I couldn't get here before, Duke. What are you sore about? Sit down. Want some peanuts? Ah. What took you so long? I, I had a date with a girlfriend. You're playing around with that dame too much. Now listen, kid, you got a job to do. Well, name it. You know Tony, that restaurant owner we had sent away? Sure, he's safe. You had him put in solitary so he couldn't talk, didn't you? Yeah, but he ain't there now. What do you mean, he ain't there now? Well, he put up some song and dance that he was a murderer. They kept him in solitary, but a member of the prison commission was going through the prison and heard about him yelling that he wanted to see the D.A. and confess a murder. This guy made the warden tell the D.A., and the D.A. went down to see Tony. You think Tony sang to the D.A.? Well, he must have told him everything, or why should the D.A. remove him from the pen? The D.A.'s got Tony out? Yeah, and he's got him hit away. And you got to find where, kid. Yeah, but... Can't you give me a steer at least? There's an awful lot of guys in this world, you know. That's your job. What do you think I've been paying you for? For getting guys out of the way, but not finding them in the first place. You do as I tell you, see? Okay. And get him before he spills everything he knows. All right, all right. And another thing. That dame of yours. She knows too much. Ah, she's all right. That's what they all think. I tell you, she ain't all right. I'm telling you, she'd up and quit you for the first good-looking guy that came along. Uh, what's the matter with my looks? I'm telling you to watch her. Now, if that day makes any trouble, you're responsible for her, kid. Just remember, if there's any trouble because of her, I'm holding you responsible. You've got a gripe, Duke. Now, don't you worry about me. I've seen too many guys get double-crossed by a demon and the whole mob suffers with him. I get rid of her, kid. Maybe. But lay off, Duke. You're just gripey today. She's all right for a while. And I'll get Tony for you. Well, you get Tony, and I won't say nothing about the dame. Now, go ahead and get Tony. Right now, they're having a grand jury meeting, and I wouldn't be surprised if they was working on some of the stuff Tony has spilled. Then we would like to have you arrest them immediately, Mr. District Attorney. This grand jury has decided they want you to arrest the men who are going around making collections from these restaurants. Uh, you say in your report here that Mr. Tony will be able to point them out to you. Uh, pardon me, gentlemen, but I believe that would be the wrong approach. The hirelings of a group of racketeers are merely weak characters who do what they're told. 
They would be harmless if it weren't for the big bosses of the racketeer gang. But if you don't get the big boss, the gang will be operating again within three months. I see. I guess your reasoning is right, Mr. District Attorney. Yes, I think You can arrest and arrest and arrest the small fry. But you haven't got anything when you get through. Just be patient. Gather the right information. And with one stroke, you can smash the entire setup. I see. Well, good luck to you. You do just what you think is best. I'm going out with Tony now to several of the restaurants. He's told me when the collections are usually made. And I hope we'll be able to bump into the collectors. But instead of going out with a warrant for their arrest, we're going out with a camera. Are you nervous at all, Tony? Oh, no, sir. I'll point out the collectors the minute I see them. You think you recognize them all right? Oh, yes, Mr. District Attorney. I paid them enough money. Just call me D.A., Tony. We know each other pretty well by now. I wish I'd known you better before I lost my restaurant. I was a fool not to talk. So this restaurant is Carlos, huh? Yes, he's a friend of mine. He wanted to hire me when I lost my restaurant, but he was afraid to. Uh, This is close enough. We can see you. Where? Those two men going in the restaurant now. They're the collectors. Shall I snap them, D.A.? Oh, wait until they get inside the restaurant, Harrington, and then go into action. If you can, get some good pictures of them while the owner is paying them off. And forget you one of those camera things. Just get as many pictures as you can, in or out of focus. They both carry guns. The heavy set fella hit me over the head with a blackjack one time. Look through this window, Harrington. There's better light. The owner is getting an envelope from the cash register. This will make a corking picture. Keep snapping, Harrington. Snap all you can. I've got them square in the lens. I'm taking so many, it'll almost be like movies. Well, let's get back into the car before they come out. Come on. We'll visit a couple of more restaurants with Tony. Now, Tony, you've been talking about one of the racketeers, Lucky Lynch. Do you think that he's the boss, the top man of the racket? No, D.A. There's another one they call the real boss, but I never heard them mention his name. I see. Did you ever hear Lynch refer to a boss? Yes, and I heard the Ohio Kid talk about one, too. The Ohio Kid? The gunman? Yes, D.A. The Ohio Kid always came to my restaurant with Lynch before they took it over. They'd come in and force me into a deal and... Then those two collectors you took the pictures of back there would come in and collect every month. I see. Tony, do you have any idea where the gang leaders could be found? Perhaps a restaurant that they may have mentioned as a meeting place? Uh, I don't know. I, uh, yes. Yes, I I heard them talk of the Harwich restaurant several times. Yeah, the, uh, the Harwich restaurant. Know where it is? Oh, yes, sir. All right, you tell Harrington where it is, Tony. I'd like to get a good look at it. Uh, keep at it just the way you are, Mr. Harrington. And then we'll turn to the right a couple of blocks down. So this is the... Well, the Harwich restaurant, huh? Harrington, get one of our investigators a job in here as a waiter. Yes, sir. If the racketeers drop in here, we ought to be able to pick up something good. Tony... Take a look into that window and see if you can see any of them in there now. Oh, they probably ain't going to... Wait. Yes. Sitting at that table near the bar. The man with the blonde girl. Who are they? Well, that's the Ohio kid and his girlfriend. Huh? They used to come in my restaurant sometimes. The, the fellow with the black hair all sleeked down. D.A., the girl's getting ready to leave. Shall I have a trail? No, not yet. It'll be easy enough to pick her up. I want to have a little talk with the Ohio kid, though. Oh, don't do it, sir. He, he'd just as soon kill anybody as not. You go back to the car, Tony, and drive it up to the next corner and wait for us there. Harrington, the kid's alone now. Let's go in and sit down at the table with him. Well, why don't you go with Tony, D.A., and I'll talk with him and join you in a few minutes. You don't want to bother with the likes of him. I've got a little idea, and I'd like to do it just for the fun of it. And we'll see you later, Tony. Let's go in, Harrington. Yes, sir. Hello, kid. Who are you? Mind if we sit down? Go oh, shake yourself. I want to be alone. We'll sit down anyway. Have a seat, Harrington. I told you I want to be alone. I don't know you guys. You'll know us soon enough, kid. Hey, if you guys are coppers, you're wasting your time, see? Don't jump to conclusions, kid. Don't you know it's bad luck to drink alone? Is it? 
Hey, listen, you. Get out of that chair or I'll blow you out. He's threatening us, Harrington. He wasn't expected from such a well-dressed gentleman. That's a nice flower you're wearing, kid. In about one second, you'll get plenty of flowers. What do you want? Kid, this is Inspector Harrington. I'm the district attorney. Does that mean anything to you? Not a thing. You got nothing on me. Of course not, kid. We just saw you here and dropped in to introduce ourselves. What are you drinking? None of your business. I'll discount the remark. Finish that drink, kid. Don't let us off stop you. I'm particular who I drink with. I said finish that drink. What's this all about, D.A.? I said pick up that glass and drink. Okay. You don't have to get nasty. Now, ah, you satisfied? That's all, kid. Now, beat it. You can't tell me what to do. I said beat it. I'll give you just five seconds. Okay. But I'll be seeing you again, D.A. He never said a truer thing in his life. <laughs> For a while, I didn't get what you were up to, D.A. Oh, so you caught on. Well, the kid didn't. Harrington, wrap the kid's glass in a napkin and put it in your pocket. I was watching how he held it. There ought to be some good fingerprints on this. We'll go back and have the prints checked. I have a feeling we'll find the kid has quite a history back of him. Hello, Mr. Harwich. Lillian. Uh, how about little kids? <laughs> Came as soon as I could. I told the Ohio kid I had some shopping to do. So I left him at the table, walked around the block, and came in the back door. I know. I was watching you. How could you see? Say, I don't manage this restaurant for nothing. Mm -hmm. Lots of times I like to sit in my office here and see what's going on with the diners. Now, look. See this piece of frosted glass? Yeah. I scraped a little off so I could sit here and see what's going on outside. Uh, and you saw me having dinner with a kid. Yeah, and I saw plenty of other things, too. Say, hey, you're pretty smart. <laughs> That's why I like you so much, Mr. Harwich. Yeah? Suppose the kid finds out. Our lives wouldn't be worth two cents, Lillian. I can handle him. Well, perhaps you won't have to much longer. You know what happened after you left that table? How could I? Two men came over and sat down with him. Who were they? The district attorney and one of his assistants. Did the kid know who they were? I think so. They talked a few minutes. Then the kid got up and left. But that isn't half of it. After he left... The district attorney and his assistant picked up the glass the kid had been drinking from. Uh, I don't get it. Why did they do that? Fingerprints. Oh. See, they'll check. And know who he is quick enough. I'll go and tell him. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Remember, your boyfriend and his racketeers have been bleeding this restaurant. Oh. And I happen to be a restaurant man. Yeah, but they're after to catch him now and send him to the chair. Well, suppose they do. He deserves it. Oh, I can't let him do that. Now, look. You said you were kind of stuck on me, didn't you? Oh, I am, Mr. Harwich. Honest, I am. Well... Well, what? Why go and tell the kid about the district attorney getting his fingerprints? Oh. You know, if the kid found out you kind of liked me, he'd kill you. Perhaps me, too. Yeah. And if I didn't say anything... Well, he may get what's coming to him. Yeah. Well, okay. You coming up to see me tomorrow? Well, I don't think I ought to take a chance to go to your place, Lillian. Suppose the kid found out. Oh, he won't, I promise. Bring up some other girl with you or something. Well... We've never had a chance to sit down and talk as two human beings. I've just seen you in the restaurant here, and we don't dare go any place together because the kid might find out and do something. Well, if you think it's all right, I'll come up. Please. Come up tomorrow afternoon. All right, if you say so. I'll see the kid doesn't know a thing about it. And Mr. Horwich. Yeah? I won't say anything about what you just told me. Thanks, Lillian. I'll be seeing you tomorrow. There are thousands and thousands of men in this country today who have been crushed by the rackets. There are thousands of homes which have been broken, thousands of men and women who have been killed or injured for life. Organized crime is responsible for more deaths and more money losses than a great war between nations. Each year in this country alone, the crime bill exceeds $15 billion, more than $115 for every man, woman, and child in the United States. The names of all characters in Mr. District Attorney are, for obvious reasons, fictitious. Mr. District Attorney, dramatized by Philip H. Lord, will be with you again Monday. This is the National Broadcasting Company, RCA Building, Radio City, New York. What's the matter? 
Carter, what is it? It's another case for Nick Carter, master detective. Yes, it's another case for that most famous of all manhunters. The detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Presented by the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux clear gloss varnish, Linux cream polish, and Linux self-polishing wax. Created by Acme, America's great producer of fine Acme quality paints. Today's curious adventure... Death. Goes to the post. For Nick Carter and the mystery of the unlucky jockey. In just a moment, we'll hear how Nick Carter was able to solve the mystery of what happened to the unlucky jockey and why he failed to win the big race. But now, here's a suggestion for you. It doesn't take folks long to learn what's worthwhile. That's why millions of wise American homemakers have discovered Chemtone, the miracle wall finish. That's why they're now discovering the new magic for woodwork, floors, and furniture. The three great Linux home brighteners. Linux clear gloss varnish to give lustrous, longer-lasting protection to every wood and linoleum surface. Linux cream polish to renew the sleek, gleaming beauty of fine furniture. And Linux self-polishing wax to lend rich, satiny loveliness to any floor, wood, linoleum, or tile. Take the modern shortcut to new home beauty with the three great Linux home brighteners. You'll find them all at your hardware, paint, or department store. Your headquarters also for Chemtone, the miracle wall finish. And now for today's mysterious adventure with Nick Carter. As today's story opens, it's near the end of the last racing season in World City. Nick and Patsy are walking back to Nick's office when Nick suddenly seizes Patsy's arm and says, Hold it, Patsy. What's the matter, Nick? That woman coming out of the pawn shop looks familiar, but I can't place her. She's a good-looking woman. Although if that blonde hair of hers is natural, I'm a Chinese grandmother. She doesn't seem to be connected with crime in any way, yet... And look who's trailing her. Hmm? Benny Retzel. I know him right enough. He's a private cop for the Mutual Protective Agency, isn't he? Yes, and they're a choice outfit not to get mixed up with. Their slogan is, you marry them and we trail them. Well, let them go. What do we care who's getting married or divorced? You can just mind our own business now, and wait go wait a minute. On... I'm going in the pawn shop. I want to ask a few questions. But why? What's it to us? Oh, probably nothing. Just curious to know who that woman was. Well, go ahead. Make a fool of yourself. She's probably nobody. Well, Mr. Carter here. Oh, so it's you, Al. Yeah, I swear to you, though, I ain't guilty. What's this you're not guilty of? Whatever you say I've done, I ain't. Oh, you probably have at that. Yes. But that's not why I'm here. Who was that good-looking blonde that just went out of here? Uh-oh. You should know her, but I don't. Eh, such a one she is. The wife of Colonel Pembert, no less. Colonel Pembert? The big horse race man? Yeah, that's the one. And you know, if I was a betting man, Carter, which I ain't, I'd see if the colonel had a horse running at the track this afternoon, and I'd put a bet down on him. <laughs> on the colonel or the horse? Such a question. The colonel, <laughs> he could win a horse race, maybe? Go on, Al. What's the story? Eh, it's just a hunch, that's all, but... Uh... When a dame asks me to give her $3,000 on a string of pearls worth maybe 10000 and swears she'll redeem them in 24 hours, and if she's married to a string of fast horses, well, you can make your own guess. And it would still be a guess. Take me to the races, Nick. Why should I? I want to win some money by betting on the colonel's horse. You know the colonel, don't you? Oh, yes, I know him slightly, but I hardly think that's... Oh, come on, Nick. It'll be fun out there anyway. I love horses. All right, but don't expect me to pay your betting losses. You're strictly on your own out there. Oh, it's always a thrill to me to be in the paddock, where you can see the horses close to. Gosh, they're such beautiful things. They certainly are. Oh, there's the colonel and his party. Let's stroll over there. Oh, there's his wife, too. Yeah. She looks more interested in the young man beside her than she does in the colonel. Maybe she is. He's much better looking. Not so old, either. Hello, Colonel Pembert. How are you? Oh, hello, Carter. Fine, thanks. I believe you know my wife. I don't, but I'm happy to. Thank you, Mr. Carter. This is Miss Bowen. Miss Bowen. How do you do? Oh, what a beautiful horse. Is that yours, Colonel? Uh, yes, Miss Bowen. That's Speed Queen, the winner of the next race. Oh. How do you know that, Colonel? Because she's ready. She'll run the legs off every other horse in the race. Better put something down on her. I don't believe a horse is really going to win when I see her trainer putting up some of his own money. Well, you'd see that right now, except that I never allow my employees to bid on any race in which we have an entry. <laughs> is that right, Dearson? That's right. It's only that rule of yours that's keeping me from picking up a fortune on this race. Well, I still say I'll believe it when I see it. 
the end of the race is the time to tell how good speed Queen really is. Shall we go, Patsy? Mm Mm-hmm. Right to the betting window. I want to put two dollars down on Speed Queen. She's too beautiful to lose a race. Well, Patsy, your friend Speed Queen is pretty far back in the bunch, if I can see straight from here. That doesn't mean a thing, Nick. You know it. Nothing, except that you're probably out two dollars. I am not. I'm going to win. Look at Speed Queen now. She's starting to come out. Say, she is at that. But now things seem to be changing. Speed Queen, who's been hanging in the back of the bunch so far, is beginning to pull up. She's passing the other horses as if they were standing still. Sunny Boy still in the lead with Nimrod close behind. Now Speed Queen is third and still growing strong. It's almost incredible the way she's running. Uh-oh, Speed Queen lost ground then when her jockey swung her wide to get around the leaders. Oh, too bad. Oh, no, look at that. She's coming up neck and neck with Sunny Boy. They're coming down the stretch together. Now Speed Queen pulling ahead. Oh, I'm a sucker, Emma. Look at that baby girl. Oh, Nick, she's going to win. She's going to win. I know she is. Looks very possible now, Patsy. She's certainly showing her heels to the rest of them. She can pass Sunny Boy now. She may make it. She's out in front. She's out in front. Oh, that was awful, Nick. What do you suppose happened to Speed Queen's jockey? We may never know, Patsy. He wasn't dead when he fell off his horse. The horses coming up behind him trampled him to death. Do you suppose he had heart failure? Maybe. And maybe not. When a horse that isn't a favorite suddenly comes up from behind to take the lead away from the favorite, and then something happens that lets the favorite win after all, I'm just naturally a little suspicious. Oh, hiya, Nick. Oh, hiya, Tim. Well, do you have anything on this race? Well, Patsy had $2 on Speed Queen, but you saw what happened. Well, she must have gotten the same tip I did. Now, Speed Queen was all set to win, but the big money didn't know it. I was so sure the tip was good that I put 100 bucks on her nose. Well, here's one ticket I'll never cash in. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Huh? Don't tear up that ticket. If you don't want it, give it to me, will you? Oh, you want a souvenir? Sure. You're welcome to it and anything you can collect on it. <laughs> Thanks. You know, if Speed Queen had one, that'd be worth 1300 bucks. Now it's just waste paper. Perhaps you're right, Tim, but I have a hunch. Come on, Patsy. Let's stroll down to the payoff windows. <laughs> Well, look who's at the $100 window. Pinky Deems. Never had over $5 on a race in his life. Nick, will you look at the handful of tickets he has? If those are all winners, there must be five or $6,000 there. Easily that much. No question about it, Patsy. Somebody knew something was going to happen to make Sonny Boy the winner. And for the sake of the poor dead jockey and speed queen, I'm going to find out what it was that did happen. Wait a minute. I'll be right back. Okay, Nick. Pinky? Pinky Deems. Huh? Oh, oh, it's you, guy. You give a guy the jumps grabbing at him that way. I didn't think you touts ever believed in your own tips, Pinky. Not enough to bet all that money on him. <laughs> you got me wrong, Connor. I didn't have nothing on this race. It was just hanging around. <laughs> I only got bus fare back to town. Uh, Pinky, I... I hold a $100 ticket on Speed Queen. I hate to be a sucker. A sucker? Oh, yeah, yeah. You, you sure was tough about the jock falling dead just when he was winning like that. Yeah. But lucky for those betting on Sonny Boy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but look, Carter, I got to go see a At guy. At 13 to 1, the ticket I have is worth $1,300. I'm keeping that ticket. Might be a smart idea for somebody to buy it from me. Huh? I'll be in my office until 4 o'clock. After 4, we'll be too late. Hey, I, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Just pass the word along. That's all. All right, Patsy. That's enough racing for one day. Let's get back to the office. You really think you're going to hear from somebody before four o'clock, Nick? It's almost that now. We have callers, Patsy. I'll get it. Yes? Okay, thanks very much. It's not a caller, Nick. It's a package. A package? Mm-hmm. What did I tell you? I'll be a... What is it, Nick? Look. Somebody's ear. Oh, Nick, how horrible. And there's a note. It says, Pinky, listen too hard. He won't hear you the next time you talk too much. If you do. 
So I was right. It was murder. You mean Speed Queen's jockey? Exactly. Give me the phone. But, Nick, I, I don't understand. You will. Hello? Daily Globe? Put Tim Rock on. Just a minute. What are you going to do? Oh, Tim Rock speaking. Tim? This is Nick Carter. Oh, hello, Nick. What's on your mind? Got a hot special for your final edition. Yeah, what is it? Quote me this way. The death of Speed Queen's jockey in the third race this afternoon was not accidental. What? It was murder. Hey, now, wait a minute, Nick. Are you sure you're... Run it just that way and quote me. Then you'll be in the clear. Yeah, but I can't just... Yes, you can. I've never given you a bum steer yet, have I? No, but well, I... Thanks, Tim. So long. That ought to stack something. Maybe somebody will try to buy that $100 ticket for me yet. Nick, you can't mean you're trying to blackmail somebody into paying you $1,500 for not investigating. Oh, you know me better than that, Patsy. I hope somebody will try to pay me the money so I can get a lead on where to look for the jockey's murderer. Because it was murder, and no mistake. Well, we've never known Nick to be wrong when he finally makes up his mind, but this looks like pretty slim evidence on which to make a charge of murder. Is Nick on the right track, or is he sticking his neck out looking for trouble? Can he prove the charge that he's just made? And how will he go about it? We'll see in just a moment. If you're a homemaker, you have every reason to take pride in a home that fairly gleams with the evidence of careful attention. And every wood and linoleum surface in your home will gleam when you use Linex Clear Gloss Varnish. Because Linex Clear Gloss lends a lustrous finish that keeps its beauty a long, long time. It lessens your housework amazingly, too, for it's so easy to keep clean. Dirt stays on the surface, where you can wipe it away in a jiffy. And Linex Clear Gloss is so simple to apply. You just brush it on, and it dries without brush marks to an elastic, transparent finish that wears and wears. A finish which protects every surface to which it's applied. Yes, it's a fact. Linex Clear Gloss protects all the wood and linoleum surfaces in your home against damage by boiling water, hot grease, fruit acids, perfume, even alcohol. In every way, it's truly the super varnish. Ask for it by name at your dealers. Linex, L-I-N-X, Linex Clear Gloss Varnish. You'll find all three great Linex home brighteners and Chemtone, the miracle wall finish, at hardware, paint, and department stores everywhere. Now, back to our story. Nick is convinced that the death of the jockey on Speed Queen was not an accident. In fact, he believes it was deliberate murder. But it's going to be a long, hard road proving it. It's later the same day as we look in on Lieutenant Riley's office at headquarters just as Nick drops in. Well, how are you, Nick? Haven't seen you around here in a dog's age. Riley, how many murders does it take to interest you? Murders? I haven't heard about any murders, but, but if you'll tell me where you hid the bodies, I'll be glad to look into it for you. One of the bodies was the jockey in the third race this afternoon. Uh-huh. What's your report on him? Uh, unavoidable accident it was. The doc says it was a heart attack, and the other horses was bunched so close they couldn't get out of his way when he fell off. Better change that to lead poisoning, Riley. Lead poisoning? You're nuts. Can you prove it? No, not yet. But the doc didn't mention any bullet wounds. Naturally not. How could he with the jockey's head all smashed up? But Another I... thing. A small-time tout by the name of Pinky Deems won't be doing any more touting from now on. Why not? He's dead. Murdered. If you don't believe me, put out a pickup order on him and see if any of your boys can find him. Do you know anything, Nick, or is this all guesswork? Two murders in the last couple of hours, Riley, and I may be the third. Yeah, come in. Lieutenant Riley, I'm mad, and I want Why, you... hello, Colonel Pember. Is something bothering you? Oh, it's you. Yes, you're bothering me. Why do you have to shoot off your big mouth to the papers the way you did? You approve of murder, Colonel? No, I don't. And I don't approve of rumors of murder, either. I demand that you retract your accusations or produce some concrete proof to back them up. I didn't accuse you of anything, Colonel. I didn't say you did. But it's a reflection on my stable and on the glorious sport of thoroughbred racing. Well, it's really all your fault, you know. My fault? Yes. You recommended Speed Queen so highly that I watched the race much more closely than usual. And what I saw led me to make the statement you see there in the paper. You say the death of my jockey was murder? I do. I say you're a fool. Maybe. But I'm going to keep on saying it's murder until someone does something about it. But, Nick, you, you must have something to back up this claim of yours. I have, but none of it's evidence yet. For one thing, don't forget that with Speed Queen out of the way, Sonny Boy won that race at very attractive odds. John Gainley, Sonny Boy's owner, made a sweet lot of money on the deal. Ugh, John Gainley's a crafty old bird, but he wouldn't murder my jockey. Uh, Colonel Pembert, before I go any further with this, I'd like to talk to your trainer. Dearson, is it? Dearson is no longer my trainer. I fired him a couple of hours ago. Fired him? 
Why? Oh, you saw the race. You saw the way Speed Queen's jockey pulled white on the turn, failed to take the fence. Probably just missed his cue, that's all. My trainers are responsible for all such things. I will not tolerate such blunders. That's a little thin, Colonel. Are you sure you didn't use that as an excuse to get rid of Dears? Now, see here, Carter. I don't have... Come in, come in. Lieutenant Riley, I demand that you... Well, hello, Pembert. Are you responsible for this? This stuff in the paper? I am not. What makes you think I'd do a thing like that? It sounds like one of your tricks. It was entirely my idea, Mr. Ganley. Oh. Well, what's your gripe? Did you have two bucks on Speed Queen's nose? My gripe, Mr. Ganley, is that a jockey who was supporting his mother and a little sister was killed so somebody could make money. And I don't like things like that. Also, I have a hundred dollar ticket on Speed Queen's nose that isn't worth anything now. Oh, blackmail. I get it. Just because my horse was a better horse than Pembert's, you kick when he wins. Your horse was beaten to a standstill when a rifle bullet gave him his chance to win. If you think you're scaring me... Mr. Ganley, I'm only trying to do one thing. I want to know who killed Speed Queen's jockey and why. I was there this afternoon. I saw nothing to indicate murder. Few men have ever seen a rifle bullet actually at work. But the medical report, Carter... A steel jacketed bullet won't leave much evidence of its passage in a skull that's smashed a few seconds later by a dozen iron shot hoops. Well, Riley, you got enough to start on? Gosh, Nick, I don't see where to begin. There's no evidence. Okay. But don't blame me if the commissioner gets on the phone and starts asking questions. But, Nick, I... You come in, Colonel Pembert. Just a minute. I want to talk to Lieutenant Riley a moment. Come on, Carter. I want to talk to you anyway. Privately. Why, of course, Mr. Gainley. I'll be seeing you, Riley. So long, Nick. So long, Colonel. Step in my car with me for a minute. We can talk quietly. All right. But I don't see what you and I have to talk about. It won't take but a minute. Now. All right, Carter. What's your game? I told you that upstairs. I don't believe you. You're sore because you failed to win your bet on Speed Queen. You don't really care for the jockey who was killed. You're welcome to think anything you like, Mr. Ganley. You think if you talk long enough and loudly enough... Somebody's going to pay you to shut up. Go on. Unfortunately for me, your accusation points directly at me. As the owner of the winning horse, I profited by the jockey's death. But I certainly didn't murder him. No one has accused you of murder? Yet. But they will. There'll be fingers pointed at me. There'll be investigations by the racing commission. How much was the ticket you have on that race? A hundred dollars. A thirteen to one, it's, uh, thirteen hundred dollars. Here you are. I trust we understand each other now. I understand that you've just given me thirteen hundred dollars. And I also understand that a jockey was killed in cold blood. But Carter, you... I said we had nothing to talk about, Mr. Gailey, and I was right. So long. Nick. Mrs. Pembert's been waiting over an hour to see you. Hello, Mrs. Pembert. What's on your mind? Could I speak to you alone? Whatever you can tell me, you can tell Patsy. We work together. Well, all right. Mr. Carter, I know everything. My husband told me this afternoon that you've been spying on me. Yes? Colonel Pembert was in a dreadful temper. He, he fired Dick, Mr. Dearson, and then told me about having you follow me. So that's why he fired Dearson. Yes, Oh, I don't know what came over me. I really love the colonel, but Dick, Mr. Dearson swept me off my feet. I guess I'm just weak. Why have you come here now? I must know, Mr. Carter. Have you told the colonel that I pawned my necklace this morning? Why is that important? If the colonel knew that I pawned my pearls and gave the money to Dick to bet on Speed Queen, then he must be the one behind the jockey's murder. He wanted to be sure that Dick would lose, because if he won, I was planning to run away with him on the winnings we'd make. Are you saying that your husband killed the jockey so you and Dearson couldn't run away together? Oh, it must be that. He must love me very much. I thought he didn't care. Did the colonel tell you I'd been following you, spying on you? Well, he said he'd hired a private detective to report everything I did. Mrs. Pembert, I'm a private detective, but I wouldn't touch one of those divorce investigations if I starved to death. Then, these things I've told you, you didn't know them? Not positively. You've given me some valuable information. Thank you. I'd guessed at most of it, but had no confirmation. Nicholas Carter's office. 
Mr. Todd is busy just now. May I take a message for him? Very well, I'll tell him. Goodbye. Well, that was short and sweet. What was it? It was Colonel Pember. <gasps> Colonel Pember? Yes, he said to tell you, Nick, that he was sending you $1,300 by messenger. He said you'd know what he meant. So the colonel's decided that he can't ignore my charges, and he wants me to drop them. Doesn't that prove what I just said, Mr. Carter? I don't know. Does it? He must be behind it. Oh, the poor man. I must go to him at once. You better not tell him you were here when his message came. Oh, I won't. Goodbye, Mr. Carter. Patsy. Mm Mm-hmm? Get me the mutual protective agency. Joe Brown. Okay. Maybe it's not blackmail, Nick, but it's certainly producing results. Yeah. Originally, I let it be known that I'd lost $100 on Speed Queen just to see what reaction I'd stir up. I wanted to get a lead on the killer. And now the money comes in by itself. Well, we'll give it to the Red Cross. There's no better use for any money than that. Hello? Mr. Joe Brown, please. Wish I had more to give them. Hello? Just a minute. Nick Carter calling. Thanks, Betsy. Hello, Joe. Have you finished that job for Colonel Pembert yet? Uh, what job? On his wife. His wife and Dick Dearson. Oh. Well, yeah. Just delivered the final report. Why? Well, if you're finished with it, you won't mind giving me Dearson's address, will you? He moved from his old place recently, I find, and left no forwarding address. Just a minute. 47 East Willow Road. You know, the colonel bounced it just a little while ago. Yes, I know. 47 East Willow Road. Thanks, Joe. Do as much for you someday. So long. What makes you think Colonel Timber's train is mixed up in this, Nick? How could he get in on it? He has some information I want, that's all. Oh. For now. So you better drive me out to 47 East Willow Road. And fast. Mr. Dearson? Well, he's left already. Any idea where he's gone? No, he packed his stuff and went out. Expressman's coming for his stuff in a few minutes now. He's meeting him at the station. This is stuff here? Yes, and three bags and a trunk. You mind if I look at them? Uh, suit yourself. It's a new trunk, Nick. Yes. The bags look quite new, too. Mm. I wonder if there are any tags. Here's a tag on the trunk. William Stewart, 711 4th Street, Evansville, Indiana. Yes. A new trunk. And yet... Well, what is it, Nick? Come on, Patsy. Let's meet Dearson at the station. See this headline, Dearson? Huh? What? Oh, it's you. I said, have you seen the headlines? It says Speed Queen's jockey was murdered. Who said so? I do. What do you know about it? Practically everything. How come you know so much? I get around. And I keep my eyes and ears open. For instance, I know that there's some connection between you and a certain William Stewart of Evansville, Indiana. Huh? What are you talking about? The tag on your trunk. Your nice new trunk. The trunk with the blood stains on it. I... I don't... Keep your hands in sight, Dyson. If you don't, I'll shoot first. That's better. Now, suppose we forget about taking the train and call on Lieutenant Riley instead. He thinks I'm nuts. But when you tell him what you know, he'll find out I was right all along. Get to the point, Carter. You didn't ask us here just to talk about the weather. Very well. Now that Mr. Gainley's here, let's get on with it. Now, you've each paid me $1,300 to hush up the investigation into the death of Speed Queen's jockey. You thought I was blackmailing you. But if you'd known me better, you'd have known I can't be bribed. I took the money, and I'm turning it over to the Red Cross. But I kept on looking around. And now I have the whole story. Well, if you've got the answer to this business, you can turn my money over to the Red Cross. And welcome... And I'll put as much more with it. And that goes for me, Carter. Now, now, what is the story? Briefly, it's this. Mrs. Pembert pawned her necklace and gave the $3,000 to Dearson to bet on Speed Queen. He thought Dearson was in love with her, but he wasn't. He just wanted her money. So he bet the money on Sonny Boy to win and arranged for having Speed Queen's jockey shot at the turn if Speed Queen took the lead. Pinky Deems put the bets down for him and collected his winnings. But I saw Pinky do it, and I spoke to him. I told him I should expect some action by four o'clock. Instead of what I expected, I got Pinky's ear as a warning to lay off. And I suppose that when I paid you that $1,300, 
You thought I was behind it. No, Gainley, I knew that you paid me to keep the scandal out of the papers if possible. You didn't want racing to get a black eye. Yes, that and you... was it. And you, Colonel Pembert, you paid me $1,300 to keep your wife from learning what a fool she'd been, didn't you? Yes, I knew she'd made a fool of herself over Dearson, and I wanted to protect her. I love her. And she loves you, Colonel. I know that. Can you prove any of this, Carter? Not much of it, unless Dearson confesses which I feel sure he'll do. But why should he confess, Nick, if you can't prove anything on him? Because there's one thing we can hang on him, fairly and squarely. What's that? Pinky's death. If you were to look in the trunk which Dearson just bought, you'd find Pinky's body minus one ear being shipped to what is undoubtedly a fake address. There were minute traces of blood in the trunk when I examined it. That alone will take care of our Mr. Dearson, who seems to have double-crossed everyone he came in contact with except himself. <laughs> Looks to me as if fate had double-crossed him, the way it turns out. Quite right, Patsy. Fate is a way of double-crossing those who don't obey the laws of right and wrong. In just a moment, Nick and Patsy will bring you a preview of next week's exciting case. You know that the more homelike the place you live in, the more fun you have inviting folks to share your hospitality. And these days, every home can look its shining best with very little effort when you depend on the three great Linux home brighteners. Take Linux cream polish, for instance. One quick, easy application reveals your fine furniture in all its original gleaming beauty. Renews the appearance of the wood. Frees it from the dull cloudiness of dust, old polish, and finger marks. You see, Linux cream polish actually clings as it polishes, cutting your job in half, saving one whole step. And when you're through, you'll find that Linux cream polish has left no oiliness on the surface of your furniture. It dries hard, bright, and dustless. Yes, in every way, Linux cream polish for fine furniture is the modern shortcut to furniture loveliness. Be sure to ask your dealer for it by name. Linux cream polish for fine furniture, which cleans as it polishes. You'll find all three great Linux home brighteners, Linux self-polishing wax, Linux clear gloss varnish, and Linux Cream Polish at your nearest hardware, paint, or department store. And now let's hear from Nick Carter himself. Well, Nick, would you care to give us a peek into next week's story? He'd be delighted to. He's been waiting for just that very question. <laughs> Thanks for the build-up, Patsy. Well, it's a story of an actor... An actor who, for some strange reason, seemed to be followed by a constant procession of almost fatal accidents. He was hurt several times, but always escaped death. What was it all about? Well, the manager of the theater, a friend of mine, called me in to find the answer to that same question. Which yeah. Nick found, of course, and just in the nick of time. Well, what do you call it, Nick? Death behind the scenes. Or the mystery of the persecuted actor. Complete details next week. So long. So long, everybody. And so long to you both, Patsy and Nick. Be seeing you next week, same as usual. Next week, the same time, listen to another curious experience of Nick Carter, Master Detective, entitled... Death Behind the Scenes. Or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Persecuted Actor. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is featured in Street and Smith magazines. Lon Clark is starred as Nick with Helen Schultz as Patsy. Original music is played by Lou White... And the programs are written and directed by Jock McGregor. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented at this time and over these same stations each week by the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux clear gloss varnish, Linux cream polish, and Linux self-polishing wax. Created by Acme, America's great producer of Acme fine quality paints. This is Ken Powell speaking for the thousands of Linux dealers all over America and saying so long until next week. This is Mutual. Another case for Nick Carter, Master Detective.
Yes, it's another case for that most famous of all manhunters. The detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Presented by the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux clear gloss varnish, Linux cream polish, and Linux self-polishing wax. Created by Acme, America's great producer of fine Acme quality paints. Today's curious adventure... Death Behind the Scenes. Or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Persecuted Actor. In just a moment, we'll hear how Nick Carter solved the mystery of the persecuted actor and prevented death behind the scenes from becoming a grim reality. But now, a word to the women. Millions of homemakers can't be wrong. For example, the millions who have learned what wonders Chemtone, the miracle wall finish, can do. And those same homemakers are now discovering the modern way to new beauty for their floors, woodwork, and furniture. The three great Linux home brighteners. Linux self-polishing wax, which beautifies your floors with a satiny, yet tough, no-skid finish that resists wear, water, and dirt. Linux cream polish, which cleans as it polishes, leaving no oily film on your furniture. And Linux clear gloss varnish, the durable super varnish that dries to an elastic, transparent surface, which protects all wood and linoleum in your home. You'll find the three great Linux home brighteners at your hardware, paint, or department store. Your headquarters also for Chemtone, the miracle wall finish. And now for today's mysterious adventure with Nick Carter. As today's story begins, we are backstage at the Republic Theater, where Charles Forrest is directing a rehearsal of his new play, Lord Byron. But it will not be possible for us to live our lives as we want to. We must live for those nearest and dearest to us. You're right, my darling. I see it all now. Nothing that may happen to us can ever change the fact that I love you. Love you with every fiber of my being. Love you with a depth I'd never thought possible. Nothing will ever change that. And I feel the same way, Robert. And I always... Well, well, go on, Miss Davis. She can't go on, Mr. Forrest. That's why Ma's cue to let her. And as usual, he isn't here. Oh! Oh, that's your cue! I don't see why we always have to wait until Paul Weimar condescends to honor us with his presence. We spend more time waiting for him to pick up his cues than we do rehearsing. Take it easy, Dick. You don't have to go griping about Weimar all the time. Paul, on stage, please. We're waiting for you. Coming, Mr. Forrest. Just a moment. Coming, Mr. Forrest. Why can't he stay here the way the rest of us do? You forget, Dick. Mr. Paul Weimar is a great foreign star. Who is? You coming, Paul? Oh, sorry to keep you waiting, Mr. Forrest. Oh. Paul, what's happened? It's, it's happened again. It's happened again. I can't go on. What is it, Paul? Another accident. Again, someone tried to kill me. This time, it's a sandbag that drops almost on my head. Bradley, what's going on up there? Sorry, Mr. Forrest. Blind holding the sandbag must have come untied. I'll take care of it. I'm through. I give up. Things break when I sit in them. Things fall over on me, and now, now this bag drops on my head. I'm sure it was an accident, Paul. Come on, let's get on with this scene. We open in three days, Oh, you know. I do not open in three days or ever. I'm through. Look, Paul, you can't quit on me now. It's too late. We're almost ready to open. I will not stay here and get killed. Paul. Suppose I get Nick Carter to come down here and find out what's going on. He can stop all these accidents you've been having. Will that satisfy you? You will get the great Nick Carter to make an investigation? I will if you'll stay with me. He'll see that nothing more happens to you. Yes, Mr. Weimar. Mr. Carter will protect you. Oh, shut up, Dick. This is serious. Will you get to work if I get Carter down here, Paul? Oh, very well. I will try it once more. But if there are any more of these accidents that nearly kill me, I shall go home and stay there, Carter or no Carter. All right. Betty! Take over the rehearsal. I'm going to get Nick Carter right now. You say you're having trouble with the new play, Forrest? I certainly am, Carter. It's supposed to be the life of Lord Byron, the poet. So that to play the lead, I brought an actor over from Paris. A man named Paul Weimer. He looks almost exactly like Byron, and he's a good actor. Doesn't sound like trouble so far. Wait. Ever since we started rehearsals, one accident after another has happened to Weimar. So that by this time, he's getting so jittery that I'm afraid he won't be able to go on with the play. Well, what kind of accidents, Forrest? Well, one time a heavy door almost fell on him. Just missed him. Another time, a chair he was sitting in collapsed under him and sent him to the hospital for three days with a wrenched back and so on. Today, the final straw, a heavy sandbag counterweight, fell on, almost on top of him as he crossed the stage. I don't blame him for being jittery. Any idea what's behind all these things? Neither one of two things. Either somebody's trying to kill Paul, or they're trying to scare him out of the show. 
And there's only one person, as far as I know, who'd profit by getting rid of Paul. And who's that? Richard Rowland, my American star. He was so upset at not being given the part of Byron that he swore he'd never act for me again. And suddenly he agreed to play the second lead, which surprised me, even though it is a pretty fat role. Hmm. Then if Paul Weimar had to give up the role for any reason, I suppose Roland would automatically step into the part? Yes, of course. Well, it certainly gives Roland a motive, doesn't it? Will you take the case, Nick? If you don't, I'm afraid Weimar will walk out on me, contract or no contract. Mm-hmm. When do you have your next rehearsal? Tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock, if the rest of the scenery is hung and ready. All right. I'll be there at 10.30 to look over the ground. Will you see to it that everything... I'll take it, Nick. Nicholas Carter's office. Yes, he's here. Just a minute. It's for you, Mr. Foster. Uh, for me? Oh, uh-huh. thanks. Hello? What? No, don't let anybody get away. Keep everything just as it is till we get there. Yes, I'm bringing him with me. Y- yes, yes, right away. Goodbye. That was Barry, my assistant stage manager. Roland is supposed to fire a shot at Paul in the second act. But when he fired just now, it wasn't a blank. It was real. Oh. Was why am I hurt? No, fortunately, the bullet missed him. Another accident, huh? Yes, another one. Heaven only knows what Wyman will do now. Let's get down there immediately. I want to start working on this before it's too late. Who wrote this play you're doing, Mr. Forrest? One of the best-known writers, Bert Lavar. Oh. A very rich man, a successful playwright. Right for his own amusement. Didn't I read somewhere that he doesn't smoke or drink and that he never married? That's right. He's a peculiar duck. What? No weaknesses? <laughs> no. There's a reason for that, Carter. He had a younger brother who went to Paris for training in art. He met a wild crew there, got to drinking and carrying on, and ended up in an insane asylum where he died a year or two later. Levan has never touched liquor or tobacco from that day to this. Well, I've enjoyed life for many years without smoking or drinking. Now, this is Ada. Yes, and there's Fred, my doorman, waiting for us. Fred, this is Mr. Carter. He's in charge now. Hello. Hello, Fred. Has anybody left here since the shooting? No, Mr. Carter. Nobody been out or in. And through this way, Mr. Carter. <laughs> quiet, quiet, please, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Mr. Nick Carter. He's in charge here now, and whatever he says goes. Now, that's Paul Weimer over there, Mr. Carter, and Richard Rowland next to him. How do you do? Now, first, let me get the facts. Oh, Rowland, suppose you tell me what happened. Well, in the second scene in the second act, Lord Byron is threatened by the husband of a lady to whom Byron's making love. I play the husband, and I'm supposed to shoot him. Instead of the old-fashioned pistol we'll actually use in the play, we've been using a small automatic with blanks. When I fired it just now, it wasn't a blank, but a real bullet. Fortunately, it missed Weimar, but I'm sorry to say it struck a stagehand who just happened to be in the line of fire. Was he badly hurt? No, it just scratched his cheek. Where's the gun you used? Oh, right here on the table. Hmm, 32 cold. Only one shell in it, and that's been fired. Roland, who has charge of this gun before it's given to you? Rogers, the property man. Get him, please. Rogers! Rogers! On stage! Well, everybody, please take the same positions now that you were in when the shot was fired. <laughs> This is about the way we were, Mr. Carter. Good. Is everybody here now? Where's Barry? Barry! Barry! Right here! I was off stage making a phone call when Roland fired, so I'm staying out of sight now. Okay, stay there for now. Where's the property man? Rogers, where are you? Here I am. Rogers, where were you when the gun was fired? In my property room. What can you tell us about this? Nothing. I loaded the gun, same as usual, with a blank. Anybody see you do it? Sure, Bradley, the stagehand was with me. Then I left the gun on the table and went out to talk to Fred, the doorman. And while you were gone, someone took out the blank and put in a real bullet. Could be. I wouldn't know. Anybody see anyone near the property room while Rogers was not there? Oh, come on. Speak up. Did you see anyone near the gun after it was loaded? Now, listen. If you know something, speak up. This isn't acting. It's murder. Mr. Carter. Did you see anyone near the property room after the gun was loaded? Well, yes, I did. My girlfriend and I were having a smoke behind one of the wings and we saw... 
we saw... Well, go on. Who went in there? Well, it, it was... was I, Carter. I went in there to find a match, but I didn't touch the gun. Oh, you did it on purpose, you jealous... Careful, Weimar. Don't start calling names. You shot at me on purpose. You want to play the leading role, Jack. Well, of course. Do you think Roland could have done it, me? No, it's too obvious, Patsy. Uh-huh. Right now, I'd like to have a look at the bullet that was fired from the gun. How could you find it? It could be anywhere in here. Oh, no, it couldn't. Look here. Uh-huh. It started from where Roland is standing. Mm. Went across the stage to where the stagehand is standing. Must have gone through those two flats behind him and into the wall. Come on. Okay. Now, if we line up Roland with the holes in these flats, we should find... That... Sure, Nick, there it is. In that big wooden post. Ah, yes. Let me get my tweezers. I'll have that bullet out of there before you can see. There. That was easy, wasn't it? Patsy, mm-hmm. look here. This bullet is a thirty-eight. The stage gun is a thirty-two. You mean that bullet didn't come from Roland's gun? No, Patsy. Whoever fired this bullet stood off stage and used the sound of Roland's gun to cover his own shot. But that... that would be murder. Yes, Patsy. Cold-blooded, deliberate murder. How much longer do you want these people, Miss Carter? Oh, they can go. I am through with them for now. That's all for today, everyone. Tomorrow morning at 11 sharp. <laughs> Mr. Carter, do you think I'll be safe now? Yes, you're safe enough for now, Ivor. And I suggest you go to your hotel. I'll see you there later. Uh, I shall do it. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Carter. Uh, before you go, Carter, I'd like to have you meet our author. All right, Forrest. Oh, is he the one in the stage box on the other side? Yes, come on over. You'll like him. Mr. Levan, yes? I'd like you to meet Mr. Nick Carter. Mr. Carter, Mr. Levan. How do you do? Glad to know you. Have you learned anything, Mr. Carter? Yes. The gun Roland used was not the gun that fired the bullet. That I know definitely. What? That means the shooting wasn't an accident? It means if the one who did the shooting had been a better marksman, Weimer would be dead right now. What's your next step, Mr. Carter? I think I'll go back to the office for a while and do a little thinking. Then I'll drop in on Paul Weimar and see what his side of the story is. Uh, shall we have dinner first? An excellent idea, Carter. I'll pick up my coat and hat and be right with you. I left my things in the box I was sitting in. I'll get them and join you in just a minute. I'll see you outside, Nick. I want a part of my house. All right, Patsy. Just have a look around while I wait. Carter! Carter, what is it? What, what's this trouble, Carter? Fall over something? No. Something fell over me. I started across stage and something knocked me over. Almost knocked me out. What's going on in here? Mr. Carter's had an accident. Wait, another of them accidents? That flower pot was on top of that pedestal. For some reason, the whole thing fell over on me. You, you all right, Carter? Yes, I guess so. But let's get out of here before the roof falls in on us. Well, you see, Patsy, it has to be that way. You say every member of the cast was on stage when the shot was fired. Yes, and they were all in plain sight of each other. That leaves only four persons, as far as we know, who were backstage and who could have fired the offstage gun. Rogers, the property man, Fred, the doorman, Barry, the stage manager, and the stagehand, Bradley. And Fred says Rogers was talking to him near the entrance, which gives both of them an alibi. Apparently. And Barry says he was telephoning, and we found that a call was made from that phone at that time, which seems to let him out. And Bradley was shot by the bullet, so he couldn't have fired it. No. Which accounts for all four of them. Which means there's something somewhere we don't know yet. That's one reason I want to talk to Weimar. He may be able to throw some light on the subject. Oh, here you are, driver. Come on, Betsy. All right. A clerk. Paul Weimar is in 279, isn't he? Yes, sir. Who shall I say is calling? Oh, never mind announcing us. We're expected. Well, what's the name, please? You must be announced. The name is Nick Carter, and don't announce it. But it's a rule to announce all guests. We can walk, Patsy. It's only the second floor. Well, why didn't you want to be announced, Nick? Just second nature. They don't know I'm coming to see them. They can't get ready to receive me. I like the element of surprise when I go calling officially. Hmm. Room 279. That must be right here. Oh, no, 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 you can't. Well, Paul Weimar seems to attract trouble as honey attracts a bee. What has happened now? Are his unfortunate accidents not confined to the theater after all? How is Nick going to unravel this tangled thread and reach a solution? We'll see in just a moment. Whatever your family's preference may be, in home decoration, your home is bound to be more beautiful when its floors are well kept and shining. 
And with Linex self-polishing wax, floors always look their very best without tiresome rubbing or polishing. Yes, with Linex self-polishing wax, which is simply wiped on, your floors are handsome for a long time because Linex self-polishing wax dries to a rich, satiny finish that really lasts thanks to its high content of genuine Carnauba wax. And the finish may be renewed wherever and whenever you like without re-waxing the whole floor. What's more, Linex self-polishing wax is easy to keep lovely for you whisk surface dirt away in a twinkling with a damp cloth. And Linex self-polishing wax is the anti-skid floor finish. For the underwriters' laboratories have proved by test that wood, linoleum, and rubber tile floors are actually less slippery after Linex self-polishing wax has been applied. Be sure to ask for Linex, L-I-N-X, Linex self-polishing wax. You'll find all three great Linex home brighteners and Chemtone, the miracle wall finish, at hardware, paint, and department stores everywhere. And now back to our story. We left Nick and Patsy racing toward Paul Weimar's hotel room, from which are coming cries for help. Oh, oh, oh. oh Nick, we've got to get in there. He's in trouble. I know. Let's see if I can open this door. Oh, hurry, Nick, hurry. You, you, you told me I wouldn't be safe here. What's happened? A man broke in through the window, tried to strangle me. Where is he now? He, he heard you at the door. He ran into the bedroom, went out by the fire escape. In here? No, there's no one in here now. Oh, fine thing. Even in my hotel, I'm not safe. You ever seen him before? Can you describe him? No, no. He, it was all too sudden. How long is this going on? I can stand it no more. Every day it is something. You say you never saw the man who... Oh, what's that? Yes, only the telephone, Mr. Weimar. I won't answer it. I won't. I won't. It might be trouble. You better answer it, Patsy. Take the message. Certainly, Nick. Hello, Mr. Weimar's room. Is Mr. Weimar there? Yes, but he can't answer the phone just now. May I take a message? Yes. Tell him Mr. Forrest called and wants Mr. Weimer to meet him in Mr. Weimer's dressing room at the theater at 8.30 tonight. Tonight? Are you sure of that? Yes, he was very specific. Said something about some revisions in the play that had to be made tonight to be ready for rehearsal tomorrow. All right, I'll tell him. Thank you. Oh, was it bad news, quick? Oh, not at all, Mr. Weimer. That was the clerk downstairs. Oh. She said Mr. Forrest wants to see you in your dressing room tonight at 8.30. Something to do with revisions in the play. And it must be tonight. Oh, oh, that is a relief. I must prepare myself to leave. You will excuse me. That's quite all right, Mr. Weimar. Patsy and I must be running along anyway. See you tomorrow at rehearsal. Good night. Good night. And thank you. Good night. Oh, splendid, splendid. I couldn't have arranged it better myself. Nick, are you feeling all right? Oh, never better, Patsy. Never better. But why all the unconcealed joy? I'd expected this case would come to a head faster now that I was in it. But I hadn't hoped it would come quite so fast. The end is now in sight, Patsy. You go back to the office and wait for me. Where are you going? To the theater. And I must get there before Weimar does, if his life is to be safeguarded. Here you are, driver. Keep the chain. Good evening, Mr. Carter. Why, Fred, what are you doing here at this time of night? You have to guard the door 24 hours a day? Well, no, sir. Mr. Forrest said he was expecting some crops about supper time, but they ain't come yet. Told me to wait for him, and I'm waiting. I see. Good. Oh, has anybody been here recently? I know. Uh, Brad was here about a half hour ago, but he only stayed a couple of minutes, long enough to get something he forgot, that's all. Mr. Forrest hasn't come down yet? No, he hasn't. Uh, was he coming back tonight? I understood so, but I may be wrong. Oh, is it okay to go in? I want to have a look at something. Oh, sure thing. I want some lights? Uh, no, thanks. I have my flash. Okay, watch yourself, though. This ought to be Weimar's dressing room. Ah, oh, yes. It's a cane he was carrying in rehearsal this afternoon. Uh-huh. Seems to be no concealed bombs. No booby traps. Well, okay for now. Nothing to do now but wait until he arrives. Oh, Mr. Carter, what are you doing here? I'm here protecting your life, Mr. Weimar, whether you know it or not. But uh, Mr. Forrest... Mr. Forrest knows nothing about this. 
The call you got came from the would-be murderer. He wanted to get you down here so he could finish his job tonight. Finish his job? How? What do you mean? That's what I want you to tell me. Oh, before you touch anything or sit down, look around this dressing room. What do you see that doesn't look natural in here? Not look natural? What do you mean? Oh, anything out of place. Something here that shouldn't be here. Something missing. Oh, I see. Now, uh... uh, Yes, yes. Someone has been smoking my cigarettes. I left nearly a fresh pack here, I remember. Now, look. There are only two cigarettes left. Ah, yes. I might have expected that. Will you have one? No, neither will you. Unless you want to die fast. Uh, I don't understand. Wait. Yes. These cigarettes have been treated with a deadly drug. One so rare that he could only get enough for two cigarettes. That's why the rest of the pack is missing, so you'd be sure to be killed almost at once. That, Mr. Weimer, was why you received the message to beat Mr. Forrest in your dressing room. You'd smoke at least one cigarette while you waited. And that one would be your finish. But but who wants to do this to me and why? I know the answer now, but I'd rather not say until I can produce the killer himself. As soon as I can, I... You interfering meddler, you'll never live... Sorry, I had to shoot out the lights, but I didn't want him to hit you. Mr. Carter, are you there? What is it that has happened? Stay here, Weimer. You're safe for the moment. I want to stop that man who just ran off. Your life's in danger as long as he's loose. Where are you going, Mr. Carter? Sit tight. I'll be right back. Fred! Fred! Yes, Mr. Carter? Did I hear some shooting? You did. Who was it just ran out here? Nobody. But he went out some way. I heard him slam the door. He must have gone out that little back door out behind the dressing room. You mean this isn't the only way out of this theater backstage? Oh, no. There's that other little door, but that's supposed to be kept locked all the time. That leads out to the other street. Oh, I see. Uh, Well, where's your telephone? Uh, Right there in the office, Mr. Carter. Good. Let me make one phone call and I'll show you a would-be killer. I tell you, you can't do this to me. Maybe we can't, but we are, so just pipe down. Why won't you tell me what I'm accused of? Because I don't know. I'm acting under orders from... That is, I'm doing what Nick Carter suggested. <laughs> and Nick's a pretty clever guy, if I do say so. Well, so you just... for those kind words, Riley. Well, where the deuce have you been? We've been waiting here in my office since... Yes, I know, I know, I know. I came as soon as I could. I got in a little traffic jam. Well, there he is. We picked him up just as he came in his hotel lobby, just like you said. Now, what do we do with him? He's the man who's been trying to kill Paul Weimer, huh? and who almost succeeded tonight. That's a lie. Is it? What did he have in his pockets, Riley? Oh, well, well you, you hear it is, Nick. It's the usual stuff. Ah, yes. The usual stuff. But not with the usual implications. Yeah, never mind those two-dollar words here. What do you see there that's so interesting? These loose cigarettes, for instance. There must be about ten or twelve there, about half a pack. Mm-hmm. And they're Paul Weimer's brand. You see what? And this little box, Riley. Mm-hmm. If you'll have your chemist examine these two cigarettes that were left in Weimer's dressing room, I believe you'll find them full of the same drug that was in this box. Well, you'll undoubtedly find traces of it there now. So, well, now you begin to make sense. This is all a pack of lies, a frame-up. It isn't either, and you know it. I am willing to bet that your fingerprints are on the doorknob of the little back door where you made your hasty exit from the theater tonight. What's that? Together with a few prints belonging to your assistant Bradley, the stagehand. And I imagine that Bradley will be very willing to talk when he finds he's up on an attempted murder charge. All right, Carter. You win. I did it. I hate that man, Weimar. But why should you hate him so, Mr. Levant? Because he was the leader of the gang in Paris who helped my brother drink himself into the insane asylum in the grave. He was more to blame than my poor brother, who knew no better. I wrote this play, Lord Byron, just to get him over here, where I could work on him. I suggested him to Forrest as the man for the part, and Forrest fell for it. Why didn't you kill him and be done with it? I wanted him to suffer as my brother suffered. But when you got into the case, Carter, I knew I had to finish it up quicker because... Bradley let you into the theater tonight through the little back door, didn't he? Yes. And it was Bradley who phoned the message to Weimer to get him to come down to the theater tonight, wasn't it? Yes. And it was Bradley who worked the backstage accidents after you had planned them, wasn't it? Yes, yes, yes. He thought it was all part of a practical joke. He didn't know I intended to kill that... All right, all right. Watch your language now. There's a lady present here. Well, I thought uh, everybody had forgotten about me being over here in the corner. I was just sitting here listening. You fired that shot during the rehearsal, didn't you, Levan? Yes, and I wished I had aimed straighter. How come you hit the stagehand? Pure accident. I didn't even see him until after I'd fired. In a way, it saved us from suspecting he had a hand in these things because it didn't make sense that he should get shot 
if he was in it. But after a while, when I began to see things the way they were going, I saw it could be nobody but you working with his help. Oh, well, Nick. Yes, Patsy? May I ask a question? Oh, yes, Patsy. One little one. Did you see who shot at Weimar in the theater tonight? No, it was all too fast. And how did you know it was Mr. Levan? Well, even before I got to Weimar's dressing room tonight, I felt quite sure that Levan was guilty. And then when I entered the room and found that it smelled very strongly of that highly scented eau de cologne that Levan uses, I was positive. Ah. By golly, you're right there, Nick. <laughs> sure, he smells like a perfume counter at the five and dime. Decidedly. That was the first thing I noticed about him when I met him earlier today. That was his only weakness, wasn't it? His excessive use of that scented eau de cologne. Well, maybe so, Patsy, but as far as I'm concerned, attempted murder is also a weakness. One that has to be punished. In just a moment, Nick and Patsy will bring you a preview of next week's exciting case. You want to take it a little easier? Then listen. Everybody's days are busy. We've all filled our daily schedules full to overflowing, doing our own home front jobs and helping with the all-out effort toward victory in every way we know how. So we appreciate more than ever before what it means to relax and how much easier it is to relax when a home is pleasant and inviting. American homemakers are learning how much easier it is to keep a home that way with the three great Linux home brightness. For example, they're learning that Linex Cream Polish restores the original handsomeness of fine furniture in one quick, easy application. Vanishes messy finger marks, helps conceal scratches, does away with cloudy old polish and dust. You see, Linex Cream Polish for fine furniture actually cleans as it polishes, saving one whole step in the cleaning day routine of busy homemakers, cutting their work in half. Let your fine furniture regain its loveliness with Linex Cream Polish. Remember always to ask your dealer for Linex Cream Polish, which cleans as it polishes. It's the streamlined way to furniture care. You'll find all three great Linex home brighteners at your nearest hardware, paint, or department store. And now let's hear from Nick Carter himself. Well, Nick, what's your story about next week? Next time, Ken, I'm going to tell you about an experience that Patsy and I had in one of the great movie studios. It started out very simply when the studio lost a reference book containing information about all kinds of poisons. You could look in that book and find out just what poisons to use for anything you wanted. It was much too dangerous a book to be at large. The unfortunate part of it was that I was called in too late to save the man whose body we found a few minutes later. Oh, but we did save the old man, Nick. If it hadn't been for you, he'd certainly have been killed. That's true enough, Patsy. What do you call a story, Nick? I call it Death at the Studio. Or the Mystery of the Murder Book. That's all for now. So long. So long, everybody. And so long to both of you until next week. We'll look forward to seeing you then, same as usual. Next week at this same time, listen to another curious experience of Nick Carter, Master Detective, entitled... Death at the Studio. Or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Murder Book. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is featured in Street and Smith magazines. Long Clark is starred as Nick with Helen Choate as Patsy. Original music is played by Lou White, and the programs are written and directed by Jock McGregor. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented at this time and over these same stations each week by the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux Clear Gloss Varnish, Linux Cream Polish, and Linux Self-Polishing Wax, created by Acme, America's great producer of Acme Fine Quality Paints. This is Ken Powell speaking for the thousands of Linux dealers all over America and saying so long until next week. This is Mutual. The Linux Show, starring Nick Carter, Master Detective, presented by Acme, America's great producer of fine quality paints.
This is the story of a man known the world over as one of the most daring and resourceful characters in the history of detective fiction. A man whose name has become a symbol of the triumph of right and justice over the sinister forces of crime and lawlessness. A man recognized as one of the great masters of deduction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Today's baffling case, The Witch of Dunderberg Mountain. Another exciting chapter dramatized from the life story of Nick Carter. In just a moment, we'll find how a curious old moldy coin lured Nick Carter into a strange community, brooded over by Dunderberg Mountain and a collection of macabre superstitions. But now, millions of American families are happier these days because women who run their homes wisely have learned about Chemtone, the miracle wall finish, which makes every home more bright and inviting. Now those same wise homemakers are learning the modern way to new beauty for woodwork, furniture, and floors. The three great Linux home brighteners. Linux clear gloss to give lustrous, longer-lasting protection to every wood and linoleum surface. Linux cream polish to renew the sleek, gleaming beauty of fine furniture. And Linux self-polishing wax, the amazing new wax finish to lend rich, satiny loveliness to any floor, wood, linoleum, or tile. Take the modern shortcut to new home beauty with the three great Linux home brighteners. You'll find them all at your hardware, paint, or department store. Your headquarters also for Chemtone, the miracle wall finish. And now for today's exciting case from the life of Nick Carter. Today's thrilling adventure starts in the usual place the gloomy old brownstone mansion at the corner of 4th and 5th. Yes, looking at that comfortable old Victorian mansion with its gay-flowered window boxes, its shiny brass door knocker and the bright and glistening windows, no one would ever guess that those panes are bulletproof. The doors, windows, and chimneys burglar-proof, and that on the top floor is probably the world's best-equipped laboratory for the scientific study of crime. As a matter of fact, Our master detective is at this moment closeted in his laboratory while Patsy Bowen, his efficient and long-suffering secretary, holds the world at bay in his second-story office and consulting room. Finally, the hidden door that leads to a secret passageway creaks open. And enter Nick Carter. Patsy, will you get that blame thing fixed? Not me. The way you gumshoe around without making a sound gives me the jump. Every time I think I'm in a perfectly empty room and suddenly look up and see you at that old roll-top desk which you won't let me throw out, as if you've just materialized out of thin air, it makes my heart do nip-ups. I just... Yes, Patsy, your grammar's a bit thumb-diddled, but I think I get your drift. You want me to stamp her on a bumper to furniture like the average man? I do not. I... Tell me, did you finish whatever it was you were puttering around with up in the laboratory? I did. I examined the shirt the man accused of the Pemberton murder was wearing the night Daly Pemberton was killed. But that shirt had been washed and ironed here. Quite so. The murderer made the common mistake of believing that a thorough washing and boiling would eliminate traces of his crime. But not with the modern benzidine test, sweetheart. No? Oh? Took me less than three drops to reveal the presence of bloodstains. Mr. Pemberton's blood. You needn't look so pleased. I'm always pleased when I've managed to end a criminal career. Murder so often becomes a habit. Well, anything happened when I was upstairs? Anything, everything. The mayor called, the head of freedom from Moravia called, Lieutenant Riley called, the butcher called. Trivia, all trivia. Anything worth bothering about down in the waiting room? Mrs. DeLacy Trump's pearls. What about them? Stolen. Tell her to report to insurance company. She can. Seems some gigolos liked them. She doesn't want her husband to find out. Not interested. Old Mr. DeWitt Hemingway's second wife has run away. She should have done it years ago. Not interested. Mr. Roger Winthrop, author and lecturer, has taken a house in some forsaken spot up the river. He's writing a history of the folklore and superstitions of the Catskills. He wants you I to... I never collaborate. Besides, what I know about the River Valley superstitions, and they're plenty gory, he can dig out of the records for himself. Not interested. Will you not jump to conclusions, Nick? He does not want you to collaborate. His servant has been hexed. The local witch has put a curse on him. And, and he's he... had a succession of headaches or corns or something. Tell him to wear a nice affetita bag. I believe that's a usual... It's remedy. too late. The servant, whose name was Jacob, died about dawn this morning. A violent and horrible death. 
His last words were something about a descent into hell. Well, why didn't you say so? You wouldn't let me. Send Mr. Winthrop up. Well, send him up. What are we waiting for? Keep your shirt on, Nick. I can't have him shot out of a cannon. Wait till I click my enter office gadget, can't you? Butch. Hi, Angel Face. Butch, Mr. Carter will see Mr. Roger Winthrop. You mean the guy with the ribbons on his glasses? Right the very first time. Okay, Mr. Winthrop. Hey, he's halfway up the stairs already. Hmm. Athletic for an author, I'm fancy. Come in. Mr. Carter, Mr. Nick Carter, where is he? Right behind you. Oh, Mr. Carter, I am... I know, Roger Winthrop. Author. I am now engaged in collecting data for my latest novel. In fact, I have already... Has this novel anything to do with your servant's death? Why, uh, no. Then skip it. Uh, of course. But if it weren't for the novel, I never would have rented the old Brocken house. And we'd never have met the old witch. You said witch? He did. You keep out of this, Betsy. What old witch do you mean, Mr. Winter? Who is this, uh... I'm Nick Carter's secretary, a menuensis, general factotum, and the lady who sews the buttons on his shirt. Now, let's get back to the witch. She sounds more... Interesting. Thanks. Of course, I don't actually think she is one. Still, the natives who live around the Brocken farm are quite convinced of the fact. It seems she's placed a curse on people before this, mostly young boys who taunted her or stole her fruit. Young William Tappan was thrown from his father's farm horse and dragged twice round the barn. Hendrik Vandervoort fell out of an apple tree and broke his arm. And Johnny Upsendike had scarlet fever and jaundice both at the same time. Seems to me I've heard of accidents like that happening to kids even without their being hacked. Yes, Patsy, but that's not the significant part of the narrative. What is? The boys' last names. Tappan, Vandervoort, Upsendike. I take it, Mr. Winthrop, the old rock and farm you've rented is in a Dutch community. It is. Up the river at the foot of the Donderberg. Wild, hag-ridden country. Mm -hmm. Those families settled there before the revolution and have married and intermarried ever since. All but the Brockins. They seem to have been disliked right from the beginning. Some say they aren't Dutch at all, but Hessians. Yes. Let me see. Brocken. Isn't that the name of that mountain in Germany where all the witches are supposed to gather on Walpurgis Nacht? Yes, that's why the Brockens are said to have settled where they did. Because old Donderberg, the local mountain, bears a strange resemblance to the Brocken. I see. Local gossip has it that on the eve of May Day, which, as you know, is Walpurgis Nacht, all the family and their cats, they've always had black cats, would swoop up the chimney on broomsticks and fly away to Donderberg Mountain for some sort of witch's Sabbath. Then this witch who's supposed to have hexed your servant Jacob is, I gather, one of the famous Brockens. She's the last of them. Miss Hermina Brocken is an old maid, and when she dies, the family will be extinct. And high time, too, if you ask me. Now, you don't really think she's a witch. No, but she's a vindictive, highly neurotic, I might even say dangerous female. And you think she killed Jacob? I do. She laid a hex on him last week. Made a rag doll out of an old scarf of his she managed to steal. She named the doll Jacob, of course, and then began sticking pins into it. And last night, or rather early this morning, he died. Tell me exactly what happened. Well, I rented the Brocken house for the summer. It seemed to have the sort of weird, not to say sinister, background I needed for my novel. Did Miss Hermina go with the house, Mr. Winter? Oh, no, no. She and her cat moved out to a sort of farmer's cottage. Oh. I insisted on that. I can't abide cats. Well, as I was saying, last night I was in my study scribbling away the better part of the night. It was a peculiarly black night, you may remember. This is what is called the dark of the moon. Yes, yes, I know. I know. <laughs> well, uh, finally I became aware that everything was unusually quiet. And then I realized I'd worked through the entire night, and this was that queer, unearthly silence that comes just before the dawn. Suddenly, I was conscious of a dull, muffled thud. A thud that was almost a plank. <coughs> what was that? <laughs> Curious how strange sounds become at night. Sounded like the clang of a coffin lid. <laughs> Better lay off work for tonight, Winthrop, old boy. First thing you know, you'll be imagining ghostly footsteps. Good Lord, what's that? Something's coming round the corner of the house. That's the tool house door. Someone's trying to get in. Oh, this is ridiculous. Better go see what it is before my imagination makes a fool of me. I'll take the lamp. It's probably nothing at all. Just the wind rattling the lock. But there isn't any wind tonight. <laughs> Pull yourself together, Winthrop. Down the steps to the woodshed. Yes, something is moving the lock. Someone's out there. Some. Wait till I unlock the door. I'm done for. Jacob, what are you doing out here this time of night? Jacob, what's wrong with you? Don't go near it. Don't go. She's right. 
They go straight down to hell. But I... I... Good Lord, he's having convulsions. Jacob. Jacob. And what happened then, Mr. Winthrop? Jacob died right there in my arms. It was horrible. As the death rattle left his throat, his right hand relaxed and something rolled to the floor with a metallic clink. I picked it up and brought it here, thinking it might serve as a clue to this whole horrible business. Let me see. Here. Hmm. Black with age. Looks like a metal slug of some kind. Betsy. Hmm? How about giving this a going over with that metal polish you keep around for polishing up doorknobs? With pleasure. Right here in this drawer. I keep it handy, Mr. Winthrop, because all the hardware in this old house is brass. And I always say, what's the good of having real brass furnishings unless you keep them well... Not interested, Betsy. Postpone the housekeeping. Well, Mr. Winthrop, from your description of Jacob's death, the panting, the dragging footsteps, and the final convulsions, I'd say he was probably poisoned. No possibility of suicide, I suppose. Of course not. It was the witch, Miss Hermina Brocken. I told you she'd put a curse on him. Curses don't cause convulsions, Mr. Winthrop. I never said they did. The point was, she hated Jacob enough to want him dead. Why? Well, I I suppose it was my fault in a way. I told Jacob to make up to the gold girl in order to get her to tell him all the local ghost stories. He unearthed plenty. Some of them, like the headless horseman and the crew of Hendrick Hudson who go bowling in the mountains whenever there's a storm, have already been recorded by Washington Irving. Yes, yes. Then there's the two spectral riders who are supposed to be the ghosts of Major Andre and General Benedict Arnold. They met and rode through that territory, you know, the night Arnold sold out to the enemy. Yes, yes. Then there's the story of a lost treasure that's supposed to be cursed, not to mention a bat woman and a black vulture who appears whenever there's to be a death in the valley. Interesting, but irrelevant. Why did Mr. Rockin hate Jacob? Certainly not because he worried those stories out of her. Well, no. As a matter of fact, I rather imagine Jacob overdid his attentions to the old girl. When she discovered he had a wife and five children in the Bronx, well, she turned on him like a vixen. It was all Peter and I could do to tear him away from her. She was trying to scratch out his eyes. Hell hath no fury and so forth. Quiet, Betty. Just who is Peter, Mr. Winthrop? A local character who does the gardening for me. He's, well, not exactly bright, but he can make anything grow. How does he get on with Miss Brocken? Scared to death of her. Carries a piece of cold iron in his pocket all the time he's around the place. If you touch cold iron, you know, a witch can't harm you. Speaking of cold metal, how's this for a handsome hunk of stuff? This shines better than our doorknobs now that I've got the tarnish off. Well, very interesting. That coin, Patsy, is gold. What? A British guinea, to be exact, minted in the reign of George III. In those days, coins like this were called traitor's gold. For Pete's sake, why? Every British soldier who brought in a member of Washington's army received one of these. And every member of Washington's forces who gave himself up got one, too. Where in the world do you suppose Jacob got hold of this? To answer that, we'll have to make a visit to the Dunderberg. Yes, Mr. Winter. I think you brought us a problem that's even more interesting than you suspect. Just what is the significance of the piece of traitor's gold found clutched in the dead man's hand? Is it connected in any way with the strange events which are happening in the shadow of old Dunderberg Mountain? We'll see in just a moment. Linux self-polishing wax is practical proof that there is something new under the sun. New beauty, new protection, new skid resistance for all your floors and linoleum. If you haven't used new Linux self-polishing wax, you haven't learned how different, how perfect the quick-drying wax can be. For Linux self-polishing wax, developed by leading research chemists to give you the best, lends a satiny appearance, a lasting protection, real anti-skid finish to every floor surface in your home. The formula of Linux self-polishing wax is completely new. It contains the greatest possible amount of genuine carnauba wax. And the underwriters' laboratories have proved that linoleum, hardwood, and rubber tile are actually less slippery after Linex self-polishing wax has been applied. When you walk on a Linex surface, you can actually feel the difference. Besides, it takes only a jiffy to wipe on, drying quickly to a handsome luster without tiresome rubbing. So it's just good sense to choose genuine Linex self-polishing wax. And, of course, if you want the modern-type finish, which is brushed on, or even longer-lasting protection, use Linex Clear Gloss Varnish. 
which dries overnight to a beautiful gloss finish that protects your floors and linoleum amazingly for months. Whichever you choose, Linex self-polishing wax or Linex clear gloss varnish, ask for it by name, Linex, and get the best. You'll find all three great Linex home brighteners and Chemtone, the miracle wall finish, at hardware, paint, and department stores everywhere. And now back to today's exciting case. As we pick up Nick Carter and Patsy, they are following Roger Winthrop along a desolate country road to the Brocken Farm, where Winthrop's servant, Jacob, has recently died a violent death. It is twilight, and the sinister hulk of the Dunderberg Mountain broods over the landscape. I'm not surprised that people who live around here believe in witches and curses and hidden treasure, Mr. Winthrop. If you'd spent a couple of months around here the way I have, Miss Bowen, you'd believe in superstitions, too. Things like that don't seem possible back in the midst of the city's traffic. But up here, time seems to stand still. Here, people are still living in the dark ages. I noticed as we came along, most of the barns had hex signs painted on them. Hex, have you noticed the clouds gathering behind that mountain? Yes. I imagine the old Dutchman will start their game of nine pins any time now. I hope we reach your house, Mr. Winthrop, before the storm breaks. It's just over the next rise, Mr. Carter. Here's the gate behind the lilac bush. Well, not what you'd call in very good repair. After you, Patsy. Thank you. That's the house down there in the hollow. And that's Peter sitting outside the tool house door. I gave him strict instructions not to let anyone move the body until you arrive. I know you detectives prefer to find your clues undisturbed. It's sometimes helpful. Why doesn't Peter sit inside the tool house? Because he's afraid of the dead. Oh. There's a superstition around here that the soul of anyone who's died a violent death is afraid of being alone and always tries to take along a companion. <gasps> oh, what's that? Something up there in that tree. It's there, silhouetted against the sky. A black cat. It's Miss Brocken's Hecuba. They're inseparable. If that cat's around... Then the Brocken female isn't far behind. I wondered who's been following us the last quarter mile. Nick, I didn't see or hear a thing. You... You don't mean she's invisible or something? Calm yourself, Betty. I'll admit she's kept out of sight. But no disembodied spirit breaks twigs and rustles dead leaves. She's been perfectly audible to anyone that took the trouble to listen. Hear that? She just stepped on a loose pedal. My teeth are chattering so I couldn't hear an avalanche. Oh, Nick, I don't like this place. Easy, Patsy. Oh, here comes Peter. Poor guy, he looks relieved to see us. I thought you was never coming. I told you I wouldn't stay if you didn't get back before nightfall. But we did, Peter. This is Mr. Nick Carter, the famous detective. Uh, He'll find out what killed Jacob. The light's fading fast. Better make our examination before it's completely dark. Oh, Patsy, it may not be nice. You want to stay out here? With that woman and her cat crawling through the bushes? And a storm coming up beside? Oh, thank you. I'm coming inside, no matter what's in there. Hold the flashlight steady, Betsy. It's horrible, isn't it? Mm. Extreme rigor mortis and marked satanic constriction of the muscles. Jaws too firmly clamped together to permit any investigation of the oral cavity. We can take a look at the inside of the lips. Hmm. Well, the poison, whatever it was, was violent, but I don't think it was administered by mouth. No. Well, let's see. Well, less than the instep of the shoes between the sole and heel. Heavy boots and corduroy trousers, no nothing the lower limbs. Ah, hands bare. Yes, yes, look here. The two small punctures of the right thumb. Yes. Winthrop, help me roll back a sleeve. Right, Mr. Carter. Ah, here we are. Two more. And here again. And again. And all the punctures have already started the gangrene. That's how the poison entered the body. Oh, how awful. It's the evil eye. Those two dents. It's the mark of the evil eye. They burn straight through you until you're dead. Interesting idea, Peter. But what killed Jacob was quite a bit more deadly than any evil eye. You mean you know who killed him? Definitely. The question now is to find where the killer's hiding. But, Nick, I... Let's see if we can get a line on how Jacob spent his last 12 hours. Get the small microscope out of my zipper case, will you, Patsy? Oh, and you might prepare a few slides. Right, you are, yes. Just exactly what are you doing that for, Mr. Carter? Uh, cleaning the dead man's nails, I mean. A good scientific detective, Mr. Winthrop, can pretty well deduce from what he finds under any person's nails where that person has been and what he's done for some time previous. Oh, a slide, please, Patsy. Here you are. This is my most powerful lens, of course. 
That flashlight isn't as strong as one could wish. Still. You had anything, Nick? Yes. Quite a few things. We ate a piece of chocolate cake for dinner with a finger support. Sawed quite a bit of wood. Minute bits of sawdust. That was yesterday afternoon. We also plucked a chicken recently and polished the furniture. Tiny globules of very fine oil. But the most interesting ingredient in the whole collection is a certain tiny spored mold of fungus. A great deal of it, as a matter of fact. Maybe you went out picking wildflowers in the woods. No. This particular fungus only grows in places where there's a great deal of moisture and where sunlight never reaches. Any place like that around here, Mr. Winthrop? Basement? Spring house? No, no. The basement's bone dry and there is no spring house. How about a well? There are few enough improvements on the place. No electricity, no telephone. But we do have a hand pump in the kitchen sink. Which means that there's a well under it. Jacob couldn't very easily get down into it. I'd say it would be absolutely impossible. Mm. Wait a minute. There's some sort of boarded-up stonework with a padlock out back of the barn. I remember someone told me it's a condemned cistern or well of some sort. Ah, yeah. that's the witch's well. You'll be wise to stay away from it. It's the way straight down to hell. The way to hell? Yeah. Weren't those Jacob's last words before he died? Why, yes, Mr. Carter. Come on, show me the place. Unless I'm very much mistaken, that's where we'll find the answer to this problem. Uh. At the bottom of the well. Sounds as if Henrik Hudson's crew had started a game of nineteen. Oh, that means there's evil abroad tonight. Nick, Nick, I just remembered something. Now what? Isn't tomorrow the first of May? That means this is Walpurgis night. When witches ride and graves give up their dead. Yeah. Yeah. That one sounded like a strike. This is the system, Mr. Carter, or whatever it is. I thought you said it was padlocked, Mr. Winthrop. It always has been. Not now. A lot lying on the ground. The staples are all bent and twisted. Looks as if someone had broken it. And the cover's been moved recently, too. Look here, Nick. These scratches on the stones. Patsy, I do believe you're finally beginning to notice things. You know where you can go, don't you? Yeah, that's just where you will go if you get too interested in that well. Now, look here, Peter. Uh, you're a big boy now. You don't really think Miss Brocken's a witch? I know she is. Ever see her ride a broomstick? No, but I've seen her go down this well. When was this? Winter nights. Me and my brother Timmy would hide in the hay of that old barn and wait for her to come along. First, we'd hear the scrape as she pulled off the lid, and then we'd see her climb down inside with the lantern in her teeth and that old black cat sitting on her shoulder. Why do you think she did it? Climb down inside, I mean. To get warm, of course. It's nice and cozy in hell on a winter's night. She never went down in summer? No, why should she? It's hot enough right here in the valley in summertime. Very interesting observation, Peter. And it verifies my hunt just how Jacob was killed and why. What do you mean, Mr. Carter? Help me pull the lid off this well and I'll show you. Here, take that side and I'll see. Right, I'm here. There. That does it. Now, Patsy, give me that flashlight. Here you are. Thanks. Now, let's see what we've got. Ah, yes. Notice those rusty spikes driven into the stonework to form a sort of ladder? And notice where the rust has been scraped recently. That's how Jacob got it in his boots. He followed Miss Brocken's example and climbed down into the well. You'll also notice that the stones are covered with that curious fungus we found under his... Hey, hey, she's watching us. Over there under that apple tree, and the cat's standing on her shoulder. We've been waiting for you, Miss Brocken. I think you can tell us how Jacob died. It was his own greed killed him. I warned him no man could go down there and live. You knew he died. You went down into the well, and yet you let him go. I did not. I refused him the key, I did. But he broke open the lock like a thief when no one was looking. He wouldn't listen, and so he had to die. And I'm not sorry. You killed him, you old... Easy, Winthrop. Miss Brocken isn't responsible for Jacob's death. Then who is? You said yourself he was poisoned. Quite right. And I think if I drop this rock down into the well, we may rouse the killers. <laughs> Aye, if you do, they'll play you their devil's tattoo. Oh, Nick, be careful. I'm afraid. Here goes the stone. Now let's... Oh, Nick. Nick, I heard it. Good Lord, what is it? Oh. Rattlesnakes. Forget this is rattlesnake country. 
And I rather imagine there's a rattlesnake nest down there. Aye, that there is. Old ones and the young ones, the darlings. I told Jacob not to go down in that well. I told him he'd go to hell, but all he cared for was gold. And so he's dead. Dead! Dead! And I'm glad! <laughs> There's one thing I still don't understand about that Dunderberg mystery. Why did Jacob go down into the well? And why wasn't Miss Brocken bitten when she did the same thing? I'll answer the last question first. Miss Brocken was careful to make all her descents into the well in winter. But for what? You see, when snakes hibernate, they become cold and almost lifeless. Ask any snake charmer. It's an old trick of the trade to put snakes on ice just before a show makes them quite harmless. Oh. And as for the reason that drew both Miss Brocken and Jacob into the well... I deduced from a sample Jacob had in his hand that the Brocken Well is a hiding place of Benedict Arnold's famous lost treasure. What's that? Well, Major Andre is supposed to have given Arnold a golden guinea for every man then garrisoned at West Point. Arnold undoubtedly hid the money and didn't have time to dig it up when he had to flee for his life after his treachery was uncovered. But if the Brocken family knew where it was, why didn't they use it themselves? Probably because they thought it was tainted money with a curse on it. I see. Well, thanks, Nick. Now, in just a moment, I want you and Patsy to give us a preview of next week's exciting case. Everybody's heard the old saying that home is where the heart is. And because home does matter most, it deserves the most careful attention you can give it. Keep your home at its loveliest with the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux cream polish, for example, renews the original gleaming beauty of your fine furniture. The handsome appearance of the wood grain itself in one quick, easy application. That's because Linex Cream Polish cleans as it polishes, saving one whole step in your cleaning day routine. The cloudy look of old polish and dust, the blurry appearance of finger marks are erased as if by magic. And Linex Cream Polish leaves no surface film of oil for dust to cling to. It helps conceal disfiguring scratches, too. So take the streamlined way to furniture care. Linex Cream Polish for fine furniture. Tell your dealer you want the product that cleans as it polishes. Ask for all three great Linux home brighteners. Linux cream polish, Linux self-polishing wax, and Linux clear gloss varnish at your nearest hardware, paint, or department store. And now let's hear from Nick Carter himself. Well, Nick, what about next week's story? Next week, Ken, I think I'll tell you the story of how an heir mysteriously disappeared before it was born. And a curious and frantic case it was. When a woman who's going to have a baby any minute disappears into thin air right on the threshold of a famous maternity hospital, then she... Now, Patsy, don't give the whole plot away. Wait until next week. What do you call a story, Nick? I call it... The Vanishing Lady. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is featured in Street and Smith magazines. Lon Clark is starred as Nick with Helen Choate as Patsy. Original music is played by Lou White. The programs are written by Edith Miser, and any resemblance therein to actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental. The entire production is under the direction of Jock McGregor. <laughs> Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented at this time and over these same stations each week by the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux clear gloss varnish, Linux cream polish, and Linux self-polishing wax. Created by Acme, America's great producer of fine quality paint. This is Ken Powell speaking for the thousands of Linux dealers all over America and saying so long until next week. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Hello? Yes, this is the Falcon speaking. Oh, Rita. I'm glad you called, Angel, but we'll have to make it another time. A man has disappeared with some of his company's money. His employers can't wait to find out what's become of him. In fact, it looks like the suspense may kill them. The case of the amorous bookkeeper. It's 
to late Sunday night in New York, and Lucille Landis is worried. Lucille is the tall, willowy brunette who is gliding down the hall of the third floor in the Tremont building. She stops at the door of the Style Center dress company, pauses briefly with her hand on the knob, then shrugs daintily and opens the door. Her partner, large, paunchy Barney Murdoch, looks up from the books on the desk in front of him as she enters. Ah, oh, at last. Come in, come in. All right, Barney. Now, what is it? You were so excited on the phone. I... Come here. Sit down. Well? I've been suspicious for some time. Didn't say anything because I didn't want to alarm you if, uh, well, if I was wrong. Unfortunately, I am not. Well, for heaven's sake, will you tell me what it's all about? It must be pretty important to get you to the office on Sunday and then have you send for me. Yes, it's pretty important. I've had an accountant down here all day. What do you think? Something wrong with the books? Hard to believe. Finch has been with us for, well, almost from the beginning, and he's such a mild little guy. What's wrong? Has he made a mistake? Mistake? Yeah, quite a mistake to think he could get away with it. He's been taking us, Lucille, for the last six months. Are you sure... Oh, I can't believe it. It's all here, black and white. How much? Nearly $30,000. Oh, no, that's impossible. $30,000 in six months. I thought our profit was off for the volume we were doing, but I couldn't find anything. So I've had an expert go over it. He's found where Finch has been juggling. Well, what do we do? What can we do? Have the police here when Finch comes to work tomorrow. I hope he hasn't spent it all. Yes, I suppose so. Oh, poor little fella. But if he's a thief... For 30000 we can waive sympathy. Well, now, come on, let me show you. That's why I asked you down. I want you to see what the accountant pointed out so you'll understand. You know I can't make heads or tails out of figures. I leave all that part of the business to you. If you say Finch has been robbing us, well, that's it. You ought to take more of an interest. Well, I do in designing and production. But believe me, Barney, when it comes to bookkeeping, I don't know a debit from a ledger. All right, Lucille, if that's the way you want it. That's the way. Now, let's call the police, shall we? Here I am, Finchie. Oh, Lucille, I've been looking for you. I didn't see you in this back booth. Oh, that's why I picked it. I don't want it to be seen. Uh, sit down. You don't have to worry. Cora doesn't know it's about us. It's not your wife we have to worry about anymore, Finch. What do you mean? The jig's up. Barney had an accountant work on the books today. Oh, dear. To put it mildly. What do we do? Well, you've got to get out of town. Oh, I knew it would come to this sooner or later. I knew it. Good. Nothing like being prepared. We'll, we'll go to California. Hmm? We? Oh, are you taking Cora? No, no, you. Oh, Finchie, don't be silly. What? But uh, I don't want to leave you. Hey, you don't have much choice. You'll join me later? No, think about it. You won't join me. You want to get rid of me? Now, Finchie. Well, you're acting so, so cold. But I'm worried, that's all. I should think you'd want to go with me, if you really love me. Let's not go to that now. <laughs> Sometimes I think... Oh, I just wonder if you've just been using me to juggle the books for you now that I'm no more used to I'm you. tipping you off, aren't I, so you can get away? Yes, but well, maybe you don't want me talking. Well, I don't, but... Uh... I've got to know the truth. I've got to... You let go of my wrist. Do you love me? Answer me, Lucille. Do you love me? Finchie. Do you? Well, you asked for it. I know it. I know it all the time. Look in the mirror sometimes, Finchie. Did you think for one minute stop, that Stop, I... stop. Don't say it. I didn't think even for one minute. Not really. I pretended, that's all. The whole thing was just like a dream. Now it's turned into a nightmare. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Honestly. Uh, you better be for yourself. You're in this with me, Lucille. And I may decide not to go to California. I may stay, see? And I may talk. Oh, Finchie, don't be silly. You juggled the books, you took the money. And there's nothing to prove you gave any of it to me or that I knew anything about it. But you wanted me to get out of town. Well, partly for your sake and partly because I don't like unpleasantness. I can deny anything you say, but I'd rather not be bothered. A little unpleasantness, that's all you're afraid of. Well, just don't underestimate me, Lucille. I'm warning you now, don't underestimate me. Thanks for the tip. Barney Murdoch underestimated me. It cost him $30,000. Cora underestimated me. She wouldn't believe I could ever have a woman like you. Maybe someday people will find out that Elliot Finch is... 
No, what am I talking about? Lucille, don't leave me, please. I'm scared. Good night, Benji. Uh, Lucille. She hates me. No, she doesn't even hate me. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Yes? Michael Waring? That's right. My name is Barney Murdoch, Style Center Dress Company. Want to hire you? Well, I never was much good on hem stitching. All right, you've had your joke. Now, may I come in? Yeah, sure. Thanks. They call you the folk in uh, some such falderal, don't they? Oh, I've been called every kind of falderal in the book. Well, I'm not much for fancy names, but I understand your shop can deliver the goods. That's what I want. Or just what goods do you have in mind? I want you to find a man for me. Name's Elliot Finch, bookkeeper. Worked for us until the day. Didn't show up for work this morning, and his wife doesn't know where he is. Well, how much did he get away with? How'd you know about that? Well, when the bookkeeper disappears and his boss rushes frantically to a detective... Good, you're on the ball. 30,000, Waring. 30,000 nice round simoleons. Hmm. Well, to coin a couple of cliches, Finch certainly believed in making hay. And, brother, that ain't hay. What's in it for me? Your fee is... $50 the... a day in expenses. I'll give you $500. If the job's done in less than 10 days... Keep the change. Well, fair enough. Tell me something, Murdoch. When did you discover Finch's defalcation? Yesterday. And today, Finch disappears. Yeah, I've been wondering about that. Don't see how he knew we'd found out about him. Well, who did know, besides yourself? Just the accountant. I had work on the books. And my partner, Lucy Landis. But surely neither of oh, them... will trust them implicitly? Of course. Mm -hmm. As much as you trusted Finch until this happened... What are you trying to suggest? I'm oh, just thinking out loud. And in my business, you don't get very far if your thoughts are all sweetness and light. Very good, Waring. Suspicious of everyone. Probably just as well. Although I don't think... Uh, <laughs> then I'll leave the speculation to you. All right, Murdoch. And as soon as I have something concrete, I'll let you know. What is it? Are you Mrs. Finch? Yes. My name is Michael Waring. I'm looking for your husband. He isn't here. I know that. How do you know? What do you want with him? Are you from Style Center? In a way. Get out of here. Go on back to Mr. Murdoch. Tell him all he's lost is $30,000. I've lost a husband. Oh, well, perhaps I can help. Help! Elliot's gone. Run away. And he's not too well, Mr. What did you say your name was? Waring. I'm telling you this. Jail would kill him. He's never been strong. But he was a good husband and a good employee for 25 years. And then, well, we all make mistakes. Temptations. Yes, I know how you feel, Mrs. Finch. But... Oh, no, you don't. You wouldn't be here trying to find him so you can take him to jail, so you can kill him. All right, Mrs. Finch. Uh, what was that? I didn't hear anything. Maybe the wind. And maybe your husband. No, he isn't here. How do you know? Maybe he just came in the back. He didn't. He wouldn't. Come on, let's go. No, speak. Elliot. Elliot, if you're here, get out. There's somebody here looking for you. All right, Cora. Elliot, he wants to take you to jail. He's not going to take me to jail. But where did you get that gun? I I found it. Now, look, no. Finch. Please, I don't want to listen to any lectures. I, I took the money. I admit it. I can't pay it back either. But I'm not going to jail. I'm sorry about this, Cora, but you know the whole story. You know there's nothing I can do. So this is all that's left. Goodbye, Cora. Finch, wait. Half an hour has passed since Elliot Finch tried to shoot his way out of his troubles by putting a bullet in himself. Finch has been rushed to a hospital, and now Mike is talking to Cora Finch, who is just recovering from the shock. Is there anyone you'd like me to get to stay with you? Only Elliot. That's impossible. You say Mr. Finch was a model husband? He was. Well, men don't just change overnight unless something happens. Now, what happened to make him suddenly take money from the firm? I told you, temptation finally got the better of him. What temptation? Money. And it took its time. He'd been with the company for years. It grows with time. Mm -hmm. And that's all? He didn't have any sudden need for money? No. What did he do with the money? Oh, please, after what I've been through, do I have to go through this third degree? I'm just trying to help. Like you helped Elliot? How did him killed him? Now, look, Mrs. Finch. In the first place, I had nothing to do with your husband shooting himself. In the second place, he's not dead. And in the third place... He's not... not dead. Well, didn't you know? But they, they carried him out. I, I the thought... The doctor told you. Well, I was so dazed. 
You're telling me the truth? Yes, of course. No, you're, you're just trying to fool me. All you're... right, call the hospital. He's really alive, Elliot. He's really alive. Here's the phone. <laughs> now hold it. Stop it. I'm sorry. Now, that's better. Now, do you want to call? Yes. Give me the phone. Yes? Mr. Waring is here, Mr. Murdoch. All right, send him in. All ready. Ah, oh, Waring, come in. Come in. Any news? Yeah, I found Finch. What? Good boy. That was fast. And I'd love to take bows, Murdoch, but I'm afraid I don't break one on this. He walked in on me, that's all. Walked in on you? Where? At his home. I thought he'd skipped. No, he had no place to go. Well, uh, uh, where is he? In the hospital. He tried to kill himself. Uh, tried to? Tried to, you say? Mm-hmm. They're working on him now. He's still unconscious, but the doctors give him a good chance. Hmm. He tried it while you were still at his place? That's right. But why'd you let him do it? He had a gun. What could I do? Guns don't usually stop the falcon, do they? Well, sometimes. Don't want to get in a rut. Did he say anything about the money? To his wife. It's gone. All of it? So she said. But where? Gambling? So she didn't say. Hmm. Another woman, maybe. Maybe. Where's your partner? Lucille? She hasn't come in yet today. Mm -hmm. Interesting coincidence, wouldn't you say? What? The day after Finch's dirty work is discovered, he doesn't come to work, and neither does Lucille. Oh, she often doesn't come in till afternoon. It's afternoon? You are hinting at something, Waring. You hinted at it before. I'm just trying not to overlook any possibilities. Well, but... There's a Sergeant Corbett of the police here. He wants to talk to you. Oh, just a minute. Must be something about the robbery, Waring. I'll see him in a minute. Now, it's not just the robbery, Murdoch. Corbett is with the homicide squad. Homicide? Mm -hmm. But who... What what homicide? Ask Corbett. Yeah. Uh, Send the sergeant in. Yes, Mr. Murdoch. You said Finch tried to kill himself, Waring. Well, that's suicide, not murder. Besides, it didn't work. That's right. Hello, Corbett. Waring. Well, now my day is complete. Mm -hmm. And what can we do for you? You can sit tight and keep your mouth shut. I want to talk to Mr. Murdoch. Well, what's it about, Sergeant? Your partner, Lucille Landis. Lucille? She's been murdered. What? What do you know about it, Murdoch? I guess that's about all I can tell you, Sergeant. All right, Murdoch, stick around. We may want to talk to you again. Sure thing. Good day, Sergeant. So long. Goodbye, Waring. Bye-bye, Corbett. I'll see you down at headquarters later. There are a few things I'd like to find out. And you think we can help you? You flatter the department, Waring. I thought you are the guy who likes to tell us, not ask us. Oh, you're all right for routine, Corbett. If it's simple. Hmm. He expects us to give him what we got after that. <laughs> you will, Corbett, in spite of yourself. Your irresistible charm, no doubt. Why, Corbett, you do care. Ah, <laughs> I've got work to do. <laughs> All right, Waring, your friend, the sergeant's gone. You can stop being cute. I want results, and I want them fast. What results? Proof that Finch killed Lucille. And if he didn't? He did. Must have. She got him to jockey the book. Did she? Look. It's your idea. You've been hinting at it right along. Yeah. Tell me something, Murdoch. What? Just when did you catch on to my hint? Now, wait a minute, Waring. I don't like that kind of a question. You're supposed to be working for me. Oh, why so touchy, Murdoch? All I said... I know what you said. Now, listen to me. I hired you to find Finch. You did. Okay. Now I'm hiring you to prove he killed Lucille. For an additional thousand dollars. You want the job or don't you? Well, why are you so anxious to pin this on Finch? Because he killed Lucille. Well, if she was double-crossing you... Get out of here, Waring. I'll get somebody who can take orders. No, 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 not so fast, Murdoch. A job's a job, and money's money. You want me to nail Finch? Okay, I'll nail him. I just wondered why you're so anxious. Because he's guilty. Oh. All right, if you say so. Well, if you don't think no, so... Oh, I do, I do. All right, then. After all, Murdoch, the customer's always right. What more proof do I need? Hello, Sergeant. Told you I'd be around. Yeah, Waring. Well, what have you got for me? For you, nothing. Well, now, look, Corbett, if you want me to solve this case for you... A little late, Waring. We've taken care of that little detail already. 
You've made an arrest? We will. We know who we want. We know where to find them. You got the wrong man. Oh, we have. Not truly. How do you know who I'm talking about? You don't need to. I know you, Corbett. Bound to be wrong. <sighs> I don't know why I put up with this guy. <laughs> you can't do without me. Now, would you like me to tell you who really killed the Landis girl? Yeah, tell me. Elliot Finch. Oh, Finch. That's right. And just how do you know it was Finch? Because I know which side my bread is buttered on. That makes a lot of sense. Does to me. I like butter. All right. Now, would you like me to tell you who pulled the job? Yeah, who did it? Finch. What? Only I happen to be able to prove it. I don't believe it. They took the bullet out of Finch's shoulder. It came from the same gun that did the murder. Oh, no, there must be some mistake. There's no mistake, Waring. But, Sergeant, if you and I agree with each other, one of us is bound to be wrong. <laughs> It's 20 minutes since Mike Waring and Sergeant Corbett startled each other by seeing eye to eye on a case. Now they're at the hospital to see Elliot Finch. They find Mrs. Finch in the waiting room. Hello, Mrs. Finch. How's your husband? He's regained consciousness, but I haven't been able to talk to him yet. They're giving him a transfusion, and then they say I can go in again. Not until I do. Well, who are you? Oh, excuse me. Mrs. Finch, this is Sergeant Corbett of the police. I might have known... Can't they give him any rest even now? I'm sorry, Mrs. Finch. I'll bet you are. I can see it written all over you. Uh, why do they always have to have families? You stay here with her wearing. I'm going in. But, Sergeant, uh, I you'd said... better do as he says, Mrs. Finch. I don't know why you all have to pick on Elliot anyway. He doesn't have the money. He only took it because that woman made him. She's the one who has it. Lucille Landis? Yes. If you want the money, ask her. I would like to, but there's one catch. Well, what's that? She's dead. She... How did that happen? Somebody killed her. But what I'd like to know, Mrs. Finch, since you know about your husband and Miss Landis, how come you didn't tell me about her before? Because I didn't want to. I didn't have to account to you. No, but you did account to me. Everything except that you knew about Miss Landis. Why do you make so much of that? Because you must have had some reason for holding back. I'm not holding back. I, I've just told you about her. Yeah, no, that's what puzzles me. It must be awful. What? Your kind of work makes you suspicious of everybody and everything. Uh-huh. Still, it's better than being afraid of everybody and everything. What do you mean by that? I'll tell you later. Here comes the sergeant again. Well, Corbett? Mrs. Finch can go in now if she wants. What did he say to you, Corbett? He has a story. Yeah? Uh-huh. He admits he was at Lucille Landis's, but he says he got there after the murder. He found the gun then and took gun. it with him. That's gun. how he got it. Gun? Miss Landis's? You... You weren't here about the money. This was about the murder. Uh, easy, Mrs. Finch. You can't think Elliot did it. He'd never hurt anyone. He didn't do it. Why can't you leave him alone? When a man has a murder gun, you don't just leave him alone. But he told you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You buy his alibi, Corbett? For now, he's not going anywhere. That's right. But suppose I could rip his alibi right down the middle. What? How? But suppose I could prove he took the gun with him too, Miss Landis's, that he went there to kill her. Go ahead. He can't. It's a lie. Mrs. Finch told me her husband admitted taking the money, but she tried to conceal his connection with Miss Landis. Now, why? I told you. Was it because you, I... she knew what was going to happen? And she wanted to protect Finch? No. Couldn't she have seen him take the gun? That would frighten her into trying to hide his affair with Miss Landis. No, you, you must believe me. I, I wouldn't shield Elliot. Not if he were a murderer. Well, you, know, you tried to protect him when you knew he was a thief. I didn't. You didn't want him jailed for it. You seemed to think it was all right for him to take the money. You said he was just yielding to temptation. Your only criticism was of the police and me for wanting to catch him. Well, I... Well, what could I do? He, he's my husband. I, I love him. Naturally, I don't want to see him go to jail. Mm, nice code of ethics. Anything he does is okay, as long as he's your husband. Embezzlement, murder... You don't understand. Now, the trouble is, I do. Corbett, I think you have a case. You can make an arrest. No. Elliot didn't kill that woman, I tell you. He didn't. I will say. But he's sick. This this might kill him. Let him alone until he's stronger. Then you'll see. He'll be able to prove You mean it. there'll be time to think up another alibi? It's no use, Mrs. Finch. Oh, why do you have to be so hard, so unfeeling? I know. It's another side of that rotten work I'm in. Well, Corbett? Okay. No, please. If nothing else will stop you, I'll confess. I killed her. I did it. She's sure determined to protect that guy. I yeah. am. Only she happens to be telling the truth. Huh? But you said... I didn't say anything. I simply asked some hypothetical questions. But now I am saying Mrs. Finch killed Miss Landis, Corbett. You said before I could arrest Finch for the murder. No, no. I said you could make an arrest. You can. So what are you waiting for?
Yes? Mr. Waring is on line one, Mr. Murdoch. Right. Hello, Waring. What news? Well, I've wrapped it up. You did? Finch? Yep, I hung it on him. There's been an arrest? Yep. Right. <laughs> Come on over and tell me about it. I'll give you your check. Oh, there's not much to tell. You wanted me to prove Finch killed Miss Landis, so I did. Good. Yeah, forced the real murderer into confessing. What? Yes, Mrs. Finch didn't like her husband being ruined by another woman, so she eliminated the other woman. Mrs. Finch? Yeah, that's right, Murdoch. She's the one who killed your partner. But I didn't think you'd mind it turning out like this. All you really wanted was for me to prove you didn't do it, right? Yeah, Waring, but I was so sure... Yes, I know. You ought to be careful about that, Murdoch. You know, there's a theory we're supposed to operate on that a man is innocent until he's proved guilty. Not a bad idea. I'll see you around. Don't look so smug, Waring. You were lucky, that's all. Was I, Corbett? You thought Finch was our boy. It just happened. Mrs. Finch broke down. Mm -hmm. And I had nothing to do with it? Not intentionally. I suppose I tell you I suspected her almost from the first minute I met her. More hypothetical questions? No, no. On the level. Okay, you suspected her. You suspect everyone. (laughs) That's what she said. But I picked her as the best bet. Why? Because one of the first questions she asked me was, are you from Style Center? What does that prove? Nothing. But she followed it up with, get out of here, go on back to Mr. Murdoch. The Style Center isn't just Mr. Murdoch. It is, or was, Murdoch and Lucille Landis. But Cora Finch had already crossed off Landis. And I couldn't help wondering why. I see. And then what clinched it was her holding back on me about Finch's tie-up with the Landis woman. Although she knew about it all the time. Could have been she was protecting her husband, like you suggested, at the hospital. Yeah. Except that when she heard her husband was better, that he would live and could talk, suddenly she told me about him and Lucille Landis. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, so she couldn't have been trying to protect him, or she would have continued to keep quiet. So you figured she wasn't covering for him, but for herself. Sure. She didn't want us to know that she was wise to her husband and the Landis woman, because then we wouldn't know she had a motive to kill her. Uh-huh. But when she found out her husband was going to live and might admit he had told her the whole story, she decided to spill the works. That's right. She thought it would look better coming from her than it would if we latched onto it ourselves. But instead, it cooked her. Well, she's not cooked yet, Corbett. Just about, with the confession and all, but I reserve final judgment until the jury comes in. Why so cautious all of a sudden, Mike? I would just like to practice what I preach. And I've been preaching. Isn't that a little out of character for you? Well, could be. Fact seems to me this whole case is out of character for you. (laughs) How come? Well, there are only two gals in it. One of them gets herself bumped off. You pin the job on the other one, and that leaves you holding hands with me. Oh, no, no, no. (laughs) You're overlooking one thing, Corbett. What's that, Mike? The receptionist in Murdoch's office. She's waiting. And I'll just have time to pick her up. So here's where you get off. (laughs) Good night, Sergeant. Signal gasoline. Let every traffic signal remind you, you do go farther with signal gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with signal. Signal Oil Company and your neighborhood signal dealer bring you another curious story by The Whistler. Tonight, Highway of Escape. I am The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the heart of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Frances Block was never meant for the desert, but fate put her there set her down solidly in the center of an expanse of creosote brush and Joshua trees, cactus and hot, dry sand, and a scrubby little group of nondescript shacks, 
huddled in the shade of a few scraggly umbrella trees. Known to the truck drivers passing through on Highway 441 as the Duncan Wells Tourist Camp. Just Francis and Pete Crawford, her stepfather. For her, it was a prison. For him, it was a living and the only one he knew. It was on a particularly hot day in July that she decided she couldn't stand it any longer. On a Sunday morning when the temperature stood at 90 degrees at 8 o'clock. And Francis knew there was always more money than usual in the cash register on Sunday morning. Five, ten, eleven, fifty, twelve, twenty-five, fifty, eighty-five, twelve, eighty-five. Oh, Morning. Oh, uh, hello. You open for business? Uh, not yet. Kind of early. Mm, not even gasoline? The pump's locked. Mm. How far is the next town? 17 miles. Saguaro. Okay, I can make it, I guess. Hmm? Thanks a lot. We better get going. Um, just a second. Yeah? You, uh, going through to, I mean, uh... Los Angeles, yeah. Due there by noon. Can you take me? Huh? I've got to get out of here this morning. Right now. Oh, come on. You could take me if you wanted to, couldn't you? No, well, I'd like to, but... Oh, please. Look, I'll give you five dollars. Yeah, sorry, sister, but it's company rules. No riders. I'd lose my job. Oh, they'll never know. Look, mister, you don't know what it means. It's life and death. Yeah? Yeah. It's life and death. Death if I stay here in this... This, this prison. Oh. I can't take it any longer, you see? You've got to take me away. You've got to. Hey, what's the matter? You sick or something? Yeah. Yeah, I'm sick. Look, look, I'll make it ten dollars. Ten dollars to Los Angeles. Yeah, but... That leaves me only, uh, two eighty-five. My bag's right there. It's all packed. I won't tell the company. They'll hey. never know. See? Just you and me will know, and I'll get off in Los Angeles. Well, for ten bucks, you can take the train. Oh, no, there's no trains here. Just trucks. Guys like you. There's a train from the next town, ain't there? Yeah. Yeah, how about that? You can take me to the next town. That's all. Just from the next town. Well, uh, I don't know. I... Good morning, Francis. Oh. There's a little lady here uh, wants to ride into town with me. Hey, sorry, mister. She's made a mistake. I have not. I'm going, you hear? No, Francis. You're not going. You can't stop me, Pete. You can't stop me. I'm not going to stay here. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not. Well, uh, look, uh, mister, maybe uh, maybe you two better talk this over. I... <laughs> I just thought I'd run it a so while, but then... She gets this way ever so often. She'll get over it. Yeah. Well, uh, we'll see you on the way back, maybe. Huh? Yeah. So long. Uh, so long. You did it again, you filthy... No, 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 there, Francis. I know how you feel, gal. This ain't no place for a young filly like you. But can't you see? There ain't nothing else I can do. Ever since your ma died, you I... You killed her. That's what you did. Francis, that's an awful thing to say. Just the same as if you shot her with a gun. Bringing her off to this godforsaken hole. Making her work when it was so hot she couldn't breathe. Well, you're not doing it to me, do you hear? Now, wait a minute. You ain't talking to me like that. Oh, no. Well, listen, you dirty desert rat. I've had all of you I'm going to take, and I'm getting out of here today. This morning. In five minutes if a car comes. You're still my stepdaughter, Francis. Until you're 21, I'm afeard I'm doing the deciding. Oh, now, come on. You just trot on back to the cabin and lay down for a while. You'll feel better in no time. Get away from me. You'll I'm... understand about your ma someday. I know this place ain't much of a spread, but it was ours, and we built it together. Come on. I said get away from me. Please, Francis, just this once. For me. All right. Wait a minute now. Put that knife down, Francis. You ain't in no condition to... All right. You ask for it. Friends, have you picked up your free federal use stamp protector yet at your signal gasoline dealers? The deadline has already passed, you know, for getting your new use stamp on your windshield. And since that little stamp has to hang on your windshield for a whole year, you'll naturally want to protect it from moisture or scuffing so it won't peel off. That's why Signal Oil Company had these little use stamp protectors made up for you. They're smart-looking, transparent, and water-resistant, so you can wash right over them without affecting your use stamp. And, of course, they're free, one of the little extra services your Signal dealer offers to keep your car looking its best. Unfortunately, like all things in wartime, the supply is limited this year. 
Since every car will be needing one, I'd suggest that you get yours without delay tomorrow if possible. Just drive into any of the friendly stations displaying signals, yellow and black circle sign, and say, I'd like one of the use stamp protectors that was offered free on the Whistler. And now, back to the Whistler. He's dead, Francis. It's over, and you're free now. You stare at him for a moment as he lies there on the floor in the middle of the small lunchroom, very still. For the first time in your life, you notice he has a kind face, a peaceful face. No look of fear on it. Just peace, deep, enduring peace. Yes, you're free now. You can leave any time you want to. Today, this morning, the next five minutes, if a car comes. You jump as a car pulls up out in front. Quickly, Francis. Move the body behind the counter before the driver comes in. That's it. Now, take it easy. Just relax. He mustn't know. Hi, beautiful. How about a cup of java? Hey, what's the matter? Oh, nothing. Uh, coffee isn't made yet. Uh, a cigarette? It's scarce these days. Uh, no. Well? What? Are you going to make it or shall I? Make what? A coffee. Say, are you sure nothing's the matter? Okay, something's the matter. I'm, I'm scared of my stepfather. Huh? He, he's horrible. I live here alone with him. I can't stand it anymore. That's too bad. Oh, please. Please take me with you to Saguaro anyway. I won't be any trouble. Oh, no. Now, wait a minute. Hold everything. There. Now, 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 take it easy. Where is your stepfather? He's, he's asleep in his cabin. He's drunk. He'll wake up. Yeah, I, I, I see. Yeah. You, uh, you got any money? Twelve dollars. But I can work once I get to a big town. Oh, I don't know. Oh, please. Please. I've been driving all night. I was going to grab a little shut eye here for a no, few I hours. I gotta go now. He, he might wake up and he might. Yeah, yeah, you know. yeah. Well, okay, come on. You know, after what you told me about that stepfather of yours, I got half a mind to go back and punch him in his nose. He's got no hold on you. What does he think he is? Hey, listen. Let's do his thing right. Go back there and tell him right off. No, we can't. I'd like to anyway. I suppose it wouldn't do any good, only make trouble for you. Beats me, though, how any man can treat a gal as nice as you like that. You, uh, you are pretty, you know. Thanks. Hal. My name's Hal. Hi, Hal. What's yours? Francis. Oh, Francis, huh? Nice name. Uh, you hear that? What? The motor. Betsy doesn't like this heat any more than we do. How far are you going, Francis? Los Angeles. Yeah, it's a nice town. And um, we could have a lot of fun there. We? Yeah, hey, you and me. I um, wasn't going that far. You but... might change your mind, huh? I don't know, maybe. Los Angeles is a nice town, isn't it? Come on over. Oh. <laughs> there, that's better. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Los Angeles is a great place. You know, I can get a couple of days off and... Uh-oh. What's that? Betsy means it this time. Hey, what was it, uh, 17 miles of Saguaro from that camp? Yeah, but... Yeah, we've come five. Shorter to go back. I gotta get to a phone. Oh, no. No, now, you look, can't. Now, Francis, don't worry about him. I'll be ready for him. No, but I can't go back. I'll, I'll walk. Now, you're doing nothing of the kind. Look, baby, all you need is someone to take care of you. And from now on, 
I'm the guy. You can't. Why can't I? Let me out. Told you to let me out. I don't want you to handle it. Stop the car. Stop it. Get hold of yourself, baby. Don't you trust me? No. I mean, yes, but... What about Los Angeles? You aren't forgetting, are you? not you. I said it's not you. Just don't ask me anymore. Stop the car. That's all I want to know. Just sit tight and let me handle everything. We made it. Now, where's the phone? On the wall by the door. Yeah. Now, what you gonna do, sit there? Yeah, I'll wait. I'll be sure you do. What do you mean? Eh, nothing. I guess I got the jumps, too. And don't worry about him. If he comes out, just let out a yell, and I'll be here in a second. Smile. <laughs> yeah, it's better. <laughs> you know, baby, I kind of like you. Keep that chin up. Yes, Francis, keep your chin up. You could use a little courage now, couldn't you? There's a chance he won't look behind the counter, just a bare chance. But if he does, there you are in a stalled automobile 20 miles from nowhere and not a car in sight. Oh, wait a minute. Around the curve, a car. Hurry, Francis, you've got to stop it. Wait! Wait! What is it? What's the matter? Take me to the next town. Hurry! Well, what's the matter? Uh, my uncle. It's my uncle. Something wrong? Yeah, yeah, he's hurt. Quick, I've got to get a doctor. Well, you're a mighty lucky young lady. I happen to be a doctor myself. Where is he? Oh, no! No, no, it's bad. It's, it's horrible. I don't want uh, you to... Now, you see... just let me decide that. Uh, here, I got my case. You take me to him. He... He's in the lunchroom. I, I'd better wait here. Yes, yes, I understand. You just relax now, and I'll take a look. It might not be as bad as you think. Just wait there in my car. Don't stand there like that, Francis. Do something. The car, his car. That's right. Hurry up. Faster, 60, 70. Keep your eye on the center line, wavering like a snake between the wheels. Twelve miles now between you and the camp. Five miles to Saguaro. 75, 80. Almost lost it on that turn. The accelerator's down to the floor. Faster. Francis, you can move. Open your eyes and crawl out of the car. You're okay. I, I'm okay. Better get off the road. Yeah. Take off cross country. I'll be watching. Watching the road. Cross country. <laughs> down. Goodness sakes alive, a body can't hear himself think around here. Oh, oh, sorry, Matty. I don't know why in the world you keep that thing banging away night and day. Well, it's the dead blasted tubes. It gets louder and softer all of a sudden. A fella from Sarawa coming up to fix her. Oh, I ain't seen him. I should be here this afternoon. Think I'll go out and take a look around. Jake Watson, you stay right in that chair. You've been a mighty sick man. Hey, Matty. Matty, look. What? They're coming up the walk. Well, where could she come from? Hey, she's sick. She almost fell. Uh, well, Dad, blast it, do something. Well, you stay right there. What's the matter, honey? I, I don't know. Oh, there, now. Just take hold of my arm. Thanks. Ma, you look all tuckered out. Come in. Thanks. 
Now, don't talk. We'll just get you out of this hot sun. Wouldn't surprise me none to find you was in my sunstruck. No hat and all. Land sakes, whatever you doing walking around out here? Now, hush yourself, Jay. Can't you see the poor thing can't hardly walk? Let alone listening to you jabber. Now, there, now, you sit down there, and I'll get you a nice cool drink of milk. <clears throat> you been walking far, miss? Yeah. Any particular reason? Yeah. I cracked up my car. Any more questions? No, no, I just thought it might be peculiar you picked this time of day to go walking. I'm oh, sorry. Now, Jake, suppose you quit jabbering and let the poor girl rest a spell. She's about done in. Yeah, she's been in an accident. Car went off the road. Well, I declare. Ain't hurt none, are you? No. Just tired. Well, here, you just lean back and take a good drink of milk. You'll feel better in a jiffy. Oh, there go them tubes again. Oh, turn it off, Jake. Yeah, but... Attention, please. Be on the lookout for a young woman in blue slacks and a yellow jacket, probably driving a Buick sedan, license number 8X43H7, about 5 feet 4 inches tall, blonde hair, name Francis Block, wanted in connection with the murder of Peter Crawford this morning at Duncan Wells. Lancy! Repeat. Hey, hey, that's you! Get out of my way! Oh, look out, Jake, she might have a gun. Hey, wait a minute, young lady. Let's go, O.B. Betty, Betty, she, she's gone. Oh, here, here, let me help you off. Her? No. That's what we get for being good Christians. Hey, turn the radio off. Huh, a murderess. I knew there was something slick about that girl. That's all right. She won't get fur in this heat. Not in the desert. It's hot. Unbearably hot, 110 in the shade. You can't keep going much longer, Francis. Feet swollen and blistered, bruises that ache with every step you take. Three in the afternoon. You've been walking two hours since you left the farmhouse. 120 blazing minutes. Your head is full of sun, the flat horizon wavers, dust in your nose and throat. You've got to have water. Water from the clear, sparkling fountain in the square of Wilkins Corners, the little town ahead. You've got to take a chance. Maybe they haven't heard about you here in Wilkins Corners, Francis. Maybe they don't listen to their radios. Look at that sign down the street. Coffee, hamburgers. Take a chance. You may not get another one for a long time. Morning, miss. Hey. Uh... Like something to eat. Well, it's come to the right place. Hamburgers, hot dogs, barbecues, whole wheat, white, rye, apple, peach, boysenberry, cherry, lemon meringue, coffee, milk, and coke. Hamburger and white coffee. Hamburger. Hamburger. <sighs> Mustard, ketchup, or tomato sauce. Ketchup. Mm. You're right up. Pre-war service now. <laughs> We've reconverted. Yeah, hi, Billy. What you doing down at Swirl? Oh, I'm mighty busy today. Barbecue and whole wheat and coffee. Special. Special. What you mean, busy? Why, I don't mean to tell me you ain't heard about the killing, huh? What killing? Well, sure. Found a man stabbed to death at Duncan Wells' tourist camp. Yeah? Yeah, a guy who runs it named uh, Pete Crawford. No. Yeah, dead on a mackerel. Then the killer got away, they say. Sheriff's got posse out. Well, I'll be... Hey, Leif, did you hear that? Why? A killing over to Duncan Wells this morning, Pete Crawford. Well, you don't say yeah. he gets a killer? Nope. You better watch out. Might be serving him a meal long about now. <laughs> Mm, stabbed, was he? Yeah, with a bread knife. Yeah. Doc Lawton was coming down from Cactus Garden. Uh, he claims he talked with the killer. Well, why'd he nail him? Oh, you know Doc, but scared of his own shadow. That's too bad. Yeah, it is. They say old Pete Crawford didn't have an enemy in the world. I mean, it's too bad Doc didn't do something. Oh. You know, the best time to nab a murderer is right after he's done his job. It surprised me none to see this thing end up as... Well, as another one of Sheriff Bradshaw's famous unsolved mysteries. Well, I don't know. You know. Murder's a funny thing. Ain't like going down to the feed store for a sack of barley. Takes planning, yeah. thinking. There's a thousand ways a killer can trip himself up. Yeah. Just one false step along the way and it's all over. Yeah, well, maybe so. You know, I'd like to see that killer right now. <laughs> Probably pacing the floor somewhere, wondering if there was a slip-up. I wouldn't want to be in old Doc Lawton's shoes, yeah. being the only witness. 
<laughs> Bet you the old boy's looking six ways before he leaves his house. Here you are, George. One hamburger. Yeah. Oh, there you are, miss. Hamburger on white, and I'll go get your cup. Hey. Well, what's the matter? Now, where do you suppose she went? You forgot your hunger in a hurry, didn't you, Francis? A half minute more in that restaurant and it would have been all over. You're tired, worn out, but you can still think. A thousand ways you can trip up, make a false step, that's what he said. But you'll show them, won't you, Francis? First, get out of town and keep off the highways. Remember the sheriff's posse. The railroad, that's it. All the freight trains have to stop at that water tower a half mile out of town. Cross country again. Through the brush, under that blazing sun, keep away from the roads. And finally, the cool shade of the water tower with the drops splashing into a puddle there in the shade. You sit down and rest. Let your eyes close. Then. Someone coming. Look, there's a piece of iron pipe in the corner. Remember where it is. Oh, beautiful. Hell. Thought you'd be here. You almost gave me the slip back there. What do you want? Gave you quite a run, didn't they? Do I mind if I sit down? I got some talking to do. Yeah, it's better. Nice and cool here. You know, maybe I'm a sucker, but I still think you're pretty nice. Beautiful, but dumb. Do you think you could get away with it? I don't know. I'm so tired. I know you're tired, baby. Probably a little loony with a heat, too. No one in his right mind would have done what you... Shut up! You don't have to rub it in. Now, listen to me. I can help you, see. I'm the only one that can help you get out of this. You haven't got a chance unless you play ball, understand? Help me. You! <laughs> Ow! Sorry, baby. Maybe you'll listen to me. All right, Al. I'll listen to you. That's a way out of this. It's a short chance, but you'll have to take it. Wait a minute. Here comes the train. Get back there. It's afraid it'll have to stop. Then let me take a look. The pipe. If I can... No. I can't tell yet. Oh, wait a minute. Yep, yep, it's a freight off. So you were going to help me, were you? You didn't fool me. That's one mistake I didn't make. Yes, Francis, you were careful. You could see through his offer to help, couldn't you? Now... No slips, Francis. No false steps. The train is stopped for water. You hide, trembling behind the shack at the water tower. Then as the train starts up, you grab the rung of the ladder on the passing car, up the side. Now across the top and down the side before anyone sees you. But wait. There's a guard on top moving toward you. Down the tops of the cars. Don't look back. Watch where you're going. No false steps, Francis. No false steps now. The Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending to tonight's story. Meantime, a word about today's pre-war bargain in gasoline mileage that's helping more and more wise Western drivers stretch their ration gas stamps. I'm talking about the good pre-war mileage you still get in Signal Go Farther Gasoline. Yes, it's true. You still go as far as before the war with Signal. And I'll tell you why. You see, the gasoline ingredients which you've heard are reserved for war are the very volatile, highest-octane components, such as isopentane. That's why Signal Oil Company frankly admits no gasoline today can give you all the pep and anti-knock performance you found in pre-war Signal gasoline, and which you'll enjoy again in even further improved Signal post-war gasoline. But when it comes to mileage, that's where Signal gasoline still shines. For today's signal formula still contains not only all the high-energy components that gave pre-war signal gasoline its superior mileage, 
but also new high-mileage hydrocarbons have been added. You can prove this for yourself by keeping track of your mileage. You'll find it's as true today as before the war. You do go farther with Signal Gasoline. And now, back to the Whistler. No false steps, Francis. That's what the man said. And you are going to be so careful... But then how could you tell what kind of a false step it might be? And now it's all over, and everyone knows the answer to the killing of your stepfather. Well, it's all cleaned up now. Found the murderer dead right there between the railroad tracks. Oh, terrible thing, terrible. Of course, without the doctor's testimony, they might never have known how it happened. The doctor? Sure, sure, according to the radio. Doctor says he went into the lunchroom and found that fellow leaning over Pete Crawford with a knife in his hand. Boy, the doc practically witnessed the murder. Then the girl didn't do it. Oh, I knew she was innocent, the poor little thing. Yep, yeah, yeah, she was innocent, all right. They figured the murderer was going to try to shut her up, too. That's why she had to defend herself with that piece of light lead pipe there. <laughs> Doggone it, he was already wanted in New Orleans for killing ten days ago. Terrible thing, terrible. The only one thing I can't figure. What's that? Well, after she got the murderer like she did, what do you suppose she was running away from? at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program directed by George W. Allen with tonight's story by Eleanor Beeson, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Marvin Miller speaking and suggesting that you let every traffic signal remind you that you do go farther with Signal Gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with Signal. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Signal gasoline. Let every traffic signal remind you, you do go farther with signal gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with signal. The Signal Oil Company and your neighborhood signal dealer bring you another curious story. By the Whistler. Tonight, a pattern for terror. I am the Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the heart of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. A kaleidoscope is a simple instrument, a toy, made of a tube with a few mirrors and bits of colored glass, nothing more. Yet when you revolve it slowly, an unending series of complicated patterns appear. Always changing, never the same. On this midnight of December 10th, 1944, 
The mind of Ted Stratton, as it struggles for consciousness, is like a kaleidoscope. One of the patterns is this. Hello, darling. Norma's party at her house. High on the hill in Marin County, looking down on San Rafael and San Francisco Bay. And Larry Craig, handsome, talented Larry, playing Chopin waltzes on the piano. A pleasant pattern, Ted. Bright reds and yellows, sparkling, cheerful. And with Norma at your side, complete. But the design's starting to change. The reds and yellows are fading. And deep blues and purples are creeping in. Ted Stratton, you're being entirely ridiculous. Ridiculous, my foot. It isn't as if this is the first time, Norma. I'll get you a little tired of it. What are you trying to say? I'm simply suggesting that your relationship with your virtuoso friend in there is slightly more intimate than pupil and teacher. Ted. It's been going on for weeks, hasn't it? You know what you're saying. Sure. Why don't you tell me? Why don't you come right out and spill it? It was all a big mistake getting engaged. That's me, Stratton, the mistake. No runs, no hits, one error. Ted, you're drunk. So what? What else can I do? Can't play the piano like Mr. Craig? Gotta do something? You have to shout? Yes. You can make a bigger fool of yourself by walking in there and telling everybody. Yes, why don't you do it up right? Make a real party out of it. You know, that's an idea. A deeper pattern, Ted. Deep blues and purples. And the green tinge of jealousy mixed with the sound of party talk and the taste of champagne. The kaleidoscope in your mind slowly turns and the pattern gets still darker. Norma's party for you. And there she is again at Ted's side, gazing at him like a crooner struck Bobby Soxer as he plays. Then the pattern turns red. Shut up, Craig! I could kill you, Craig. Do you hear me? I could kill you. Nothing now. Just blackness. No colors. No pattern. It's cool, quiet, except for the monotonous moan of the foghorn down at the point near San Quentin Prison. Cool, peaceful. The fog has turned to a drizzle and it feels good on your head. Clears your mind, takes away the nagging ache. Open your eyes, Ted. Look around. Where am I? Black. Swirling fog, everything black. Can't even see the moon. It's almost raining. You're wet and cold. Raise your head. A hot knife jabs in. Breathe in that cool air and try again. string of yellow lights over to the left, wavering like a clothesline in a high wind, finally settles into... Yes, Ted, you must have stopped here on the way home from Norma's party. Party? Yeah, party. What am... What am I doing here? The car, who's... Larry's. I'm in Larry's car. alone in Larry's open convertible. Remember, Larry? You could kill him. It's just what you said, wasn't it? You could kill him. Where's Larry? I've got to find Larry. Go back. Go back to Norma's. Uh, no. Wait a minute. Not yet. Better check first. Telephone. <laughs> Down the highway a half mile, Martinelli's Roadhouse. You can call her from there. She'll probably laugh and tell you Larry is pacing the floor, wondering what happened to his car.
What do you want to drink? Oh, right? I think I'll have a dash for you, darling. <laughs> you know, I... Oh. Come on, Leona. That man, he... Uh, what'll you have, mister? Mind if I use your telephone? Yeah, go right ahead. Thanks. Uh, sorry. Around the corner to the right. Uh, this is the house phone. Oh, okay. Tell me, where's Larry? Why isn't he with you? What do you mean? I thought he was. He left right after you did. He left? Naturally. What else could he do after that horrible thing? He must have been out of your mind. Tell, tell me exactly what happened, Norma. I, I don't want to discuss it. You've got to. You have a lot of apologizing to do, Ted Stratton. That's not important now. Well, maybe not to you, but... Norma, will you please tell me what happened? Well, I'll see the all those terrible things right in front of everybody about, about wanting to kill him. You grabbed your hat and walked out. He just stood around looking embarrassed and... <laughs> How long after I left? This? You must have seen him down at the highway. I must have seen him down by the highway? Ted, where are you? Hello? Down by the highway. S I G N A L. Signal. What's in a name? The name Signal. Well, for instance, Signal Oil Company sponsors the Whistler. In addition, for 14 years, the name Signal has stood for the finest petroleum products that money can buy. But most important today, Signal Go Farther Gasoline is helping Western drivers stretch their gas stamps. For it's true, you still go as far as before the war with Signal. And I'll tell you why. You see, modern gasolines are composed of many ingredients, each of which does a specific job. For instance, the very volatile, highest octane components, such as isopentane, give pep and anti knock and these are the ingredients reserved for war. That's why Signal Oil Company frankly admits no gasoline today can give you all the brilliant performance you found in pre-war Signal gasoline, and which you'll enjoy again in even further improved Signal post-war gasoline. But other ingredients give mileage, and these components are still in the famous Signal formula. In fact, additional new hydrocarbons rich in mileage have even been added. That's why more and more wise drivers who keep track of their mileage are finding it's as true today as before the war. You do go farther with Signal Gasoline. And now, back to the Whistler. Ted Stratton stands in the telephone booth of the roadhouse for over a minute, receiver in hand, staring dully at the phone dial, trying to think, trying to remember what happened after he left Norma's party. Nothing, no dice. Just the red rage at Larry before he walked out, then blackness, a blank, until he opened his eyes in Larry's car parked at the edge of the highway. Norma says, I left, Larry left right after me. Just after in front of everybody, I said I wanted to kill him. It's impossible. I couldn't have. But that's not what you told everybody, is it, Ted? That's the one thing you do remember. You could kill him. No! Easy, Ted. That's only your reflection in the big mirror on the wall. No wonder they jumped when you walked into the bar. Clothes torn to shreds, an ugly gash over your right eye. 
Larry must have been tougher than you figured. Look at your right hand, Ted. Swollen up like a bunch of bananas. Better get out of here. Oh, the guy, I tell you, I know. I don't know what he looks like, but... Uh, call you back. Well, get your call through okay, brother? Yeah, thanks. Uh, just a minute. You, you look like you could use a drink. Thanks, no, I... Hello. Uh, what? Well, that's Rose. Sings with the band weekends. Maybe I... Maybe I can set you both up, huh? Oh, that would be a swell idea, mister. Sorry, I'm in a hurry. Oh, don't be that way. <laughs> He's just playing hard to get. Come on, pal, I feel generous. This one's on the house. <laughs> he doesn't do that for everyone. How about... I gotta go, I tell you. Oh, just one. Get out of my way, let me go. You plan to push me. Hey, what are you doing? Let the air out of the tire. I'm trying to stall me. I've no time. Fix it later. I gotta go. They're onto it already. You're sure of it. You can see tomorrow morning's headlines. Body found on highway. Attacked by unknown assailant. Police searching Marin County for murderer. That's why the bartender was wise. Tried to stall you. Lucky you caught part of that phone call he was making. Thought that flat tire would stop you, did they? Can't go much farther, though. It's in shreds already. Oh, look, the service station down at the junction. You've got to take a chance. You're lucky. No customers. Yes, sir? Got a flat tire. Yes, yeah, so I see. I got to change it in a hurry. Could you help? Sure. Got the dolly right here. Have it off with it? I'll help you. <laughs> here we go. There. Now... I'll get the tire on. Good. Let me see where it is. Yeah, there it is on the floor under the steering wheel. Must have been using it tonight, huh? Yeah. I guess so. Pick it up, Ted. The feel of it in your hand. Familiar, isn't it? Part of that hazy pattern in your mind. You have used it tonight. Positive. You can feel it in your right arm, swinging the iron bar hard through the air, landing with a sickening thud on someone's head. There's no doubt anymore. You must have been crazy to run on a tire like that. Good one, too. Plenty of tread left. <laughs> Ain't fit for the junk heap now, though. I was alone on the highway. I didn't have a jacket. Yeah, alone? Couldn't have waited long. Every cop in the county's on the road tonight. They give you a hand, you know. What did you say? Why, cops. Must be a thousand of them tonight, passing by the station. Won't say nothing about what's up, but I can tell they're looking for someone. They'll... Looking for someone, huh? Yeah, a lot like the night they escaped over San Quentin a few years back. Yeah, maybe so. Can you hurry a little? Yeah, sure. Uh, hey, where are you going? San Francisco. Good. Huh? I'll ride across the bridge with you. Uh, uh, hello, officer. Just fixing up the man's tire. Be ready in a shake. Didn't mean to scare you, buddy. McGregor, State Patrol. Left my partner around the corner in the car. Got to pick up another one in San Francisco. Okay? Well, I, I don't know. Well, you said you were going to San Francisco, didn't you? I meant that I... Okay... I'm going to San Francisco. Nice night for ducks. <laughs> yeah, kind of wet. Due to bust loose with some real rain any minute. Say, uh, you ever thought of putting that top up? Huh? Oh, yeah, the top. Yeah, this is one of them fancy automatic ones, isn't it? Yeah, automatic. Well, how about putting it up? Well, well it, it doesn't work. It's, it's broken. Oh, uh, uh, pull into that toll plaza for a second, will you? I want to check with the boys. Yeah, sure. Hello, Mac. Wet enough for you? Yeah. I was just... Who's this? Guy's giving me a ride into town. Left Charlie with a patrol car. I'm going to pick up another one at headquarters. I see. Come into the toll room a second, will you? Something I'd like you to look at. Sure. I'll be right with you, buddy. This ought to be it, Ted. You can see them in the glass-enclosed toll room looking at a paper, then at you arguing about something. Maybe you can run for it. No. Look at that motorcycle cop up in front. He's looking at you, too. And there must be five of them behind you, all waiting. But don't sit there and shake. Do something. Wipe the seat off. Anything. Ought to be a rag in the glove compartment. There. Now what? 
Oh, yes, you're cold. Get that blanket out of the back seat. <laughs> Your heart stops cold, then races like a trip hammer. There, under the blanket, in back, huddled on the floor, is a body. A foot with a gray suede black leather shoe sticking out from under the blanket. Wait a minute, Mac. All right, all right, you can see for yourself. Well? Huh. You're right, Mac. Sure. Wrong guy. Okay, see you in an hour or so. Come on, buddy. Let's get going. Yeah, yeah, okay. Sorry about that last. Eddie's a new man. Eddie? What do you mean? Well, the guy at the plaza. New guy. Got the jitters, you know. Oh, yeah. Seems like everybody's got the jitters tonight. You, uh, you stopped at Martinelli's about a half hour ago, didn't you? Yeah, I had to make a phone call. Martinelli's got the jitters, too. Called headquarters about you. Me? How come? Well, he happened to know we were after a big duck tonight. Thought you were it. So did Eddie. Just like I've been telling the chief. You only ask for trouble when you tip off the amateurs. You say you're after someone? Yeah. Who? I was just saying it don't pay to tip off the amateurs. Hey, pick it up a little, will you? I'm getting wet. Hey, maybe this blanket in the back... Wait a minute, no. What was that? Uh, nothing. <laughs> was close. The other blanket on top of the seat, remember? And he didn't look down. It can't last much longer, Ted. You're ready to drive the car off the road, anything, but you haven't a chance on the Golden Gate Bridge. Cops at both ends and 200 feet down to the water on either side. That crazy idiot! Follow him! Huh? Hurry up! That car! He must have been doing 70! We can catch him at the toll station! That's good for 30 days. He's got to slow up for the toll station. He's going right through. Follow him. We might catch him at the signal. Maybe this is your chance, Ted. You'll get him out of the car anyway while he's writing out the ticket. Your luck's holding out. I knew it. Look up there. He's tangled with that truck at the intersection. Slow down. I'm going to teach that guy a lesson. Pull up here. Okay. I better get out your side. Up against the pole. Yeah. Stick around. All right, everybody. One side. Who's the driver of this car? All right, all right. It's your only chance, Ted. Mingle with the crowd for a minute, two minutes, three. He's busy now, taking names and numbers, writing out citations. And don't argue with me. When you pass us on the bridge, you were doing 70. You're plenty lucky nobody was killed. Why, I'd just as soon hang 20 years for manslaughter on your neck and swat a fly. And don't give me any more back talk. You can save it for the judge. He's forgotten about you, Ted. Ease back toward the car now. He can't see you with people crowding around him. There you are. All set now. Get everything ready. Once you step on that starter, you'll have to move fast. Okay, the switch. The keys. Where are the keys? I had them, I left them. Going somewhere, buddy? No, I... Shut up. Jerry! Yeah, Mac? Take over, will you? I gotta get down to the station. Okay. All right, get going. Here's the keys. I don't play hunches very often, but when I do, I'm usually right. Start the car. Listen, I'm late now. I gotta... be plenty late tonight, brother. You know... A million reasons why you got an egg on your noggin. Black eye, torn clothes. There might even be a reason why you ain't got a registration on the steering wheel. Maybe it ain't back from Sacramento. Maybe you just bought the car. Maybe you lost it. Okay, so I pass them up. Listen, officer, you're right. It isn't my car. It belongs to a friend of mine. Girl in San Rafael, Norma Schaefer. I bought it tonight. Shut up. I ain't finished. And I ain't saying I'm right. Listen, you can phone me. Shut shut up. All right. So I pass up the black eye and the torn clothes and no registration, figuring you got good reasons. But there just ain't a good reason for a guy riding around on a rainy night with a top down. I said it didn't work. Maybe it doesn't. I can be wrong. Give it a try. Where? I don't know. You don't know how, huh? She didn't tell me. It's very simple, pal. All you gotta do is this. And up she comes. I was right, wasn't I? 
Oh, listen, I can explain. You'll have a chance to explain. Don't worry. Only it looks to me like maybe you didn't want to seem too strange to the car where the copper's sitting next to you. Maybe you borrowed it without bothering to tell the guy who owns it, huh? You seem to know all about I'm it. I'm still guessing. Like I told you, we're after a big duck tonight. But I ain't above hauling in a car snitcher on the side. <laughs> There went your last chance, Ted. You may as well give up, spill the works. You were out of your head. Maybe you complete insanity. You're in a locked room at the station now, and the car is safe in the garage downstairs. It's only a matter of time until someone looks under the blanket on the floor in the bag. 2 a.m. Two hours since you woke up with the rain in your face parked on the highway... You're too tired to care now. Your head feels full of broken bottles. You wish they'd call Norma and get it over with. Find out from her that it's Larry's car. The same Larry Craig they found on the highway. Okay, Stratton. Huh? We finally reached her. Norma? Yeah. Okay. Tell me, Stratton, why did you give me the bum steer? What? Why did you tell me it was her car? She told us who it belonged to. I thought she would. What next? Just a little friendly advice. Next time, tell the truth and you'll save yourself a lot of trouble. What do you mean, next time? Next time you pick up a cop in a borrowed car. Okay, you can go. You mean I can leave? Sure. <laughs> Unless you want to spend the night here. Come on. Hey, what's the matter with you? Oh, nothing. Down the stairway here to the garage. Yeah, here's your car. Oh, say, Mac, will you hold it a minute? Hmm? I didn't get this baby logged. Thought you were going to be here longer. Yeah, so did I. I got the motor number and description, but I got to check the luggage compartment. Just a sec. Yeah, looks okay. Seems pretty silly, but these things are important sometimes. Now the back seat. There's nothing there. Just checking. Blanket. No, not the bl- uh. What's the matter with him? He passed out. What's under that blanket? Nothing. The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. Meantime, a word about a way you can add actually thousands of miles to the life of your aging tires through a service offered by Signal Gasoline Dealers. I'm talking about scientific tire switching. You see, tests prove that the right rear tire gets almost three times as much wear as the left front, and the left rear gets 50% more wear than the right front. That's why tires should be switched at least every 4,000 miles, or oftener if you drive on bad roads. Your signal dealer knows the proper method of crisscrossing tires to get maximum wear from each one, including the spare. And while the tires are being switched, is an ideal time to have them thoroughly examined so any small injuries can be found and repaired before they spread and perhaps ruin the tire. Here again, your signal dealer is completely equipped to give you the finest in modern tire repair, whether it's a small patch or a full recap. You see those friendly dealers displaying signals, yellow and black circle sign are much more than just a place to get signal go-farther gasoline and find signal lubrication. Each signal dealer has a complete line of automotive services and fine accessories to help your car run better, look better, and last longer. And now, back to the Whistler. Too much, Ted. Too much to take right from the start. You were hanging by a thread from the moment you opened your eyes at midnight on the highway. You welcomed the sea of blackness that engulfed you when Wilbur lifted the edge of the blanket in the police garage. It was rest at last and peace. You finally opened your eyes in a white hospital room with a white hospital smell in the air. The first thing you see is a pair of shoes underneath the bed next to you. The black and gray suede shoes. Remember? But she will be all 
Sure, sure. He just needs a good rest. Norma. Norma. Ted. Norma. Oh, Ted. Oh, I'm so sorry about everything. It was my fault. Norma, those shoes. They're keeping them in the next room. There's an officer with them all the time. Your brother, when you slug them, they stay slugged. He's got a fractured skull. Oh, Larry, come on in. He's awake. Uh, hello, hero. How do you feel? Larry. I was just checking our victim. Huh? Or what? <laughs> okay, so he's your victim. But I softened him up for you. You must have done the trick with that tire iron, huh? I don't know what you're talking about. The convict, dear. Don't you remember? No, convict. Hey, he doesn't remember. Maybe that's why you were playing games with me. Well, in case you don't know it, Ted, he would have killed me if it weren't for you. He had me on the ropes down at the car when you came up from behind. The last thing I remember is you shoving me into the bushes and taking him on, gun and all, with that tire iron. Oh. And maybe you don't think you made a monkey out of me, riding into San Francisco with a guy tucked away in the back seat all the time. He must have come to and crawled out when we stopped at the accident, I guess. But Jerry nailed him before he'd gone a hundred yards. But, Ted, dear, why in the world did you have to try to take him in by yourself? Why didn't you come back to the house and telephone? Wait a minute. I remember. I stuck him in the back seat, took off. I started to pass out. Pulled over on the shoulder. But, darling... Now don't ask him why, Norma. You may as well get used to the fact that the guy just likes to do it the hard way. Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program, directed by George W. Allen with tonight's story by Harold Swanton, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Marvin Miller speaking and suggesting that you let every traffic signal remind you that you do go farther with Signal Gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with Signal. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Signal gasoline. Let every traffic signal remind you, you do go farther with signal gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with signal. The Signal Oil Company and your neighborhood signal dealer bring you another curious story... By the Whistler. Tonight, Summer Thunder. I am the Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. There is a curious connection between an entry in the records of the British Weather Bureau and a corresponding item in the annals of the police department of Plymouth. The first indicates that at 9 p.m. on the night of August 18th, 1937, tourists and vacationers on the southern channel coast of England were disturbed by a radio warning. Attention, all vessels in channel waters between Land's End, Cornwall and Beachy Head, Sussex. Low-pressure area approaching rapidly from the southwest. Violent storm in prospect. Put into the nearest port immediately. I'll repeat that. Attention, all vessels in channel waters between Land's End. The heat was oppressive, deadly. The atmosphere was so heavy and damp that breathing was an achievement. 
people at the watering places of Torquay and Brixham couldn't sleep and tried to pass the night over tall drinks and sodden bridge games on their verandas. So much for the weather report. The police records indicate that on the same night, a night when the heat had put everyone in southern England on edge, murder was taking shape in the mind of at least one human being. It began in Plymouth, in the second floor apartment of Perry Elliott. Claudia, for heaven's sake, where have you been? I've been calling all over town for you. I'm sorry, Perry. It's nine o'clock. I know it's nine o'clock. Oh, why didn't you call? I thought I'd better wait. Will you come to the point? Perry. I'm sorry, dear. This blasted heat's getting on my nerves, I suppose. I know. Now, come on. Let's sit down here and I'll explain. Now, I, I know this is going to be difficult for you, dear. I want you to try and understand. What are you getting at, Claudia? I've been up to Ivy Bridge. What do you mean? I've just had a talk with your Uncle Rodney. Claudia, you had no oh, please, right to... please, Perry, let me finish. He realizes now how very foolish it was to disinherit you. I think it was a good idea. For the first time in my life, I'm free. <laughs> let us listen, Claudia. I know him like a book. He's frustrated. He doesn't know which way to turn. He's discovered for once that there's something his filth the money won't buy for him. He can't pull strings anymore and watch me jump about like a marionette. Oh, Perry, you don't understand. I'm afraid I do. Did he call you? No, it it was your aunt. Agatha? She's in, she knows better than that. She's only trying to make peace in the family, Perry. I tell you, I don't want his money. Is that clear? He changed his will. Let him leave it that way. I said he's sorry about it. He wants to apologize. Apologize? Wait a minute. Do you know why it all happened? He didn't approve of you. He said I had married a social climber, that I was dragging the noble name of Elliot in the mud. <laughs> Claudia, I can't understand how you could fall for it. I said I'll forgive him, Perry. I see. He's bought you off like the rest of them. Perry, you're not being fair. And you're not very perceptive. Don't shout at me. Very well. Cigarette? No, thank you. Do you have a match? I don't know what's become of my lighter. Here you are. Thanks. Well, Perry? Claudia, darling. Tonight, for the first time in my life, I feel quite capable of killing a man. Perry! I'm rather pleased about it. It'll put me on equal terms with Uncle Rodney. What do you mean? I'm going to see him, dear. When? Now. Two hours later, an unreal calm settled around Plymouth. Nothing stirred. Crickets stopped chirping. Trees suddenly became very still. And the bridge players paused to note there was an electric feeling in the air... The mind of the murderer was tense, too, like the atmosphere. Then it hit. Bridges washed out, roads became bogs. And shortly after midnight, the telephone rang in Claudia Elliott's apartment. Yes? Claudia. Oh, yes, Aunt Agatha, what is it? Something terrible has happened. Rodney is dead. Where's Perry? I don't know. He and Rodney had a terrible scene about money or something. Did you... Did you notify the police? The inspector will be here directly. I'd better come out right away. Here's something for you drivers to think about. Do all Chevrolets get the same number of miles per gallon of gas? Do all Fords? Of course not. For it's an established fact that the mileage you get depends on three things. The condition of your car, the way you drive, and the kind of gasoline you use. Well, those first two factors, they're up to you. But when it comes to gasoline, that's where I come in. For the same company that sponsors the Whistler, Signal Oil Company, also makes the gasoline that's become famous throughout the West as the Go Farther Gasoline. Yes, for years, wise Western drivers who kept careful record of mileage found you do go farther with Signal Gasoline. But what's most important is that even today, 
you still go as far as before the war with signal. And I'll tell you why. You see, although certain high-octane anti-knock ingredients are reserved for war, the mileage ingredients which made pre-war signal famous are still in today's signal formula. And what's more, new hydrocarbons rich in mileage have even been added. Oh, but you're not interested in chemical formulas. You're interested in miles. And there's an easy way to prove that for yourself. Invest your next gas stamps at one of the friendly stations displaying Signal's yellow and black circle sign. Let your own car prove that it's as true today as before the war. You do go farther with Signal gasoline. And now, back to the whistler. You're stunned, Claudia, as you hang up the phone. You aren't conscious of the storm raging outside. All you can hear is Perry's voice over and over saying, Tonight I feel quite capable of killing a man. He should be home in a while, Claudia. What can you do? What can you say to him now? No, he couldn't have done it. You mustn't even think of it. Go out to Ivy Bridge and see the inspector... Find out for yourself. Better take a coat. Perry's raincoat hanging on the rack near the door. Yes, it's going to be a rough trip. But you arrive safely. Evening, madam. Hello, Edmund. Is... The inspector here yet? Not yet, madam. I expect the storm will delay him considerably. Where's Aunt Agatha? Upstairs, madam. Be down directly. Edmund, tell me what happened. Where is Rock? I mean, the body. In his room, on the floor. Exactly where I found him. You found him? Yes, madam. I found him. You... You don't seem very disturbed, Edmund. I'm not, madam. I see. For 20 years I served him. Now I'm through. No, madam. I'm not uh, disturbed. Oh. What are you looking for? Oh, I, I... I had some cigarettes somewhere. There's some on the table. Oh, thank you. Matches there, too. Oh, thanks. I, I've got a lighter. Could I take your coat, madam? Thank you. Hmm. Get us soaking, madam. Edmund, may I see the body? Well, I don't know, madam. The inspector said to leave everything as it oh, was. Oh, please, it's very important. I won't touch anything. Very well. This way. In here, madam. Oh. He was strangled with a chain. The marks are still in his throat. A chain? Oh, but his head... Oh, bloody. He was struck first, madam. Oh, no. No, he couldn't have done it. Not very. Not very. Come along, oh, madam. Claudia. Claudia, dear, where are you? Oh, Aunt Agnes. Claudia, darling. Why did you take her in there, Edmund? She asked me to, madam. You should have known better. There, dear. You may go, Edmund. Oh, it wasn't Perry, Aunt Agatha. Really, it wasn't. He, he said some awful things, but really... Just a minute, dear. Oh, no. I said you may go, Edmund. We won't need you anymore tonight. Very well, madam. <laughs> Aunt Agatha, I must try and call Perry. He may be home by now. You can't, dear. The lines are down. I just tried. Oh, what can I do? I'm sure he didn't do it. Of course he didn't. I'd better go back. The roads are impossible, dear. You'd be taking an awful chance. I know it, but I... Now suppose you get some rest. The storm will very likely blow itself out before morning, and you can go back to town with the inspector. <laughs> Yes, Claudia, you could use some rest, but you lie awake until three in the morning telling yourself over and over that Perry had nothing to do with it, never quite believing yourself. You finally drop off to sleep only to find Perry 
smiling at you from a hundred angles as he toys with a short length of chain. You're trying to tell him, trying to explain, but he continues to smile and tie loops and knots in the chain until finally... It's morning. Six o'clock by your watch. All you can think of now is finding him. You dress hurriedly and leave while the others are still asleep. The storm has passed, the sky is blue, and the morning air is cool in your face as you drive back to town to your apartment. The bed's been slept in, and piled in a heap on the closet floor are the clothes Perry wore last night. The navy blue jacket and white linen pants, sodden and muddy. You lay them out on the floor, and then... There's a suspicious-looking stain on the left leg of the white trousers. Quickly, go through the pockets. A card with a red smear on it, a fingerprint in blood. Now the coat. In the right outside pocket, a short length of chain. Oh, no, Perry. No. Yes? Inspector Dutton, city police calling. Is this Mrs. Elliot? Yes. We're detaining your husband here at headquarters, Mrs. Elliot. Oh, could, could I speak to him? He's being questioned at the moment. If you don't mind, I'd like to come out and have a look at your apartment. Oh, of course. I know. I'll be out in 20 minutes. Very well. Well, Claudia, that puts it up to you, doesn't it? You can go one way or the other. You can produce the piece of chain and the blood-stained linen trousers and see Perry safely off to the gallows. Or you can do what you really want to. After all, does it matter what he's done if you love him? You better decide, Claudia. There isn't much time. First, you burn the card. Then connect the electric iron, get out soap and warm water and a bottle of benzene. Blood is nasty stuff to get out, isn't it? It takes a lot of scrubbing. But finally it's gone, no trace. You iron it partly dry and rumple it up. There, a little dust from the floor and you can't tell it's been touched. But what can you do with the chain? There's the inspector. Quickly, Claudia, put it anywhere. In your purse, that's it. Good morning, Inspector. How do you do, Mrs. Elliot? You returned rather early from Marie Bridge, didn't you? I was quite concerned about Perry. We couldn't get through on the telephone. Did you think of calling at headquarters? Why, I just arrived when you telephoned. I see. Now, uh, let's take a look, eh? Mr. Elliot presumably slept in this room last night? Yes. You haven't disturbed anything? No. Mm-hmm. Ah, yeah. Oh, here we are. Are these are the clothes that he wore last night? Yes. Blue jacket and white linen trousers. I'll take these along if you don't mind. Let me see. Hmm. What is it? Nothing in the pockets, eh? Well, I suppose he emptied them when he changed clothes. I'm afraid your husband is getting into this thing rather deeply, Mrs. Elliot. What do you mean? I think you'd better come along. Oh, couldn't I? Couldn't I drop down later, perhaps a half hour? I'd like to clean up and... It's rather a peculiar position to take, Mrs. Elliot. Perhaps you aren't aware of the fact that your husband's life is at stake. I... I realize that, Inspector. I'll get my purse. Yes, Claudia, your husband's life is at stake. And you realize as you ride to headquarters with Inspector Dutton that his fate may depend on what you do with that short piece of chain in your purse. Oh, Inspector. Hey? I've got a frightful headache. Would you mind stopping for a minute at that chemist? I'd like to get an aspirin. Well, of course. I'll get it for you. Oh, no, please. Well, I insist. It'll only take a moment. Oh, but I'd rather. I'll be back in a jiffy. You can still get rid of it, Claudia. Look, here comes a dump truck. It's filled with dirt. Throw it in the back. Ready? Now! 
missed it. You'll see it, Claudia, lying there in the street next to the car. Pick it up. Hurry. Oh. Here he comes. The sewer right next to the car. He's coming around the other side. He can't see you. Throw it. Oh, oh here we are. Well, they didn't have any aspirin. Will a bromide do? Oh, yes. Yes. That will be splendid. <laughs> Reeves? Uh, yes, Inspector? Uh, Mr. Reeves, uh, this is Mrs. Elliot. How do you do, ma'am? Would you get Mr. Elliot, please? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, he's right here in the next room. Sit down, please. Thank you. Come in, Mr. Elliot. Hello, Claudia. Perry. Sit down, Elliot. Now, I want the complete story this time. I must warn you that anything that you say may be used in evidence against you. Take it down, Reeves. Yes, sir. I've said it so often, I know it by heart. I'll say it again. I left Uncle Rodney's at 11.15. At 11.30, the storm broke and I got stuck in the mud about halfway home. I was there for three hours and all. That's a juicy poor alibi. I told you I can prove it. The chap who stopped to help with... Well, what about him? I asked him for his card. I was going to try to find him and well, reciprocate. What's his name? I didn't even read it. The card's in the pocket of my blue jacket, though. You can call him. The card isn't in the pocket, Mr. Elliot. You can see for yourself. Here. Why, why, I don't know how... Why, it was there last night. I... All right. Where's the chain? What chain? Perry. Wait a minute, Claudia. I told you, Inspector, the man tried to pull me out of the ditch with a chain, but but the chain broke. I remember putting the odd piece in my pocket. Now, what have you done with it? I haven't done anything with it. That jacket's exactly the way I found it on the floor of your closet. You're lying, Inspector. It's got to be there. It's not there. You can see for yourself. All right. When the motor went dead, he thought he might, it might be a clogged petrol line, so we drained a quart or so of ethyl from his petrol tank to fill the carburetor. I spilled some on my trousers. I remember there was a red stain on them when I got in this morning. I, I never use ethyl petrol, do I, Claudia? Do I? Oh, Perry, I... Here are the trousers, Elliot. Look at them. Why, I... What? You see, Elliot? You don't have much of an alibi. Why, why, I don't know. I... And furthermore, can you explain the cut on your hands? They look very much as if you took too tight a grip on a chain. They did quite a bit, didn't they? I, I was holding on to the shackle when he pulled me out. It was a chain. Oh, of course. It's... It's a frame-up, Inspector. Someone's been in my apartment. No one's been in your apartment. Except your wife. Claudia. You. Oh, I don't know what... Take him back, Reeves. Oh, dear me. That'll be all. Yes, sir. You don't need to assist there, Reeves, thank you. I can make it alone. Oh, I know it's difficult, Mrs. Elliot. Oh, they can't convict him on that kind of evidence. Just because he can't prove he was somewhere else. It'll go a long way. We have more positive evidence, of course. What? We know, for example, that he was in the bedroom of the deceased about the time he was killed. Oh, you're wrong. Oh, listen, Inspector, you've got to believe me. This may sound fantastic, but it's true. I destroyed that evidence. I burned the card. I cleaned the red spot in the trousers. What are you talking about? I tell you, I did. Why? Because, because I thought Perry had done it. The card had a bloody thumbprint on it. I thought the pig stain in the trousers was blood. I thought I, thought I was protecting him. What about the chain? <laughs> I thought that was was what he killed Uncle Rodney with. Hmm, what did you do with that? I threw it in the sewer by the chemist when you went in for the aspirin. That's why I wanted you to stop. I'm sorry, Mrs. Elliot. You... You don't believe me? No. Of course, we'll check, but... Uh, uh, Reeves. Yes, sir? Take the lady home. Oh, thank you, please. I said I'm sorry, Mrs. Elliot. Good day. Well, Claudia, you're finally beginning to grasp the horror of the thing you've done. You couldn't have made a smoother job of it if you tried to frame your husband. There's no way out. Or is there? You do believe Perry, don't you? He didn't do it. But if he didn't, who did? 
Rodney wasn't what you'd call a model of popularity. He had enemies, plenty of them. Some, perhaps, with motive enough to kill him. Who would know? Aunt Agatha. As soon as you can get a call through to Ivy Bridge, you telephone her. Perhaps she can help. You feel better when she arrives at the apartment late in the afternoon. I'm so glad you've come, Aunt Agatha. I've made a terrible muddle of things. I wish there was some way I could help, dear. You... You believe, Perry, don't you? Believe what? He's getting stuck in the ditch and having the man help him. I... I don't know. What do you mean? He acted so strangely with Rodney last night. I tried to make him understand, but first thing I knew, Rodney said some things he shouldn't have said. And there was a horrible scene. Perry went into a blue rage and threatened Rodney. I had to leave Claudia. I was afraid of him. What's that? The back door blew open. Oh, I'll get it. Oh, leave it. It's so hot. On the Agatha, he couldn't. I know Perry has a temper, but, but he's kind and good. Oh, don't you see? It must have been someone else. But who, dear? Oh, I don't know. But Uncle Rodney had lots of enemies. There must have been someone who would gain something by his death. Don't you see? Perry had nothing to gain and everything to lose. But he wasn't thinking clearly, dear. Oh, you must know of someone else. That's really why I asked you to come here. There must be someone. Why, I don't know. Agatha, they can't convict him just because he can't prove an alibi, can they? Well, I think that's pretty important. The inspector said something about more positive evidence. What did he mean? Why, I don't know. The lighter, perhaps. The... the what? His cigarette lighter. They found it next to the body. Next to the... Well, that, that's impossible. What do you mean? He didn't have it last night. He left it in the pocket of his raincoat. I had it. I used it right there in the house. And when I came back this morning, I left the coat. Agatha. Somebody took that lighter out of the coat and put it near the body before the police arrived. Afternoon, madam. Edmund, what are you doing here? I mean, listening at the door, Miss Agatha. Eavesdropping. So, that's it. You, Edmund. Better take it easy, madam. I've got a gun. The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. Meantime, I'd like to tell you about two live-wire young Californians who typify the more conscientious, more thorough service your car gets from a privately owned signal station. I'm talking about Bud Morley and Frank Sager, who just a year ago took over their own signal station in Burbank, California. Both, of course, had had years of experience servicing cars. Well, before long, Bud Morley and Frank Sager had more than doubled their business. Now, there must be good reasons for such success, and there are. Those boys are friendly, courteous, eager to please. They not only give service with a smile, but include many little unasked-for extras. For after all, being in business for themselves, they have a personal reason for keeping customers so well-pleased they'll come back again and again. And there, friends, you have the important difference in signal service, a difference in thoroughness and conscientiousness that can add so much to the life of your car. What's more, it costs nothing extra. It's ready for your car at your neighborhood signal gasoline dealers. And now, back to the Whistler. Well, Claudia, it came to you in a flash the minute Agatha mentioned the lighter. Edmund. The peculiar remarks he made when you arrived at the house last night. I'm not disturbed, he said. And then something about being free after 20 years. Yes, it all fits together now, Claudia. Too bad he's standing in front of you with a gun in his hand. You're being very foolish, Edmund. You think you can get away with this? As a matter of fact, madam, that's precisely what I was going to ask you. What do you mean? Edmund, you took the lighter, didn't you? You put it in the bedroom next to the body before the police arrived. Begging your pardon, Mrs. Elliot. But if I may say so, you're underestimating my intelligence. Do you think I'd be so foolish as to plant a piece of evidence which I knew wasn't there at the time of the killing? I saw you use the lighter, you know. 
I took your coat. Edmund, I refuse to listen to you. That will be enough from you, Miss Agatha. You'll have your chance to talk directly. Inspector Dutton is on his way. What do you mean? I heard you saying that Mr. Perry had nothing to gain, Mrs. Elliot. That perhaps there was someone with a bit more of a... Payoff, you might say. Don't listen to him, Claudia. Edmund, what are you trying to say? Mr. Rodney was determined to change the will in Mr. Perry's favor, madam. But he didn't. He'd planned to call the lawyer this morning. He told me to remind him just before the unfortunate incident. So you see, there was someone who stood to lose everything if he'd lived. If you hadn't tried to make it too perfect, Miss Agatha. Agatha! He's lying. The monster's making this up. The small matter of the cigarette lighter, you see. Only you could have made the mistake of thinking Mr. Perry had left his raincoat at the house with the lighter and the pocket. You beast! You can't prove it, you can't! You have a chance to talk, madam. And you'd better be working on your speech. Inspector Dutton is a mighty critical listener. Next Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program, directed by George W. Allen, with tonight's story by Harold Swanton, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Marvin Miller speaking and suggesting that you let every traffic signal remind you that you do go farther with signal gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with signal. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. In 1945, I considered myself a very lucky man because I was the announcer on the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. My name is Harry Bartell. Won't you join me now as I reminisce about those wonderful days of dramatic radio? Glenn Hall Taylor was the producer of the show. He was the Young and Rubicam representative, Young and Rubicam being the advertising agency for Petri Wines. And Edna Best, in the season that I was on the show as, a, as the announcer, was the director. So that uh, Glenn Hall would provide commercial material and so forth for Edna's use, and then Edna directed the show in the booth. She was the one who made all the line changes, all the timing uh, changes, all the cuts, and so forth. I know that Glenn Hall, I think, directed it one year. I got the Sherlock Holmes show by accident. I came over to CBS Studios on Sunset Boulevard one day to rehearse for another show. And the lobby was loaded with announcers. Practically every announcer in Hollywood was there. I couldn't figure out what was going on, and as the secretary came out with her list and said, George or Sam or whoever, I said, what's going on here? And she said, they're announcing, uh, auditioning, rather, for a new show. And I said, who's holding the audition? I said, Edna Best. Edna Best was a lovely, lovely lady. I had worked with her on other shows. And I said, if she has a moment, let me sneak into the studio, if you don't mind, just to say hello, and I'll come right back out. She said, I'll ask. So she came out a little later and said, you can go in for just a second. I went in, stepped in front of the microphone, which was set up in the studio, and said, Edna, I came in to say hello. Hello, bye-bye. And I started to leave. 
And she said, aren't you going to read? And I said, well, no, I hadn't planned to read. She said, well, as long as you're here, read anyway. So she gave me the copy that they were auditioning. And I said, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to see you again. And I left, never dreaming that I would ever get it. Because there were big name announcers, the Ken Carpenters, the Ken Niles, the Wendell Niles, a whole bunch of them. And sure enough, I got a call, and that's how I wound up on the show, because I happened to be in CBS at that time. Petri Wine brings you Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce and the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting story about his good friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And I'd like to tell you something that maybe you already know. The fact that America's favorite wine is port wine. Did you know that? Well, if you didn't, you'll know why port is the way out front favorite if you'll just sample some Petri California port. You just look at that Petri port and you know it's good. That wonderful deep, rich red color. And Petri Port is so clear. Well, just hold it to the light and you can sort of see right through the glass. But what you really want to know about a wine is how does it taste. And I'll tell you something. I, I've never yet been able to find the adjective that'll do Petri Port justice. It's wonderful, honest. You just got to taste it for yourself and find out for yourself. You love that Petri Port in the evening after dinner when you're sitting around listening to the radio. And it's perfect to serve your friends when they come over. Oh, and you can show that Petri label, too. In fact, you can show it proudly, because the name Petri is the proudest name in the history of American wines. And now I'm sure our old friend Dr. Watson's ready for us, so let's go in and join him. Come in, come in, come in. Good evening, Mr. Bartow. Good evening, Doctor. Well, the puppies seem very happy tonight. Yeah, tonight, yes, but you should have seen them this afternoon. I doubt if there were two more frightened little dogs in the whole of California. Well, you not to control yourself. What well, happened, Doctor? Well, I took him for a walk on the beach. And as we were scrambling round a rocky point, a seal popped his head up in the water quite close to us. What did the puppies do? Oh, both of them barked at it furiously. And the seal? Blew a few bubbles and then barked right back. I don't know what the world's speed record is for short-legged dogs. <laughs> I'm sure they're broken. <laughs> you know, Doctor, I'll have to join you on one of those afternoon strolls of yours. You always seem to be having such exciting adventures. Oh, and talking of that, how's about tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure? Well, I'm all ready for you, my boy. In fact, I was looking over my notes on the case just before you arrived. This is another story in which Sherlock Holmes' his elder brother, Mycroft, played an important part. Mycroft Holmes was seven years older than Sherlock, and some said it is superior in powers of observation and deduction. That sounds like heresy, Doctor. No, 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 young fellow, my lad. Holmes himself was the first to admit it. In fact, if it hadn't been for his incurable laziness, Mycroft could have been a formidable rival to his younger brother. However, Mycroft did hold a position of considerable importance at the Foreign Office, and it was there that tonight's story begins. It was in the winter of 1899, and Mycroft Holmes, after a gourmet's lunch, was reclining full length on a leather settee. His eyes were closed, his hands were folded across his stomach, and his breath came rhythmically. A cynic would have declared that Mycroft Holmes was taking an after luncheon snooze. But Mr. Holmes' secretary, a gentleman by the name of Gardner, was a realist. He tapped on the door discreetly. Then he rapped on it. And still there was no response, so he opened the door and entered. After a moment... He gave what he thought was a discreet cough. <coughs> Mycroft Holmes opened his eyes and folded his hands and said, Found it, Gardner. Must you come in here and bark at me so soon after lunch? I'm sorry, Mr. Holmes, but I thought that... You the... thought that as I was lying down with my eyes closed that I must be bored, and so you came galloping in. Oh. Well, what do you want? There's an old lady outside, sir. She insists on seeing you personally. I've tried to get rid of her, but... What's her she... name? Mrs. Hudson, sir. Mrs. Hudson? Huh. Show her in, Gardner. Show her in. Very good, sir. Undoubtedly a message from young Sherlock. How are you, Mrs. Hudson? 
Oh, good day, Mr. Holmes. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I won't take up much of your time. Sit down, won't you? Don't leave us, Gardner. I may need you in a few minutes. Very good, sir. Now, Mrs. Hudson, what's the message? Message, sir? Didn't my brother send you with some message that he was afraid to entrust to the ordinary channels? He's always so confounded and dramatic. Oh, bless your heart. No, sir. I- I've come to you with a little problem of my own. I didn't like to bother Mr. Sherlock Holmes with it. He's been so busy lately, and, and he's looking very tired. And so you came to me. Oh, delightful. I thought you wouldn't mind, sir. You've always been so nice and friendly to me. Pure laziness. It is less effort to keep an old friend than to make a new enemy. But tell me your problem. Well, it, it's really my sister's problem, sir. She keeps a boarding house at 14 Kensington Garden Square in Bayswater. And she's convinced that one of her boarders, a, a man who has a room on the first floor back, she's convinced that he's a bird man. And what in heaven's name is a bird man? Do you know, Gardner? No, sir. I can't imagine. Oh, it's like a werewolf, gentlemen, except that the man turns into a bird. Oh, come now, Mrs. Hudson. Oh, I know it sounds daft, but my sister's in a dreadful state. Of course, I've been with your brother long enough, sir, to know that such things are nonsense. But how can I prove it to her? What reason does your sister give for holding her strange belief? She keeps finding pigeon feathers in the room. Now, the man doesn't keep pigeons, sir. My sister knows that for a fact. Has she found any traces of scattered food on the window ledge? None, sir. No signs of any pigeons, except the feathers. My sister's a wee bit fey, Mr. Holmes. She's the seventh daughter of a seventh daughter, and you know what that means. Just the same, she's not imagining things, sir. She's shown me the feathers herself. Where were they, Mrs. Hudson? Somewhere on the floor by the end of the bedstead, sir. I I brought some along with me. Here, sir. And we found some more in the gentleman's cupboard where he keeps his clothes. By George, I wonder if... What is it, sir? I'll tell you in a moment, Gardner. Uh, Mrs. Hudson, this matter will require a little private investigation. You may return to your sister and tell her not to worry. I shall get in touch with you as soon as my inquiries are completed. Good day to you. Good day, sir. And I'm very much obliged to you. Well, Gardner, what do you make of it? An old wives' tale, sir. You're not treating it seriously, are you? Yes, I am. One of these feathers shows evidence of having had string tightened round it. That suggests a captive bird. Now, a captive bird smuggled into an obscure boarding house would point to something of the greatest importance to us, Gardner. By George, sir. You mean carrier pigeons? Exactly. And remember that we're at war and that the Boers have obtained several important and highly confidential secrets of ours lately. We know there's a leak somewhere. This requires an active investigator who can work with discretion. Now, I could work with discretion, but uh, I don't feel too active at the moment. (laughs) Ah, I have it. I want you to write this letter to my brother. Disguise your hand, use plain, cheap notepaper, and don't sign the letter. He won't be able to resist that combination. Are you ready, Gardner? Yes, sir. Very well, then. Uh, My dear Mr. Sherlock Holmes, uh, we know of your proposed investigation of the tenant in the first floor back at uh, 14 Kensington Garden Square... We warn you, as you value your life, keep away from the... We warn you, as you value your life, to keep away from the case. And that, my dear Watson, is why we are driving towards 14 Kensington Garden Square, disguised as building inspectors of the London County Council. Well, I must say, it's a very challenging letter, Holmes. Unsigned, yes. I noticed. Written on cheap note paper and in a disguised hand. No clue there, I'm afraid. Well, we're, we're entering the square, Holmes. Uh, let's stop the cab here. Uh, you can drop us here, cabby. Go on to your cab, yeah. It would seem a little incongruous in these costumes for us to arrive in a cab. Yes, I suppose so. Here you are, cabby. Oh, thank you, Governor. Supposing this mysterious tenant to the first floor back should be in his room when we get there. Then we must hope that our disguises are convincing and keep our wits about us. Now, this may be a trap. Yes, just what I was going to say. After all, you've never heard of 14 Kensington Garden Square until you received an unsigned letter two hours ago warning you to keep away from it. I don't like the look of it. There we are, number 14. I suggest that you let me do most of the talking. Good God, yes. My cockney accent doesn't compare with yours. Oh, 
Louie, do you want to say? Uh, we're from the London County Council, we are. We've had complaints about a leaky gas jet in the uh, first golf back. Oh, that's Mr. Green's room. He ain't home. Oh, that don't matter, my dear. We'll go up and take a look. Come on, Bertie. Right, right you are, Alfie. Want me to show you the way? The missus is out, shall No, me? thanks, dearie. Me and Bertie can't get lost, can we, Bertie? No, of course we can't. <laughs> of course we can't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look at him laughing. <laughs> uh, come on, Bertie. Oh, I do not to be beside the seaside. Oh, I do not to be beside the sea. Dilly um pum pum pum, dilly um pum pum pum. Nice ass, Bertie, ain't it? Yes, Elf. Nice as can be, this ass. Oh, I do not to be beside the seaside. I do not to be beside us. There we are. First full back. Better make sure the bloke ain't home. Oh, I do not to be beside us. No, ain't home, Alfie. Huh? No, well, all right, let's go in. Oh, so this is the mysterious room, eh? Well, that looks perfectly ordinary, doesn't it? Yes, a depressing example of the squalor of boarding house life. Hello, what's this on the bedspread? Feathers. Must have come out of the pillow. No. He's a pigeon stead, this old chap. And look here, Watson. Attached to the bed rail. No, it's only a piece of string. String, yes, but... With a small metal ring on the end. A ring such as is used to place around a homing pigeon's leg. But why should someone keep carrying pigeons in an obscure boarding house like yes, this? Why indeed, why indeed? The answer could be that the tenant of this room is engaged in some sinister activity that requires the use of carrier pigeons in sending messages. Yes, there's no evidence of the birds being kept here. That's true, fellow, that's true. Uh, possibly the owner of this room is given to... Is given a pigeon by one of his superiors, brings it here, affixes his message, and releases the bird. But why couldn't he just take the message to where they keep the birds? Well, in that way, he would run the risk of being picked up with uh, dangerous and incriminating messages on well, What kind of skullduggery involves the use of carrier pigeons, do you suppose? We're at war with the Boers in South Africa, Watson. What could be more logical than that a spy in their pay should be using this method to smuggle important information out of the country? Right, Jove, yes, Holmes. I wouldn't mind very... Shh! Somebody coming. Look out. Who are you? What the devil do you think you're doing in my room? Well, my name's Bertram and I come here to look at your gas pipes. No, don't lie to me. Who are you? It's like I say, Captain. My name's Bertram, and I come from the London County Council. Uh, very well, then. If you won't tell me the truth, perhaps this revolver will make you change uh, your look mind. Look here, Captain. Look here, right, Captain. Oh. Right. Grab his revolver, Watson. Yes, right. Holmes, where were you? I slipped behind the door as this gentleman opened it. Yeah, me, sir. Your overcoat your coat seems extraordinarily well filled with chest, doesn't it? Why not slip it off? Yeah. It's a bit warm in here. Ah, oh, let me alone. Right. So we, you were right, Holmes. He had a pigeon under his coat. Yeah, uh, yes. See if you can catch the bird, will you, old chap? All right, here. Come on, Pidgey. Pidgey, come on. Come on, little fella. Come along, Pidgey. There he comes. That's it. <laughs> look at the little fella. Snuggled up on my arm. Friendly little fellow, isn't he? Yes, I... Look out, Watson. The gentleman's revolver. Yes, He's going after when it. I get it, I'll... Oh. A beautiful uppercut, Holmes. I'm, uh... I'm afraid he'll be unable to talk to us for some time. How fortunate he told us where the message was hidden before we indulged in this little set What do you too. mean? He didn't say anything about a message? No, not verbally. But I was watching his reflection in the mirror as he entered the room. His eyes first glanced at this top drawer on the dresser here to see if we touched it. It was obviously the most important spot in the room. Let's see. Ah, here we are. A message already rolled up and in its container. Oh? What does it say, Holmes? It's in code, which is not surprising, but I don't think it will be very difficult to decipher. Yes, and when you've done that? Then, my dear fellow, I shall compose a code message of my own and persuade this pigeon to lead us to its master. I can see from your puzzled expression, Watson, that you're wondering why I brought you to Dexter's Music Hall in the Edgware Road. Well, I must confess, I'm a little confused, Holmes. First of all, we go to Baker Street and you spend hours poring over some obscure book. Then you write out a message, attach it to a pigeon, let it loose. Now you bring me here. I hate to question you when you're working, but I should be glad if you'd give me some idea of what's going on. Of course, old chap. At times I must seem confoundedly mysterious, I'm sure. Here's the situation. The obscure book I was studying was a table of ciphers. I was trying to decode the message we found in the room on the first floor well, back. Obviously you succeeded or we wouldn't be here. Yes, the key word was Louis Botha, the name of the Boer leader. 
A message was a report on the number of troops now in training at Aldershot. Then you were right. We're mixed up with a ring of enemy agents. Obviously, old chap. So I kept the original message and composed another using the same code and dispatched it by carrier pigeon. Well, what did you say in your message? Meet me tonight, 8 o'clock, table number 3 at Dexter's Music Hall. What made you choose this place as a rendezvous? Well, I happen to know that it's a common meeting place for underworld characters. And which is table number three? The one over there in the corner. I reserved it. Then why don't we go and sit down there instead of standing it here at the back? I I thought we'd give our visitor the opportunity of showing his hand first. He won't be expecting Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, I fancy. This woman coming on to sing. Do you ever see so many fellows? Not allowed to ever bow except upon the sky. So yesterday he came and took me walking through the Holmes. line. Holmes, Holmes, look, look. A man just sitting down at table number three. What's with it? Look. It's Sid Trimble. Sid Trimble, who's he? A dangerous criminal who once worked for the Moriarty gang. We've caught a prize pigeon, Watson. Better have your revolver handy, old chap. Undoubtedly, he'll recognize us. Right, you are home. Right on, then. I'm so glad you're able to keep your appointment, sir. Sherlock Holmes. This is a trap. No, oh, don't try any tricks. I've got a revolver here, Sid. How would you like this table in your face? This... <laughs> Watson, you didn't shoot him, did you? No, no, he knocked my hand. The revolver went off. I... The shot went wild. I swear it did. Yes, of course. Look at the wound. There are no powder burns. The shot was fired from some distance. Holmes. Holmes, he's... He's dead. Out of the way. Out of the way, please. Now then, what's going on here? Uh, Constable, this man has been killed. Yes, and it's easy to see who did it. Well, I didn't do it, Constable, if that's what you're thinking. No? Then why are you standing here with a smoking revolver in your hand? Come on, you. You're under arrest. But you can't arrest me. I'm Dr. Watson, and this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes. I don't care if you're the King of Siam and the Bishop of London himself. You're under arrest, and I'm taking you both to Scotland Yard. You'll hear the rest of Dr. Watson's story in just a second. And if you don't mind, I'll take that second to say just one word to the ladies. And that word is muscatel. Petri California muscatel. I want you women to know about it because Petri muscatel is one wine that practically every woman likes. Maybe because it's such a beautiful color. Like, well, like pale gold. But I guess really because Petri Muscatel brings you the wonderful flavor of luscious, sun-ripened Muscat grapes. And that's a flavor. Try Petri Muscatel after dinner or any time as a change from Petri Port. Have a bottle of each on hand. When you buy Petri wine, don't buy one, buy two. Remember, if it's a Petri wine, you know it's a good wine. Dr. Watson, that was really one for the books. So you got yourself arrested on a murder charge. Yes, Mr. Bartell. It's a very humiliating experience. I was taken off to Scotland Yard in the Black Marais. Just like any common criminal. The wretched constable wouldn't listen to a word that I'd got to say. Well, Sherlock Holmes went with you, of course. Mm, Naturally. But as we arrived at Scotland Yard, my mortification was complete. And I found that I was led into the presence of our old friend, Inspector Lestrade. Holmes spoke to him at some length, but I could see from Lestrade's expression... My position was a very serious one. Now I can see uh, what it is, Mr. Holmes. You see, I know you both. But I must say there are lots of them here at the yard as don't like what they call your eye-handed method. But, Mr. Our personal likes or dislikes have nothing to do with this. No, no, of course they haven't. This is purely a matter of evidence. Well, I know that, Dr. Watson. And the constable's evidence was as clear as the nose on your face. The dead man was shot through the head, and you were standing in front of the body with a drawn revolver but in your hand. my dear hand. Lestrade, my dear Lestrade, there were no powder burns on the wound. Yeah, that's what you tells me, Mr. Holmes. But I'll have to wait for the official report on that. The police surgeon's examining the body now. 
You understand, gentlemen, I'm not saying I'm sorry that uh, Sid Trimble is dead. He's been a thorn in our side for a good many years. In fact, I... Oh, here's the uh, police surgeon now. Uh, Dr. Hendrix, uh, this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes and uh, Dr. Watson. How do you do? How do you do, do, gentlemen? I'm a great admirer of you both, and I'm sorry to see you in such a very unfortunate plight. Thank you, thank you, Doctor. Uh, What were your findings, Dr. Hendrix? Well, I just extracted the bullet, Lestrade, and I'm very much afraid it's the same make and caliber as the one missing from Dr. Watson's revolver. Yes, but that doesn't prove that I fired the fatal shot. A forty-five Colt's a very common weapon, Doctor. It proves nothing. Uh, Dr. Hendricks, as I was just saying to Inspector Lestrade before you came in, the only fact that would show my friend guilty would be powder burns on the wound, thereby giving, <coughs> proving that the bullet had been fired from close range. I entirely agree with you, Mr. Holmes. Uh, then, uh, as there were no powder burns oh, on the... Oh, but there are powder burns, Mr. Holmes. What? Very distinct ones, too. Good Lord, I... Uh, well, uh, I just... I don't understand, Holmes. I'm sorry, gentlemen, huh? to be the bearer of bad tidings, but... I have my duties to perform. Yes, and I'm sorry too, Dr. Watson. Huh? I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to let you leave here. You must consider yourself under arrest. Holmes, I never felt more despondent in my life. Oh, cheer up, old chap. Well, how can I? Locked up in a prisoner's cell. Looks as if I might end up at the gallows. Don't worry, Watson. You'll be out of here before the night is over. I promise you that. I wish I felt as confident as you do. How do you propose to do it? Oh, with the aid of a little hard thinking. Thinking? (laughs) That won't unlock any cell doors. Thinking. It will, old fellow. It's obvious someone's deliberately trying to incriminate us. Try and reconstruct the killing logically. Hmm? Said Trimble was a member of an espionage ring. I sent him a false message. After he'd uh, left to keep the appointment, one of his colleagues trailed him to the music hall and killed him before he could be betray anything to us. Yes. Yes, that's undoubtedly the way it happened. But the powder burns, Holmes. How do you count for them? There were none just after the shot was fired. We know that. And yet Dr. Hendricks assures us that there are very distinct powder burns now. May we come in, gentlemen? Yes, yes, of course you can, Dr. Hendricks. Oh, hello, Lestrade. Yes, I thought we'd come and uh, chat with you, Dr. Well, that's very nice of you, gentlemen. Yeah, not a bit of it, Doctor. You know, it, it hurts me to see you in here, and that's a fact. And I can't bear to see a fellow medico in such plight without coming in to see what I can do to help, Watson. Yeah, you're very quiet, Mr. Holmes. Am I, Lestrade? I was thinking, you see, uh... What, no chap? I have it. You have what? The answer. You'll sleep in Baker Street tonight after all. Mr. Holmes, what are you talking the about? The murder of Sid Trumbull. The incriminating powder burns were obviously faked. Watson and I know that, whether you and Dr. Hendricks believe it or not. The question is, how were they faked? I think I have the answer. Uh, Dr. Hendricks. Yes, Mr. Holmes? If a blank cartridge were fired at the wound after death, it would produce powder burns, wouldn't it? Undoubtedly. Yeah, but uh, who could have done that, Mr. Holmes? Ah, that's the point, Lestrade. Who had the opportunity? The constable who brought the body here. So, old chap. Huh? Also, you, Dr. Hendricks. That's perfectly true. Yeah. Well, I had the opportunity, too, Mr. Holmes. I spent half an hour in the morgue alone with the body when it first came in. Well, you've narrowed it down to three suspects, Holmes. I hope I don't hang before you find the real killer. I found him, Watson. Why, what? who is he, Mr. Funny? Holmes? The answer is simple, Lestrade. The powder burns were certainly faked by a blank cartridge. Now, if a blank cartridge were fired into a wound, the uh, wadding would have penetrated and distorted the wound. Yes, but supposing the person had removed the wadding from the black Mr. Holmes? Its effect would still be uh, quite apparent to the police surgeon who removed the bullet. Am I correct, Dr. Hendricks? Entirely. A surgeon could not fail to identify the marks, Mr. Holmes. Exactly. Uh, Therefore, only one person could have fired that blank cartridge without detection. The same person who made the incision necessary to remove the cartridge would also remove all traces of the shot. You yourself, Dr. Hendricks. Uh, Holmes, I I believe you're right. (laughs) That's an ingenious theory, Holmes. Surely you're joking. Am I? Then how do you account for the pigeon fellow's feathers on the collar of your coat? Uh, I'm not... The devil with you, Holmes. Here, here, come back here. Hey, doctor. Hey, uh, constable. Come back, Dr. Hendricks. Wait. Great Scott. Scotland Yard itself harboring an enemy agent. <laughs> On my soul, Holmes, you've done it again. I must say you've got sharp eyes. I didn't see those pigeon feathers on, on Hendricks' collar. Uh, confidentially, my dear fellow, neither did I. But Hendricks' guilty conscience knew they might be there. 
It was a shot in the dark, and I had to take it. If you'd spent the night in, in a prison cell, I should never have heard the end of it, I'm sure. Never. I want to see Mr. Mycroft Holmes, please. Follow me, Mrs. Hudson. He's expecting you. Hi, sir. Ah, there you are, Mrs. Hudson. Come and sit down. Oh, thank you, sir. I I got your message and came over right away. In the first place, Mrs. Hudson, you may tell your sister that she needn't worry any more. I'm sure she'll find no more pigeon feathers in her room on the first floor back. No, sir, thank you. But she knows the fact, because the bird man left her yesterday for good. Some strange men came and took him away. And today, she's let the room to a nice young commercial traveller. I- I'm really sorry to have bothered you with her trouble, sir. I'm very glad you did, Mrs. Hudson. Thanks to your information, an enemy espionage ring has been broken, and the British government is deeply grateful to you. <laughs> you're always one for a joke, aren't you, Mr. Holmes? Well, I'm glad you're not angry with me. I'll be going now, sir. Just one more favor I'll ask before I go, though. Anything, Mrs. Hudson. What is it? Please don't tell your brother about this, sir. He'd be so angry with me for wasting your time. Well, Doctor, that was really a swell story tonight. Although it was a bit unexpected for you to have been arrested. Yes, indeed. Mr. Martell, uh, when you're a detective like uh, like Holmes or a doctor like myself, well, you've got to be prepared to meet the unexpected every once in a while. Mm, I suppose so. Of course, you wouldn't know about things like that, being a, a wine expert yourself. Oh, now, wait a minute, Doctor. From the way you talk, you'd think I spent every waking moment in a... Nice, cool wine cellar, tasting wine from morning till night. Well, don't you? (laughs) Oh, now, Doctor, I'm no more a wine expert than you are. All I know about wine is that it either tastes good or it doesn't. And I know that Petri wine does taste good. And that's because the Petri family took time to make good wine. Generations of time. Why, the Petri family's been making wine ever since they started the Petri business way back in the 1800s. And since the business has always been family-owned and operated, they've been able to hand on down from father to son, from father to son, all they've ever learned about the fine art of turning luscious, sun-ripened grapes into fragrant, delicious wine. And they've learned plenty. So no matter what type of wine you want, for any occasion, you can't go wrong with a Petri wine because Petri took time to bring you good wine. Well, Dr. Watson, what story do you have lined up for us next week? Well, now, next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you a weird adventure that Sherlock Holmes and I had in the East End of London. It concerns a most unusual stage play, a badly frightened actor, and a blood-stained razor. I call it The Strange Case of the Demon Barber. <laughs> Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Greek Interpreter. Music is by Dean Fossler. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is Harry Bartell saying goodnight for the Petri family. For a solid hour of exciting mystery dramas, listen every Monday on most of these same stations at 8 o'clock to Michael Shane, followed immediately by Sherlock Holmes. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. This is Harry Bartell. I'll be right back with another new adventure of Sherlock Holmes. Huh?
Tom? Yeah, Bob. We on time? Sure. We just highballed through Danville. Oh, we're coming to that bad curve, huh? Uh, it's not the curve that's bad, Tom. It's the grade crossing just around it I don't like. Hope they make an underpass out of it pretty soon. Where you been? Back in the baggage car. And I've never seen so many armed guards in my life. What are we carrying? Gold. Plenty of it. They gave it to us to carry because we go nonstop from the capital all the way to the city. Gold, huh? Yep. Ah. Well, I guess if this was in the days of Jesse James, we'd be worrying about being stopped, huh? <laughs> hey, Bob, we're coming to that curb. Yeah, and then that crossing. Better whistle for it. Okay. <laughs> That's right. Boy, it must be some load. All the guys they got guarded. Wish I had some of it. Hey, Bob, look. Yeah? There's a car still on the great cross. I know, I see it. Well, the whistle. Quick, quick. Bob. Did we stop in time? No, oh, we couldn't see it until we rounded that curve. We're going to hit that curve. We're going to hit it hard. Hold on, Tom. Hold on. And now, on to Dick Calmer as Boston Blackie. Enemy to those who make him an enemy. Friend to those who have no friend. Well, Harry, there she goes. That's right, Jeter. And here he comes, walking towards us, just as if he knew we were hiding yeah. here. Then again, why shouldn't he know? He had his instructions, same as we had ours. He knew we'd be in these bushes. Yeah, I know. This is going to give a hundred people a headache. Wait till they try and find out what this is all about. Uh, I got news for you. Uh, yeah? I don't know either. You don't have to know. All you got to know is you're going to get paid. You can't figure this out. Nobody's going to figure this out. But somebody is going to be very happy. Believe me, somebody's going to be very happy. This is Blackie. Oh, hello, Blackie. Are you back in town? No, Mary, I'm not. I'm still down here in Danville. And what a metropolis. It's nothing more than a crossroads with a railroad station. You must love it down there, then. When are you coming back? Well, that's why I called you, Mary. I've just finished my business here, but there's not another train out of here for six hours, so I won't see you until late tonight. Come in. What did you say just then, Blackie? I said come in. There's someone just knocked on the door. I'll see you tonight, then. Late, Mary. Bye. Bye. Boston Blackie? Mm-hmm. Well, hello, beautiful. Are you Miss Danville or Mrs. Danville? I'm Margaret Perkins, Blackie. I've heard about you, and and I need your help. That's what I like, the subtle approach. Uh, but I'm sorry. I'm a little out of my territory in this town of yours. You've got I... to help me, Blackie. I'm afraid my brother is in some kind of trouble. Sounds to me like he's the one who needs the help, then. Sorry, Miss Perkins, Blackie, I could Blackie, please... Hmm. That's the kind of logic I like. You think your brother is in trouble? This note he left me when he disappeared yesterday morning. What does it say? Please read it. Okay. Hmm. It says, uh, Goodbye, Margaret. I'm leaving this town for good and with enough money to keep me going for a long time. Don't try to find me. You never will. Signed, Harry. Well... You noticed what this note was written on, I suppose. Yes, yes, the back of a railroad timetable. Mm-hmm, and there's a ring drawn around a special train, the Metropolitan Flyer. Well, yes, I noticed that, Well, but... it's obvious, Miss Perkins. Your brother is going to the city. There's no point in looking for him around here. Well, that's what I thought. Danville's too small for him to be here without my knowing about it. I'll tell you what I'll do, Miss Perkins. I can't get a train out of here for another six hours. But I'm going down to the railroad station to pick up my ticket. Maybe that's a good place to pick up something on your brother, too. Take it to the city, please. Yeah, to the city, young fella. Ain't a train out of Danville today again for another five and a half hours. Yes, I know that, but I'll get my ticket now. That is, if you don't mind. Yeah, the only thing I mind is my rheumatism. 
<clears throat> One way, you say, uh, there'll be a dollar and fifty cents. One fifty. Okay, here you are. Uh, thank you, and here's your ticket, young fella. Thank you. Say, by the way, you didn't see this young lady's brother in here yesterday, did you? Hello, Mr. Washburn. Oh, howdy there, Margaret. Uh, didn't see you. Uh, looking for Harry, are you? Yes. Nope, I ain't seen him. We think he took the Metropolitan Flyer out of here yesterday. Flyer? Uh, you mean the non-stop from the Capitol? Yes, I have an idea. Well, the, the pro- idea's bad, Sonny. Flyer don't stop here. Never has in 50 years. Yes, it ever came was yesterday when it hit an auto up at the crossing mile and a quarter past here. Oh, how terrible. Was anyone in the car hurt? Anybody hurt? Nope. And you know that was the funny thing about it. There weren't nobody in the car. There weren't nobody around even. And this auto was just sitting on the tracks all by itself. And no one ever claimed the wreck? Nope. Guess whoever owned the thing just walked off and left it. Mighty funny place to leave it, though, on the main line tracks with the Metropolitan Flyer coming through. Apparently, it stopped the flyer, though, didn't it? Oh, sure did. Flyer was standing out there in the middle of nowhere for 20 minutes. Uh, but that don't have nothing to do with your brother, Margaret. Uh, I ain't seen him, not in a couple of days. Well, thanks, Mr. Washburn. Thanks a lot. Yes, thanks, old time. It's all right, young fella. And same as Perkins, is there a place in town where we can borrow a car? Why, yes, we can use my uncle's. Good. Let's get your uncle's car and go have a look at that wreck that stopped the flyer yesterday. Well, if you want to, but I don't Ms. think... Miss Perkins, your brother put a ring around the Metropolitan Flyer on the timetable for a reason. I'd like to take a flyer at looking at that wreck for a reason, too. <laughs> the track. And what a wreck, too, Miss Perkins. Good thing there was no one in it. Well, let's get out and have a look at that car. I don't know what it has to do with finding my brother, but if you say so... I don't say so. I just have a hunch, that's all. Something very strange about an empty car being left on a grade crossing. If it were out of gas, it could have been pushed off before it was abandoned. Whew. Look at this mess. It's hard to believe it was once an automobile, isn't it? I don't think that it's been classed as much of an automobile for a long time. Must be 10 or 12 years old. Say, here's a door frame with a body number on it. Does that mean anything? It means I might be able to find out who owned this car. I think I'll write it down. 732. Good heavens, what's this Uh, terrible mess? uh, That, Miss Perkins, was the engine. Hmm. The motor number's still visible. I think I'll write that down, too. Why, well, I thought license plates were the best means of a car identification. Well, they're fairly good, but not much help in this case. This car doesn't have plates. Oh, so it doesn't. That convinces me more than ever that... Say, look at this. Look at what? See this round hole in the motor block here? Yes. Well, that's where the carburetor belongs. And this engine had no carburetor. Is that bad? Well, <laughs> it isn't good. If you expect to do any driving... An engine can't run without one. Oh. Well, maybe it was knocked off in the accident. Oh, no. This motor hasn't had a carburetor for years. The place it should be attached to is all rusted over here. This car was pushed a towed here and purposely left on the tracks. Well, that means someone wanted it to be hit by the train. But why? Why? To stop the train, of course. But why did someone want to stop that flyer? Well, I'm sure I don't know. Well, I don't either. This might have nothing to do with your brother, but it has me puzzled. The first thing I want to find out is who owned this car. There's an automobile dealer in Danville, isn't there? Yes, Mr. Boswell. Well, Mr. Boswell knows a lot about cars, I'm sure. Let's go see how much he knows about people who buy them. Yes, Blackie, you sold that car yesterday morning at 9 o'clock. At 9 o'clock yesterday morning, eh, Mr. Boswell? And the Metropolitan Flyer comes through Danville at 10. Yes, yeah, sir. Sure. Like clockwork. That means the car was bought just one hour before the Flyer hit it and wrecked it. This is getting more interesting every minute. Well, that means the car was bought to stop the train, doesn't it? <laughs> it wasn't bought for any cross-country tour. It wasn't even in running condition, was it, Mr. Boswell? Uh, no, no, it wasn't, Blackie. Two men who bought it had to tow it away. Two men bought the car, huh? Did you know them? I uh, knew one of them. It was your uh, brother Harry, Miss Perkins. My brother? Yes, he came in with a fellow I've seen before, but don't know by name. I think your brother called him Skeet, though, or Pete, or something like that. Well, so Harry and his friend bought that car to stop the Metropolitan Flyer. Okay, here's where I start finding out why that train was stopped. <laughs> Thank you. 
Give me your keys, Miss Perkins. I'll unlock the door for you. People in small towns never lock doors, Blackie. You'll come in a while? Yes, it's still several hours before my train leaves, and there's nothing I can do about your brother till I get to the city. You think that's obviously where he's gone? I think that more than ever now. I think he used the car to stop the Metropolitan Flyer and got on it. Let's go in and talk this over. Oh, yes, of course. Uh, Harry! Oh, he's been shot Harry. several times. Harry, what's happened? Who did this to you? Oh, tell me, darling, who did this? Harry! Harry, what is it? I got to... Got to tell... Tell why... Why we stop... Stop the train. I got to... Oh. Harry! It's no use, Miss Perkins. I'm awfully sorry, but he's dead. Yes, I know he is, Blackie. I... Go ahead. Cry if you want to. It'll do you good. <laughs> What's this in his shirt pocket here? Looks like a newspaper clipping. This is what Harry was trying to tell us. This newspaper clipping says the Metropolitan Flyer was carrying gold. A million dollars in gold. I thought it was something like that. Number please. Operator, get me Inspector Faraday at police headquarters in the city right away. Faraday speaking. Hello, Faraday. This is Blackie. I have the case you're working on solved for you already. Oh, you have, have you? Well, what makes you think you've solved it? And how did you even know I was working on a case? Oh, I didn't say you were working, pal. I don't expect miracles. I just said you've got a case that probably has you stopped. Well, for once, you know what you're talking about. It's the toughest, biggest case I've had in years. And if I don't crack it soon, the commissioner's going to make a traffic cop out of me. Oh, who did it, Blackie? Harry Perkins and a fellow named Skeet or Pete. Perkins? A fellow named Skeet? Who are they? The two men who robbed that shipment of gold. Gold? What gold? The gold that was supposed to come in from the Capitol on the Metropolitan Flyer yesterday morning. You must be crazier than I thought, Blackie. That gold arrived on schedule yesterday, and it's safe and sound in the National Bank. No. Yes. I'm not looking for any gold, beg, borrowed, or stolen. I'm looking for the guy who killed Roger Lane. Roger Lane? Who's he? He's the guy whose murderer you aren't letting me find. Because you're bothering me, that's who. No gold is missing? Uh, if you had any in your teeth, it'd be missing. Because I'd knock it out. Now, hang up and don't bother me, Blackie. I got something on my mind. On it, but not in it. Okay, Faraday. Maybe you do have a problem, but believe me, trying to figure out when a train was stopped has me stopped, too. And now, back to Boston Blackie. Harry Perkins and a man not yet properly identified bought an old automobile and placed it on a grade crossing where it was hit and demolished by a non-stop railroad train carrying a shipment of gold. But though the train was stopped, it was not robbed. Later, Harry is shot to death by an unknown assailant. And Boston Blackie, working on the case for the dead man's sister and searching for a reason why the train was stopped, comes to the city in search of clues. With him, as he knocks on Mary Wesley's door, is the dead man's sister. Hello, Mary. Oh, Hello. Blackie, come in. I'm so glad. Oh. Oh, it's not what you're thinking, Mary. Miss Perkins, Miss Wesley? Well, I don't have to say it the other way, too, do I? Oh, of course you don't. How do you do, Miss How Perkins? How do you do? Miss Perkins is the girl I told you about on the phone just before I left Danville, Mary. Oh. Oh, I see. Oh, Miss Perkins, I'm awfully sorry about your brother. And I know that Blackie will find out who killed him. I hope so. Won't you come in, both of you? We will. And, Mary, I'm going to ask you a favor. Of course, Blackie. I want you to keep Miss Perkins here with you for a day or two until I find out who killed her brother. I'm sure his death had something to do with the stopping of that Metropolitan Flyer. Harry and his killer stopped that train together for a reason I can't understand. Yet. Well, maybe the train was wrong. Well, that's what we both thought, Miss Wesley, until Blackie found out the gold it was carrying wasn't stolen. Yes, I wondered about that. Maybe it was stolen, and Faraday just won't admit it. Well, make Miss Perkins comfortable, will you, Mary? I'm going to make Inspector Faraday uncomfortable. (laughs) 
So you think the shipment of gold was stolen off that train, do you, Blanky? Yes, Faraday, and I think it's such a big case, the authorities decided to leave you out of it. Oh, is that so? Well, let me tell you something, wise guy. This afternoon, I talked to the bank that was supposed to receive that dough, and they got it. Do you hear? They got it. Now, beat it, Blanky. I got problems. You always have problems. Now, listen to I'm me. I'm not listening have... to anything. I've got a murder to worry about. Roger Lane was killed this morning at about 7 o'clock. And I know who killed him. Well, that's fine. Arrest the killer, and then let's try to figure out the thing that's got me stopped. Well, forget it, will you? I've got a killer, and I know his name. Sam Baldwin. I know he killed Roger Lane. Yet I can't break his alibi. Maybe that's because he isn't your killer. Oh, no. Look, Faraday. There was the Metropolitan Flyer standing out there in the country with a couple of million dollars in gold in the baggage car. It was stopped on purpose. But it wasn't for the gold. What was it stopped for? I don't know, and I don't care. Maybe it was on the wrong track. All I know is that if you think that flyer was stopped for the gold, you're on the wrong track, too. Look, Baldwin, sit there and smirk till your face freezes in a grin if you want to. But I know you killed your partner. <laughs> you, you know it, huh, Inspector Faraday? Then why don't you arrest me? Because I don't make arrests until I have proof. Until I can slap a charge on a man and make that charge stick. Then why do you bother me? Can you prove I killed Roger? No, but I can prove you had a motive. No, can you? Yes. Lane embezzled from the company. He stole plenty from you. Mm-hmm, so he did. I can also prove it was your gun that killed him, can't I? Yes, yes, you can, Inspector. I admit it was my gun that killed him. But does that mean that I was the one who fired that gun? I say it does. Oh, but how can that be, Inspector? You forget I was in the Capitol. Or I was on my way back from the Capitol when Roger was shot, wasn't I? Yeah, you were. That's why you aren't under arrest. Yet. And why I'll never be under arrest? Do you think a jury would believe that I shot and killed Roger Lane this morning at 7 o'clock when I boarded the flyer in the Capitol at midnight last night and arrived here at 11? <laughs> well, man, I was four hours outside the city when Roger was killed. You checked with the conductor... He told you when I got on and off. Yes, yes, he remembered you getting off. That's why... Say, Boston Blackie said something about a train that gives me an idea. You think you have a foolproof alibi, do you, Baldwin? Well, it does prove I couldn't possibly have murdered my friend Roger. Oh, it does, does it? Well, I'm going to find Blackie, and when I do, I think maybe I'll find a hole in that alibi of yours. I'll see you later, Baldwin. Mm-hmm. You will, huh? Jeter Johnson, please. Speaking. Oh, Jeter. Inspector Faraday was here again. So what, Baldwin? What are you worried about? Plenty. But why? I took care of the only guy who could rat on us. Harry Perkins is dead. Yes, yes, I know you took care of him all right, and that was good work. But, Jeter, you're going to have to take care of somebody else the same way. Oh. Boston Blackie. Boston Blackie? I don't want to mess with that guy. Look, you want to go to the chair for killing Harry Perkins? No, but what does Blackie know about who killed Harry? Nothing yet, but he will pretty soon, because he seems to know something about why you and Harry stopped that train near Danville this morning. What? He knows why we stopped it? I think he does. And if he gets to the police with it, they'll be able to prove that I killed my partner. Uh Uh-oh. And, Jeet, if I go to the chair for killing Lane, you'll go there, too, for killing Harry. I'll say to it. So, uh, don't you think you ought to take care of Blackie? Huh? I'll get it, Margaret. It's probably Blackie. All right. You don't think he has any news, do you, Mary? He might. Blackie solves very difficult cases awful fast sometimes. Yes, I know. Hello, Blackie. Oh, hello. Hiya. You're Boston Blackie's girl. Is he here? No, no, he's not, but uh, he's expected any minute. Good. I got a tip. If he wasn't home, he'd be here at your apartment. I'll wait for him. Well, I... All right, come in. Thanks. Hey, nice place you got here. Why, Jeter. Jeter Johnson, what are you doing here? Well, Margaret, what are you doing out at Danville? I thought you weren't ever going to leave the place. I'm I'm here because of Harry. 
He was murdered this morning, Jeter. Murdered? Oh, say I know how you feel, Jeter. You were one of his best friends. Oh, excuse me, Miss Wesley. It's Mr. Johnson. How do you do, Mr. Johnson? Jeter and I are old friends. He lives in Thomasville, just three miles from Danville. Oh, I see. And you're an old friend of Blackie's, too. Yeah. Well, this is all very chummy. You uh, don't mind if I wait for him, huh? No, not at all, Mr. Johnson. But do you have to wait for him with a gun? A gun? The outline of a gun is pretty evident in your coat pocket. Okay. So what if I am packing a gun? Just stand uh, right where you are, both of you. Jeter. I'm waiting for Blackie. And what do you want with him? I just want to find out what he knows. My boss thinks it might be too much. That's why I'm waiting for him with, uh, like you say, Miss Wesley, a gun in my pocket. Now, if he doesn't know anything, the gun stays there. Simple, isn't it? Well, what is it that Blackie is supposed to know about? Why the Metropolitan Flyer was stopped. Oh, I'm sure he doesn't know a thing about that. Now, believe me, he doesn't. Sure, I'll believe you right away. Oh, oh. There's Blackie now. He'll tell you that he... Miss Wesley, I'm getting behind that door in the other room. Let Blackie in, but don't say I'm here. I'll let all three of you have it. Don't forget. Don't worry, I wish I could. Okay. Let Blackie in. Yes, but in for what? Margaret, cross your fingers that Blackie doesn't know anything. They're crossed. Good. Hello, Mary. Oh, come in, Blackie. My goodness, you you it's don't Mary, know... Mary, Mary, a... I've got it. I've got it. I've got the answer to the whole case. Oh, for goodness sakes, you mean the Afghanistan case, don't you? That's wonderful. Afghanistan? But, but I... What are you talking uh, oh, about? Afghanistan, Blackie, you know. I do not, but I do know... Why that train was stopped just north of Danville this morning. Oh, that. Who cares about that? Who cares about it? I do, and Faraday is going to care about it, too. Look at this clipping I found in the afternoon paper. It says Thomas Baldwin of the Capitol, brother of Sam Baldwin of this city, bought a small building today. Blackie, that doesn't mean anything. It really doesn't, does it? Uh, Uh, Mary, stop making those silly faces. I'm serious about this. It's a clue to the whole thing. I know why. That train was stopped this morning to let Thomas Baldwin get off and go back to the Capitol and let Sam Baldwin get on in his place. Oh, but Blackie, that doesn't make any kind of sense. Don't you see that... I certainly do see, Miss Perkins. Sam Baldwin phoned his brother in the Capitol to take the Metropolitan Flyer to the city at midnight last night. Oh. At seven this morning, he killed Roger Lane. Blackie, you don't know what you're saying. Don't I, though? Listen, by 8.39, he was near Danville, 50 miles from here, where Harry Perkins and his friends stopped the Metropolitan Flyer with that old jalopy. Oh, Blackie, I don't think my brother had anything to do with that. Look, let me finish, will you? The whole thing works out perfectly. When the train was stopped and the passengers got out to look at the wreck, Thomas Baldwin got off and went back to the Capitol by bus or car. And his brother Sam Baldwin got on the train in his place. That's right, Blackie. Uh, Who's that? Blackie, I tried to stop you. Oh, man with a gun. Yeah, a man with a gun. And you're a man with no future. You're the man who killed Harry Perkins, aren't you? That's right. I bought the jalopy with him, only the dealer knew him, so I had to knock off Harry. The name's Johnson. Jeter Johnson. Blackie, I tried to warn you that he was here and tell you not to let on you knew anything about that train. Oh, that was the Afghanistan gag, wasn't You're gonna wish you were in Afghanistan in a minute, Blackie. Come on, out the door. You girls, too. We're all going bye-bye. Oh, they're not, pal. Oh, but you are, Johnson. Uh, what Barry. goes here? Drop that gun, you. Go, no, copper. Not without dropping you first. <laughs> Why, you... You both missed Faraday, but I've got Jeter. Go, oh, no, you haven't, Blackie. Blackie, look out. He's getting away. No, no, he isn't. Oh, oh Blackie, what a suck. Uh, Mary, please, such language. <gasps> well, here he is, Faraday, all yours. And Sam Baldwin is going to be yours, too. You know that? Yeah. I came looking for you, Blackie, to get more information about that train. I heard it all while I waited outside that door. Then you know how Baldwin could have murdered his partner at 7 this morning and still come in on the Metropolitan Flyer at 11 o'clock? Sure. But don't forget, you thought the Flyer was stopped because it was carrying gold. Yes, I did. And one of these days, somebody's going to mistake me for a train. I've been carrying you for years.
Hello? Yes, this is the Falcon speaking. Oh, Grace. Well, I'm glad you called. I'll have to cancel out tonight, Angel. I'm all jammed up. Mm-hmm. Some girl I know just brought me a very unusual proposition, and I'll be hanged if I touch it. The Adventures of the Falcon, starring Les Damon. You met the Falcon first in his best-selling novels. Then you saw him in his thrilling motion picture series. Now, join him on the air when the Falcon solves... The Case of the Talented Twins. Case of the Talented Twins. It's late evening in New York, and the yellow convertible tears down Riverside Drive. At the wheel is George Alexander, who operates the car as though he owned the streets. Yeah, Mr. Alexander is a big operator. And the blonde alongside of him knows him. You warm enough, Masha? Oh, I'm fine, Mr. Alexander. My friends call me George. Now, why don't... Oh, you passed it. Huh? You should have turned right on 76th. What for? Well, that's where I live. Oh, I'm not taking you home, Marsha. Now, really, Mr. Alexander... George. The only reason I consented to go with you was because Mr. Kemp introduced us. You like singing at Mr. Kemp's club? Yes, of course. What's that got to do with it? It's got everything to do with sweetheart. I own the joint. Oh. Sure. Whose idea do you think it is for Kemp to give you a job in the first place? Uh, I didn't know. Well, any time you don't know something, Marsha, you just ask George. He's got all the answers. Well, if you don't mind, Mr. George, I'd like to go home. Really, I've got a splitting headache. That's okay. I have my boy fix you up something in my place. Now, why don't you sit a little closer? I'm perfectly comfortable over here. Nah, it's oh, too far away. Please, Mr. Alexander, you better look where you're going. <laughs> Come on, Masha, be sociable. What, do you want to sit there all look by... Look out! Huh? You better hit that man! Why not? He may be dead. Then we can't do him any good. Let me out. Get your hand off that door, Marsha. I'll let you go when I'm good and ready. And I'm not ready yet. Yes? I'm looking for Michael Waring. Well, you've come to the right place. Are you the one they call the Falcon? When they can't think of anything worse. Come on in, Miss... Uh... Davis. Ruth Davis. Sit down. Thanks. Now, what can I do for you? I'm not quite sure. Did you happen to notice an item in this morning's paper about a man being killed in a hit-and-run accident last night? Yes? Yeah. That man was my father. Oh, I'm sorry. I want you to find the driver of that car. Why? Well, isn't it obvious? That man murdered my dad. He murdered him just as surely as if he used a gun. I don't care what it costs. Well, you should, Angel. I'd be lying if I didn't tell you that anything you invest in a case like this, it'd be money thrown down the sewer. As I recall, the police don't have a single lead. Oh, yes, they do. There was a man named Arthur Crane who witnessed the accident. He might know more than he's told them. What makes you think so? Call it a woman's intuition. Well, you know, that's greatly overrated. And... Maybe, but there's no harm in trying. Uh-huh. What did you say this witness's name was again? Arthur Crane. Arthur Crane. All right, Angel, I'll do what I can. Uh, here it is, Artie. Uh, Alexander George, real estate, 1792 Belmore... It's uh, Elwood O6742. wonder if that's the right Alexander. Well, it has to be. Didn't the license bureau tell you that was the name of the party who owned the car? Yep. Well, this is the only George Alexander in the book. All right, hand me the phone. Right. What's that number again? Uh, Elwood O6742. See who that is, man. You expecting anyone? No. Too early for Jack to drop around. Just a second. Yeah. You want the crane? No. Well, is he in? Who is it, Pete? Uh, it's some guy who wants to see you. How do you do, Mr. Crane? How do you do? 
My name is Mike Waring. I'm a private detective. Private detective? Yeah, at the moment I'm working for Ruth Davis. Who? Ruth Davis. She's the daughter of the man who was killed last night in that hit-and-run accident. Oh, well, sit down, won't you? Pete, see if we got any beer on ice. Yeah. Uh, don't bother, Mr. Uh... Uh, Jordan. Pete Jordan, and it's no bother at all. Yeah, go on, Pete. Now, uh, what can I do for you, Warren? Well, according to the police blotter, you were the one who discovered Davis's body after the accident. That's right. I was coming home from a club date. Club date? Mm-hmm. I'm a musician. Oh. I play piano with a small combo around town. Mm-hmm. Well, go on. Well, just as I got out of the subway, I saw this guy Davis laying in the gutter. What time was that? Oh, it must have been around uh, quarter past three. First, I thought it was just some stew bum, you know. Mm-hmm. Until I saw that briefcase under his arm, then I realized it must have been an accident. Well, you couldn't have gotten there much after it happened. That's what the cops told me. You didn't notice any sign of a car around? Nope. Well, there couldn't have been too many cars out of that hour. This is very important to my client. Look, Waring, if there was any way I could possibly help you, I'd be glad to. Any driver who pulls a stunt like that ought to get it in the neck. Yeah, sure, but uh, you can't tell me any more than you have, huh? Not a thing. I'm sorry. I wish I could. Well, here's your beer, gents. Well, I'm afraid I'll have to ask for rain check, Jordan. You going already? Yeah, I got to. But uh, I'll leave my card. If you think of anything... Just leave it to me, Waring. If I think of anything, I'll know what to do. <laughs> Mr. George Alexander around? Who wants to know? My name is Artie Crane, but uh, I don't think it'll mean much to him. Just say I'd like to talk to him about a yellow Buick convertible. You what? Tell him I admire his taste in cars. You're nuts. Mr. Alexander doesn't own any convertible. That's not what the license bureau told me. Uh, maybe you better come in, Buster. Yeah, maybe I better. Sit down. I'll get Alexander. Hey, that's a nifty-looking piano he's got there. Mind if I try it? Just so you don't break it. That's very pretty, mister. You like? Yeah. What do you call it? I've got those gimme, gimme blues. A very original title. I'm a very original guy, Mr. Alexander. How so? Well, 99 guys out of 100 who know what I know would have spilled everything to the cops. But not you, huh? Mm-mm. Little Artie knows when to keep his mouth shut. For instance... Keep out of this, Vince. Go on, Crane. Well, for instance, last night I was coming home late and I saw a car bowl over some character who was crossing the street. Fortunately, I had enough presence of mind to copy down the license number. And you think this car belongs to me? Mm-hmm. You're wrong. Okay. I'm perfectly willing to leave it to Mike Waring. The Falcon? That's right. He's working for the daughter of the poor slob who got hit. He was around to see me this afternoon, wanted to know if I could help him. And you told him? Not a thing. I thought I could help you more. How much more? About ten thousand dollars worth. Why, you dirty little let, let go. Should I throw him out, George? Calm yourself, Vince. Don't be so free with your hands. You Mr. shouldn't blame him, Marty. Vince never liked that. Ah, well, that little pushing around is going to cost you another five, Alexander. Why, take it easy, Vince. You think the money was coming out of your pocket? So now you want fifteen thousand dollars, eh, Artie? Otherwise, I go straight to Waring's and from there to the cops. Well, I wouldn't want you to make such a trip on my account. Then you better get it up. Okay, Artie. You leave it to me. I'll take care of you. And when I get through, I bet you don't complain. Now back to the adventures of the Falcon. Two hours have passed since Artie Crane made his little call on Mr. Alexander. Now we find Mike making a call of his own. Only his isn't nearly as successful. So when you come right down to it, Mr. Waring, you've made no progress at all. Well, I could give you a big song and dance, Ruth. No, thanks. I'm in no mood for entertainment. You see, the truth of the matter is I'm stymied. The only potential witness we had was this musician, Artie Crane. And he couldn't tell you anything? No, not a single solitary... 
Oh, wait a minute. What's the matter? That briefcase your father was carrying... That won't help you. They found it clear across the street where it was knocked by the car. Well, if it was knocked there by the... Say that again. Why? This Artie Crane character told me he realized that it wasn't some drunk sleeping it off when he noticed the briefcase under your father's arm. Well, what's wrong with that? Hey, you just said it, Angel. The car sent that briefcase flying. If Crane saw it under your father's arm, it could only have been while your father was alive. Then Crane was lying. That he was. Well, you think... I think I ought to have another little talk with that boy. Oh. Let's see if we can get him up here. He, he won't suspect anything? Not if it's put to him the right way. Well, what are you telling me? Now, don't you worry, Ruth. I'll add lead something. Uh, hello, I'd like to speak to Artie Crane, please. Who wants him? Mike Waring. Well, Artie isn't here. This Pete Jordan? No, Pete isn't here either. Well, where is everybody? Unless there's been a change in plans, you might try the morgue. Hello, you still there, mister? Yeah, I'm just waiting for the top right. Hey, wait a minute. Is this Sergeant Corbett? Sure is, Mike. All right, Corbett. Give it to me gently. Who did what to whom? Well... Home is your friend Artie Crane. The what was a half dozen slugs through his head. As far as the who is concerned, we got no idea. Have you, Mr. Waring? Okay, okay, I'm coming. Hello, Pete. Oh, hi, Mr. Waring. Well, I drop around and redeem that rain check. Rain check? I asked for one the last time I was here. Oh, yeah. Well, I guess you heard about Artie. Mm-hmm. That his piano? Yeah. To think he'll never touch it again. Mm. Just how good was he on it? Oh, you can have the Duke and Count Basie. You ought to take an Artie any time. You a musician, too? Yeah, but I wasn't in his class. I, I, I used to sing a little. Oh. Well, how about an audition? What do you mean? Well, you never can tell, Pete. I may want to sponsor you. So let's hear how well you do in the voice department. Who killed Artie? Now, look, you can't talk to me like that. Come on, Pigeon, sing. <laughs> Artie, ouch. I wouldn't try that. If your big brother was around. Let me go. Not before we have a solo. Now, who killed Artie? How should I know? You should if anyone would. Who had it in for him? No one. Everybody liked him. Uh -huh. So one of his admirers pumped six slugs into his face so even his own mother wouldn't recognize him. Incidentally, how did you? There wasn't a thing on the body. Well, I, I found him here. Might have been a visitor from Mars. Yeah, but he had a, a flag tattooed on his shoulder. A patriot, no less. Who was the hit-and-run driver who killed Davis? I don't know what you mean. Yes, you do, Pete. Artie must have told you everything. He saw the car that killed Davis. No, no, he didn't. You know, you won't look so good singing without those dazzling white teeth. <laughs> well? It's a fellow named Alexander. Does this fellow have a first name? George. George? You mean Arthur tried to shake down George Alexander? You know him? Well enough to realize that Artie made a serious mistake trying it. Let's hope we all profit by his example. That you, Vince? Yeah. How you make out? Just look. All right, beautiful. Inside. Stop that! Inside. Hello, Marsha. You're not going to get away with this, Mr. Alexander. I told you my friends called me George. You want to be my friend, huh? No. You're fooling. Sit down, baby. You can't keep me here. You can't keep me here. You can't do this. You can't do that. Why don't you give that tongue a rest? All right, that's enough, Vince. <laughs> Marsha and me, we understand each other. Well, don't we, sweethearts? What do you want? I just want to make sure you didn't tell anybody about our little ride there. Get it, Vince. What about Marsha? What's the matter? Can a gentleman invite a lady up to his apartment? After all, we got you for a chaperone. All right, all right. Hold your horses, will you? Hello, is George... Oh, I see he is. Wait a minute, Buster. Not so fast. It's okay, Vince. This is the pork and he's an old friend of mine. Well, I wouldn't go so far as to say that. I... Oh, I beg your pardon. Am I interrupting something? No. Marsha, meet my query. How do you do? Well, generally I do all right, but I see George does even better. <laughs> Cute kid, eh? Yes, indeedy. Well, if you gentlemen are through discussing me, I'll say goodnight. Hold it, sister. Hmm. He's got a hypnotized. Vince just thought maybe I want to tell us something. It's okay, Marsh. I'll give you a call later. All right, George. <laughs> <laughs> you wish you were in my shoes, eh, Mike? Hardly, George. 
I wouldn't care to face a murder rap. I'm afraid I don't understand you, Wary. Well, it stems from the manslaughter charge. Manslaughter? Mm-hmm. For killing Ralph Davis with your car last night. You know, Mr. D.A. could tell this story very effectively. It's got a wonderful moral, how one crime leads to another. Now, the opening scene would show you driving along. Get out. But... Well, you might let me finish, George. It's got great dramatic possibilities. You heard him. Get out. Who's this little Sir Echo? If you're not out of here by the time I count through... You mean you're not interested in how my little script ends? No. And you keep up like this, Mike. And you won't be around for the end. Dear Mr. Waring, but what happened after that? That's all there was, Ruth. You mean you know who killed my father and you let him go? I mean he let me go. He brought you off. No, no, no. Wait a minute, oh, Angel. I'm sure I was a fool not to see it before. But we'll see what the police think. Now, about... sit down. Oh. You listen to me, Ruth. I walked out on Alexander because there wasn't a thing I could do. You know he ran over my father. Yeah, sure I do. But where's our evidence? There isn't any way I could tie it to him. The only witness was murdered. Well... Well, what? You know he murdered Arthur Crane. Can you prove that? Well, it stands to reason... Look, Angel. You can build as good a case against several other people. <laughs> Who, for example? Well, for example, you. What? Sure. You and you, Artie Crane, could identify the man who killed your father. And when he refused to give you any information, you murdered him. That's the most ridiculous piece of... Yes? Well? That's right. My name's Marsha West. I don't know if you remember me. Oh, you underestimate your charms, Marsha. You're the kind of a girl my kind of man could never forget. Well, I'd like to talk to you. Well, what would be the point? I thought you were a close friend of Alexander's. Well, I was in his car last night. You what? Yes, he was taking me home when he killed that man. Where are you now? At the place where I work. It's called the TikTok Club. When can I expect you? Just open your door, Angel. I'm practically there now. Come on, you creep. Snap into it. We haven't got all night. The show goes on in a few... Yeah, what do you want, mister? Where's Marshal West's dressing room? The first one on your left. This one here? Yeah, that's right. I don't keep her too long. She's on in ten minutes. Come on, girls. Don't stand up. Marsha? Marsha? She ain't here, Waring. What? No, just stay like you are, Falcon. Lock the door, Vince. All right. Where is she, George? Where is Sue? Marsha. She called me from here not more than 15 minutes ago. You say, Vince? Was it uh, that old hag with the mop? And you boys ought to try television. That's a great act you've got there. I'm glad you like it. What am I should tell you on the phone? Who? Don't be smart. And I just wanted to show you that two could play that game. What you tell him? Enough. You know, I wouldn't need much excuse to paste you one right now, Buster, so don't tempt me. What do you say, Mike? I say you boys aren't very smart. There are a dozen people out there. And they all work for me. So start talking. <laughs> Why, you chum. Now, why you want to knock him down for Vince? <laughs> you only got to pick him up again. That's all right, Alex. I'm in very good shape. I can keep this up all night. <laughs> well, sleeping beauty, I didn't even have to kiss you to wake you up, huh? Yeah, this isn't the Princess Palace. It's Bellevue Hospital. Uh, no kidding. Okay, Mike, who slugged you? First, I want to know where you found me, Sergeant. On West 8th Street. Well, how did I get down there? I can tell you one thing. I don't think you made it on foot. Uh, someone must have given me a lift. Oh? A character named Vince, working at the behest of George Alexander. What do they want to do that for? Because Alexander was the one who drove the car that killed Ralph Davis last night. Last night? Well, isn't this Sunday? Where have you been? Don't bother answering, I know. All right, all right. What day is it? Monday. What? Holy smoke. Where's Marsha? Who? Marsha West. She was in the car when Alexander killed Davis. She tell you that? Yes, and I wouldn't be surprised if she knew all about the Artie Crane killing, too. Is that tied up with this? Definitely. You see, Crane tried to blackmail Alexander, and he... That's so fast. Can you prove that? No, I can't hear, Corbett. So let's go where I can. To the adventures of the Falcon. A 
half hour has passed since Mike Waring set out with Sergeant Corbett to try to tie the case together. Their destination, the apartment of George Alexander. You're a pretty sick man, Waring. You don't know what you're saying. Uh, that's no use, George. We've got all the evidence we need. Right, Sergeant? Right. So why don't I hear from the district attorney? You will, shortly. You're still bluffing, Mike. Admit it. All right, then how do I know you paid off to Artie Crane? You know? Yes, and I can prove it. How about that, Mr. Alexander? Well, you see, it's like this, Sergeant. It was no shakedown. I gave Artie the money. Oh, because you were impressed by his musical talents and wanted to see him further his career? Why, well, Mike, you take the words right out of my mouth. Oh, no. Something wrong? You don't think the DA will buy that? Why not? If it's okay for me to help young ladies interested in musical careers, why not young men? Sounds logical. Oh, come on, Corbett, be smart. You don't believe that? I didn't say it did. I just said it sounded logical. That's all I ask. Where's Vince? What? I want to talk to him. You're going to have a long wait. Vince leave town Friday night. Friday? Yeah. Uh-huh. I suppose that was his double who bounced me around backstage at the TikTok club on Saturday. I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, sure. Next you'll say you never heard of a girl named Marsha West. Of course I have. Oh, sweetheart. You call me, George? Marsha. Is this the girl you mean? All right, never mind the act, George. Listen, Marsha. This is Sergeant Corbett. I want you to tell him everything. Everything? Yes, beginning with your call to me on Saturday night. My call to you? Don't you remember? I don't see how I could be expected to, Mr. Waring, seeing this is the first time we've met. What? But it's been a real pleasure. Let's do it again sometime. You know, Mike... Maybe we ought to go back to the hospital. It's not a bad place. They got a couple of good-looking nurses there. Okay, okay, so I'm nuts, Sergeant. But just humor me a couple of minutes more. I still don't see what you're going to accomplish with Pete Jordan. I tell you, he knows that Artie Crane went to see Alexander. I still don't prove anything. Crane could have gone to see Alexander for a million reasons. Well, suppose Pete's willing to swear that he... Yeah? Well, if it isn't the gay troubadour. Hello, Pete, remember me? Now, oh, look, Waring, I'm busy. Yeah, I... sure you are. This won't take much of your time. Did Artie Crane tell you he saw the car that killed Ralph Davis in that accident? Well, uh... Well, didn't he? Yeah. Get your coat, Jordan. We're going downtown. Uh, now, don't rush him, Sergeant. You might break the spell. As long as Pete's in the mood for singing, maybe he'll be willing to croon you something else. I told you everything I know. Not quite. There's one song you forgot. The one that goes, I killed my best friend and am I sorry. What are you talking about? The murder of Artie Crane. You know enough about that to give us a complete chorus. So start singing, pigeon. <laughs> no, girls, that's the whole story. Alexander goes up for manslaughter and Pete Jordan for murder. Any questions? I have one, Mike. Oh, so have I. Uh, I think Marsha was first, Ruth. All right, go on, Marsha. Well, first, I think I owe you an explanation. Yes, I wouldn't be surprised. Well, Alexander made me say I didn't know you. He and Vince caught me phoning you that night. Yes, I figured as much. I was afraid of what he might do, not only to me, but to you. Well. I thought she had a question to ask. Oh, well, all I wanted to know is what made you suspect Pete Jordan. Very simple thing, Angel. As you recall, when the police found Artie, there was nothing on him. So? So the question arises, Ruth, what happened to the hush money Alexander paid him? I don't get it. Well, I pulled one bluff on Alexander that worked. The only reason he admitted giving money to Artie was that he thought I could prove he did. And you couldn't? No, because there was no money found on the body. And it stood to reason that Alexander and Vince didn't remove it. Otherwise, they would have known I was bluffing. So I figured maybe this was just a plain, everyday murder for money. And once you realized that, it was just a matter of picking out the only party who had the opportunity. That's right. That gave me Pete Jordan. But I'll tell you one thing this business taught me. What? Never take a case where two beautiful women are involved. Makes for complications. <laughs> How so? Well, it's too much of a good thing. You know the old saying, two's company, three's a crowd. He's got a point there, Ruth. He certainly has. No, 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 no. Don't fight. I'm sure we can settle this peaceably. I'm sure we can. That's the spirit. Now, how are we going to work it? That's easy. Mm -hmm. Good, Good night, night Mr. Waring. Ladies.
Ladies and gentlemen, there comes a time in a husband's life when he screws up his courage to tell his wife that in spite of all domestic joys, tonight's his night out with the boys. And that is just about what's going to happen this evening at the home of Fibber McGee and Molly. Oh, for goodness sakes, McGee, you're as restless as a bird dog tonight. What's the matter with you? Well, shucks, I, I thought I... Oh, I don't know. Well, sit down and read the paper or something. I did read the paper. Nothing in it but news. <laughs> Want to play a game of rummy? No, I guess not. That's kind of tame. Tonight I'm in the mood for a... Well, I feel kind of... No, I don't want to play cards. McGee, you're bored. Well... And I must say it isn't very flattering to a wife when she knows her husband is bored. Well, shucks, Molly, I... What you ought to do is get out of this house for a while. Huh? You you mean that? Say, I think you got something there. That's exactly what I've been thinking. So if you don't mind... I don't mind a bit. Okay. Get your hat and we'll go to a movie. (laughs) Uh, A movie? What's that, the movie? Adam had four sons and Bob Hope. <laughs> I've seen all five of them. Well, I'm sure I don't know what to do with you. For goodness sake, stop fidgeting around you. Well, I guess I'll go work on Come in. Oh, hello, Mr. Gildersleeve. Uh, good evening, Mrs. McGee. Uh, hello, little chum. <laughs> Hi, Rocky. I'm sure glad you came in, Mr. Gildersleeve. McGee's been restless all evening. How's your wife, Gildy? My wife's out of town, and you know it, because that's why we... Uh, I, uh... <laughs> she is, eh? <laughs> out of town, huh? Where'd she go, Mr. Gildersleeve? Well, uh, she went down to her sister's. Her sister's having a baby. Ah. Oh. Oh. Did you get a telegram or something? Oh, no. But every year about this time, uh... Br- <laughs> Uh, by the way, uh, McGee, what are you doing tonight? Who, me? Why, I don't know, Gildy. I hadn't given it a thought. Thought maybe I'd work a while on my ship model. Yes. He's making a ship model in a glass bottle, Mr. Gildersleeve. Yeah. Say, uh, didn't you have some trouble with the keel, dearie? Yeah, I got to get the hull out of there. And uh, but, uh, <laughs> Why did you ask, Gildersleeve? Well, uh... <laughs> I, uh, I just thought, well, I'm at sort of loose ends tonight, and I thought maybe I'd drop down to the Elks for a while. How about going with me? Oh, he can't. They don't allow women down there. I ain't a woman. I am. <laughs> but look, Mrs. McGee, don't you think it'd do McGee good to get out and mix with the boys for a while? Oh, will there be a lot of the boys there? I'll say there will. We've arranged... Oh, there won't be many there on a Tuesday night, Gildersleeve. Tuesday's kind of dull at the Elks. Oh, oh, yes. <laughs> yes, yes, I guess it is, come to think of it. <laughs> but we could have a rousing game of checkers, McGee. Just you and I. Heavenly days, you don't have to go clear down to the Elks to play checkers. We have a checkerboard right here. Why, Molly, I didn't know that. Where is it? Why, it's right out of... No, you wait right here. I think I can find it in just a couple of minutes. Think fast, Gildersleeve. How do I get out of here? I don't know, chum, but you got to do it. Hi, George, we've had this little poker game lined up for three weeks, and you know it. Everybody's going to be there. High stakes and a lot of laughs. Oh, Mrs. McGee, find the checkers. <laughs> no, Mr. Gildersleeve, but I did even better. Here's the Parcheesi board. Parcheesi? Uh, I'm afraid I don't know how to play Parcheesi. Oh, say, McGee can teach in two minutes. No, I can't. He's too dumb. Yes, that's all. Yes, that's all. Why, you little... <laughs> yeah, I, I guess I am at that. <laughs> uh, look, Mrs. McGee, I, I think it would do McGee a lot of good to go down to the Elks tonight. It's, uh, well, it's uh, sort of special. How special? Well, they, uh, it's sort of a patriotic affair, yeah. In fact, they've arranged a sort of a patriotic game. Oh, really? Yes, we call it uh, uh, Three Cheers for the Red, White, and Blue. <laughs> You see, uh, every player gets a certain number of little counters which are colored red, white, and blue. Yeah. Yeah. And the object of the game is to see who can get the most of. Uh, yeah. I played it before, Molly. It's, it's a very fascinating test. Yeah. Well, that's entirely different. Now you boys run right along and play your game. Oh, oh thanks, Molly. Hot diggity. Come on, McGee. We don't want to be late for that red, white, and blue game, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say we don't. Well, so long, Molly. And don't worry if I come home kind of late. Uh, <laughs> goodbye, Molly. Goodbye, dearie. Give me a kiss. Okay. Goodbye. Come on, Frosty. Okay. (laughs) Poor 
Poor McGee. Well, now let's see. I better get busy on that chili con carne, so. 79 Wistful Vista, Molly McGee speaking. Who? Oh, hello, Mrs. Uppington. What? Oh, we'd love to play bridge, but McGee isn't here. He went down to the Elks with Mr. Gildersleeve. What? <laughs> yes, they have a big poker game going on, but they don't think I know it. <laughs> yes, three cheers for the red, white, and blue. Goodbye, Abigail. <laughs> It's just going to be a night. I'm going to paint the town red with purple polka dots. You know, we ought to do this oftener, McGee. My goodness. Are we men or are we mice? <laughs> You'll think I'm a rat before I get through playing poker with you, Gildersleeve. <laughs> I'm going to send you home in a barrel. Is that so? I'll say so. I'm a woolly wolf from wild Wyoming, and this is my night to howl. Wahoo! It's roundup time. <laughs> hey, wait a minute. This is where the old timer lives. Let's pick him up and take him along to the office. with us. Come on. He promised he'd be there. Okay, good idea, McGee. You just hope your voice is yeah. out. There. You bet. I'll play a fine game of poker. Well, hello there, boys. What you want? Come on down to the Elks, old timer, and let us brand our initials on you with a little red hot poker. I uh, can't do it, fellas. Mama doesn't want me to go out. Oh, no. Come on, assert yourself. You can't back out on this poker game now, old timer. It would be unethical, unfair, and unprofitable to McGee and me. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good, Doc Morton. But that ain't the way I heard it. No. The way I heard it, one feller says to the feller, Say, says, I see where the government is going to raise the income tax something terrific. Is that so, says to the feller. Well, what's the joke? It's no joke, Johnny. You will find out. <laughs> Never mind that, old-timer. You coming with us or aren't you? Well, I don't think Mama wants me oh, to... Oh, go tell her you're coming. Be independent. You mean speak right up? That's it. Don't take any back talk, eh? Certainly not. Don't be a Mama's boy all your life. Just get up on my hind legs and tell her what's what, eh? Yeah. Hey, wait a minute here, kids. Okay. Hey, Mama, you know what I'm going to do? I'm... We're probably doing him a big favor, McGee. Why, sure we are. Sure. He's old enough to go out by himself at night. Absolutely. <laughs> Mama persuaded me to stay home tonight. Well, how about it, Wilcox? You're going to back out on the biggest poker game we ever had? Yeah, come on, Wilcox. You promised, you know. I'm sorry, fellas. I can't do it. There's a new floor show at the Biltmore, and I've got to go. A fine thing. Here you got a chance to go out with a swell bunch of guys, and you pass it up for a gander at a bunch of chorus girls. Grow up, Wilcox. Don't be a playboy all your life. Now, what'll the nightclub do for you that a good poker game can't do? Yeah. The stakes won't be any tougher. <laughs> now, I'm sorry. Some other time. Besides, I'm putting on this floor show myself. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> okay, okay. You got your foot in the door, Wilcox. You might as well wiggle your toes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can always play poker. It'll mean a lot more to me than sitting around with a bunch of you mugs in your shirt sleeves squinting at each other over your busted flushes. <laughs> but here, take this. Uh, what is this? Ten bucks. I always lose anyway, and I don't want you guys to be out any dough because I didn't show up. <laughs> But look, Nick, this is the night of the big poker game. You promised you'd be there, remember? Yes, you're not going to Welsh on us, are you? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a Welsh, I'm a Greek. Yep. <laughs> I'm not going to go to the club tonight. That's all I have to say, and if I don't like it, I know what I can do. <laughs> but look, Depopolis, my wife's out of town, and McGee's got the night off, and you know you like to play poker. Certainly I like to play poker. But, but tonight, I'm afraid you'll have to strangle along without Depopolis. Because certain circumstances have come up which make it impossible. <laughs> is it, uh, is it your wife? Uh, yes. Uh, won't she let you go? Sure she let me go. Well, if she'll let you go, why don't you go? What is this, anyway? Well, I'm saying to my wife, look, Mrs. Depopolis, I'm saying, putting my best foot in my mouth. <laughs> look, Mrs. Depopolis, I'm going out to play poker tonight, I'm saying. And she's saying, 
Okay, Switch Patootie, go ahead. Oh, I don't get it. You got her permission, so come on, let's go. No, sir, I won't do it. Huh? If my wife is saying I can't do it, then I would be with you in two jerks of a fairy tale. You grab me? But when she's saying, okay, go ahead. No, sir, she can't throw the populace out of his own house. I'm going to stay home tonight if it takes all evening. <laughs> We seem to be the only guys in town with any spirit of independence, don't we, Gildersleeve? Yes, but by George, that isn't going to spoil it for me. No, sir. I'm on the loose and I've thrown away the wrench. <laughs> by the way, before we get to the Elks Club, Gildersleeve, there's one thing I want to say. Yeah? What's that, little chump? From the time we sit down to play poker, we ain't friends anymore. Yep. From there on in, it's dog eat dog, see? I'm going to raise you so high you can look down the chimney of a full house. Is that so? Why, you little palooka, I'll beat your alleged brains out with deuces back-to-back. Yeah. <laughs> Gildersleeve, I hope you got hair on your chest, <laughs> because you're going home without a shirt. <laughs> now, look here, McGee, if you think for one minute... <laughs> so that's ridiculous. You couldn't think for ten seconds. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, you wait till we... Hi, mister. Oh, hi, sis. Oh, uh, hello there, little girl. Ain't you out kind of late, sis? So are you, I betcha. Oh, that's different. We're grown up. Grown ups don't need as much sleep as little girls. Why? Well, because they don't, that's all. Children are so constituted that a maximum of relaxation is necessary for their proper physical development. <laughs> yeah, but I. Hmm? I said kids are so constituted. You try it, Gildersleeve. Okay. Now look, little girl. Alrighty. You know what metabolism is? Now, do you? Of course I do. Metabolism is the rate at which body energy is built up and torn down. Well, gee, what do you build it up for if you're just going to tear it down again? Why do you? Well, because that's nature. That's why it's a physiological process that's necessary to the, uh, uh, to the, uh, take it, McGee. Now, look, sis, well, why do you take a nap in the afternoon? Because Mama has a bridge party. No, no, no. That ain't the reason at all. You take an afternoon nap to restore the energy expended in your play. You got to give nature a chance to recharge your, your dynamo, as it were. As it were what? Just as it were. How were it? <laughs> it were... Ah, you try again, Throcky. Okay. Now, look here, little girl. <laughs> you just consider your energy as fuel. Let's say you're an automobile and your energy is gasoline. How much is ethyl? Well, ethyl is 20. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it does, too, I bet you. If I'm going to be an automobile, I want to know how much uh, is... This is just a hypothetical case. Gee, is it? Certainly. Now then, let's say when you play outdoors for three hours, you, you burn up 10 gallons of energy or gasoline. You have to replace that before you can keep on running. <laughs> you see? I could get somebody to pull me, I bet oh. Okay, McGee. What we're trying to get at this is this. It's what? Is this. What? Well, let me tell you, Dad, read it. All righty. Now, suppose you never got enough rest or sleep. You know what would happen? You'd get worn out. You'd get pale and anemic. The amount of body sugar that gives you energy... What, is... Dad? Sugar. I'm hungry. Uh, go on home, sis. Come on, Drop <laughs> Kingsman sing the hot stuff song. Well, come on in, McGee, and I hope all the card tables aren't taken. Well, if you'd organize this poker game with a little more brains, you'd have reserved a table. Give now, look here, McGee. You said three weeks ago that you were going to organize this poker game. That's why I thought you'd do it. You're always such a buttinsky. Well, this is one time I should have put it in. You feeble, frustrated little fumbler. You couldn't organize a bull weevil party at the Cotton Club. <laughs> The trouble with you, Gildersleeve, is your voice drowns out your brain. You'd be better off if you'd think louder and talk softer. You're a hard man, McGee. <laughs> By George, when I think of all the trouble I went to... Hey, Rocky. Uh, what is it, chum? <laughs> Who's that guy across the street? Ain't he a member of the club? No, I never saw him before. Okay, I just thought he might be a good victim for us. What was we saying? Search me, I... Uh... Oh, yes. By George, when I think of all the trouble I went to... To make plans for a poker game tonight, I could use your head for a handball. Go on, you can't even use your own head for a head. And if you make one more pass at me, Gildersleeve, I'll pop you so Why, hard. Why, you gabby little grub, you couldn't pop a stick of bubble gum. <laughs> and furthermore, I've heard enough of your twaddle. I wouldn't play poker with you tonight if you were the last man on earth. Oh, yeah? Yeah. 
You probably will be because you'll bore everybody else to death. <laughs> That's okay with me, you big bag of balloon juice. There's plenty of other guys in the club to play with. I don't need you. I can have a better time without you anyway. And that goes for me, too. In spades, doubled and redoubled. I'm going to the telegraph office and send a night letter to my wife. That's swell. Give her my love. That'll give her the illusion there's a man in the family. Oh! I'll kill that <laughs> Ah, good old Gildersling. He's got the makings of a great guy. <laughs> got the makings, but he can't roll them. Oh, well. Now to show a few of these guys how to play poker. Hi, everybody. Get off the tables and the cards. I'll be back in a flash with a bus. Hey, is anybody here? Well, that's funny. There ought to be a few guys around here. Well, this is a fine state of how do you do. Here I am, spring in my heart, full of sulfur and molasses, and what happens? Everybody walks out on me. Hey, Porter. Hey, Peabody. Uh, yes, sir. Hey, is there anybody around this joint but me? Uh, yes, sir. Only Mr. Wallace Wimple, sir. He's sitting in the library. Uh, well, he's better than nobody, but not much. Oh, thanks, Peabody. Uh, re end the toot, sir. Huh? That's French, Paul. Think nothing of it. Oh. Well, I'll go in and talk to Wimple. Maybe I can whoop him up to go to a show or something. Hi, Wimple, old man. Remember me? Trevor McGee? Oh, yes, indeed. Good evening, Mr. McGee. <laughs> How about a little game of 500 rummy? Any a point? No, thank you. I never gamble. Oh, you don't? Well, uh, have a cigar? Thank you, Mr. McGee. I don't smoke. <laughs> you don't? Well, if we had a piece of string, we could play Cat's Cradle. <laughs> what say we have Peabody bring us in some root beer? Do you want to wet your whistle? I can't whistle. I had braces on my teeth till I was 27. <laughs> Look, Wimple, if you don't want to play cards or billiards or smoke or be a he-man, why the Sam Hill did you ever join the Elks? I like to sit in the window. It's the peachiest place in town to watch parade from. <laughs> hey, Wimple, huh? I'm desperate. I started out tonight to kick the gong around and somebody's hid the gong. I want to have some fun. I want to laugh and play. I could take you home and show you my stamp collection. <laughs> but my wife is mad at me. Oh, she is, eh? What'd you do? I talked back to her. That's why I'm here. I'm a wife, Eugene. <laughs> That's tough, Wimpy. <laughs> She's awfully mean to me, Mr. McGee. Sometimes I think I can't stand it another year. You know how it is. No, I'm afraid I don't, Wimple. I, I got the best little wife in the world myself. Sweet, sympathetic, and beautiful. Yeah, I wonder what she's doing now. I know what mine is doing. What? Rolling out some dough for pies in the kitchen. <laughs> well, at least she's a good cook. She's a terrible cook. But that way, when she comes to the door with a rolling pin, it doesn't seem so obvious. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess I didn't realize how well off I am. I'm probably the happiest married guy in the world, Wimple. Why, when I think of the fun me and Molly have together, I just... Well, I don't know why I ever want to go out alone. In fact, I don't know why I'm out alone tonight, even. Why am I out alone? I'm going home. Good night, my folks. Good night. <laughs> Forgot how nice it was <laughs> Well, I just thought... Uh, oh, shucks. Uh, there wasn't much doing down at the club. Hey, what's that I smell? Makes my mouth water. <laughs> well, I was just fixing up some chili con carne, McGee. You want some? Oh, I don't want to chisel in on any snack you fixed up for yourself. Oh, that's all right. I fixed enough for two people. Two people? You expecting somebody? Yes. Who? You. Oh. <laughs> Give me another stack of chips, fellas. Oh. 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 Oh, 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 oh,
McGee. And whom? McGee, wake up. You're dreaming. Huh? Oh. Oh, thank goodness. I, I, I had an awful nightmare. Sounded like it. Mm. I, don't, I don't feel good either. I'm sick. Oh, are you sick? Get me another blanket, will you? Chili? Must have been. I had two bowls of it. <laughs> good night. Good night, all. <laughs> The Johnson Wax Program with Fibber McGee and Molly. The makers of Johnson's Wax and Johnson's Self-Polishing Glow Coat present Fibber McGee and Molly, written by Don Quinn with music by the King's Men and Billy Mills Orchestra. The show opens with I Struck a Match on the Moon. What's the most popular room in your house? Most people say the living room with the easy chair pulled up alongside the radio. But personally, I want to put my vote down for the kitchen. I spend more time in people's kitchens and in my own than anywhere else. I suppose the icebox has something to do with it. But whatever it is, the kitchen is a cozy room and deserves to be a cheerful one. And you can make it cheerful, too, without spending much money. Gay curtains at the window, fresh oilcloth, and Johnson's self-polishing glow coat on the floor. Glow coat not only gives linoleum floors sparkling beauty and keeps the colors as bright as new, but it protects them against wear, makes them last longer. And it does all this in addition to saving you hours of work. Because Glow Coat needs no rubbing or buffing. Just apply and let dry. Glow Coat does the rest. May I suggest that you add Johnston's self-polishing Glow Coat to your next shopping list. Well, a man can fool some of the people all the time, and all the people some of the time, and his wife almost none of the time. <laughs> so, so when our hero seems unusually gay and lighthearted, laughing at anything, his better half suspects the worst. In other words, when a guy doesn't grouse, his spouse smells a mouse. <laughs> and that's the way it is tonight with Fibber McGee and Molly. So when I seen Egghead Vanderveen there in front of Joe's tavern, I walks up to him. <laughs> Hi, Egghead, I says. What's cooking? <laughs> and he says, I am. He says, hey, just give me the hot foot. <laughs> well, see, that just about tore me asunder because Egghead is McGee. the kind of... <laughs> McGee. McGee. Kind of... Huh? What's the matter with you? You're as merry as a grig over nothing. What's on your mind? On my mind? Why, why, why nothing, but let me tell you about Egghead. <laughs> so I says to Egghead... I, I don't <laughs> want to hear about Egghead. I want to know about you. You always act like this when you're covering up something. Look, did you mail that special delivery letter for me yesterday morning? This is special? Oh, that. Oh, don't give it a thought, Molly. But to get back to what I says to Egghead... Did you mail that letter? <laughs> Why, Molly, am I the kind of a guy who, when you tell him to do something you want done, don't mail it? Now, never mind that. I just asked you a simple question. Did you ever ask me to do anything that I wasn't only too glad to cooperate into doing it? No, sir. McGee, did you mail that letter? <laughs> no. <laughs> Well, the reason I wanted to know oh, is... Oh, then I'll do it right away. Wait till I, wait till I get my coat. And as soon as I can run across the street, I'll... But, do... McGee, now let me tell no, you... No, I'll do it. I should have done it yesterday. Sorry I forgot, but you you can consider the air and rectify. Wait a minute, McGee. That letter now is... I'll just dash across the street to the mailbox, Molly. I'll be right back. McGee, wait a minute. I didn't... Oh, dear. 
times I wonder why the government always puts the mailboxes on the corner where somebody else lives. <laughs> if I'd have had my way... Oh, hi, Gildersleeve. Hello, McGee. Hey, don't run across that pavement. Can't you see they've just... Ah, go bounce a meatball, you big ape. <laughs> I know what I'm doing. Hey, hey, what, what is this? Fresh car? Get out of there, McGee. They've just resurfaced that pavement. You get stuck. What do you mean, get stuck? I am stuck. Well, why didn't you warn me, you big dumbbell? Don't! Oh, I tried to, you little twerp. If you hadn't... Ah, oh, there, Mrs. McGee. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Gildersleeve. McGee, come out of that mess this minute. I can't. I, I can't pick up my feet. What is this, anyway? Tar? No, it's a new patent paving material they're trying out. <laughs> you like it? <laughs> I love it. In fact, I'm stuck on it. <laughs> well, Dad, rather do something. Get me out of here. Can't you pull your feet up, dearie? Oh, wait. Let me try again. Oh, no, it's no use. The harder I try, the deeper I get in. You see, Mrs. McGee? <laughs> Confidentially, he sinks. <laughs> Dad, glad it's your sleeve if you don't... Now, touch... now, 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 let's all keep calm and think this thing out. McGee, can you slip out of your shoes? Yeah, but I ain't gonna. I just had them half sold. <laughs> Come on, dearie, don't stand there arguing. You're attracting a crowd. Take your shoes off and start running. Okay, I'll take... Okay, here I come. Well, come on. I can't. I'm stuck again. Oh, dear. Take off your socks and start over. Okay, I'll try anything. Now. Ooh. Well, what do I do now? Take off my feet? <laughs> Who shall I call, dearie? The street commissioner, the fire department, the police, or the gallop pole? What do you mean, the gallop pole? Well, you're the man on the street, all right. <laughs> <laughs> what do we do, Mr. Gildersleeve? <laughs> I don't know what you're going to do, Mrs. McGee, but I'm going home and get my movie camera. By George, I've never seen anything so funny in my life. <laughs> Dad, glad if you stay where you darn are, Gildersleeve. <laughs> You big heel fool. <laughs> McGee, now you mustn't call Mr. Gildersleeve a heel. Well, maybe not. But I'll bet he could have a lot of fun sliding down a shoehorn. <laughs> hey, ain't anybody going to get me out of here? Oh, now don't get excited, McGee. We'll do everything we can. Hello there, daughter. Hello, Gildersleeve. Hi, Johnny. What you doing? What do you think I'm doing, you old dodo? Tap dancing? <laughs> Tap dancing, eh? You never told me he could tap dance, Dutter. <laughs> Let's see you doing off to Buffalo, Johnny. <laughs> oh, for goodness sake, stop teasing him. Huh? He's in a terrible predicament. Hey, what's this all about, kids? What's he doing out there in the street, Dutter? He's stuck in that fresh pavement, Mr. Oldtimer. Do you know any way we can get him out? Sure. How? Look, get a couple of shovels, see? Then go down to the basement of your house, yeah. dig a tunnel till you get right under him, then dig up till you reach him and pull him down through. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Silly. It ain't only silly, it's callous and cruel. Everybody making wise cracks while I stand here and suffer. Don't you realize this pavement material is getting harder every minute? Call somebody. Do something. But what do we do? How should I know? If you can't think of anything else, throw me a red and green lantern. I'll spend the rest of my life here as a traffic signal. <laughs> That's pretty good, Johnny. But that ain't the way you are, you heard it? <laughs> says the telefeller says says but hey this ain't any time for jokes is it poor little Johnny out there stuck in the tar no it certainly isn't of course not though on the other hand it, it might cheer him up the way I heard it one feller says the telefeller say says I see where Groucho Marx is going to be a professor of humor at Harvard is that so says the telefeller Where's Harpo going? To Wellesley? <laughs> I guess you got something there, old timer. That Harpo is a great guy for blondes. <laughs> hey, what am I laughing at? Dad Rattus, get me out of here. Whoa. Do something, somebody. Whoa. Don't just stand there. Help! Help! <laughs>
that guy doing out there in the street? Advertising something? No, they say he got stuck in that fresh pavement. Mm. Well, if he saw they were going to pave the street, why didn't he get out of the way? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they ought to put a rail around him and use him as a statue of a leading citizen. <laughs> hey, Molly. Molly. Yes, dearie, here I am. And here's a little footstool for you to sit on. <laughs> Catch it. Uh, much obliged. Is somebody coming to get him out of this? Who'd you call? Well, first, Mr. Gildersleeve and I called the Commissioner of Streets. Uh-huh. And he referred us to the uh, Department of Health. Department of Health? Yeah, he said it wasn't healthy to stand there in the street night and day. <laughs> <laughs> well, what did the Health Department say? Well, they referred us to the License Commissioner because they said you were making an exhibition of yourself. Uh-huh. Yeah, and the License Commissioner sent us to the Board of Education. Dad Braddock, what's the Board of Education got to do with this? Well, they said they teach you to stay off freshly paved streets. <laughs> But I tell you, we finally got to the right people, dearie huh? This is a new type of paving and, and they're sending the inventor of it out Oh, well, thank goodness, at last Well, hey, what's in the mud? Can I have your autograph? Why, certainly, bud Throw me your death certificate Oh, <laughs> oh dear Mr. Gildersleeve, if that man doesn't get here pretty soon I don't know how... Oh, how do you do, Mrs. Uppington? Oh, how do you do, my dear? And Mr. Gildersleeve? Uh, good day, Abigail. Well, what on earth is the cause of this boisterous crowd, my dear? It's McGee, Abigail. He's stuck out there in the middle of the street. You see him? Well, really? How did... What did I... I mean, did he step on some chewing gum? <laughs> <laughs> he just started to trot across a freshly paved street, the silly asphalt runner. <laughs> We simply can't have your husband making a spectacle of himself. He's lowering the tune of the whole neighborhood. Ah, don't give me that Vassar Vaseline, dearie. (laughs) Next thing you'll get so exclusive, you'll want our fire department to have an unlisted phone number. Well, really, Mrs. McGee, I... Now, wait a minute, girl. Hey, McGee. Ah. Uh, Here's Mrs. Uppington. She wants you to get out of there. (laughs) She says you're lowering real estate values. (laughs) Oh, I am, eh? Abigail, you mean to stand there wobbling on your wedgies and accuse me of doing this on purpose? I really wouldn't know, Mr. McGee, but if you're posing as a personal investigator of paving material, I have a suggestion to make. Yeah, what's that? Did you ever hear of a certain place which is said to be paved with good intentions? You mean? Yes, and when you get through here, go there. Good day. <laughs> Molly, where's the guy who invented this stuff? When's he ever coming? Just as soon as they can get a hold of him, dearie. Just wait till I get hold of him, I'll Hey, hey, what is all this? Hey, come here a minute, Fibber. No, you come here, Wilcox. <laughs> all right, I'll no, come No, 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 Mr. Wilcox. You'll get stuck, too. Yeah, McGee is held tight in that new paving material, Harlow. Don't you set foot on it. Ah, oh, why didn't you let him come? He's always claimed he was a guy that would stick by his friends. <laughs> <laughs> Say, you're in a tough spot, pal. Can't you pull yourself loose? Who, me? Why, sure, Wilcox. I'm just standing here till the steam roller comes by. <laughs> then I'll lay down and get my pants pressed. <laughs> well, I can really sympathize with you, Fibber. Standing in that tar, you're typical of the stories I hear every day. What do you mean, typical? You're tired, aren't you? Sure, I'm tired. Well, but... so is every housewife in the world. <laughs> Tired of the everlasting scrubbing and cleaning and dusting. Tired of the dust and dirt and dampness. Tired of trying to keep house with old-fashioned, inefficient methods. That's why they all love Johnson's Wax. Because it cuts housework to a minimum and keeps floors and furniture shining and beautiful and protects them against wear and dirt. Get some today. Johnson's Wax for that hard feeling. What? You're fired. <laughs> I am not. You didn't hire me, and you can't fire me. And I can prove it. How, oh, Mr. Wilcox? I'm going to send the sponsor a war. Oh. <laughs> He'd spend more time listening to Peter McGee and Molly and less to Lum and Abner. <laughs> hey, what am I ever going to get out of here? No, no, take it easy, little chum. Take it easy. We'll uh, just have to wait till the paving expert gets here. Don't you little chum me, you big chump. <laughs> All you've done since I've been stuck here, standing around and crack wise. Is that so? Why, you ungrateful little grunion, you lippy little lizard. You wait till you get out of there, and I'll teach you a few manners. Go on, you couldn't teach a worm to squirm. 
You big oaf. Oop. By the time I get loose from here, I'll be in just the mood to kick you right in the teeth. And I don't care if they ain't paid for you. No. Now, now, now. For goodness sakes, boy, stop it. Well, I just dare him to come out here, that's all. I'll show him. You can't fight here. And huh? McGee. Huh? You owe Mr. Gildersleeve an apology. He's done everything he could to get the city officials to come out here and get you loose. Yeah, and it's like most of his arrangements. Nothing happened. Yes, that's so. Yes, that's so. Why are you abbreviated anthropological aberration? Who's an abbreviated anthropological abbreviation? You are. He is not. I am too. You are not. Then make up your mind. <laughs> now stop this bickering, the both of you. Come on, Mr. Gildersleeve. Let's go call up the street commissioner again. Well, all right. Now, don't worry, little chum. <laughs> Hold tight. We'll be right back. <laughs> Okay, Rocky, and hurry back, Molly. All right, dearie. Uh, come on, Joe. Let's beat it. Yeah, he ain't gonna do nothing. No, he just stands there like a dope. Come yeah, on, Charlie. Go on. <laughs> hey, hey, don't everybody leave. Somebody stay and talk to me. Hey, hey. <laughs> that's that's a bad rat of luck. Why does everything have to happen to me? If I'd only mailed that letter to Molly's when I ought to have, this wouldn't have. Hi, Mister. Oh, I'm sorry, sis. I ain't got time to talk to you now. I'm in a hurry. Where are you going? Well, I'm going down to the... I'm going... I'm, say, come... come say, what do you want, sis? <laughs> what you doing out there in the street, mister? What you doing? Who's what you? I'm a... <laughs> I'm a scare sparrow. Hmm? I says I'm a scare sparrow. That's the same as a scarecrow, only I don't scare crows. I scare sparrow. <laughs> Why? Well, they make too much noise. They, they disturb the friend stands. What's a friend of Sam's? Well, that's the kind of a thing that gets disturbed. It's sparrows. Oh. I bet you can't scare the Whittycombs, I bet you. Well, uh, what's a Whittycomb? It's a little girl who doesn't believe that friend of Stan stuff. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm glad you come along, sis. You cheer me up. No, you cheer me up. <laughs> you cheer me up first. All righty. Shall I tell you a story, hmm? Sure, sure. Tell me a story. How about Cinderella? Well, it ain't risque, is it? Hmm? What? Uh, never mind. Tell me about Cinderella. And take your time, sis. <laughs> I ain't going anywhere for a while. All right. Once upon a time, there was a little girl named Cinderella, and she had a nasty old stepmother, and she went to a ball and lost her slipper, and the prince found her, and he married her, and they lived happily ever after. You want to hear another one? <laughs> Thanks. I, I, I was going to ask for the one about Peter Rabbit, but the way you boil them down, it'll turn out to be awesome. <laughs> I can, I can recite poems, too, I bet you. You can? Hmm? I said you can? Can what? Cherries, and be sure you get all the pits out of them. <laughs> You're silly, mister. <laughs> I guess I am at that, sis. Well, I'll go ahead and recite something. All righty. This is going to be a dandy one, I bet you. The boy stood on the burning deck, mending a pair of socks. It roused his ire when the thread caught fire. Hot darn. <laughs> you don't mind, sis. I think that ought to conclude your benefit performance. You want to earn a nickel by running an errand for me? No. You don't? No, I want to earn a dime. <laughs> taking advantage of my desperation, sis. I'm going to report you to the labor board. Okay, it's a dime. Now, look. All right. Run down to Kramer's drugstore and have him throw me an evening paper. Mm -hmm. Then run over to my house and tell Mrs. McGee I want a little table and a deck of cards mm -hmm. so I can play solitaire. Oh, yes, and a portable radio. All righty. Shall I tell her anything else? Yes. What? I'm hungry. Oh, sure. <laughs> The King's Men sing the Little Brown Jug. My wife and I live all alone in a little log hut we call our own. We're so happy, warm, and snug as long as we have our little brown jug. Ha, 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 you and me. Little brown jug, don't I love thee? Ha, 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 you and me. Little brown jug, don't I love thee? When I am toiling on my farm, I carry a little brown jug under my arm. Sit me down in the shade of a tree and say, shoo fly, don't bother me. Ha, 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 you and me. Little brown jug, don't I love thee? Ha, 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 you and me. Little brown jug, don't I love thee? Little brown jug, 
goes to my head and makes my nose a rosy red. In the dark it shines so bright, I never get lost on the blackest night. Ha, 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 you and me. Little brown jug, don't I love thee? Just we two, me and you, having a great big spree. And me, you're as happy as a bug We get along fine with a little brown jug I beat her, she beats me We love each other tenderly Oh, you and me Little brown jug, don't I love thee In the winter time, you warm my toes Every time I tip you up Down it goes have you had enough to eat now, McGee? Not quite. Toss me one more cookie. Thanks. How about coffee, McGee? You want some more? No, thanks, Gildersleeve. You can pull in the hose now. Okay. Hey, when is this guy going to come to get me out of here? You mean the man who invented this paving material? <laughs> He's due any minute now, dearie. Just be patient. Are you terribly tired? I ain't as tired as I am disgusted. I'm disgusted and humiliated. <laughs> My feet are getting knocked. Now, this stuff is getting hard. Hey, did you call the city hall again? Yes, I did, dearie. Who'd you get? Mert. <laughs> Mert? <laughs> What'd she have to say? She said her cousin overturned his canoe yesterday. Yeah? Did he get drowned? No, he just got tired of paddling and overturned it to his brother. <laughs> overturned it to his brother. If that ain't the farthest fetch gag I ever heard. <laughs> and me standing here helpless. Why, George, here he comes, McGee. It won't be long now. What? Who? It's the inventor of this paving material, McGee. He'll know how to get you loose, dearie. Make way there, please, folks. Oh, yeah. Let the man oh, yeah. through. Let the man through. Oh, let McGee, through. here's the expert. Oh, hi, bud. I'm glad to see you. Oh, hello. <laughs> oh, my goodness, it's Wallace Wimple. Are you really the inventor of this pavement, Mr. Wimple? Yes, I am. And I'm <laughs> dreadfully sorry that your husband got stuck, Mrs. McGee. Just makes me miserable to think of it. What do you mean it makes you miserable? What do you think of me? I'd rather not say in front of all these people. <laughs> well, how do we get him out of there, Mr. Wimple? Well, Mrs. McGee, as I see it, the whole thing depends on a chemical analysis of the material. Maybe we can dissolve some of it around his feet. Well, that's the first sensible remark that's been made today. What is the chemical formula, Wimple? Oh, that's a secret, Mr. McGee. What do you mean it's a secret? That's what I mean. It's a secret. <laughs> Well, you know what the secret is, don't you? No, but my wife does. <laughs> your wife? What's she got to do with your invention? Well, she's really the inventor. I'm only the one who saw the possibilities in it for a paving material. Well, what was it in the first place? Her recipe for chocolate pudding. <laughs> The minute I tasted it, I said to her, I said, Cornelia, I said, this would make wonderful paving material. And what did she say? I don't know. Everything went black. Yeah. <laughs> but, 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 here's what we better do, Mr. McGee. I don't care what we better do, but let's do it. All righty. I'll go home and analyze this material and see how we can dissolve it around your feet. Will your wife give you the formula? If she won't, Mrs. McGee, we'll have to use air hammers and chop him loose. Well, let's hurry up. Hey, go easy, fellas. You're getting awful close to my feet. Be patient now. You're nearly free, dearie. There you are, buddy. Sorry you got to go home with a hunk of pavement on each foot, but that's the best we could do. 
Now, I imagine you can soak that off with turpentine, McGee. <laughs> Come on, dearie. Come on, I'll take one arm and Mr. Gildersleeve the other one. Okay, much obliged, fellas. All right, one side there, everybody. Uh, stand back. Stand back now. Uh, can you walk a little, chum? I think so. Let me try. Yeah. <sighs> Yeah, I can manage. Boy, is this a relief. I thought I'd never get out of there. You know what the first thing is I'm going to do is, Molly, after I get these hunks of pavement off of my feet is? What, dearie? I'm going to run right out and mail that letter for you. Uh, give me the letter, dearie. Oh, sir, I started out to mail it, and by the seven sisters of Maud Kelly, I'm going to mail it. It's no use, dearie. That letter's no good now. What you mean? Who is it to? The street commissioner. My goodness, Mrs. McGee, uh, what did you want him to do? Pave the street in front of our house. Oh, sir. Oh. Bibber and Molly will be back in just a moment. Here's a question several people have asked me lately. Is Johnson's Glow Coat good for other kinds of floors besides linoleum? Yes, it most certainly is. It's good for painted or varnished wood floors and for floors covered with rubber or asphalt tile. Glow Coat gives all these floors a real coat of protection, enhances their beauty, makes cleaning easy. And it's just as easy to apply Glow Coat to these floors as it is to linoleum. When the floor is clean, apply Glow Coat with a cloth or long-handled Glow Coat applier and let it dry for 20 minutes. Glow Coat polishes itself without any rubbing or buffing. That's why it's called self-polishing. Most women find Glow Coat especially helpful in protecting their kitchen linoleum floors because these floors get more than average wear. Linoleum manufacturers themselves recommend this easy, no-rubbing method for keeping linoleum clean, making it last longer. Try Johnson's self-polishing glow coat on your floor. Is one of those of all the dad dreaded. If that wasn't the darn Who are you thing... talking about, McGee? Egghead Vanderveen? No. Egghead McGee. <laughs> I'm disgusted. Making a receptacle of myself. Everybody jeering and pointing at me. And me squawking and hollering there like Oh, hey. now stop fussing about it. It wasn't that bad. And anyway, I'll give you credit for one thing. What's that? It's the first time you ever put your foot in it and then opened your mouth. <laughs> Speaking for the makers of Johnson's Wax and Johnson's Self-Polishing Glow Coat. Inviting you all to be with us again next Tuesday night. Good night. Mr. Jones, do you have that new kind of enamel that contains wax? Yes, indeed I have. And lots of my customers are buying it. Here it is, Johnson's Wax Enamel. And a wonderful enamel it is. See those 19 stunning colors, all selected by prominent decorators. Wax enamel gives a smoother finish and a more beautiful luster than any enamel I've ever handled. Not a harsh glare at all. And the wax in wax enamel gives it added protection against wear and makes it easier to clean. Here, here's a free color chart for you. Just try wax enamel on old furniture or on your bathroom or kitchen walls. This is the National Broadcasting Company.